Web novel fanfiction TG the good. The latest of the latest. Chapter 1 The big screen that was installed on the building shone. Those who were walking on the street or driving couldn't keep their eyes from the screen. There was an orc on the screen. A single orc. He was facing thousands of troops alone. He showed up again. He is blocking the Allied forces alone. Nobody knows who he is. It is unknown if he is a user, an NPC, or a named boss NPC that the game manufacturers have created. Everything is unknown. The commander who led the army approached the orc. The screen zoomed in on the commander's handsome face as he said. Do you think you can stop it alone? The orc didn't answer, the steel helmet casting a shadow over his expressionless face. Why are you blocking us? The narrator explained who the man was. An elf, he has the War Maestro class, lauded as a hidden piece, and is the top-ranking master of the Heaven and Earth clan. He is a genius at large-scale tactical command. He is Choi Hansung, a popular user called Rommel. The orc then opened his mouth. Why are you attacking them? The orc spoke in a distinctively thick and low voice. That. Choi Hansung hesitated to speak. The answer was obvious. Due to the large-scale quest, he wanted to receive items and to gain levels. He would then obtain wealth and power. However, he couldn't give that answer. They are our enemies. Why? If you block us any further, then you will also become our enemy. Didn't you come to this place to betray their faith, and slaughter the innocents, just to gain money and equipment? The orc laughed. Human who does not know honor. I am an elf. Are you perhaps a user? Listen carefully. The orc raised his gaze. Inside his helmet, a formidable light shone. His appearance on the screen was zoomed in, making him seem like he was looking at everyone. The orc declared loudly. His voice rang throughout the plains and out of the screen, into the ears of everyone listening. I am an orc, a warrior. A warrior doesn't forsake faith. A warrior doesn't persecute the weak. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. A warrior doesn't yield to injustice. A warrior doesn't shame the gods. A warrior pays back any favors or vengeance. A warrior protects the powerless. I swear to the gods, I will abide by these laws as a warrior. The orc lifted his enormous greatsword. Prove your honor. The body of the orc appeared on the screen. The earth shook and the entire army, including the commander, took one step back. The orc laughed, come, human. Chapter, 2. Game, start. At the compulsion, Ian stiffened and shook his head. He was a man who had never sucked to oppression. He slowly pressed his hand against his younger sister's forehead in warning as she tried to forcefully push her upper body over the counter. If you don't have any credits, then you are banned from accessing it. However, his sister Young Yu didn't back down. Just try connecting as a test. Appa is always doing everything, which is why you don't have a girlfriend. Cash or credit? Ah, why do you want to receive money from your little sister? There are other customers waiting behind you, so please hurry. Wah. Really? Yu's face turned red as she heard the laughter behind her. She extended some bills clutched in her fist. You are lacking 501. Shut up. I'm going to school. Eu stuck her tongue out and ran away from the cafe. Ian smiled as he looked at her back. The customer waiting for their turn came up. Ian SSAS little sister is always cheerful. I wish she was calmer. Did you want an Americano? As the man who ran a quiet cafe, young Ian always had a kind smile. His tall, Slender body and gentle atmosphere meant that quite a few female customers stopped by to see him every day. It had been less than one year since he opened Cafe Reason, but the relaxed atmosphere meant that it was always frequented by regulars. Ian SSI, are you playing Elder Lord? I'm not good at games. It's a virtual reality game so you should be okay. Ian SSI should give it a try. Don't you think that there are more people playing the game than people not playing it? Ha! <laughs> Is that so? Here is your iced Americano. 
please let me know if you ever start. It'll help you, as my level is quite high. Elder Lord was a virtual reality game that started its service a few months ago. It already dominated the virtual reality game market due to the perfect reality that couldn't be compared with existing games. The unique game system, and the fact that the rate of assimilation affected a player's abilities. Role-playing users who shot movies of their characters were broadcasted during the golden time, while the revenue of the ranker surpassed that of celebrities and sports stars. The fact that virtual reality was starting to replace reality had now become a slogan. This was the age of Elder Lord. Ian bought a connection capsule for EU a while ago, but now she wanted him to join her. He could guess the reason why EU was doing this. Elder Lord was very difficult, and it was hard to level up and improve one's abilities. Monsters and NPCs were also very strong, so most of the first-time users suffered. They were strangers who entered the world of the NPCs and started from the bottom, so soon after EU started, she couldn't help but whine to Ian to help her. A person's real abilities could affect their performance in Elder Lord. A player's physical abilities depended on the character, but players could reproduce techniques that they already knew. It was rumored that rankers were people set in martial arts or acrobatics. Ian had seen a war video of Elder Lord on television, and he didn't like it very much. Excuse me? Ah, I'm sorry. What did you say just now? Cappuccino. Ian's hands shook as he entered the order. He held his trembling fists and then slowly opened his hand. The shaking stopped, and it felt like his hand was frozen stiff. At one time, he had been on the battlefield and slept with death around him every day. He wouldn't ever play Elder Lord. After meeting the eyes of those dying on the battlefield, how could he cheer as he saw a sword slicing a man's neck in a game? Won't you try it once? Ian shook his head. What do you mean? I won't do it. This guy, why are you still caught up in the past? I saw that you were shaking when you were trying to shoot a gun. It isn't like that. Ian turned his gaze away. The man who was facing him, Beck Hanho, burst out laughing. He wore an improved Hanbok, but his hair had pomade in it, and he was wearing an expensive watch. He sipped the coffee that Ian brought and muttered, Eh, I can't drink this. Coffee was originally this bitter. Life isn't like that either. Ian frowned. Beck Hanho spoke once again before gulping down the coffee. Beck Hanho tilted his head upwards and laughed after drinking all of it. You finished it. Didn't you say that coffee is originally this bitter? Beck Hanho laughed and stroked his chin. Then he continued, I know that coffee is originally bitter water. That's why I was afraid. I hate it when you speak in Zen riddles. You are a coward. Ian's face wrinkled again. Then Beck Hanho said, Take a look at your sister, Yu. Isn't she someone who grew up alone? Now her brother won't even play a game with her. TSK TSK. I'm only joking, but you should seriously consider my words. Ian held his chin and started thinking. Suddenly, the door opened and the notification bell was heard. There were two people, one tugging at the other. They were both girls, the sound of their high heels heard by the entire cafe as they entered. Their words came out in an unstable tone. In all likelihood, they were the last customers of the day. Ian automatically checked everything about them, his habits from the battlefield obviously still following him. He heard their voices. In regards to Elder Lord, I managed to level up due to Appa helping me. What about you? Why I'm envious. He changed yesterday. How irritating. Changed. That pig suddenly touched my beauty have truly bad luck. What did you do? Did you report it? Why would he do that? Really? Ian's eyes shook as he heard the conversation. Hanho placed a cookie in his mouth. Then he said to Ian. Hum hum. In fact, I am quite far in Elder Lord. Then he paused as he saw Ian's eyes. What? Teacher Nim. What is it? Elder Lord, how do I connect to it? Have you changed your mind? I have. Thus, Ian started the game to defend his sister. Right. Huge trees and lush foliage covered the sky. 
the sunshine pouring through the gaps disturbed his eyes. He stepped on soft soil. He could smell the forest, hear the cries of the birds and saw insects crawling around. Ian was flustered. Tesis a game. It couldn't be. It was a reality. However, the message windows that surfaced before him said that this was a game. Welcome to Elder Lord. Please check your status window. Your starting point is Orcrock's Fortress. Good luck. The message windows disappeared once Ian checked them. Once again, the lush forest that seemed like reality stretched out before him. Ian idly wandered and saw a puddle. A small squirrel that was sipping water fled when it saw Ian. Ian confirmed his appearance in the water. He was a huge monster with green skin and huge tusks protruding from his rough face. Status Window Ian, Novice Orc Level 1 Achievement Point 0 Assimilation 50% Abilities Orc Strength Common Orcs Recovery Common He was an Orc. The users could select from the following list of species the humans, elves, dark elves, dwarves, gnomes, and the orcs. Unlike the other species that had an appearance similar to humans, the orcs looked like an in-game monster. Their appearance couldn't even be customized like humans. Therefore, Ian chose it. The reason was simple he wanted to surprise Eu. However, when he opened his hands and checked his green skin and thick fingers, he felt uncomfortable, as if his soul was occupying the body of another being. The weight and center of this body was different from reality. It seemed like time was required to become more familiar with this body. Sometimes animals would discover Ian and run away. Ian chased after them and dived in pursuit. He managed to grab a rabbit. This body was heavy, but fast. The density of its muscles was different from humans. This was a strong orc. Ian looked at the spires of the castle that were rising above the trees in the distance. The cradle of the orc warriors, Orcrock's fortress. It seemed like he needed to go there. Ian walked in the direction of Orcrock's fortress and disappeared into the forest. After Ian left this place, a new player appeared out of thin air. He also looked around like it was his first connection. Oh, this is Elder Lord. Really? Doesn't it look like the real thing? This is a virtual reality game. Let's see put it in the ear I do this. Uh, I've connected. What do I do? Species? Orc. A man should be an orc what? Do it again. What? Wasn't it in the introduction of the game? Why is an orc an error? A species that the game manufacturers accidentally opened. A dog-like species? The orcs of Elder Lord are too weak. People don't choose them as a species. There is no one. None. Really none. They all reset before level 5. No yes, you what? Are you trying to be vicious to the NPCs, like a villain who steps on the underpaid contract workers below you? It is okay since this is a game. Users are much better than NPCs. Puha. I understand. Understood. Then, I will be a human. I'll say it again, it is a lot of effort. Chapter, 3 As Ian approached the wall, two orcs in chain armor stood tall like stone statues. Their blades flashed in the sun. They discovered Ian and laughed. They were laughing, but due to their tusks and their heinous appearance, their faces seemed evil. Hey, are you alive? I'm alive. I came here to become a fellow warrior. They burst out laughing. It was a unique tone caused by their stomachs shaking. Ian gulped at their overwhelming momentum. He had once been a soldier, but he couldn't help but shrink back at the two monstrous orcs side by side. One of the orcs held out a fist. Ian looked at the rough hand blankly before realizing it was a greeting. Ian also made a fist and bumped it against each other. The orc guard smiled and said. Anyway, you have arrived at Orcrux and I wish you good luck. Today there is a funeral where we will remember an honorable warrior. Koko. Stay alive. They shouted to open the door. The walls were high enough to cover the sun, and the giant door that was the size of the building started to slowly open. 
The door opened with a thunderous sound and Ian was able to see the inside of Orcrock's fortress. Oh! Ian thought of orcs as savage monsters, since their appearance alone was heinous. But that wasn't it. The scale of the buildings were different. There were tall buildings around the giant tree in the center, with bridges in the sky connecting each one. Above his head, orcs were busy going to and fro. It felt like the city of elves in a fantasy world. There weren't just warriors with weapons or shamans with staffs, but various orcs, such as merchants, in order to form a civilization. It was a magnificent landscape that was more realistic than reality. The orc fortress filled Ian's view. This is really a game. Hey, you're alive. Are you new? Passing orcs smiled at the stunned newcomer and held out their fists. Ian bumped them with his fists. Whether he was alive or not, it didn't take long for him to realize that it was the orcs' greeting. All of them asked each other if they were alive, meaning this was a place where life and death occurred often enough for it to become a greeting. Ian didn't know what to do after entering Orcrock's fortress, so he checked the interface for beginner's tips. If you selected an orc, can you really endure it? If you are a beginner, look for Instructor Lennox at Orcrock's fortress. Lennox? It was at that moment. Uh, a user? Wah, a real user? There was a loud and gruff voice, but the tone was light. Ian turned his head and saw a shabby-looking orc. This is the first time I've seen another beginner orc. It's nice to meet you. He tried to shake hands before grunting and putting out his fist like the other orcs. Ian smiled and bumped his fist. Are you alive? I'm alive. Huh, by the way, did you just start playing? What's your name? I'm called Grom. I got it from a character in an old classic game. Yes. I'm Ian. Ian nodded. Ian then discovered sewing on the other person's forehead. A white star was shimmering in the middle of his forehead. That? What? Grom followed Ian's gaze to his forehead. Ah, this. You don't know. The white star allows you to identity the users. Ian has one on your forehead as well. That's how I knew that you were a user. NPCs can't see it, only we can. This is really the first time I've seen it. Is that so? There are even some who hide it to pretend to be NPCs. You must have really started without investigating anything. This is the first time in playing a game. I see. Be careful, this is a big deal. Elder Lord is a really hard game so you should look at the tips. He nodded and smiled. Of course, you didn't see it, which is why you picked an orc. Huh. It's nothing. Are you going to see Lennox? That is what the tip said. Let's go together. I was about to start heading there now. Ian followed Grom. Ian was immersed in the sight of the city. Orcrock's fortress was filled with all types of things. There was a market and smithy. It was a realistic scene that couldn't be thought of as a game as merchants shouted about their goods, adventurers gathered to fight monsters and orcs drank alcohol. Ian started to think differently of Elder Lord. The game system seemed to have a personality and story for each character. A civilization and culture was created for the orcs. It was a wonderful game. As Ian immersed himself in the world of Elder Lord, Grom laughed. Isn't it amazing? Yes. I can't believe this is a game. How? He couldn't believe that what he was seeing, hearing and feeling now was a game. Oh, there is a funeral. Funeral. Orcs are mourning the death of a great warrior. He was a great NPC who sacrificed himself to protect his allies. Suddenly, the faint sound of a horn could be heard. At that moment, the entire Orcrox fortress became quiet. Ah! All the orcs were silent. Even the merchants shouting at the market and the drunkards became silent. The horn rang out slowly in the midst of this quiet. All the orcs looked at the center of Orcrox fortress. There appeared to be an altar made of bricks with an orc body lying on top of firewood. The orcs started humming in bold tones. It was a thick, subdued tone, like the humming of the Tibetan monks. The entire Orcrox fortress was filled with the beat of the funeral procession. 
At the bottom of the altar, the orcs presiding over the funeral started to slowly beat the drums. The sound of the horns and the drumming and humming of the orcs mixed together. The warrior's body caught on fire, the flames consuming the body of the dead orc warrior. The orcs held a ceremony in remembrance of their own. Ah! Ian was shocked. A ceremony to honor their comrades. He was reminded of a soldier on the battlefield. Cornell had become a star in the sky due to rebel bullets, and his colleagues had sent him away with bright smiles instead of sad tears. The song chosen wasn't a tranquil song, but an army song. Nobody cried that day, but their hearts and minds were overflowing with hot and sad emotions. The memory of that day was revived. The humming of the orcs was grand and noble. Ian couldn't take his eyes off the burning orc warrior. The mournful cry of the horns wandered throughout Orcrock's fortress. Ian didn't know the name of the orc, since he was just a character in the game. However, it is clear to Ian that he was a great and respected man. Ah, noisy. Ian's mind snapped back at Grom's words. Grom was grumbling beside him. A funeral should proceed quickly and quietly. Ah, Hugh. Right? Ian looked at him blankly. Did this person really feel no emotions when seeing this scene? In a world that seemed more real than reality, could he throw away the solemn ceremony of the orcs just because it was a game? Ian turned his gaze once again to the burning body of the orc warrior. Assimilation 50%. Assimilation 51%. Assimilation 52%. Ian didn't know about the changes in his status window. Hello. I am a helper to help you live a comfortable elder lord life, Yu Yong. I am Jae Han. Today we will talk about assimilation rate. Jae Han SSI, what is your current assimilation rate? When my condition is good, it is over 50%. On average, it is 40%. That is amazing. I am usually 30%. An average user is between 3000 and 40%, so Jae Han SSI is capable. Ha ha ha. Still, I don't want to get hurt when fighting, so I often end up limiting it. At 50%, I feel dizzy like I am actually hit by a knife. In fact, I usually play at a limit of 20% due to that. Oh, that is worse. Hi hi hi. Anyway, what is the assimilation rate of the viewers? The survey results say that the average is between 3000 and 40%. In the case of high rankers, especially those who are role-playing, it may be up to 70%. Amazing, don't they seem to be properly immersed? Tremble Tremble In particular, the most popular role-player, user Kim Dokwang of the Militia, has released his latest status window. His assimilation rate is a huge 73%. Whoa! Is that how he became a ranker? The game publishers didn't disclose how the assimilation rate affects performance, but it certainly has an effect. It is common sense that rankers have a higher rate of assimilation, since the assimilation rate determines the rankers' abilities. Their SS, attacks and movements are superior in every way. Doesn't this narrow down the difference between NPCs and users? Ah, scary NPCs. I don't like NPCs. Ha <laughs> ha. Is that so? That is why users are attempting to create a village. I interviewed Elaine, an elf user who designed Shangri-La, the village of users. A restaurant staff member changed the television channel. Eh, the world is going crazy for games. Young Yu, who was immersed in the contents, recovered. Her friends who she was eating together with also turned their heads away. What is your assimilation rate? I'm around 20-30%. I've gone over 40% but am usually around 30%. Young Yu laughed, I am 10%. Hey, what is this? Do you only play with the right side of your brain while the left side is sleeping? It's a game. The thought of it being a game keeps me from being immersed well, I did level up. You died to a rabbit. What? How did a rabbit you? Is that possible? Do rabbits even attack? EU sighed. I don't know. I tried to attack it, but the rabbit bit my legs. I was constantly bitten by the rabbit and died from severe bleeding. Amazing. Crazy. Young Yu laughed.
But don't worry. Now my troubles are over, since my brother has started playing the game. Ah, uh, that brother? Yes. Appa will become a high ranker quickly and take care of me. I will catch up to all of you. A friend who was listening interrupted her, why will he become a high ranker? My brother is a soldier. Soldier. Will a soldier be more familiar with sewing like Elder Lord? There are plenty of army men. He was in a real battlefield, not a normal soldier. Do you know the foreign troops? He shot people in the Middle East and Africa. Really? Then he has ed people. Everyone's gaze turned to Eu, who shrugged. I don't know, he doesn't talk about it. Amazing. A friend of my brother's is a martial arts player and adapted immediately. Isn't he a ranker now? Hey, young Eu. Don't pretend not to know me later. Eu shrugged at her friends. So be good to me. However, Eu didn't know one important thing about Ian, whom she was putting all of her expectations in. He chose the orc that was called the Game Maker's Mistake. Chapter, 4. Kohuk. Ian fell to the ground. The orc warrior, Instructor Lennox, laughed at them. You guys came to become warriors. Kiuk. Lennox grabbed Grom's neck. You. Don't overrate yourselves. Orcs. Keep your head up. Lennox pushed his face right up to theirs and shouted. Look at these soft limbs. You aren't orcs. Humans. Elves. I can even believe that you are dwarves. Lennox then threw Grom, who moaned as he rolled across the floor. The orc warriors that were training laughed at them with their distinct voices. When Ian and Grom first told Lennox that they wanted to be orc warriors, Lennox asked them. Why do you want to be a warrior? Ian and Grom looked at each other. Grom replied within a minute. I want to become stronger. The orcs, a fighting species. They were strong warriors who worshipped fighters and never bowed to the enemy. It was a textbook answer, and to some extent, it was true. Lennox's eyes widened at Grom's response. He nodded, and then punched Grom and Ian. Now they were being beaten up. Why, why are you doing this? Even if it was virtual reality, they still felt pain. The amount of sensation was deducted in accordance with one's assimilation rate, but the pain itself still existed. Grom sounded like he was going to cry from the beating. Lennox and the other orc warriors once again laughed at Grom's voice. The sissy is crying now. That's it, meek orc. Lennox raised his fist once again and Grom crouched down. Lennox smiled and put down his fist. Then he turned and looked at Ian. Ian was bracing himself while standing up. He shook due to the sense of pain that he had forgotten for a while. It really felt like he was being beaten. He started swaying. Hey you. What about you? Ha. Huh? Did you come here because you wanted to become stronger like him? Ian felt a sense of deja vu. Lennox resembled the instructor of the foreign troops. The instructor had asked the recruits, why did you come here? What reason do you have for jumping into the firing line? There were many answers, but the instructor just laughed and kicked them. Then Ian replied. To protect my younger sister. Their parents had died, leaving no money and inherited debt. He had to protect his little sister. He, who only had a body that learned martial arts. He turned towards the battlefield. The instructor had nodded at Ian's reply and kicked Ian in the stomach. Do it well. The instructor had muttered softly instead of laughing. As Ian recalled that time, he stared into Lennox's eyes. Lennox no longer seemed like an ugly monster in a game. He was a warrior, an instructor. A mentor to the orc warriors. It wasn't the time to joke right now. He stared straight into his eyes. Lennox wasn't the type who required a typical answer in a game. That's right. Ho. Become stronger. Ian said firmly. To protect my precious people. He was sincere, Ian had truly started this game for EU. He had learned on the battlefield that the world was a heavy place. The wars were just a proxy for the politicians. 
Lennox laughed at Ian's answer and then he slammed his fist into Ian's abdomen. Heok. Ian clenched his teeth and persisted. His waist folded, but his legs didn't collapse. Everybody get up. Lennox's voice was heard and Grom stood up. The two people stood in front of Lennox. Lennox looked at Grom first. If you want to become stronger, never cower. Yes, yes. Straighten your waist. Grom tightened his waist. Then Lennox looked at Ian. You want to protect your precious people. Right now, you can't even protect yourself, let alone your precious people. Lennox grinned. Remember today's helplessness. You have become an orc apprentice warrior. Become a great orc warrior with the teachings of Instructor Lennox. Ten achievement points have been acquired. The message windows opened. Grom looked like he had received the same messages. Lennox made a gesture to follow him. They entered a large stone building that was beside the training grounds. Anyone who wants to become a warrior will need to stop by here. He waved his hands and the dark interior lit up. These are the great warriors who have entered the Hall of Fame. The lit torches revealed multiple statues surrounding them. They were several times larger than actual orcs and were delicately sculpted to look as if they were alive. Ian once again admired the level of civilization of the orcs. The statues stood proudly with their weapons, including an axe, a hammer, a mace, and a morning star. Lennox asked. Who do you want to follow? The message windows popped up. Please select your role model. The orcs believe in intuition and following the pull of the soul. Your weapon will depend on this choice. The weapon can be changed at a later time, but for the time being, you will proceed with the weapon and SS that you have chosen. It seemed like they were now choosing their weapons. Ian odically examined the statues. The statues looked down at the center of the circle, making him feel like he was making eye contact with those legendary figures. Ian suddenly felt an intense gaze and turned his head. One of the statues that was holding a huge greatsword was staring at Ian. Even though it was a stone statue, Ian's heart pounded as it seemed as if the eyes were actually looking at him. But that wasn't the only thing that surprised Ian. He was a human. That human? Lennox replied. Liteno. Lennox walked towards the statue of Liteno. He walked the path of a warrior like us and was the only human to become a brother of the orcs. This human? A long time ago, when the humans betrayed us and broke the covenant, Liteno fought with us against their greed and hypocrisy. He was a warrior who knew honor, a true warrior who never compromised when faced with injustice and never abandoned faith. Every time he wielded his great sword, the blood of the enemies would gush out like a river. Lennox extended this fist. The statue of Liteno stayed still, but it seemed like he met Lennox's fist. We respectfully call him the master of the great sword. You have chosen a great warrior, the master of the great sword, who became the brother of the orcs in human form, Liteno. Your weapon is a great sword. S great sword technique common has been acquired. Status window. Ian, orc apprentice warrior. Level 1. Achievement points 10. Assimilation 53%. Abilities. Orc strength common. Orcs recovery common. Greatsword common. His weapon was automatically designated by the system, but Ian didn't panic, as he had wanted to choose Liteno. He was a human, but he chose an orc as his character. He felt a sense of connection to Liteno, who had become a brother of the orcs in human form. In addition, Ian had learned the sword from Beck Hanho. Due to your basic SS, the proficiency of greatsword technique common has increased. As proficiency accolades, you can upgrade it to the uncommon rating. How did his game know that he had previously learned swordsmanship? The system was truly elaborate. Grom has chosen Gloin, whose axe is said to have split apart a whole mountain. The axe is good. That's right. The axe is a basic weapon for all orc warriors. Kokoko. Lennox laughed. He also carried an axe on his back. Follow me. After they left the Hall of Fame, Lennox pulled out their weapons from the arsenal next to the training grounds. The old greatsword common has been acquired. It was difficult to hold the heavy greatsword. 
Unlike other games, Elder Lord didn't have an inventory. It was a game that eliminated user convenience for extreme realism. Even considering the size of the orcs, he would have to carry an oversized greatsword from now on. Grom also wobbled as he held his axe. Grom whispered. We aren't orcs for nothing. Ow, this is a really brutish weapon. Ian swung the greatsword in the air. Still, the strength of an orc could be seen. I guess you like it, you little ones. Lennox said with a laugh, but I wonder if that will be the case after listening to my words. From now on, you will swing your weapon at the training grounds. They stood at the training grounds. In addition to the two users, there were numerous orcs training with their weapons. The axe and halberd boasted the highest proportion of wielders, followed by hammers and maces. A great sword like Ian's was rare. They looked at Grom and Ian like they were a spectacle. Look at my posture. Lennox took Grom's axe and demonstrated. It was a clean downward blow. Lennox repeated the technique again. Then he showed a two-handed slash with Ian's great sword. Repeat this. How many times? Until you are satisfied. Ha. Huh. Lennox gave a loud laugh. If you are satisfied, then come find me. Lennox said before leaving. The other orcs gathered around Grom and Ian and laughed. Kokokol. It is starting again. Kokol. Hey, newbies. Let me tell you one thing. Yes. Instructor Lennox has never been satisfied once. Then what? You should learn it with your body. The orcs laughed again. Kokol. Lennox's new sheep, stay alive. Kohaha. Ah. Grom sighed. He took the axe and swung it a few times in the air before stopping. Ian. Ian was familiarizing himself with holding a sword again. Are you going to continue today? Yes. I'm a little tired, so I need to log out and I'll search for a few attacks. Ah, uh, being an orc is more exhausting than I thought. I understand. Then have fun, I'll see you later. Grom gradually disappeared as he logged out. At that moment, the other orcs became nervous. How did the orcs perceive his sudden disappearance? The orcs clicked their tongues as they saw Grom disappearing. What, someone who received the curse of the stars? They asked Ian. Are you the same? Have you been cursed by the stars? Help came while Ian was worrying about the answer. In the world of Elder Lord, users have received the curse of the stars. Sometimes they are summoned by the abyss and due to the curse of the stars, they are revived after dying. Those who receive the curse of the stars can be released from the curse by building up achievements and receiving God's forgiveness. If they can't, they will be destined to suffer forever in the abyss. If NPCs know that you have been cursed by the stars, then you may be discriminated again. Whatever the OD, everything in the world of Elder Lord is your choice. Ian immediately understood the situation. The curse of the stars was a setting created to explain the users logging out and their revival after dying. He nodded at the maker's foresight. Ian replied honestly, that's right. I see. They didn't say anything else. In the world of Elder Lord, NPCs felt reluctant towards the users cursed by the stars. Ian paid attention to his greatsword again. He recalled Lennox's movements. Even if his weapon was a sword, Lennox was a great warrior. Right now, to Ian, Elder Lord wasn't a game, but a new world. He was a newcomer cursed by the stars who was sweating to become an orc warrior. Qua. Haya. I'm alive. Bolter. A burning spirit rose up inside Ian as he heard and saw the orcs sharpening their SS. Ian wielded his sword. Chapter, 5. Azi Dahaka. A monster named after a legendary dragon. An alias for the first dragon class monster to appear. I thought it was dead but now Azi Dahaka is raising its body. Ian heard the news and bowed his head, touching his chin. He had a headache thinking about the humanoid monster that appeared next to Parthenon's body and now Azi Dahaka was resurrected. The worry that he always had in the back of the mind was revived and his head was disturbed. It was one question. Can humanity prevail in this war? 
It was this. He didn't know the power of all the monsters. He didn't know where they came from or how many there were. Scientists came up with all sorts of ideas about these monsters. They were bioweapons made from genetic engineering, a species from another world aiming for this planet. Monsters made by the Nazis, world government conspiracy theories, a punishment from God, etc. As the debate worsened, one fact became clear. Humans still didn't know anything about the enemy. There were ten dragon-grade monsters who appeared. All but Azzy Dehaka died from the hands of Ian. Humanity's countermeasure was still only Ian. He wasn't immortal. The hunters who awakened due to the days of Elder Road were continuing to grow, but they weren't at the level to deal with dragon-grade monsters. Would this war end? What kind of result waited at the end? This worry had continued to grow since his awakening. I see. After a long silence, Ian replied. He decided not to think too deeply. He couldn't afford to feel fear now. No matter what the future held, he had to do his best in the current. Where is Azzy Dehaka? Sydney? It has left. Really? What about the National Guard? There is no damage. The National Guard knew they couldn't cope so they all retreated. Azzy Dehaka left Sydney and went to the desert. It is currently at Ayers Rock. Ayers. Also known as Uluru, a rock that was called the belly button of the world. A picture of a huge dragon was sent to Ian. Azzy Dehaka was sitting on the largest rock known to humanity. Ian stared at Azzy Dehaka in the photo. The support. The Australian government has promised to devote all its best. But based on Sydney, they can't do much. In fact, there is no support. Ian always fought alone. The word support didn't match him. In return, he received a huge reward. But this wasn't important to him. There was nothing he needed. He'll ask for support. Ha. Huh. Why? Ian's agent, Leonardo looked at him with a questioning expression. It was rare for Ian to ask for sewing first. Contact the US and ask them to prepare a nuclear bomb. Ian. It is good that it is already a desert. Are you serious? I just don't feel good. Don't worry. There won't be any problems. I understand. I'll leave as soon as possible. Thank you, Leonardo. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Leonardo winked. Then he turned off the video call. Sigh. Ian leaned back. He eliminated Egypt's Ramel and Libya's Parthenon. Now it was Azzy Dehaka. It was unprecedented to deal with so many dragon-class monsters in a row like this. Will you be okay? His secretary asked. He continued to use his healing ability on Ian. Ian laughed. If I'm not okay. You must be tired. If I stop, people will die. His secretary fell silent. The man who gave off a good impression was actually carrying the fate of the world. I'm okay so let's depart immediately. Yes. I understand. Ian spread open his hands and relaxed. The next destination was Australia. I can't reach him. Really dot. He must be busy. Neither the secretary or agent accepted my call. Did sewing happen? Leave it dot. Crocta has his own business dot. Tio's party already paid no attention to Crocta's whereabouts. They were having a happy time at Choi Hansung's home. This. What is this dish? It is the first time I've tasted such delicious food. It is called chicken. Tashiquil. Try the soy sauce one here. It isn't a joke. Oh. Today is the first time I thought it was good to join your adventure. Me too. What dot? Didn't you like it before? Tio's party wasn't able to eat proper food due to the hardships in the past. Choi Hansung ordered various delivery foods for them and gave them a big meal. They fell for the taste of this food. Chicken, pizza, Chinese cuisine, fish, meat and various midnight snacks were delivered to create a lavish feast. Human. What is this? It is pizza. Pizza. I like it. 
the double-wielding swordsman, Dryden was holding a pizza in both hands. What are you eating now? Oh, it is ramen. It is delicious but it isn't good for the body. I'm curious. Can I taste it? Yes. Choi Hansung handed over his ramen. Tio looked at it carefully and gulped down the soup. Then his eyes widened. This. Tio's reaction attracted everyone's attention. Tio shouted, This isn't the demon's food. Dot. Demon? Really? This. It is like that fellow Abaddon. Dot. Really? HRMM. The group rushed like zombies at his words. Choi Hansung had to boil a few more packets of ramen for them. Then he heard the story about the Y food that was similar to ramen in Elder Lord. They couldn't eat it due to wandering around here and there. The taste of home. I have no regrets if I die. The taste of their home was ramen. I'm going to burst. This amount if enough to make the middle full. Kulko. As orcs could eat a lot of food, Tashikul patted his belly and lay on the sofa. Aner lay his head on Tashikul's belly. By the way, Krokta is busy. Tio looked at Choi Hansung. We can't go meet him. Dot. I don't know where he is and it is probably far away. Far away. Dot. Tio laughed at his words. Rommel says he is far away. Dot. He looked at his party members. Everyone laughed. We have already crossed seas and continents. It is funny to say that he is far away. How far is it? We crossed dimensions. At best, isn't he on the same planet? For us, this greenhouse-like planet is ridiculous. Quahahat. They giggled like it was absurd. Choi Hansung was upset. These guys from Elder Road dared ignore his blue planet. This planet had beautiful four seasons and produced superstars like Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods. Pacquiao dominated the 8-class weight category and Eminem broke the record for album sales. Wasn't English the most used language in the world? Do you know Mariana Trench? Do you know Mount Everest? Choi Hansung roughly manipulated the remote control. Tashikwil, who was staring at a girl group with his mouth gaping open, glared at Choi Hansung. I was watching that. His complexion darkened. The giant full HD screen he bought with the money of a hunter was now showing sewing more beautiful than a girl group. It was a lonely planet rotating in a vast universe. It was just a pale blue dot compared to the scale of the universe, but it was the sea of life. All of us. The blue planet Earth. The majestic scenery looked down at them. All the known history and civilization was on this blue sphere. Choi Hansung was thrilled and whispered. That. Is where we are. Tio replied. What bull is this dot? The rest protested. A bee dot. It is a pretty but eerie image. The background is poor. I'd like to look at what was on before. Choi Hansung tried hard to explain but it didn't reach them. The frustrated Choi Hansung was eventually forced to show them a map of the world. Now they nodded. Oh, a map dot. It is unbelievably detailed. We are here. It is called South Korea. Tio said, eh. It is very small dot. No. What are you saying? We have Park Jisung and Kim Yuna, as well as the most scientific writing system in the world. Then where is Krokta dot? Do you know? Maybe he is here. Choi Hansung pointed to the area labeled Egypt. They couldn't see how far it was because they didn't have a sense of Earth's size. It will take one day on a plane. Such a small planet dot. No. Choi Hansung explained that Earth was actually a very big and cool planet. But thanks to the edge technology of an airplane, they were able to move in a short amount of time. There was a lot of suffering behind its history and could be traced back to the achievements of the Wright brothers. However, Tio's party stopped listening from the middle. Sigh. He really speaks a lot. Dot. Shut his mouth. In pretending to listen. Kokoko. The attempt to tell them about the greatness of Earth's civilization failed. Choi Hansung felt desperate. 
At that moment, his phone rang. Hello. Choi Hansung looked towards Tio's party and raised an index finger to his lips. Really? Choi Hansung was also a world famous hunter. No, he was the best except for Ian. He was Rommel. Before Krokta's appearance in Elder Road, he was the leader of the Supreme Heaven and Earth Clan. His information network was different. Choi Hansung's face became serious. The information was shocking. Its body revived again. He asked the Korean government for information on Ian's location and they informed him of an unexpected fact. Ian had defeated Rammel in Egypt, Parthenon in Libya and recaptured the city. But then Azzi Dahaka started to move again. Ian headed straight there. He would dealing with dragon-class monsters in succession. Choi Hansung frowned. No, that doesn't mean he will immediately. No, ha. Yes. I understand. Choi Hansung shook his head. They said Ian was going on his own. The bottom line was that there was no solution unless Ian went. Choi Hansung felt his own helplessness every time a dragon class monster appeared. If it weren't for Ian, the human race would already be destroyed. Humanity as a whole owed him a debt. Can't it be ed by a nuclear weapon? What is the crisis over there? Choi Hansung asked. Where is Azzi Dahaka? Yes, I will go. I'm not crazy. I'm going. I will go directly. What if Ian has a problem? This is three dragon class monsters in a row. Choi Hansung shouted. In any case, it is all over if sewing happens to Ian. South Korea will be fine even without me. But it is over if we don't have him. If there is a problem, contact the White Knight. That uncle is free. Me? I am originally a rude. No, what is with my tone? Aren't you twisting it? It is always me. Are you going to die without me? Why is South Korea relying on me alone? How long have I been doing this? Aish, really? The government official shouted but Choi Hansung just hung up. He was a man of action. Humans are so stifling. TSK. Choi Hansung shook his head. Tio looked at him and clapped. I have found out where Krokta is. I heard it. You are a bigger man than I thought. Dot. Let's go. Dot. Starting now. Let's go quickly. I don't have a good feeling. We have to go and help. Ian will be having a hard time right now. Hoo-hoo, we are finally dealing with some monsters. Interesting. How are we going? Are we taking the car? Don't worry. The airplane. Choi Hansung paused. Buy planet tickets. Then. Come to think of it, they didn't have passports. Their identities were also unclear. How could he fly with them to Australia? Ah. Choi Hansung grabbed his head and muttered. That. He thought for a moment before sighing. Sure. Choi Hansung alternated looking between his phone and his shaking hands, before eventually opening his phone. He moved his hands and touched the call button. Before long, he started acting politely. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. I had to take a minute. Yes. It is because I am sometimes stressed from work. Ha ha ha. I'm sorry. Not that different. I have a favor to ask. Ah, uh, yes. I'm sorry. I'm glad. Chapter, 6. Ian and Grom passed Lennox's test. Grom brandished his axe a few times and went to Lennox, where he was beaten and started training again. Meanwhile, Ian didn't go to Lennox and stayed at the training grounds. Therefore, a week passed by in reality like this. Thanks to the brain acceleration system, one day of reality was five days in Elder Lord. A time acceleration of five times was applied. Thus, Ian reported the same thing for more than a month in game time. Ian, who repeatedly trained himself, and Grom, who acted like a normal user, couldn't progress in the game for a month. Ian realized the severity of the orc species. Who would want to spend a month doing the basic foundations in a game? 
they trained repetitively every day until they collapsed from exhaustion. It was natural that there were no users. Then Lennox called Ian and Grom over. Now you are a little usable. He looked at Ian when saying this. Of course, you are still greatly lacking. This time he looked at Grom. Ian and Grom had become an attraction in Orcrock's fortress. Both of them had become synonymous with fighting spirit. Ian trained diligently, while Grom had the habit of going over to Lennox, being beaten, and then going back to training without giving up. I'm still not satisfied, but that would take another 100 years, so you will now receive your first mission as an apprentice warrior. Yes. Finally, a mission. Ian and Grom looked at each other and smiled. Recently, wolves have appeared to the south of Orcrox Fortress. There seems to be a shortage of food, so the orc farmers are suffering damage. Orc farmers. They were fresh words. It is suitable for both of you who desire to become warriors. Hunt the wolves and help the farmers. Lennox has given you a quest. The first quest. I am cheering for you. Get rid of the wicked wolves that are threatening the good-natured orc farmers. You must help them. First, look for the orc farmers outside of the fortress. The compensation for the completion of the quest is Lennox's recognition and achievement points. Depending on your accomplishments, there might be sowing more. A quest window was created. Grom's eyes moved like he was also seeing it. Now, start. Then Lennox yelled at the orc warriors at the training grounds as usual. Don't give up. Jump. Forget about your breathing. Do you want to be comfortable? Then quit. We are orcs. Bolter. Being comfortable isn't for a warrior. Comfort makes you weak. You will only grow through pain. Fight. Yua. Ian nodded. Really cool. That is cool. Grom shook his head. I am enthusiastic. I still haven't adapted to being an orc. Speaking of which, Ian SSI seems like you have received training like this before. Do you work out? I was a soldier, a professional soldier. Aha. So that's what it was. Now I understand. Your tone and behavior naturally fits this place. I am currently worrying over whether I should continue as an orc. Come on, I will be lonely if you leave me alone. Kook, then I will stay because of Ian. Grom laughed. He felt like a friendly neighborhood friend or younger brother, but he had the threatening face of an orc. Shall we buy some items? I have no money. Ah, that's right. We can earn money by doing the wolf quest and by selling the loot we pick up. Let's eat delicious food at that time. The meals at the warrior's barracks tended to just be cafeteria food. Surprisingly, the orc's diets were quite palatable. Their diet was similar to that of normal people, except that they had a higher proportion of meat and that there was a lot of food. As Ian and Grom left the fortress, the orc guards greeted them. Hey! It's the newbies. Are you alive? I'm alive. Ian and the guard's fists met. Grom also shared the greeting with the other guard. You must have been trained properly by Instructor Lennox. Now you have a bit more flesh on you. The orc guards laughed. Is it a wolf hunting mission? That's right. I see. Be careful. Lately, there have been dire wolves blending in with normal wolves. Grom was surprised, as they were a pretty powerful monster. Ian asked. What if we run into them? Look at the situation and run away if it is dangerous. The orc guard raised his finger with a serious expression. Keep this in mind. To survive is to be strong. Boldness isn't courage, so if you are in danger, don't be stubborn and run away. I understand. Kokoko, come back alive. Ian and Grom left the fortress. Wolves were dangerous beasts. Ian was well aware of this. However, he wasn't worried. He glanced at Grom walking next to him. Big and burly. He was also an orc, but the orc's solid body and tight muscles made catching any wolf-like beast seem simple in comparison. Although they were only slightly taller than humans, their bodies were twice as large as an adult male's body. 
They also had thick limbs, making them seem like gorillas. Are these wolves different from those in reality? Ian asked. They are usually similar. Animals are almost identical to those in reality. Elder Lord is difficult due to the monsters and other species being really strong. Then can't the orc farmers deal with the wolves? Ian lifted his forearm and showed his biceps, which were at a Guinness world record level. Grom laughed. That's true, but there may be sowing unusual like the dire wolves among the wolves. Ian suddenly turned his head. He was nervous, but it was just a roe deer. The roe deer often ran off when they saw the two orcs. A bird perched on the roe deer, causing both the roe deer to buck and the bird to fly off. The bird seemed to be playing a joke on the deer. It was a beautiful sight. The world of Elder Lord, which sometimes seemed more realistic and beautiful than reality, was inspiring. As he played Elder Lord, Ian seemed like he was really becoming an orc apprentice warrior. Ian muttered the orc slogan. Bolter. It was a word that orcs always repeated. It was the ancient orc word meaning, life. Chanting this seemed to clear his mind. Grom laughed. Ian will become a role player later on. Role player? Immersion is important in Elder Lord, as is the assimilation rate. There are many people who make a drama by acting like real NPCs. It is popular on TV and the internet. Kokoko, I can't do that. Look, look at that smile. Sometimes I can't help but think that you're a real orc. Your assimilation rate must be high. Ian jumped, as he could feel eyes watching them. This gaze was different from those from the animals. It resembled the ferocious gaze of the enemy on the battlefield. Ian's body tensed up. Uh, what is it? Who is there? Who? Grom looked around. There's nobody. He walked towards a bush as he looked around. The forest was filled with tall bushes and trees blocking the field of view. As Grom waved his hands in front of the bushes, hands appeared and gripped his neck. Yua. Ian drew his great sword. Grom floundered and missed his axe. The owner of the arms gradually left the bushes, revealing his appearance. He had a rough face with protruding tusks. He was an orc. The orc asked, Who are you? I am an orc. I see that. Koko. The orc stepped on Grom's axe that had fallen to the ground. Are you thieves who stole these weapons? Orcs could also be thieves. Ian shook his head. No. Then. We are warriors. Really? The orc narrowed his eyes. Ian added, apprentices. It is hard to believe. No matter how young, you look too weak to be warriors. The orc pressed harder against Grom's neck. Grom struggled frantically. Okay. Then who is your instructor? Lennox. Oh, he is a very friendly instructor. Isn't that right? Lennox isn't friendly at all. HRMM. I guess you know Lennox. He let go of Grom, who fell to the floor with a loud cry. The orc then hit Grom's head. Be tense, trainee. You should have expected sewing to emerge from the bushes. Quack. These days, there are many orc bandits. Everybody has lost their honor. Grom stood up while wiping away his drool. Who are you? Me. The orc puffed up his chest. I am Grant. A farmer. Farmer. I work honestly and sweat while gathering the grain. Ian gave Grom his axe. It is nice to meet you. Oh. Grant. We've received a mission from Lennox to help the orc farmers. Grant burst out laughing. You guys? We might be weak, but we can still help. I heard that there is a problem with wolves. Yes, that is true, but will you be able to help? Believe in Lennox's eyes, not us. Indeed Lennox wouldn't have sent just anyone. Grant considered for a while and nodded. I understand. Follow me. They followed Grant. A log cabin was built not far away. There was a fence built around a field that wasn't large. Two small orcs were using farm equipment in the field. Hey, are you alive? 
Daddy. Father. The little orcs ran forward. Cute. Considering the orcs' horrible appearances, he wouldn't have expected to think they were cute, even if they were young. However, any animal would be considered cute as they looked with wide eyes at the person patting their head. The little ones discovered the two unfamiliar orcs and became wary. Grom glanced at them before the introduction started. Ian and Grom introduced themselves. The eyes of the young eyes shone when they heard that Ian and Grom were warriors who came to help Grant. A warrior, how awesome. Warrior. Stay alive. They pretended to wield weapons like the warriors. Grant snorted with an affectionate expression. Grant also had a wife living in the log cabin. She was an orc that couldn't be called pretty, but she greeted them with a gentle face. Ian and Grom were treated to her warm stew. After only having cafeteria food, Ian and Grom hurriedly ate the stew. Grant's wife gazed at them happily before suddenly saying to Grom. You are a good person. Ha. Huh. Grom raised his head. But the world is pushing you. What are you? Make the right choice. It sounded like a Zen riddle. Grom looked at Grant with a puzzled expression. Grant explained. My wife has magic eyes that can weakly see destiny. It would be better to listen to her. Yes. This time, Grant's wife turned to Ian and said. You were born with the soul of a warrior. Thank you. But your soul has been greatly hurt by sewing. You gave up the warrior's path because of this pain however, you picked up the weapon again in order to protect others. Ian was stunned. Did this NPC just read his past? He got into an argument during a war meeting and was discharged, and then he started playing this game due to his sister. Could the virtual reality system read his memories? She gently laughed. I don't know the details, but I feel like I should say this. Do what you believe in with courage. Ian and Grom both had confused expressions on their faces. Grant burst out laughing. Kokokol. You must be surprised. What are you going to do if you are surprised at just this? You have to go with me to catch wolves. Huh? Didn't you come to hunt the wolves? Grant, you'll go as well. It's my job, I have to go. Grant pointed to a wall, where a halberd was hanging. I can catch all the wolves alone, but I encountered an enemy that I need your help with. What is it? A mutant wolf. Grant lowered his voice. He's just a wolf, but his size is bigger than any dire wolf, and he is very smart. He had started moving the wolves odically. That is why the farmers have recently been damaged by the wolves. Ah. Your help is needed. I have faith. Kulko. Grant's wife looked at him with concerned eyes. Don't worry. I'm not someone to be ed by wolves. You. Just cast your spells. The sweet blessings like your lips. Be careful. The two of them gazed at each other with affectionate eyes and kissed lightly. Grom dropped his eyes, as if the sight wasn't great, but Ian watched them as they quietly whispered to each other. It was like watching a sad scene of lovers in a movie. Orcs had their own love life. A smile appeared on Ian's face. We will do our best to help you. Um. Grant laughed. Your eyes are alive. Bolter. Bolter. Grom noticed and followed them quietly. Bolter. The look in your eyes is dead. I am alive. Be Bolter. Dead. Chapter, 7. After the meal, the three orcs set out from Grant's cabin. You have received the blessing of the orc shaman Endera. Physical strength and combat power will be improved for half a day. They received a buff from Grant's wife. Please be careful. The party was led by Grant and headed further and further away from Orcrock's fortress. The dim forms of other orc farmers could be seen coming and going. They followed after, and saw the houses and fields of other orcs. The orcs originally didn't do farming of any sort, Grant explained as he waved to the other farmers. However, one day, there were orcs that committed to farming. There were many orcs who resisted, but I was impressed by the fact that they were honestly sweating as they harvested the crops. Were you originally a warrior? 
Ian asked. He got that impression when he first saw Grant. I was. Oh did Lennox train you? He did. Lennox was frightening and strict, even back then. Apparently, Grant was older than he looked, meaning that Lennox was considerably older. Shoo. Off any sounds, we'll soon be in their area. Grant was extremely wary of the wolf chief. Wolves could be seen in the distance, and looked like like they were guarding their territory. Their patrols consisted of a systematic movement that was difficult to expect from animals. Ian gulped as an unknown anxiety welled up inside him. Even if the numbers were the same, there was a large difference between dealing with rabble and dealing with organized soldiers. Grom said, let's just run in before they get away. Ian shook his head. No. They are just wolves. There is sowing strange, it's like they've been trained. Trained? Grom ed his head in confusion. Grant, who had been listening in on their conversation, nodded and looked at Ian. You are a trainee, but you seem to have some combat sense. It's nothing. They aren't just wolves, since the wolves led by the leader act as if they've been trained. If we just barge in, then numerous wolves will surround us. Then. This is giving me a headache. We can resolve it if we just catch the leader. Ian started thinking. In a war, it was common to split up to divide the enemy's attention. In order to reach the boss, Soing needed to grab the wolves' attention. Let's try to attract their attention. How? Do you mean to split up? Rather. Ian grinned. The enemy of our enemy is our friend. Are there any other predators nearby? Ho. Grant laughed and nodded like he understood Ian's plan. I see. You know how to use your head. Moreover, I even learned sewing from you. What does that mean? Grom was confused because he couldn't understand the conversation happening before him. Let's use another guy, a guy who was driven away because of the pack of wolves. They found an animal other than the wolves. It was stronger than the pack of wolves, but was a good opponent since it was alone. They found a tiger. A tiger? We have to deal with a tiger and a pack of wolves. Grom was terrified. Dealing with one tiger is better than fighting a pack of wolves. What are we going to do after catching the tiger? We're going to use it to lure out some wolves before entering and hitting the leader. They wandered around the forest for a while before finding the target. A tiger was sitting on a rock and yawning. The trio hid themselves in the bushes. Stun the tiger. How? Hit its head really well. Grant formed a fist. Grom shook his head. The tiger felt the three approaching orcs presence and rose from its spot. Ian, Grom, Grant, and the tiger. Three versus one. It was Ian's first battle in Elder Lord. Ian felt a good sense of tension wrapping around his body. It was the feeling he felt on the battlefield. He felt the muscles of his tough body stir and became confident that he could deal with the tiger. The tiger roared, its low-frequency cry reverberated throughout the earth. Grom's feet were shocked stiff. The tiger noticed this fact and instantly jumped at Grom. The tiger's body flying through the air was immensely large, causing even Ian to flinch for a moment. Grom. What are you doing? You. Grom closed his eyes and waved his axe, the blind attack failing to reach the tiger. The tiger's paw pushed against Grom's shoulder as it opened its mouth. Ian calmly struck the tiger, aiming for the mouth, and causing the tiger to fall back, unable to bite Grom. Its bloodthirsty eyes turned to Ian. At that time, Grant dramatically swung the halberd and struck the tiger's back. The impact was delivered through the thick skin, shocking the tiger. Don't it? Yes. Ian ran and hit the tiger's head with his great sword as the tiger threw its head back rebelliously. Grom also regained his mind and beat the tiger with the opposite end of the axe. The three orcs started to beat the tiger. Yip. Yelp. Yip. The tiger howled like a dog and crouched down, its eyes filling up with tears. It seemed like its earnest eyes were asking them to stop. Grant faced it and laughed and hit the tiger's forehead with a fist. Yip. The tiger was stunned. It was a really brutish sight. 
Who, this guy wasn't such a big deal. You have overpowered the tiger. You have beaten the pitiful tiger that was chased out by the wolves until its fighting spirit rose you have taken one more step into the world of the orcs. Ten achievement points have been acquired. The proficiency of orc strength common and greatsword common has increased. He checked the message windows. If his proficiency kept rising, then eventually, his SS would be able to enter the uncommon rank. Now, let's drag this guy over to the wolves. The three people carried the stunned tiger on their shoulders. It was like they were recreating the training scenario where soldiers ran carrying logs. They headed back to the wolf territory where the wolves were patrolling in a cyclical route. It was clearly a systematic OD. Ian tensed up again. They were wolves, but this was the world of Elder Lord, after all. Their abilities were possibly incomparable to those of normal wolves. The organized behavior already indicated that it was somewhat the case. I will send this friend in. Grant touched the tiger's head as it lay on the ground to check if the tiger was listening. Hey, wake up. Grant spoke, but the tiger's eyes still didn't react. Did you hit it too hard? Is it dead? No, it's still breathing. Grant struck the tiger's cheek successively with one hand. It was a sight that would normally be impossible to witness happening to a tiger, also known as the King of Beasts. Ian thought that the orcs really were an amazing species to achieve this amazing feat. Grol Huang. The tiger's eyelids shook. As soon as it opened its eyes, Grant hit its face again, glancing back while the tiger was recovering. And now. What? Urit. They picked up the tiger and threw it into the middle of the pack of wolves. The tiger flew through the air. Still, the tiger had the senses of a cat and landed on its feet. Grung. The wolves were amazed to see the angry tiger appearing out of nowhere. Gur. One glanced over before giving a long howl. A wool. A wool. The other wolves came running. The tiger quickly grasped the situation and confronted the wolf pack. Its fighting spirit wasn't bad as it glared at the wolves with an arrogant attitude. The wolves were beasts, but the tiger was the king of the beasts. It circled around the wolves, causing them to step back a little bit. It was a dignity that couldn't be imagined. The tiger opened its mouth, as if it was mocking them, and roared loudly. Kwang. The wolves panicked and withdrew, starting to call the other wolves over. Now there were dozens of wolves surrounding the tiger like ants. The wolves threatened the tiger with their numbers, but it didn't lost its dignity. It truly was the king of the beasts. Ian was touched. That guy, Simba. That guy's name is Simba. How do you know? It's just the name I gave him. I see. Grant nodded. Now that you've given him a name, he isn't just a tiger anymore. For Simba, we have to hit the leader over there. Let's meet again, Simba. Grom looked at Ian and Grant with a strange expression. As the wolves were distracted, the three orcs moved slowly towards the leader. The roars of the tiger and the wolves whining could be heard from behind them. After moving through the forest, they reached a rocky hillside. There was a wolf on top that was watching the fight between the tiger and the wolves. It had black fur and looked larger than the average wolf. It's that guy. Indeed. Sowing outstanding was felt from him. Once we get rid of that guy, peace will return to the farmers. Catching a tiger, and now one wolf. Grom firmly held his axe and raised his body. The wolf discovered Grom and bared his teeth. Even though it was a long distance, the sound of the wolf growling rang inside their ears. The trio walked towards the hill. The wolf didn't try to escape, instead descending the rocks with leisurely movements. However, he didn't come down on his own. Grung. As the wolf snarled, other wolves appeared from behind the rocky hill. There seemed to be around ten of them. The black wolf led the wolves to surround the three orcs. These guys, aren't they different from the earlier wolves? These wolves were all bigger, the atmosphere around them was fiercer, and their fangs were all sharper. They were a group of elite wolves. Ian raised his greatsword. Watch the wolves. The wolves rushed in first. There was a pincer attack performed on the orcs. 
the wolves were fast. One of them jumped in front to lure Ian's big sword, and as he swung it, another wolf pierced the gap in the attack and aimed for his side. Ugh. Grom and Grant were also struggling. Ian elbowed a wolf in the head while hoping that he could deal with his share quickly. The pain in his side woke up his sense of realism. Pant, pant is this really a game? Ian muttered as he watched the leader wolf's oppressive face retreating. The burning pain in his side that he could feel right now was no different from what he felt on the battlefield. His spirit flared up. It was easy to understand why people said that Elder Lord was difficult, and that being an orc was hard. The fighting in Elder Lord was just like fighting in reality. However, Ian had lived in one of the harshest realities. He could see Grom rolling on the ground. Ian's eyes stung at the sight. He wanted to help, but he needed to subdue his own opponents first. He couldn't afford to be careless. Ian first stepped forward. The wolves withdrew as Ian's sword moved forward, sideways, and back while exposing gaps where he could be bitten. The number of wounds on his body increased. At that moment, one wolf came flying. A wolf that had been sliced by Grant's halberd bumped into a wolf confronting Ian. As they flinched, there was a gap that Ian inserted his sword in. It pierced the wolf's belly and penetrated its internal organs. Yip, yip. The wolf cried out as it started trembling. Ian kicked the wolf's head with his feet and the wolf fainted. Ian pulled out his sword, revealing a blade covered in the wolf's blood. Now it's your turn. Ian laughed. The remaining two wolves frantically rushed at Ian. One bit at Ian's right arm while the other aimed for his lower body. Quack. The wolf used its momentum to try and chew Ian's right arm off in one go. Ian lost his grip on the great sword due to the bite. This. Ian punched the wolf's head with his left hand. The wolf's bite was broken with a loud whine. The other wolf was still hanging onto Ian's legs, but Ian just continued to punch the first wolf. Eventually, the wolf's skull caved in. Ian retrieved the great sword and slashed at the wolf biting his leg. The wolf whined and retreated. Ian was drunk on the sense of fighting and swung his great sword indiscriminately. Only the enemy and his sword were visible to him. In the end, the wolf lost its head to Ian's sword. Pant pant. Ian was also bloody. Practice and training were vastly different from an actual fight. No matter how much someone trained in martial arts and prepared for battle, the pressure and stamina of an actual fight wasn't comparable to a spar. Ian turned his head as his body sagged. Congratulations on your first bloody welcome as an orc. You want to fall from exhaustion, but the soul of a warrior has captured your body. The warrior's fighting spirit uncommon has been used. Orc's recovery common has been used. Grant was struggling. Ian had dealt with three wolves, but five were currently attached to Grant. Including the dead wolf from earlier, Grant had battled twice as many wolves as Ian. Help Grom. Grant shouted. His voice grew louder as he fought. He looked like a warrior as he brandished his halberd with bloodthirsty eyes. Ian found Grom. Ian's eyes widened in shock. Grom was twitching with a wolf biting at his neck. Grom. Grom's eyes grew dim as he lay still like a corpse. Ian's eyes popped out as he ran forward roaring wildly. Groom. Chapter, 8. Ian roared as he rushed forward two wolves withdrawing in response to Ian's mad dash. Grom. A hork hurts. Grom muttered. Ian grabbed the fallen Grom. Steady yourself. Grom. Grom. Grom grinned with dim eyes. Ah, if I die, then my points and SS will fall. Ian's mind snapped back at Grom's words. Ah, this was a game. Even if he died, Grom would just revive again. As he realized this, Ian's mind calmed down. His wildly beating heart sank. Sorry for not helping you. It's nothing. I blocked my neck. Ian tore at his clothes and bandaged the neck and other bleeding areas. A human would have died, but Grom had the thick skin and resilience of an orc. You would have died if you weren't an orc. Crudork. Ill take care of this quest. 
Coco Coupliers. Ian stood up. It was just for a moment, but he had lost control when he saw Grom in a dying state. The memories and the helplessness of losing an ally on the battlefield had entered his mind. His chest seemed to collapse. He wanted to rip apart everything in front of him. If he was stronger, then he wouldn't have lost anyone. A warrior isn't a warrior because he is strong by himself. A warrior proves his honor when he protects his friends, allies, and those precious to him. Your fury has granted you the blessings of a warrior. Your physical abilities will increase by 10% for 30 minutes. You will only feel 50% of the pain for 30 minutes. The messages popped up. Ian's eyes turned towards the black wolf still looking down and laughing at them. Just wait there, he'll go there soon. Ian then plunged towards Grant. Grant was fully dealing with the wolves as he avoided fatal injuries and attacked the wolves. Another wolf died, making it harder for the others to approach. At that moment, Ian stepped in from the side and swung his sword, causing the wolves to howl and prance about. Grant and Ian didn't miss the gap in their defense as they wielded their weapons. The wolves were ed by one or two weapons. Although the leader howled encouragingly from behind, the remaining wolves died. Ian and Grant pulled the wolves' fangs out of their bodies and cleaned up. Grom. He isn't dead. He pointed to Grom. Grom was sitting down and taking deep breaths while holding the bleeding area. He is an orc, so he could recover from that wound. Now there is only one left. Grant and Ian held their weapons and approached the leader. The black wolf looked down at them from a rock. Now it is your turn. Grung. The black wolf descended from the rock and stood before them. The wolf growled. Ugly orc s. Grant and Ian's eyes widened. The wolf had just spoken. The wolf smiled before raising his head and howling towards the sky. A wool. A wool. Then the wolf's body started changing. His body swelled as its front legs rose up, becoming a bipedal walking creature. The shadow of the giant wolf suddenly completely covered Grant and Ian. Werewolf. They were a completely different species from wolves. While they looked just like ordinary wolves, they were cursed beings that could turn into bipedal wild beasts. He was twice as big as an orc. The nails of both his hands were long, sharp like daggers, while the huge face had saw blade-like teeth. The vicious eyes turned towards Ian and Grant. Orcs appearing in the subject of farmers. Ian's fighting spirit soared as he laughed and spoke without any fear. Shut up, dog s. You just learned how to stand on two feet. Kukukuk. These orcs always come to be bitten. Grant whispered. An advanced werewolf he is a dangerous opponent. I've never seen one talk before. It must be a mutation. Is he strong? Strong. Grant laughed, anyway, I can't run away. I'm going. His smile was just like someone else's. It was Lennox's smile. A warrior's smile. The courage to smile before an unknown enemy was part of the spirit of the orc warriors. Ian smiled back at Grant. Good. Did you say you were an apprentice? Yes. Grant grabbed his halberd and stared at the werewolf in front of them. You will be a good warrior. There was no need to say anything else. Ian and Grant rushed at the same time. The werewolf was quick. He lightly avoided their two charges and aimed for their sides. The nails tore through the air like a weapon. If his flesh was torn by that, it would be a fatal blow. Ian took a more careful attitude. The werewolf giggled as he approached them. Kick it. I can't taste orc meat. Grung. A while ago, I chewed on orc meat and spat it out because it was too tough. Kukukuk. The werewolf looked at Grant and said. The name was Abuchwi. Grant's eyes widened. Abuchwi dead? I ripped him apart. Him and his family. The werewolf laughed. He was begging for the lives of his children. Grant ran forward and swung his halberd. The werewolf avoided it and aimed at Grant through a gap. Grant's chest was torn apart as the werewolf said with a giggle. Stupid orc. Grant spoke in a despairing voice. 
A butchwi was an honest farmer. Orcs farming, kikikik, how funny. What would a mutation like you know about honest labor and sweating in nature? Grant's eyes changed. An unknown power gathered in his body. The orc farmer Grant has been breathing as one with the land for a long time, realizing the joy of the harvest and the circulation of the ecosystem and nature. As a warrior who lived the life of a farmer, he has gained a new enlightenment. Grant has used nature's rebuke special. Ian saw an active S for the first time. The basic SS that Ian possessed were all passive types. Furthermore, this was the special rank. It seemed to be a deadly move in the game. Nature's mistake. Mutant wolf, returned to nature. He swung his halberd, causing the earth to shake. A powerful wave of energy was launched. A blow that contained the power of nature. The werewolf flew back as if he was hit by a hammer, slamming into the rock behind him. There was a loud whine as blood emerged. So even a werewolf can whine. Grant approached the werewolf. A mutant werewolf that was born against the laws of nature. For him, the blow that contained the power of nature was deadly. This is the last one. Grant raised his halberd. It was at that moment. The werewolf, who was in a critical condition, squeezed out the last of his strength and bit Grant. Grant grimaced and his body shook. As Ian ran over, the werewolf kicked Grant away. Ian caught Grant, the two of them tangling together as they rolled across the floor. The werewolf watched Grant with glazed eyes. Inature's mistake. The werewolf said. How funny, you garbage orc. The werewolf howled. A oh, woo. Somehow, the howl seemed sorrowful. The werewolf turned away from Ian and Grant and limped away. The appearance of the mutant werewolf disappeared, with the blood showing his escape route. He wouldn't be able to recover for a while. Grant, are you okay? That guy. He escaped. Hugh I didn't him in the end. Ian shook his head. It will be difficult for him to recover for a while. Let's hope so well, it doesn't really matter. Grant laughed. Even if he reappears, the farmers will scold him. Ian burst out laughing. The mutant werewolf has been defeated. Unfortunately, you were unable to it. The mutant werewolf will someday return. After helping to solve Grant's problem, the name of the apprentice warrior Ian will become known. You have acquired 30 achievement points. Your level has risen. The title, Friend of Farmers, has been acquired. Friend of Farmers will increase your familiarity with farmers and improve the efficiency of agricultural work. The message window shown. Ian checked his status window. Status window. Friend of Farmers Ian, Orc Apprentice Warrior. Level 3. Achievement points 80. Assimilation 55%. Abilities. Orc Strength Common. Orcs Recovery Common. Greatsword Common. Warriors Fighting Spirit Uncommon. Nothing had greatly changed. Ian went up to Grom. He was sitting down and holding the bandage at his neck. Ian grabbed Grom's hand. Ah, what a surprise. Wake up. It has ended. Oh. I saw the message windows. Too bad it wasn't dead. Grom stood up. His neck had been pierced by a wolf's fangs, but he hadn't died. The orc's flesh was phenomenal. Let's go back. Today passed like this it's rewarding. The sun went down. As they were trying to leave the werewolf area, a loud sound was heard in the distance. It was the cry of a beast. This. Simba. They had forgotten about him. The tiger, Simba, was still fighting the wolves. They ran with their weapons out. Ian and Grom opened their mouths in disbelief at the sight before them. Numerous wolves had been ripped apart. The tiger Simba was glaring at the remaining wolves, who bowed and slowly backed away with their tails between their legs. Simba was bloody and was covered with all types of injuries, but he maintained his dignity as the king of the beasts. The stripes covering the tiger's body were manly. Simba snarled and all the wolves ran away. Simba roared at his victory. Kuhiung. Clap. 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 
Ian clapped as he watched the scene. Grant and Grom also clapped. The three orcs cheered as they watched the King of the Beasts reclaim his throne. Simba bowed his head, as if he was humbly receiving their praise. Simba, a tiger who once ruled this area, was pushed away by the wolves' tactics. However, today he regained his honor as a tiger and returned to being the king of the forest. Although it started with a beating, you have managed to form a hot friendship with the tiger. The title, one who respects the honor of the tigers, has been acquired. Your familiarity with tigers will rise, and you can feel some of the finer emotions of a tiger. He received the title and felt close to the tiger, Simba. He could feel pride and friendship in Simba. Simba. You are a true tiger. Grung. The bold battle of the king of beasts who fought against dozens of enemies. A true tiger who slaughtered wolves with an unyielding will. Simba was a warrior. Ian extended his fist and the tiger bumped it with his paw. Let's meet again. Kwong. Chapter, 9. The trio had a warm farewell with Simba before returning to Grant's cabin. Please deliver this for me. This? It has been quite a while since I've last seen Instructor Lennox. As Grant's wife fed them warm food, Grant held out a letter. Thank you again for what you've done, the other farmers appreciate it as well. I just did what I had to do. You're already a warrior, Grant laughed out loud. They promised to meet again and left Grant's house. Their tension-filled bodies finally relaxed. As they walked towards Orcrox Fortress, Ian and Grom looked at each other. Today. Shall we call it a day? Yes, it's late. Right now, it was dawn in reality. We finally had an adventure in the game. That's right. Thanks to Ian, I think my life as an orc is going well. Grom thanked him. Without Ian, he wouldn't have been able to complete this quest, and would have died. Tomorrow as well. Yes, if nothing happens. Then let's meet again tomorrow. Ian and Grom smiled and bumped fists. Within a moment, their appearances blurred as their connection to Elder Lord was terminated. Boss Nim, did sewing good happen? No, does it look that way? Yes, you keep smiling. Did you get a girlfriend? Ian smiled at the inquiry. Look, there's the smile again. It's nothing. What? Sewing is strange. Ian was thinking about his adventure with Grant and Grom. They got rid of the mutant wolf and formed a fierce relationship between men. A smile appeared as he recalled Grant's final blow to the werewolf and Simba's indomitable will against the wolves. Ian had completely fallen for the charms of Elder Lord and the orcs. He hummed as he imagined his next adventure. Suddenly, Ian's phone rang. It was his little sister, Iyu, who should have been listening to lectures at school at this time. What was so urgent that she would call him at this time? Yes, hello. Appa. Her voice was urgent. What's going on? Appa, you see right now I am at. Ian's face stiffened at Iyu's following words. The police station. What for? That. Ian roughly heard the situation and took off his cafe apron. Boss Nim. I need to go out for a while, so please look after this place alone. Please. Ian left the cafe. He got in his car and stepped on the accelerator, driving towards the police station close to EU's university. Ian went inside and found EU, who got up as she saw him. Her expression was grouchy. Ian hugged her. Are you okay? Yes. Are you uninjured? Yes I'm fine. Then it's okay. Ian ruffled Eu's hair, causing her to quietly laugh. He turned his head and saw two men sitting down, both of their faces looking like a mess. One of them got up and greeted Ian. Hello. I am Eu's friend, Park Yungte. I've heard the story. Ian shook hands with Park Yungte. And there. He looked at the man sitting apart from Park Yungte. That person. He scowled at Ian and looked away. Ian asked Iyu, what exactly did he say to you? To me? Just let's have a meal today. Girls always agree when I promise to take them someplace expensive he muttered. Ian raised his eyebrows. 
so you. I stayed quiet, but Yung Tae was next to me, and they ended up arguing. Fists ended up flying. Park Yung Tae bowed his head like he was ashamed. Ian sighed. Who struck first? Almost at the same time. There were such moments. Just before a physical conflict, their eyes would meet and sparks would fly before they pounced at the same time. Looking at their faces, both of them seemed similar. It seemed like they thrashed around without actually knowing how to fight. There were no serious injuries or aftereffects. Ian laughed as he looked at their faces. Eu poked Ian's side. Appa, why are you laughing? They are truly kids. Still, I'm glad that it wasn't a big deal. This isn't a big deal. Nobody is dead or maimed. Please don't say such scary things, this is the police station. Won't Yung Tae go to jail? ITLL be fine. An agreement would be reached by both sides. Ian looked at the men. The words he said to you as a senior, is he usually like that? Sometimes she flirts, but I don't care. It isn't uncommon. Ian raised his eyebrows, causing Eu to laugh this time. What? Don't you know that I get several phone numbers from men whenever I go outside? Right, Park Yung Tae. Ah well. Park Yung Tae answered with a gloomy expression. Ian started laughing. So that's what happened. Park Yung Tae and the other man were fighting over Eu. The level of injuries were similar, so it was likely to end with a mutual agreement. That's why the police officers cleared a space for them to talk. Ian told Park Yung Tae, You fought because of Eu, so thank you. Still, in the future, don't swing your fists, even if there is an argument. Yes, I'm sorry. If that senior continues to bother you, then contact me. He handed Park Yung Tae his business card. Park Jung Tae's eyes widened as he saw the name Cafe Reason. Ah, uh, are you the boss here? Yes. Do you know of it? I heard the girls saying good things the boss Park Yung Tae smiled at Ian and continued, he is kind. Come visit sometime. Suddenly, there was a disturbance in the police station. A middle-aged man was walking this way. There was oil on his face and he yelled as he walked, where is Sango? Sango. Yan Sango. Ian had a bad feeling. The senior who fought Park Yung Tae over EU stood up. Yan Sango. Hey, you stupid fool. Why did you get beaten up? You're a disgrace to my name. Father. Yes, where is your opponent? Is it you? He pointed to Park Yung Tae. You were hit by this child Aish, you screw up. What was it about? This woman. Ian's eyebrows twitched. Well, you both hit each other, so we can come to a mutual agreement. No, will that be enough? Should I call the police commissioner? The middle-aged man bragged as he raised his phone. Is that your guardian over there? That baby? Or that woman? Is that young man related to you? No parents? At that moment, the police officer in charge came back. His expression was heavy due to the disturbance. Oh, Guardian Nim. Please sit there quietly. I should be quiet. I am a busy guy, yet I came all the way here, got it? Calm down, yes. Ian, who was watching the scene, knocked on Eu's back. Go back to school. Appa? Don't worry, I will handle it. Still. Don't you know that you won't receive your allowance if you're absent from school? But. It'll take care of Yung Tae, so go. Eu nodded. However, she couldn't help looking at the middle-aged man with an uneasy expression. Ian placed his hand on Eu's head and grinned. Young Eu. Yes. Don't you know that I can solve things? That's right. Her brother, Young Ian, always solved her problems, no matter what happened. When she was a child, she told Ian that children were harassing her, and they became quiet after a few days. Ian found her lost items and cooked whatever she wanted to eat. After their parents passed away, she was uneasy about their inherited debt. However, Ian just smiled and told her to believe in him, and he dealt with it all alone. He became a soldier and paid off the debt, providing her living expenses and paying for her university tuition fees. 
Seven years later, when he returned to South Korea, Ian was unchanged. He always solved her problems reliably. That was why EU was forced to nod. Appa, thank you. If you want to thank me, help out at the cafe. That is too much. Don't you know that it's the exam period? I hope you do well on the exams. Look forward to it. Ian ruffled EU's hair. EU said goodbye to Park Yungte. Someone glanced at her as she left. It was the middle-aged man talking with someone over the phone. Why is that girl going? Isn't she involved? W what is that look? Park Yungte was surprised. Ian's expression changed the moment that EU disappeared. He seemed like someone who always smiled gently. That was the story he heard about Cafe Reason's boss. A warm-hearted man who was always smiling, making the customer feel stable the moment they saw Ian. But that smile was erased the moment that EU left. Now he looked like someone else. My brother, he was a soldier. He used to fight in the Middle East and Africa. The words that EU had said popped into his head. The conflicting images were now merging together. The middle-aged man cried out, You, you, why are you staring at me like that? Don't talk anymore. Are you talking to me right now? Are you crazy? How old are you, you brat? The police officer in charge said, Both of you, please calm down. Didn't you hear what that brat said to me? Your boss, who is it? Do you know who I am? I am someone who eats with the police commissioner, understand? Hey! The middle-aged man searched through his wallet and pulled out his business card. I am a person who runs a company, you. A brat who doesn't even know shame. Ian approached. As Ian looked down at the man, he flinched and dropped his business card. Don't you know shame? Why why you, this? Don't you feel any shame when you look at your child? Talking impolitely. The police officer inserted himself between the two of them. Now, now, calm down. The police officer flinched. He easily pushed the middle-aged man, but Ian didn't budge. It felt like he was pushing against a large rock. The police officer glanced at Ian with surprise before sitting both of them down. The middle-aged man regained his bravery. Call your boss here. Now, there'll be a lawsuit, instead of an agreement. Jung Ti's face became pale. His situation at home wasn't good, so Jung Tae hadn't told his parents. He had no knowledge of law and couldn't afford to proceed with a lawsuit. The middle-aged man seemed to have a lot of money. Just as he saw on TV, the middle-aged man would use an expensive lawyer and his connections to turn Jung Ti's life upside down. Then Ian said, Jung Tae. Yes Young. I'll resolve it, so don't worry. Ian picked up the business card that the middle-aged man dropped. The man was talking with someone on the phone. He was disguising his son as a victim and asking the person to solve it. The man made all sorts of promises like, let's play golf next time, he would buy them a drink etc. It was sickening. You over there. Ian called out to the senior who fought with Jung Tae over EU. The senior raised his head. It was an ambiguous expression. His belief in her father along with the shame of the situation appeared on his face. Did you apologize to EU? Apologize? The senior looked down as he shook his head. Ian waited for his answer. Once he raised his head again, his face resembled his father who was oily and greedy. Why? You should be prepared to bow deeply in apology, along with that brat. The senior exclaimed. Ian started laughing, that isn't pride. What nonsense are you saying? You are ashamed of your father, but have decided to follow his actions. Don't speak nonsense. Look. Ian pointed around. All the police officers and civilians had expressions of contempt on their faces. They are watching your father with that disgusted expression. You. Later, those expressions will turn to you. The middle-aged man finished his call and got up. Do you know who I just called? That person. Ian ignored him and turned to the officer in charge. The police officer had a distressed expression on his face. He was obviously disgusted at the actions of the powerful, but it was a world where innocent people would be sacrificed. 
A scenario where the student called Park Yungte was in trouble was painted in his head. Inspector Nim. He'll be back after a phone call. The cop looked at Ian. He, the man who was the guardian of the girl who caused the fight, was consistently calm. He felt so indignified in that attitude. He expected a possible reversal of the situation. Chapter, 10. Did sewing good happen? No, does it look like that? Yes, you keep smiling. Do you have a boyfriend? Ji Hei Eon smiled at her secretary's inquiry. Look, you're smiling again. It's nothing. So yes. Ji Hei Eon looked down at her phone. The recent call log displayed one unsaved number. She pressed the save contact button instead of just staring at it. The name was Raveno, delete. She recalled the strange pronunciation that emerged from his mouth. Ian. Young Ian. That was his name. She had met the man called Young Ian a long time ago. In the past, she had visited the Middle East for a business meeting when she was kidnapped by an international terrorist organization. Having the air of a huge company as their hostage was a useful bargaining tool for them. Her eyes had been covered and her limbs were bound for several days. The only thing she could hear was the Arabic language and gunfire. She managed to soothe her burning throat with lukewarm water and pieces of bread. She tried not to let go of the string of hope. It was a strange voice that saved her. Ji Hei Yan, is that correct? After incredibly loud gunshots were heard, the door opened and she unbelievably heard someone speaking Korean. The cloth covering her eyes was released. Even though she was blinded from not seeing light for a long time, she tried to look straight at the owner of the voice. There was a man wearing black tactical gear and holding a rifle. I have come to rescue you. Hostage secured English. He said into the radio. Thanks to the call over the radio, she was able to figure out the man's name. Raven. The man was called Raven. After being rescued by him, strangers from all over the world surrounded her. While escorted to the tactical helicopter, she trembled from a habitual fear. Were they really here to save her, or were they another criminal group? The painful hours of being held hostages sparked an obsessive fear. As she looked down from the helicopter, she saw a battlefield. One of the soldiers saw her pale complexion and spoke to the man called Raven, who then looked at her. He removed his helmet and goggles. That single moment was engraved into Ji Heian's mind. She never imagined that he would have such a gentle appearance. It was difficult to associate the fierce soldier with the gentle man. His kind eyes tried to reassure her while his clothes were covered with the enemy's blood. It's okay. You're safe now. She felt relieved as the man smiled at her. From now on, he'll protect you. He made her feel at ease. She started crying as all of her tension was released. The other soldiers heckled the man as he approached and awkwardly patted her shoulders. After returning to the base camp, mercenaries and officials dispatched from the Myongsong group were waiting for Ji Heian. Ji Heian tried to express her gratitude, but she couldn't see the group of soldiers anymore. Nobody knew exactly who they were. Both her father and the chairman, Ji Yunchul, had sought out the best experts. There was a rumor that they were a special unit from the UN, or that they were secretly run by the United States of America. There were even rumors that they were the private forces of a huge international group. In particular, everyone was reluctant to talk about the man called Raven. Raven was seen as an incomprehensible demon or ghost, who was rumored to have been able to shoot the target in the forehead without making a single sound. Even Chairman Ji Yunchul didn't know the exact truth. She made a strong request and was able to briefly meet him before returning to South Korea. Ji Hei Eon handed a note to Raven that contained her phone number. Please get in touch if you come to South Korea. I want to pay back this favor. He just gave her an ambiguous smile. Since then, she had never forgotten his face. Time passed. As the successor of the Myongsong group, every single day was busy. She thought of him whenever she was having a particularly hard day. Was he still fighting in foreign lands? She wondered if he was saving someone in distress like her. Then today, she received a strange number on her personal mobile phone. Only a few people knew this number. 
She almost didn't answer as she thought it was a wrong number, but then an unknown feeling grabbed her. Once she answered the phone, she heard a soft voice that revived the old memories. Hello. She was able to tell at once. It was him. Is this Ji Heian? I am Raven. She wanted to know why he was calling her but it was a minor matter. It was nothing really, sewing very trivial. To her, the problem would be like stepping on an ant. The ant would be stuck to the sole of her shoes. What are you doing now? I own a cafe. Ji Heian couldn't help exclaiming. A cafe. It was a place that seemed to fit him. A quiet and warm place. When he said that he was sorry for bothering Ji Heian, she wanted to tell him to contact her at any time. However, she hesitated. She had never once chased after a man, but she couldn't afford to be proud now. Ji Heian suppressed the laugh in her voice and said. I'm sorry but you'll have to pay me back. How? That. She suggested like it was a trivial matter. Where is the cafe? Thus, she was able to find out the location of Cafe Reason. She also found out that his name was Ian, not Raven. Young Ian, such an ordinary name. She discovered that he had a pretty younger sister who attended university, and that there was a problem because of her. He was a person who lived an everyday life. She felt a little closer to him. Ji Heian wrote down each word on a memo and then handed it to her secretary. This? Cafe Reason. Young Ian. Young Yu. A prestigious university. Several words seemed to be written randomly. The secretary looked at her. I want to know all of the information related to this. I understand. If the cafe is doing good business, the sisters' grades, the house where they live, the growth process, everything about their family. Then she added like she had forgotten. Oh, and the man at the bottom. He seems to be a nouveau rich person, so just push the problem away. Yes. Do not let that man do any harm to Young Ian. Her secretary grinned. This is my specialty. Ji Hei Ian walked to the window. The building overlooked the entire city. This was the headquarters of the world-renowned Myongsong Group, the leading corporation in South Korea after launching Elder Lord. Ji Hei Ian smiled quietly as she watched the scenery outside. You don't look so good. Ian's eyes opened at Hoyt's words. Keep your composure. Any agitation in the heart will be revealed on the flesh. Hoyt was a warrior introduced by Lennox. Grom said it would be difficult for him to connect for a while because he was busy. Therefore, Ian went to Lennox alone, who gave him a new mission. Help the warrior Hoyt. He was able to meet Hoyt at the entrance to Orcrock's fortress. Hoyt was blind in one eye. He was a bald orc with a big scar and some tattoos across his face. He also sported a black eye patch for his blind eye. Ian was nervous, as Hoyt's weapon was also a fearsome hammer. However, after sharing a few words with him, Ian found out that Hoyt was a calm warrior. Have you done sewing that you don't want to regret? How do you know that? Inexperienced warriors reveal their emotions on their faces. Hoyt paused for a moment. They had been walking east through the sea of trees. Hoyt was heading to a small town. If you have a weakness, never reveal it. Your shaky mind can lead to impatience. If I were an enemy, I provoke you to run at me like a raging bull, and then I would take advantage of the large gap in your defense. Yes. Ian nodded. Hoyt's face distorted as he grinned. One day, you'll meet an enemy stronger than you. However, never show any sign of weakness and always look for a way to escape or to win. Why? Your fear is a strength for the enemy. It's the same with animals. As soon as you cower, you will become the prey, instead of the hunter. If they see your weakness, they will gain strength and try to trample on you. Ian nodded. The world of Elder Lord was really mysterious. Each NPC seemed to have their own philosophy. This world seemed more real than reality. Ian learned more in Elder Lord from Lennox, Grant, and Hoyt than he did from reality. Then what about this expression? Ian had a mock-confident look on his face. That's worse. 
isn't that a face that's asking to be hit? They burst out laughing. Ian eventually had to use an old relationship due to the problem at the police station. He was strong, so he hadn't felt good about relying on someone else. However, he forgot about all of that after connecting to Elder Lord and meeting the Orc Warrior. What will we be doing? Lennox only told Ian to help Hoyt. That'll let you know when we arrive there. They walked together and dealt with the occasional monster. Ian encountered goblins and dire wolves, but he easily faced them. Hoyt defeated them casually. Grant, who had repelled the werewolf, didn't seem to be a match for Hoyt. He was a great warrior and would need to be hit by a really high-level user. He pointed to Ian's great sword. Your swordsmanship is aimed to deal with humans or elves, right? That's right. You'll need to act a little bit differently when you're dealing with monsters that aren't humanoid. Move more freely and believe in your instincts. You have been taught by the experienced warrior, Hoyt. The accolated battle experience and Hoyt's teachings have combined together and Greatsword Technique Common has evolved. Greatsword Technique Common has been upgraded to Orc's Greatsword Technique Uncommon. Your level has risen. Status Window Friend of Farmers Ian, Orc Apprentice Warrior Level 4 Achievement Points 80 Assimilation 55% Abilities Orc Strength Common Orcs Recovery Common Orcs Greatsword Technique Uncommon Warriors Fighting Spirit Uncommon His S was upgraded and his level rose. Ian felt like his greatsword was lighter all of a sudden, and the large sword moved along his desired trajectory. Hoyt smiled at the sight. Always think. Don't just repeat the actions like you do in the training drills. Think about what is more efficient and move. Ian had also heard this from his martial arts instructor, Beck Hanho. Did the creators of Elder Lord invite real martial arts practitioners to ask for advice? Ian nodded energetically. Thank you for your teachings. It's nothing. The duty of a warrior is to lead young orcs. They left the forest. As the thick trees covering their field of view disappeared, walls could be seen from far away. A free city where anyone can stay, a nail is the city of dreams. You have moved beyond the territory of the orcs for the first time. Ten achievement points have been acquired. Is this the first time you are seeing it? You're a rural orc. Hoyt chuckled. This is the free city, a nail. It's a neutral city where any species can freely come and go. Then are there other species present? Of course. Ian had never seen another species in Elder Lord, as he had only seen the orcs in Orcrock's fortress. There would be other users here. What would the humans, elves, and dwarves look like? Ian's steps became faster. A human was guarding a nail, the free city. Hello. I am alive. Ian was disappointed. The guards of Orcrock's fortress stood firmly like stone statues. The orc watchmen who were difficult to approach. But a nail's guards looked like swindlers. This one dd his leather armor on a spear and leaned against the wall. He looked at Ian and Hoyt with a bad expression. The guard signaled to open the gate. Well, go in. Orcs, go and don't cause any trouble. Thank you. Stay alive. It sounds like you're wishing for me to die. Are all orc greetings so weird? The guard started exchanging gossip about orcs. Ian's face wrinkled, but Hoyt's expression didn't change. Thus, Ian and Hoyt entered an ale, the free city. The composition of the city was very poor compared to Orcrock's fortress. The scale wasn't so big and there were many poor houses that seemed on the verge of collapse. There were also poor people begging for money. The orc farmers' cabins looked like wonderful mansions compared to the houses here. Hoyt laughed at Ian. You still can't control your facial expressions. Ah. Compared to Orcrox, it isn't a great place. It was originally a place where the fugitives of each species gathered. Humans, dwarves, and gnomes could be seen. Their appearance wasn't as nice as he imagined. They looked like the commoners in medieval movies. However, the beauty of the elves was extraordinary. Come along. It was a free city but orcs couldn't be seen. 
Ian and Hoyt received a lot of attention as they headed to a house in a corner of the city. It was a small and old house. Hoyt stopped. This place. Wait. Hoyt frowned. Sewing is happening. What? Hoyt pulled out his hammer. Prepare your sword. Ha. Huh. Hoyt opened the door and entered the house. Shouting was heard from inside. Ian also entered with his great sword. However, the situation ended without Ian having to help. A woman and two children were trembling in a corner, while the three human men threatening them were instantly subdued by Hoyt. Hoyt stepped on one of them and asked, Were you sent by Derek? Quack that's right. Didn't he say he would wait? The promised time has passed. Thompson ran away. One of the children shouted instead of Hoyt, No. My father didn't run away. Hoyt chased out the men, who left while glaring at Hoyt. Damn orc interfering again. Don't think that you're safe. Derek will you? Hoyt nodded. I will be ready. Let's see, dirty orc. The men ran away. The children ran forward and hugged Hoyt. It was strange to see human children being held by an orc, but it was sweet. The woman who seemed to be their mother approached Ian. Are you Hoyt's friend? Thank you for your help. She bowed deeply. Ian didn't know the situation so he looked over at Hoyt. He laughed and called Ian outside. You must be wondering what is going on. That's right. How do you know them? Hoyt explained the situation. There was a man named Thompson, who was Hoyt's friend. One day, Hoyt barely won after fighting some human bandits and was in a critical condition. He barely reached this place, but no one tried to help an orc. However, the man called Thompson helped Hoyt. He sprinkled a lot of potions and took him home for treatment. Thompson and his family nursed Hoyt for a while. Therefore, Hoyt owed a life debt to Thompson. Thompson and Hoyt became close friends. Thompson is a traitor. At one time, he was the master of a good company, but he was betrayed by his business partner. While his partner's betrayal was due to his nature that cannot feel doubt, that very nature also allowed him to survive. Thompson dreamed of a resurgence. Thanks to his old customers who remembered his personality, he was able to get another opportunity. His only problem was the issue of money. In the end, he borrowed money from Derek. At first, Thompson thought he was a pure investor, but he found out that Derek was just an unscrupulous loan shark. Thompson believed Derek and made the deal, but Derek suddenly turned around and demanded high interest. Thompson couldn't refuse Derek. In the end, Thompson accepted Derek's demands and left for a distant land. The promised date with Derek was three months. Before leaving, Thompson had asked Hoyt for a favor. He would come back, so be sure to protect his wife and children until he returned. Hoyt believed him and waited. When was that? Hoyt laughed bitterly. Four months ago. It's already been over a month. Derek and his men started harassing the family, even before the deadline passed. They were going to make the missus a prostitute and sell the children as slaves. Dirty. I stopped by Orcrox to visit Lennox and sewing like this happened again. Then a girl ran out. Uncle Hoyt. Uncle I don't know. It's time to eat. A young boy held on to Hoyt's clothing, as if he liked it very much. Hoyt smiled and a child laughed as he saw an orc smile. Enter first. Yes. Come quickly. Let's eat together. Ian smiled at the children's bright gazes. He was reminded of Eu when she was young. Is there a chance that an accident happened to Thompson? Ian asked. It's a possibility, since he had to travel through a dangerous place. What will you do if he doesn't come back? It doesn't matter if Thompson doesn't return. Hoyt pointed to his face. Tattoos were covering half his face. Orcs who were recognized as a warrior had tattoos engraved on their body. They contained the beliefs of a warrior and had the power to strengthen the warrior. Thompson saved my life and is my friend. He believed in me and left his family in my care. Hoyt's eyes were strong. A warrior never forsakes one's faith. Faith. How long had it been since he last heard this word? 
In addition, the person said it with such strength. Compared to this orc, real human beings were ugly. So, young orc, will you help me? Ian stared into Hoyt's eyes and nodded. Yes, I will do my best to help. Ian firmly bumped fists with Hoyt. Chapter, 11 I can't see the rumored rookie. An orc remarked to Lennox as they stood at the training grounds. It was a shaman wearing animal skin and holding a staff. Lennox nodded. I sent him to Hoyt. Hoyt I haven't heard that name in a long time. Has he been doing well? He's gone away this time because he became friends with a human. Human. The shaman touched his chin. It isn't good to become entangled with them. I hope the human he called friend is a man of honor. A few warriors greeted the shaman. Tashiquil. Are you alive? Oh, I'm alive. Bolter. Tashiquil. Tashiquil smiled and nodded. Hey, everyone's alive. Just like Lennox was the instructor for the warriors in Orcrock's fortress, Tashiquil was the teacher for the shamans. Beginner orcs often met with either Lennox or Tashiquil. The system determined the user's alignment and suggested the way best suited for them. They were the two NPCs that could be called the starting point of the hell species. Lennox stared at a collapsed warrior who jumped to his feet and started moving again. I see you're still strict. I'm treating them as warriors. Lennox laughed. Grant sent me a letter. Grant? Didn't he become a farmer? He did. I was expecting him to give up. He selected that life for himself. At the time the mutant hunt quest was received, the system said that the compensation would depend on their performance. Ian and Grom didn't know it, but the letter Grant wrote to Lennox resulted in a far bigger reward. Tashiquil waved his staff and a blessing covered the orcs practicing at the training grounds. The warriors shouted their gratitude to Tashiquil. That blunt person wrote a letter. What does it say? He gave me his regards and talked about the rookie. He met the rookie. Yes. I told them to help the orc farmers as a whole, but they ended up meeting Grant instead. What he say? That hell be a good warrior. A good warrior. Tashiquil started thinking. I have seen many warriors. Good warriors as well. But not all good warriors go the same way. So you sent him to Hoyt. That's right. Hoyt is an honorable man. It's enough as long as the rookie doesn't forget the path of honor. That is your answer, Lennox. At that time, an orc appeared in front of Lennox's eyes. With a lousy rushing gait, it was Grom. Lennox laughed bitterly. There's another rookie. This one. He isn't reliable, but he's coming along well. Lennox called out to Grom. Grom jumped. He became tense as he discovered Tashiquil, who had a fierce atmosphere similar to Lennox, standing on Lennox's other side. Tashiquil waved his staff. I am alive. I am Tashiquil. I am alive. Are you the shaman instructor? You know me. Grom initially worried about whether he should become a warrior or a shaman. In fact, the system had proposed becoming a shaman, and told him to go to Basque village to find the shaman Tashiquil. However, Grom himself chose to become a warrior. Lennox told Grom, the mission to help Grant turned out well. Thank you. But I'm still not satisfied. Are you satisfied? Ah, uh, no. Yes. Never be satisfied with the present. I will give you a mission. Alone. Grom had learned through a whisper that Ian was on a solo quest. This would be the first quest that he proceeded on alone without Ian. In fact, it was thanks to Ian that Grom had made most of his progress as an orc. If it wasn't for Ian, then he would have already quit. The orc really was a hell species. What quest would he have to do alone? Grom gulped. I understand. These days, a group of goblins are threatening the orcs. Go with the warriors to clean them up. Fight together. Uh, when? Now. Lennox pointed behind Grom. There were a series of warriors holding weapons. They grinned as they gestured to him. It was a fearsome sight to behold. 
Grom seemed like he was about to cry. I understand uh. Kashikwa laughed as he watched Grom walking away. That guy's going to be a warrior. Anyone can become a warrior. Kokoko. Indeed. Kashikwil, a warrior isn't born, but made. You are still a romantic. I just believe. Lennox grinned. I believe in the possibilities of all orcs. Ian walked around a nail. Once he became recognized as an orc warrior someday, he would leave Orcrox fortress and meet various other species. Just like he admired Orcrox scenery, a nail was overflowing with NPCs with their own intelligence and personality. In addition to the merchants at the market welcoming customers, he also saw the mercenaries of Elder Lord who would do anything for money. Orcs were rare in a nail, so Ian gladly bumped fists with them every time he met one. Hey, are you alive? I'm alive. This is the first time I've seen you. A warrior? I'm still an apprentice. Shaman? No, no, no. I am the much cooler warlock compared to a shaman. Oh this is the first time I've seen an orc warlock. Don't reduce the honor of the warlocks. I am a warlock. Kokoko. I'll be careful. It is nice to meet you, warrior. Warriors can be called the pride of the orcs. Become a warrior who knows honor, young man. I understand. Bolter. Bolter. The citizens glanced over at the two big orcs saying goodbye on the street. Ian's childhood memories returned as he wandered around the market. It was fun to follow his parents around at the market when they were alive. When they saw the young Ian, the adults at the market would give him sewing to eat. Purchase radish. Selling radish. Purchase radish. Purcha. Eh. A woman screaming while holding a radish in both hands noticed Ian and her eyes widened. Ian looked at her as well. There was a white star in the middle of her forehead. A user. It was the first user he met apart from Grom. A user? Yes. Whoa, this is the first time I've seen an orc user. Wah, wah. She examined Ian with amazement. As she reached out to touch Ian, she realized that she was holding radishes in both hands and stopped. Do you want to buy a radish? Kokoko. It's okay. She laid down the radishes with regret-filled eyes. This is really the first time I've seen an orc user. Have you been playing for a long time? Not that long. I'm a beginner. I see. You should try a different race. I have friends who tried being an orc, and they all ended up quitting. Kokoko. You are like a real orc. A woman was selling a variety of vegetables on her own, with a sign saying a nail branch of the blacksmith company in front of her. Her eyes widened as she noticed where Ian was paying attention. Ahem, I am the successful applicant for the intern position at blacksmith company. Intern. Don't ignore the interns. The blacksmith company is a large business in Elder Lord. Even in games, the preference for large companies remained. I'm going to become a legend of the business world and appear in Elder Lord times. Elder Lord Times was a program that talked about news in Elder Lord, as well as the rankers. Ian had watched videos of Elder Lord through this program before starting Elder Lord. Orc, what is your profession? A warrior, although I am still an apprentice. Truly an orc. How tough. The woman sighed, it's good that I don't have to worry about fighting. But I have to sell all of this today. She glanced at Ian. Are you busy? I'm not busy but. Now was his free time. Hoyt told Ian to explore the city. Then please help me. Stella has suggested a quest. The pay will be according to the results. There is a base salary of 5 silver and you will receive 30% of Stella's dividends, depending on the sales performance. Stella's quest. This was the first time he discovered that users could grant a quest. Ian looked at the woman, Stella, who was gazing at him earnestly. Iman in turn. If my performance isn't good then I can't switch to being a full-time employee. It was the sad reality. Anyway, it seemed fun so Ian nodded. Did you see my name in the quest window? I am Stella. Orc, what is your name? 
I am Ian. That isn't an orc-like name. Thus, Ian started to help Stella with her business. Purchase radish. Buy carrots. Selling cubers. Stella yelled loudly. Unbecoming of her slim figure, she yelled like an Amazon, but nobody looked back. Ian watched Stella. Excuse me, mister. Do you need a radish? This is a radish, a delicious radish. You can boil it, cook it, or even sell it. Buy it. I'm not buying, not buying. The auntie over there. Carrots. It's great for your body. Good for your eyes, and rich in beta carotene. Even children like them. Carrots are great, auntie. My kids hate carrots. The pretty sister over there. Elf sister. Sister, do you like green peppers? Sister, how about a basket of green peppers? Step aside. Ian shook his head. Stella looked over at Ian with tearful eyes. What? You're just watching and not helping. Do you think you'll be better than me at this job? Isn't it just selling? Yes, I went to a private school in order to pass the interview to enter the blacksmith company. School. There are many special schools for Elder Lord. If there were private schools for games, it would surely be in South Korea. I'm broke because I used my salary to pay for the private school's fees. He was reminded of EU when he saw Stella. Ian sighed and said, Okay. I will lend you my strength. Bah, will Ian's strength make a difference? Will it turn carrots into beef? You would be a wealthy merchant. Desperate words poured out of Stella's mouth as she started talking. Ian placed a dirt-covered carrot in her mouth. She tried to speak while spitting at OT. What for? Stella, please remember this. Ian puffed up his chest. He was a dignified and honorable orc. If you want to grab the mind of a person, be aware that 70% of communication is through nonverbal behavior, not words. Ian moved Stella out of the way and sat down. The people passing by looked at the orc sitting in front of a vegetable shop like he was a spectacle. Ian didn't say anything. At that moment, he caught the eyes of a passerby. The man flinched at Ian's intense gaze. Green skin, grim expression, protruding fangs, and the huge size. It was a scary appearance. The man became nervous as Ian paid strong attention to him. An orc acting as a substitute in the market, what the hell was this? The moment that they locked eyes, the terrible orc started to lift sewing up. Dagger? Axe? Hammer? Was he staring because he was going to do some act of violence? The man swallowed his saliva. Should he run? The orc lifted sewing up. It was nothing other than a radish. An orc holding a radish, it was an unusual sight. Was he an orc who would throw everything around him if he got upset? Would the radish fly over right now? His eyes looked down. As the man tried to bow his head, sewing unbelievable happened. The orc placed the radish near his face and gently smiled. Then the orc spoke in a loud voice, Radish. Do you need one? Did he need a radish? The man didn't understand. However, he felt a type of strange trust from that short question. A pride that didn't need long, flowery words. The warmth that spread from a gentle smile. The man nodded like he was spellbound. I need. There was nothing more to say. The man paid the money and the orc handed over the radish. One radish was sold. Stella couldn't understand why the man bought the radish and what this whole thing meant for her. After the man bought the radish from the orc, people started to show interest. Another man walked up to the orc and said, This is the first time that I am seeing an orc vegetable dealer. Orc, how much is this onion? Ian looked at the man with blank eyes. It was a deep look. What will you do with the onion? The man rolled his eyes at the sudden question. Ha! Huh. That I don't know. My wife will take care of it. He was a patriarchal man who knew nothing about cooking. Ian shook his head. I won't sell you the onion. A declaration of refusal. The eyes of everyone watching grew bigger. What merchant would refuse to sell an item? Had the orc applied a quota to the onions? 
he was a mysterious orc vegetable seller. Each ingredient has a value. An onion is the ultimate vegetable that can be used for all dishes. It can be used in stir-fry, steamed soup, soup, fried dishes, or as a nutritional or taste supplement. It is the guardian of the home. T then why? I will only sell it to those who understand the value of this ingredient. The pride of the seller who would judge the buyer's qualifications. It was a first for the market. The orc vegetable seller folded his arms and didn't say anything more. The rejected man looked between the orc and the onion with devastated eyes. T then. A woman came forward. HRM, he doesn't know the value of the onion at that age because he depends on his wife instead of cooking for himself. It's shameful. She was a middle-aged woman wearing a headband. She lifted a potato and said, Orc, I want to buy a basket of potatoes. Ho! What do you think I will make with this? A basket of potatoes. The orc vegetable seller touched his chin with a troubled expression, from potatoes thinking about the health of the family how about a boiled potato salad? The middle-aged woman waved her fingers and said with a smile. Wrong. Then what? The dish I will create. She said firmly. Everyone was surprised by her answer. Fried potatoes. Fried. Frying. Crispy potatoes fried in oil. Fried oil isn't this the enemy of health that causes hypertension, myocardial infarction, or obesity? Didn't their parents and elders always tell them to boil instead of frying? Yes, Mr. is correct. That is possible, but they are just words. The middle-aged woman laughed at the orc vegetable seller's puzzled expression. Isn't it good to risk your health if you can know the taste of fried potatoes? I would rather live today freely than tomorrow in caution. That is the value of the potatoes to me. That. It was big. This woman big. Her thoughts were bigger than his. She was someone who walked the path of a gourmet without any prejudice or self-righteousness. The orc vegetable seller stood up in amazement. Rather, I have learned sewing from you. The world is wide, Mr. Orc. To you I will sell three baskets instead of just one. Ill willingly accept. Thus, the middle-aged woman left with three baskets of potatoes. The people who witnessed the encounter came up to the orc seller and started conveying their beliefs. I will make a soup with the carrots. The color will hide the identity for my children who don't like carrots. It is my small consideration for the dark night at the table. Give me an onion. I'll serve it with a great steak. The people of the world only look at the heroes, but the protagonists are the performers who do their part in silence. Please give me garlic. I'll eat it raw. It's my gut feeling that I have to try the original taste of the ingredient and confront the world. Truly a great success. The vegetables started to quickly sell. The orc vegetable seller looked around at the empty store. Sold out. It was a clean sweep. He declared it to the customers, Today, I left the land of the orcs for the first time and had a thought as I saw the various species in an ale. Do they really know the honor of the ingredients? Do they take vegetables seriously? Are they pursuing the path of cooking with their own beliefs? I was skeptical, as I figured it wouldn't be the case. But now I have realized it. I was wrong. Ill acknowledge my misjudgment. There are a lot more gourmets than I first thought there were in this world. Everyone nodded. The orc bowed. This orc. Today I have learned from the humans, dwarves, elves and gnomes. Um. Oh. Clap. 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 An enthusiastic applause began. Everybody who watched him cheered and clapped. This day became a legend at the Anale branch of the blacksmith company and would be circulated throughout the city for years. The legendary witness, Stella, who had been watching this scene from the beginning, made a rotten expression. What on earth? Chapter, 12 Stella questioned Ian, what the hell was that? How did you do that? Let's see I just became an orc vegetable seller. This is nonsense. It was like a scene from a short story. If she took a video and posted it on the internet, it would be a wonderful video that would instantly become a phenomenon. 
Ian pondered before speaking, I didn't think about becoming an orc with my head. Then? I asked myself what if I weren't the human young Ian, but actually an orc vegetable seller. What would I do in this situation if I were an honest orc vegetable seller? He wasn't from Earth, but a living orc in the world of Elder Lord. Then I just acted accordingly. Like a role player. Role player. Ian laughed. I just became my character. Stella started thinking. These things were common sense to the rankers of Elder Lord, who had the ambition to climb up. They played Elder Lord sincerely. The system followed the user's assimilation rate. Everything changed according to how immersed they were, and their subsequent actions. Even if the people speaking had the same confidence and gestures, the world of Elder Lord responded differently depending on their mindset and assimilation rate. The man called Ian had a strange feeling about him this person really enjoyed Elder Lord. Stella nodded. I see, I just realized sewing. By the way, is your real name young Ian? Are you Korean? Yes. I thought you were a foreigner after hearing the name, Ian. Ha ha. In Elder Lord, one could meet users from all over the world. Thanks to the sophisticated state-of-the-art interpretation system, all of the users spoke a universal language in Elder Lord, regardless of their nationality. Ian forgot this fact since the communication was so natural. In fact, both Grom and Stella could be foreigners. Stella smiled at Ian and said, I'm a Korean. Aha, I see. Register me as a friend, I'll contact you often in the future. Ian only had Grom registered as a friend at the moment. Ian accepted Stella's friend request and now they could send and receive messages to each other. Stella asked, How long have you been playing Elder Lord? Around two weeks in reality. Really? Stella's eyes widened as she nodded. I see. In the future, Ian will become big in Elder Lord. Me? It's nothing. This is just a hobby. He was just doing this because of his little sister. But now it seemed like he was enjoying Elder Lord more and more. Well, that's as good. Isn't your assimilation rate pretty high? Assimilation rate? In the status window. Wait a minute. It had been a while since he looked at his status window. Ian checked his status window. Status window. Friend of Farmer's Ian, Orc Apprentice Warrior. Level 4. Achievement points 80. Assimilation 56%. Abilities. Orc Strength Common. Orc's Recovery Common. Orc's Greatsword Technique Uncommon. Warrior's Fighting Spirit Uncommon. His assimilation rate was slightly higher than before. It started at 50% and was now at 56%. I have 56%. Omo, really? Is that high? It's pretty high. It's a great assimilation rate, especially since you just started. Mine is between 3000 and 40%. Aha. Rather, the higher the assimilation is, the more painful and realistic the game becomes. Therefore, there are a lot of people who deliberately lower the limit. That's why it was painful when he fought. Ian nodded. He hadn't cared so far, but there was a details option in his status window. With this, he could put a limit on the assimilation rate or modify his title. He could also determine the approximate proficiency level of his SS. Orc strength and orc's recovery were close to reaching the uncommon grade. The rate of assimilation was left with no limit and his title was friend of farmers. After talking more with Stella, he discovered that her level was much higher than his. In Elder Lord, the level didn't necessarily mean strength because it depended on achievement points and SS. This allowed players of various occupations to enjoy Elder Lord, rather than just fighting. Stella mentioned her trumpess, negotiating eloquence, which was at the special grade. Please tell me if you have anything you want to buy next time. This S is very strong when it comes to bargaining prices. You couldn't sell a few vegetables. Fatu I can't say anything but Ian is strange. She checked the time. Oh, I made a promise to someone, so I need to disconnect. Today was nice. Thanks for everything, you really surprised me today. See you again. Yes. Then let's meet another time. 
Ah right, please receive this. She handed a bandana to Ian. It seemed to be a worker's bandana with the mark of the blacksmith company in the corner. Use this. It isn't good to be a user in a nail, especially as an orc. The mark can only be seen by users. That's the problem. Stella shrugged. Users are scarier than NPCs. Oh, I am late. I really am going now. Then bye. She went into the store and disconnected in order to avoid attention. Today, he met a new friend in Elder Lord. This was why people played Elder Lord. Ian smiled happily. Then he suddenly realized. Wait. The quest reward? He had forgotten about the reward as he was talking to her. Was this the influence of her negotiation eloquence s? Next time they met, he would have to ask for it. He wore the bandana. He quite liked it, he looked like a trendy orc with a fashion sense. Ian headed towards Thompson's house, where Hoyt was currently at, with a spring in his step. However, there were shadows peeking at Ian. That orky's a user right? That's right, there's a star on the forehead. Hoo, isn't he one crazy? That crazy is perfect for us. It is great. Shall we hunt an orc today? Whispering in the alley, a white star like Ian shone on their foreheads. It was dark. The night sky of Elder Lord was also beautiful. The stars from reality shone brightly in his virtual world. The galaxy, a group of stars that became a heavenly river in the sky. Ian hummed as he looked up into the night sky. If the stars were like little children with shining eyes, the moon that shone calmly upon the world was their mother. The clean air cleared the atmosphere around him. Ian wasn't surprised when three humans appeared from an alley, as he had heard them approaching. However, he hadn't lowered his head due to the beautiful stars. Hello Orc. The weapons in their hands were dully shining in the moonlight. The first thing that popped into Ian's mind was a name. Derek? They looked at each other and shrugged. I have no idea who that is, but just die quietly. They didn't seem to be Derek's followers. Ian looked around, they were in a place with no people. This was the best place to attack someone. Orcs are a great source of achievement points. He is easy to catch because he is a user, and it also raises proficiency. Kikikik. The three of them surrounded Ian, who stepped back and calmly analyzed them. It was an unexpected incident, but Ian's head quickly entered combat mode. It was as natural as breathing for him. He quickly figured out the enemy's information. The tall, slim man wielding a spear was the ranged type to keep Ian in check. The other man, who was in the back holding a staff, was a support magician in the rear. The light-bodied woman who held two short swords was a close combat fighter that would disturb his field of view with dizzying movements. What are you looking at? Ian didn't respond to their words. He focused on predicting the flow of the battle and figuring out how to take the initiative. This moment would decide the outcome of the battle. The man with the spear would stop Ian while the woman would distract him. While Ian dealt with the other two assailants, the magician in the rear would bombard him with spells. It was a familiar attack formation based on raid tactics. He needed to disrupt their rhythm. Ian's first priority was to catch the defenseless magician. Ian purposely acted frightened. Excuse me, hat will you do? The woman burst out laughing. Look, he's so cute when he is frightened. You used to act like this when you were attacked by knights. As they laughed among themselves, Ian immediately struck. They weren't in an attack posture and hurriedly raised their weapon towards Ian. Eh eh. There was a short gap in their combat power in the short moment that they weren't ready for battle. Ian rushed like crazy and thrust his great sword at the spear and swords. They stepped back to take an attack stance. However, Ian ignored them and kept rushing. The magician was temporarily left unprotected and exposed to the orc warrior, his eyes clouding over in dismay. Ian laughed. Ian's sword slashed his neck before the magician could even lift his staff. His head flew through the air. Kayak. The woman screamed at the sight of blood. Ian kicked the body of the magician who had lost his head. He had died before even using magic once. 
Congratulations. You have made the man who attacked you pay the price in blood. Fifty achievement points have been acquired. Your level has risen. An explosive power was momentarily displayed. The S, Orc Strength Common, has evolved. Orc Strength Common has been upgraded to Orc Superhuman Strength Uncommon. No, that, he was clearly a user. What user? This. The man and woman stepped back. This wasn't what they expected. Users were weak. Apart from their combat power, their mental strength was also weak. They were modern people. They couldn't become immersed in realistic battle, where blood and guts oozed out. Therefore, most of them were passive in combat, making it possible for user hunters like these people to exist. However, Ian was different. He was a man who lived in a reality that was as cruel as Elder Lord. A dead body wasn't able to stop him. No, it only made him more brutal. Ian smiled as he recalled Hoyt's teachings. That's right. The fear of the enemy was his own strength. As the bloody orc smiled, the two people backed away in horror. Hey, hey, we, we were wrong. That isn't a user. It doesn't seem like it. I saw it. Ah, uh, I don't know. He's wearing a bandana. I was mistaken, what kind of user is that? They fell into confusion. Ian was still a beginner. He had felt it when he hit both of their weapons when they weren't ready. Ian wouldn't have an advantage in the fight against them. However, they were already gripped by fear. Ian approached as they fell back while raising their weapons. Ah, uh, I don't know. Fight. Him first. Yua. The man thrust his spear. Ian moved his body and avoided it. He tried to dig into the gap, but the woman came up to Ian with her short swords. Two wounds occurred on both sides of Ian's body. We can deal with him. We've had a lot of users. We can do it. Formidable. Their movements were practiced. How many users had they had to move in sync like this? Ian's face distorted. Ian remembered one of his SS. Orc's recovery. It was an orc passive S that healed the injuries after a considerable amount of time. Okay. He didn't want to see the enemy's face filled with confidence anymore. He would erase it. Ian avoided the spear while focusing on the woman's movements. He revealed a gap around his abdomen, as if it was a mistake. The woman responded immediately. She came in deep and aimed her swords with a shout. At that moment, Ian struck back with the greatsword instead of defending his body. Puk. Giak. Their attacks crossed. Ian had a dagger stuck in his belly, while the woman's torso was split in half. Chapter, 13. A cross-section of the woman's body was revealed as her parts fell to either side. The man screamed at the gory sight. Airy. Airy. Anybody who fought in Elder Lord would have a brutal battle. There was a reason why Elder Lord was an adult game. However, Ian wasn't concerned, despite being the person involved. He just admired the realistic representation of the human body. He looked at the sword that was stuck in his abdomen. He would leave it alone and get rid of the other guy first. Ian lifted his bloody greatsword, its shadow covering the face of the spear user. The man lost his strength and flopped down. Then he whispered. As much as possibly no pain. Ian nodded and swung his sword straight downwards. His first PK experience in Elder Lord had ended with his victory. You have gotten rid of all the assailants. Two hundred achievement points have been acquired. Your level has risen. Orc's recovery common has been used. You have recovered from countless wounds suffered in many battles. Orc's Recovery Common has been promoted to Orc's Vitality Uncommon. There is a short sword stuck in your abdomen. It will be dangerous if left untreated. Status Window Friend of Farmer's Ian, Orc Apprentice Warrior Level 6 Achievement Points 330 Assimilation 57% Abilities Orc Superhuman Strength Uncommon Orc's Vitality Uncommon Orc's Greatsword Technique Uncommon. Warrior's Fighting Spirit Uncommon. 
Two of his SS had been upgraded after taking care of the users. It made sense why these guys hunted users. The bodies of the dead users turned into white particles, drifting like dandelion seeds in the wind, until they couldn't be seen anymore. The three bodies of the men and woman disappeared, leaving only their equipment behind. Are these mine now? This was another reason to hunt other users. Ian pulled out the sword stuck in his abdomen. He swallowed back the pain and bandaged the wounds with the clothes of the user hunters. He scanned the equipment and found nothing special. They were the ordinary clothes and weapons sold at the blacksmiths. All of them had the common rating. He grabbed the spear, the swords, and the staff, since they could be sold. Ian and raised his head and saw an empty, vacant lot. There was no one here. The battle was over. Ian felt sowing unfamiliar swelling up inside him. He had defeated criminals in Elder Lord. Ian murmured to himself, Today, I met three wicked people and ed them, implementing justice. An orc who knew honor. Where are the people who know honor? The orc who fought against injustice. Great. It was like a scene from a movie. However, he felt strangely ashamed. Ian's face turned red, moving quickly in case someone had heard him. Soon after Ian's figure disappeared. Only the clothing of the assailants remained in the back alley of a nail. Amazing. Then a woman walked out from the shadows. She was a woman wearing all black, with a mask covering her face. The tight clothes revealed her alluring body. I came to cover the user hunters, only to hit a jackpot. She looked at the place where the assailants were. Jackson. Brown. Airy. They were user hunters active in the Anail area, and were known to attack anyone, regardless of whether they were beginners or not. They used a friendly approach to get close to the user, only to stab them in the back and gain their items and achievement points. They aimed solely at users that weren't familiar with combat. Therefore, there were complaints about the trio of heirs. However, they hit an orc NPC by accident and suffered. The battle scene was amazing. A boldness that the users couldn't follow. A cruelty that wasn't afraid of blood. The decisiveness of his attacks. A soliloquy after the battle ended. She came up with a title for her video. The mannerless user hunters, justice is implemented. Their bad behavior had already been uploaded. The scenes of them ambushing a user, only to be ed, would be an explosive hit. She didn't know why, but it seemed like they had mistaken the NPC for a user. She nodded as she checked the video that she recorded. People would go crazy over it. The sight of wicked people forgetting themselves and falling into the pit of hell. There was even a nice soliloquy of justice. She glanced around as she ended the connection. Park Yungte smiled as he heard Eu's voice next to him. Hey, Park Yungte. What level are you? I don't have a capsule. Then go to a capsule room. Stop playing the game and focus on your life. Didn't you do badly on the exam? Wow, how cowardly to attack with that fact. The two were sitting in a cafe on campus. After their economics lecture ended, they decided to spend some time together. As the two of them were talking, someone called out Eu's name. Ah, Eu. Young Eu. Park Yungte as well. A group of girls rushed over and sat at their table. What are the two of you doing? Isn't this strange? Perhaps. Yungte, while wow, Park Yungte, not bad. Eu laughed, if you are just here to talk nonsense, then leave. Isn't that too harsh? Do you want me to keep calling you rabbit? Didn't a rabbit give you a hard time? Ah, noisy. After Eu died from a rabbit in Elder Lord, her friends kept on calling her rabbit. By the way, have you seen it? Her friend asked. What? Yuvitzer Laney's video. Yuvitzer. Yuvids was the world's largest video upload site, and its content creators were called Yuvitzers. Of course, even in Yuvids, most of the mainstream content was related to Elder Lord. Laney was a star who emerged after reporting on various types of wicked players, filming their wickedness in gruesome detail. Rumor has it that the users captured on video weren't even aware of Laney's existence because she was such a high-level assassin. Scene what? 
Eu asked. Look look, it is a bit hit. The three user hunters humiliation video. She pulled out her tablet. Eu, Park Yungte and her friends focused on the tablet. Laney's justice is implemented on the user hunters. The opening scene was of three users chuckling with one orc standing in front of them. Laney edited the caption. The mannerless user hunters, they found an orc user. Orc. An orc user. Keep watching. As usual, they are trying to ambush the user. They laughed as the orc hesitated. But after a short moment, the orc rushed and instantly cut off the magician's head. Whoa. Isn't that crazy? The dismay on the user hunter's faces was caught on the screen. But ding. That is incorrect. An NPC. It became a two versus one fight. The user hunters were familiar with fighting, so they attacked the orc pretty well. The orc went on the defensive. Isn't the orc losing? It is coming soon. At that time, the woman stabbed the orc with a short sword. The orc was waiting for that moment and cut the female hunter's torso. The user hunter's body was split in half. Eu flinched as she watched the brutal scene. I can see the flesh and bones. Park Yungte admired the sight. The woman's body was broken and the lone spearman soon fell down. He whispered sewing to the orc and the orc nodded. Then he beheaded the user. 3 vs 1. Their power didn't differ much. Rather, the user hunters were superior in power. However, the S and the boldness of the orc overwhelmed them. It was truly a fierce battle. This is why you shouldn't touch NPCs. The corpses of the users turned white and disappeared. The orc grabbed their weapons and stood still. The video didn't end there. There's more. Listen carefully. The orc stood there, looking into the air. Then the orc opened his mouth. Today, I met three wicked people and ed them, implementing justice. The orc formed a fist. Where are the people who know honor? It was a loud voice. The orc disappeared into the darkness of the city after speaking. Park Yungte and Eu's mouths dropped open. Really cool. An unknown spirit was blazing from him. There was an explosion of comments. Elder Lord's path am going to become an orc. Arigato 222222. I am the best 222222. Cooking fondant 222222. Wu Insung Secret 2222. View more. My name is Yoda we are going crazy protect honor. Assassination King I have to reevaluate hunting orc users. Dragon bra it's just a staged scene. Ninano he really seems like a NPC and orc who clears houses. Orc hunter and orc is a mob. Number one orc user Maguchwi dirty humans. Death. Shout bolter. Camper the real one has appeared. Oscar Hazard Explanation Maguchwi quit being an orc shaman truly an orc user. I am the upright beta I am still an orc. Jungle King Wenger weren't you whining that you should reset? Normal person I am someone who hasn't been an orc. Americano the orc's tears. Slow angel tears of an orc user. Number 2 orc user Kawakta shout. Bolter. Oscar Hazard A festival for orc users. Delicious Omurus Orc users are going crazy. Psychedelia keep quiet Orc users. Orc never die what is Bolter. View more. The general users and Orc users who believed in Orcs were all enthusiastic. Eu's eyes shone as she saw the comments under the videos, then she asked, should I go be an Orc? Are you crazy? Is that so? Don't be an Orc. Park Yungte also thought about trying out an Orc in Elder Lord, but he soon gave up. The character that he had been playing for a while was human. He was a blacksmith but he was busy with his part-time job and school. It was tough to enjoy the game. Soon, it was time for his next lecture. Park Yungte got up. I have to go. Ah. Uh. Bye. See you tomorrow. Yungte, bye. Bye. Park Yungte separated from the group and walked through the university. Hey, Park Yungte. Eh. A foreign car stopped on the side of the campus. 
the car door opened and someone ran towards him. Park jumped his face distorted. It was the senior he got into a fight with over a you. The senior cried out, you, what did you do? Eh? What's going on? Ill apologize, yes. Cancel everything, ill pay for all your medical expenses. W what? My father's company will be ruined. Why are you telling me? Using common sense, you're the only one. Why did the customers suddenly cancel their accounts? They have all abandoned our company. After we fought. His face was like he lost his soul. The senior didn't pay any attention to the gazes around him as he clung on to Yungtae. Somebody popped into Park jung tees head at the words. It was Yu's brother and the owner of Cafe Reason, Yung Ian. The senior cried out, I am acting like this, eh? I didn't know you were so strong. Really? No, senior. I really don't know. Would I have a part-time job if I could do that? I'm trying to make a living. Ah. I don't understand, but I hope it will be resolved. Now I have to go to a lecture. Hey, agreement. Let's come to an agreement. Eh. I can write a memorandum. Write it now. Now. Yes, now. Park Yungte nodded. Yungte, ill resolve it so don't worry. As Ian said, Yungte didn't know what happened, but everything was resolved. Chapter 14 Ian spent several days at Thompson's home. Direct's men kept threatening them, so Hoyt and Ian took turns protecting the house. Meanwhile, Ian was trained by Hoyt. In Elder Lord, SS were divided into various ratings. Common grade meant one was around the ordinary level, while uncommon was better even better than that. After uncommon was special, and then after that was the rare rank. Following rare, the current highest known rank, was essence. It meant literally realizing the essence of the S. Among the famous rankers of Elder Lord, Choi Hansung's S, Battlefield Penetrating Eyes, was revealed to be at the essence grade. Most of the user's SS were common, uncommon, or the occasional special grade SS. Elder Lord resembled reality. Everyone's abilities were different, and it wasn't easy for a user to reach a level beyond special. Therefore, most of them were enthusiastic about gathering as many SS as possible. Do you believe in your abilities? I believe in them to a certain extent. Ian replied. He learned martial arts. In other words, he was unusually strong. Of course, he trained hard, but it wasn't like his colleagues didn't work hard either. Ian knew that he had a talent for violence. Talented people would feel like they were talented. Hoyt nodded. Certainly, you have talent. However, keep in mind that talent isn't the only thing needed to become strong. Are you talking about effort? I think that the word effort is too light. He laughed. Obsession. We can be anything. He didn't want to, but he acknowledged it. It wasn't strange to call it a type of power. Ian had lived in poverty, and his parents' business hadn't been good in his childhood. After his parents died, he inherited their debt and headed to the battlefield to make money. It was a harsh life that he could never boast about to anyone else. He ed and ed again. It was all for the sake of money. The targets weren't always evil. Therefore, if he acknowledged Hoyt, he would have to blame himself for choosing life on the battlefield without trying any other ways. Indeed, such guilt tormented his heart. Ian continued, not everyone can do that. Everyone. Hoyt smiled and aimed his hammer at Ian. I am not talking to everyone right now. Then. I am talking to you right now. Ian looked at him. Hoyt's body, full of battle scars and tattoos, was proof of his experience over the past years. Are you a common person? Do you want to be a warrior? I want to be one. Everyone if you are like everyone else, then you can't be a warrior. A warrior has to go on a path that no one else has traveled before. Hoyt moved back and raised the hammer with both of his hands. Look closely. Hoyt took a deep breath. Ian flinched. The atmosphere seemed to be shaking, and he could feel sewing coming from Hoyt's body. Strength, it wasn't the same as energy. Rather, it was the opposite. 
As a result, Hoyt's presence became blurred. He was becoming a part of this world. Then again, he became separate from the world. Hoyt moved his hammer. It was a slow motion. However, Ian witnessed the world moving in reverse. The world broke with the simple movements of the hammer. Ian wanted to sit down, as he couldn't believe his eyes. This, this was the pinnacle state that Beck Hanho said Ian was unlikely to reach in his lifetime. This was the domain of the ancient military arts. It was short, but seemed to last for an eternity. Hoyt raised his hammer and restored his breathing. He looked at Ian and smiled. Did you see? Ah. I was hoping so, but you really are amazing to see it. This. Hoyt put down his hammer. Sweat rolled down his face. When I was your age, there was a really talented orc. I was stupid compared to him. Sewing that he took one try to learn would take me twenty or thirty attempts. Hoyt. That's right. He really was a genius. He would make an instant judgment and rush at the opponent with marvelous s. He had a brilliant wit that I could never reach in my lifetime. So, I desperately asked the instructor. What could I do to become stronger? Hoyt raised the hand at his waist. Ian handed him a towel. The instructor showed me a number of ways to wield the weapon. And that was enough. I didn't need to know anything else, he said. It was the early stages of the pinnacle. I believed him and repeated his actions like crazy. People laughed at me like it was ridiculous, but I didn't give up. I worked constantly without compromise. Ten thousand times, one hundred thousand times, and more. Then at some point, I became a warrior. Ian looked at his sword. He could do the same. You definitely have talent, Hoyt said. Yes. That is why I am saying this. Yes. Go towards the pinnacle, and beyond me. Ian's martial arts were stagnant. It had undergone further development on the battlefield, but was blocked again by a wall. He couldn't go beyond that. Ian inwardly acknowledged his limits. But today, he saw beyond it. It was inside a game. Congratulations. You have witnessed a pinnacle grade S. You feel thrilled by the high level of martial arts and the reality of the pinnacle grade S. A pinnacle grade S is only achieved by the real powerhouses in the world of Elder Lord. The title person pursuing the pinnacle has been acquired. All SS will gain proficiency until they reach the pinnacle grade. You have acquired the mind's eye special S that allows you to understand the reality of the target. Fifty achievement points have been acquired. Your level has risen. Status window. Person pursuing the pinnacle Ian, orc apprentice warrior. Level 7. Achievement points 380. Assimilation 57%. Abilities. Orc superhuman strength uncommon. Orc's vitality uncommon. Orc's greatsword technique uncommon. Warrior's fighting spirit uncommon. Mind's eye special. The messages popped up, but Ian shook his head. Those things didn't matter right now. His heart pounded. He wanted to swing his sword. He wanted to move his body. Not just in the game, but in reality as well. Ian still couldn't believe that he saw it. It's hard since it's the first time I've done it in quite a while. It is really wonderful. You are even more amazing. You don't seem like an apprentice, since even some of the best warriors would only see a common swing. Hoyt looked at the sun. He had the ability to calculate the approximate time according to the location of the sun, A.S. that Ian didn't have. It's time for Ray to finish. Ian said, I'll go. Please. Ian started moving. Ray, the oldest of Thompson's children, was attending school. It wasn't a regular training curriculum provided by the government like in Ian's reality, but a private institute run by various intellectual scholars. Thompson believed that his children should be in school, regardless of his economic situation. It was an educational facility that the guards of a nail protected, so Derek couldn't reach it with his hands. Ian headed towards the school. It had been a few days, so the people of a nail were used to seeing orcs. Some people of different species greeted Ian. Uh, aren't you selling vegetables now? 
It was a part-time job. Too bad. Stella is still selling fresh vegetables. I can't trust that girl. Kokoko. The reputation system. Reputation existed in Elder Lord. Ian became known in a nail through positive activities, such as selling vegetables and protecting the Thompson family from the vicious loan shark. The attitudes of the NPCs changed from what they were before. They didn't discriminate against orcs any longer. Ian entered Ray's school with light footsteps. However, the atmosphere was weird. The children were forming a circle around sewing. This was the scene of a typical kid's fight. There was a familiar face inside. Ray. Ian watched closely without interrupting. Ray and another child were tangled together as they rolled across the ground. Fists were aimed at the other person. Ian touched the shoulder of a child watching on the outside. Hohawk. The child's face turned pale as he was faced with the rugged face of an orc. Ian asked quietly, why are they fighting? That Robin teased Ray and said that his dad had run away. Hmm. Ray was pretty tough. Even though it was an even fight, Ray soon overpowered Robin. He got on top of Robin and swung his fist. Robin covered his face with his arms. Ray's fist hit the guard. At this moment, Ian interrupted. Stop, stop. The children separated like the how the sea split from Moses after hearing the orc's words. Ray also stopped moving. You shouldn't fight. Ian pulled them apart. Ray released Robin and started panting, while Robin stepped back with a nosebleed. If you say it one more time, then I'll you, Ray declared, his eyes filled with hate. That Robin hadn't died. That's right, your dad isn't here right now. This. Ian stopped Ray, who shook his head as he was grabbed by Ian. Mr. That, look at what he is saying. Ill him. Ian was stumped. When he was a child, he beat someone up for cursing at his family. Ian couldn't say to not use violence because he understood Ray. In addition, this was Elder Lord, where fists were close to being the law, unlike in the real world. It wasn't an ideal story. In the end, humans had to learn how to survive on their own in this world. Ian just shook his head. It is done, so let's stop here. You don't want to fight anymore, do you? Ray was still enthusiastic, but Robin didn't want to fight any longer. He wiped his bloody nose with his sleeve. Ian dispersed the children. He took Ray and started heading back home. Ian had raised Eu, but she didn't experience this situation because she was a girl. She would just quarrel with her friends and then they would make up. Mister, I want to become stronger by learning the sword like you. Why? If I get stronger, then I can those guys. Ian chuckled in a low voice. Do you want to them? Isn't that too much? I am angry. You can't a person just because you don't like them, Ray. There is always someone stronger than you. Then what if that person appears and s a person you care about? Then I will die fighting them, like a man. Ian looked at Ray. Ray avoided his gaze as if he knew what Ian was thinking. That isn't a manly thing to do. Ray. It is easy to speak about death. Ian patted the head of the silent Ray. He seemed more suited to the world of Elder Lord. He received a secret ING technique from Beck Hanho and survived on the battlefield. These things had no place in the real world. He might run a cafe that made coffee, but he knew more about fighting and ING, life and death, than anyone else. Ian scratched his head. His mind was complicated. At that time, some people appeared and surrounded Ian and Ray. Hello Orc, we meet again. This face. It was one of Direct's underlings who broke into Thompson's house. That monster isn't here this time, so won't it be different? All of them were holding weapons. Their purpose was obvious, even to a blind man. Ian placed Ray behind him and grabbed his sword handle. He measured their power. If they were his opponents, then he would be able to get away with Ray somehow. But there was a man watching from the rear. A middle-aged man with a beard looked at Ian with a bored face. He wore expensive clothing and held a sword. And bright aura shone around the sharp blade. 
Are you a friend of Hoyt? A low and hoarse voice emerged from the man. He stepped forward. A strong force was emitted from his whole body. Ian was nervous. Strong. Clearly stronger than Ian. I am Derek, young man. Ian gathered his strength as he listened. He had to hang in there. Looking at Derek's nonchalant face, Ian felt like an egg before an approaching knife. His entire body was ready. Derek approached. The interest I will have you pay for it with your body. Chapter, 15 The residents fled after seeing Derek. Everyone knew Derek, the notorious loan shark who dominated a nail's back alleys. Ian looked around. There didn't seem to be any escape path for him to take. Derek's men formed a circle around Ian to prevent him from fleeing. What should he do? Ian's eyes sunk. Derek and his five people. Not only that, but Derek was much stronger than the rest of his people. It was best not to fight. Derek, it's best that you don't fight me. Why do you think that? Do you have the confidence to stop Hoyt's anger? He mentioned Hoyt. Derek's failure to harm the Thompson family was entirely due to Hoyt. However, unlike his expectations, Derek smiled quietly. Ian became uncomfortable. Derek's smile and laid-back behavior was the exact opposite of what he imagined. Ian expected him to be a sleazy money lender, but Derek was much bigger than that. His strength was like a warrior, exuding a sharp atmosphere that Ian had never felt before. Ian realized that the situation was going out of control. Now he had to gamble. Derek raised his sword. You won't be going alone, so don't worry. He laughed and imitated Ian's words. Young man, it would be best if you didn't fight back. Ian could feel Ray's hands trembling at his waist. Ian tried to get help from Stella, whom he met in an ale, but she wasn't connected. It was a dilemma. Ian also raised his greatsword. The important thing was Ray. For his survival, Ian had to retreat. Ian whispered to Ray, hold on tightly to my neck. Ha! Huh. Ian lifted Ray up and placed him on his back. Ray reflexively grabbed his neck as Ian rushed backwards. It was in the opposite direction of Derek. The subordinates gathered in the direction of Ian's escape. He needed to defeat the one in front of him before they all gathered. However, the underling was different from the user hunters that Ian had overpowered. He calmly swung his sword and slowed Ian down. As Ian stopped, the other underlings caught up. Ian was once again surrounded and the siege was narrowed further. Beyond them, Derek was approaching. Even if you struggle, the result is the same. Ian decided to buy some time. No matter how dirty a lone shark is, you shouldn't act unfairly. Unfairly? Yes, Derek. Let's have a fair one-on-one -on -one fight, Ian said. Derek burst out laughing. Puha! What are you saying, Bork? Derek is a thoroughly practical person. Do you think that I would speak nonsense? Have a one-on-one -on -one with your friends in heaven. Kill kill. Derek's mouth rose. HRMM. Ian ignored the underlings and told Derek. Surely you aren't scared of a one-on-one -on -one fight. What an interesting friend. Ian didn't expect him to agree to the blatant provocation, but Derek abruptly nodded. Okay. His subordinate's eyes widened. Boss? Why, do you have no confidence? Me? Yes. Derek placed a knife at the neck of an underling and said, Surely Derek's men aren't afraid of an orc. Ah, uh, no. So fight him. Alone. Yes, yep. Direct's subordinate vigorously nodded his head and pulled out his sword as he stepped forward. Ian put Ray down while ignoring the ominous feeling in the back of his mind. Ray, stay back. If there is a gap, then run away. Mister. Don't worry. Don't you believe in an orc warrior? Ian laughed. Ray's face became tearful. It was a familiar scene. Ray, don't you believe in father? His father Thompson had left after saying the same remark as Ian. He still hadn't come back. Ray wanted to hold on to Ian, but he was already moving forward and pointing at Derek's subordinate with his sword. The battle began. 
Ian came out first. He tried to draw the opponent to his side, but the person stepped back because he felt the incredible atmosphere of orc's superhuman strength. This was fortunate for Ian. Ian just wanted to buy some time. Eventually, Hoyt would hear about this and come running. Ian moved forward with no substance in his attacks. The opponent kept avoiding. Derek's expression hardened as he saw both of them. How boring, Derek muttered. Then the expression on the face of the underling changed. Ah wah. The opponent rushed at Ian, who stepped back to avoid the incoming attacks. The attacker and defender had changed, but the battle was a repetition of the previous one. Young Orc. I know your intentions, but you should also pay attention to me. Derek gestured with his chin. Derek's subordinates once again raised their weapons. If you don't properly entertain me, then this will be over. Ian took a deep breath. His choices had disappeared. There was only one road remaining now. He had no other choice but to commit to a last hurrah on this path. Ian's muscles swelled up. Bolter. Ian charged towards the opponent. His greatsword descended with force towards the opponent's weapon who twisted his body to avoid it. Ian pursued him and slashed him. Quack. His opponent blocked it. The two blades faced each other and it became a battle of strength. Ian put pressure on the opponent. The other person kicked Ian in the abdomen. Hook. Die, orc. The underling stabbed at his neck. Ian quickly ducked and rolled across the ground to avoid it. The sword missed. Again, the sword descended towards the body of Ian, who had fallen. Ian could barely escape by rolling to left and right. He gritted his teeth. Horia. Ian stood up and charged again. His opponent aimed the blade, but Ian didn't care. He pushed ahead and slashed the opponent with his sword, despite the blade aiming at him. The opponent fell to the floor. Ian got on top of him, but there was still the blade between them. Ian paused for a short moment. He wielded his fist before he lost his spirit. Wah! The orc's fist struck the underling's face. Piak. 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 Ian's punches turned the subordinate's face into a rice cake. Ian's hand stopped as he recovered his spirit. There was a blade at Ian's neck. It was another of Direct's subordinates. Stop. You can't any of my men. Ian stood up with a wince. Is he alive? Yes, he is still breathing. Foolish guy. Derek placed his foot on the head of the collapsed underling. Losing to an inexperienced orc. Ian stepped back and picked up his sword. There were still four subordinates remaining. Ian asked with a grin. Who's next? He breathed out. His body was a wreck. Orc's vitality uncommon is being used. The bleeding is severe. Please seek medical attention. Your right arm won't move. Your actions are constrained. The third subordinate was lying down with a pierced abdomen. Now there were only two left, excluding Derek. Ian's head drooped against his will. He wanted to collapse. He wanted to rest. It would be comfortable if he died. After all, this was just a game. However, he had to protect Ray. It may have been a game to him, but this was reality for Ray, an NPC with an artificial intelligence. Right now, the life of an NPC was depending on him. Ian laughed. Lennox's voice rang in his ears. Raise your head. Everything is hard. Don't relax. It is hard. So what? Nobody cares. Those words. The enemy wouldn't care about his substances. The enemy didn't care that he wanted to close his eyes and collapse. No, they would gain strength from Ian's despair, and would try to step on him. Who's next? Ian shouted. The residents were already watching the fight through the windows and gaps in the alleys. An orc struggling against the infamous Derek. The orc shed blood, but didn't give up. Come. I will deal with you. Impressive. Derek nodded. Yes, you you truly are Hoyt's friend. I believe it. Derek, will you come out? 
The entertainment is over, young man. What do you mean? I enjoyed it, but now it is time to work. Derek gestured with his chin. Then his subordinate, hovering behind Ian, grabbed Ray. Ray struggled desperately, but he couldn't resist the strength of an adult. Ian tried to rush over, but Derek approached and punched Ian in the abdomen. Cough. Derek was strong. It was a blow that made his head go blank. Ian sat down. Derek spoke in a laughing tone from above him. The time is coming soon. Derek grabbed Ian's hair. Then someone caught Ian's attention. An orc was running over. One eye, and a scary face laced with scars and covered in tattoos. It was Hoyt. Chapter, 16. Hoyt, the Honorable Warrior Hoyt. Derek laughed. I'm glad that you came. Let go of them. Let's see. Ray was brought to Derek's side. He circled around Ian and Ray as he asked, Hoyt, what is your relationship with this young orc? He is a colleague helping me out. Is he also an orc warrior? An apprentice, but I guarantee that one day he will become a warrior. Derek nodded. Orc warriors are extraordinary I haven't met many orc warriors, but they all have one thing in common. Derek kicked Ian. Ugh. They all have a logic that I can't understand. He unleashed a barrage of attacks on Ian, who was collapsed on the ground. The shock caused by the feet hitting Ian's wounds caused more blood to pour out. Ian's body was so weak that he couldn't get up anymore. You are protecting the Thompson family. Derek touched Ian's head with his toes. This orc also risked his life fighting for that trivial reason. Quack. I will be honest. Derek held a knife to Ray's neck, who was captured by his men. The money that Thompson borrowed, it is nothing to me. Derek. But I had a lot of fun after you guys barged in. An honorable warrior, that is interesting. If you hurt the both of them, then I will keep my honor and make you pay the price, growled Hoyt. Calm down, I haven't done anything yet. I don't want to do anything. Direct subordinate grabbed Ray's hair and pulled his head back. The boy's white neck was clearly revealed under the midday sun. You are the one who will have to do sewing, Hoyt. What does that mean? I always wonder the same thing when seeing people like you. What if that belief was bent? Where will you go? The blade passed lightly over Ray's neck, leaving a thin red line in its path. Blood flowed downwards. Kneel down, Hoyt. Derek. If you don't fall to your knees, then this child will die. Ray trembled. Ian tried to stand up, but a subordinate nearby stepped on his back. Ian moaned and collapsed back onto the ground. Come, kneel down Hoyt. Bow your honor. Derek said with a chuckle. Ian formed a tight fist where he was laying on the ground, his head brimming with fury. Hoyt wasn't an orc who could be insulted by a lone shark. A man who made slaves of others or sold them to brothels for money couldn't sneer at Hoyt. He was a warrior who knew honor, and had proven himself. Derek absolutely couldn't mock Hoyt. The warrior's fighting spirit uncommon has been used. You are an orc who doesn't know how to give up. Your fighting spirit has raised the limits of your body. Ian shook his head. Hoyt was about to bend his knees. His eyes were calm, but Ian's eyes shook fiercely as he looked at Hoyt. A hot emotion was boiling up in his body. Your willpower has soared. Warrior's fighting spirit uncommon is extremely fierce. Warrior's fighting spirit has temporarily changed to indomitable will special. Indomitable will special has temporarily changed to indomitable fighting spirit rare. Your body has gone beyond its limits. His status window flashed. Direct's voice was heard. Kneel and place your forehead against the ground. He was smiling. There should be a banging sound. Then he'll safely return them. Ian's hand moved. He grabbed Direct's ankle. Your assimilation rate has risen. It is now 57%. Assimilation 58%. Assimilation 59%. Assimilation 65%. Assimilation 66%. Your assimilation rate has risen. It is now. 
Ian pulled at Derek's ankle. Derek stumbled at the sudden power. Ian stood up using all his might. The subordinate with his leg on Ian's back fell down. All the strength in Ian's body exploded as he aimed his left fist at Derek. Derek avoided it and aimed his knife at Ian. Ian leaned back. His body was light. He avoided Derek's knife. Every wound on Ian's body was screaming. The pain cleared Ian's spirit of any distractions. He desperately burned his power as he aimed at Derek's torso. This last-ditch struggle. Derek growled out as he stabbed Ian with his knife. The knife was stuck in Ian's side. His knees tried to buckle, but he gave strength to his legs and persisted. He gritted his teeth and moved. His goal wasn't Derek. Ian aimed at the face of the man holding Ray. Ian's fists flew at his face. A strike with all the power in his body. The opponent's body flew through the air. Ian caught Ray's body. He could feel a weapon aiming towards his back. Ian didn't care and threw Ray towards Hoyt. Run! Ray flew through the air and rolled across the floor. He got up and ran towards Hoyt. Ray burrowed himself into Hoyt's arms. Ian laughed at the sight. It was up to here. He had done what was needed. Then Derek kicked him onto the ground. Ian was trampled on many times by Derek and his men. Derek's attack contained a lot of anger, so it felt like Ian's breath stopped every time. Ian's vomited up blood. Derek didn't care and kicked Ian's head. Ian rolled across the ground. Derek stopped the beating and breathed out. Who, who? Ian grinned with his messed up face and asked, How is it Derek? I looked down on you. I apologize for that, but nothing has changed. Derek smiled like he was suppressing his anger and turned towards Hoyt. It is because my proposal is still valid. Hoyt, kneel. Otherwise, I will this or cruelly. I am very angry right now so my patience has fallen. Do it right now. Derek raised his knife. I said to bow down. Ian burst out laughing. Kokoko, Koko, Kuku, Kokoko. Koko, Ku, Koko. What is so funny? Ian cried out, Hoyt now you don't have to listen to this coward. Do you want to die? Derek, I won't die even if I die. What does that mean? Literally. Ian spat out blood and said. I received the curse of the stars. Even if I die, I will revive. I absolutely won't let Derek insult Hoyt. Kokoko. Derek glanced at Hoyt. Is that true, Hoyt? The curse of the stars so you're not afraid of death. Derek nodded. I will know once I you. He raised his knife. Ian smiled and closed his eyes. This was his first death in Elder Lord, but he wouldn't feel afraid if he could preserve the honor of a respectable warrior. Rather, he would gladly die. Just as Derek's blade was about to fall, Hoyt's voice was heard. Derek, stop. Ian opened his eyes. What is it? I will accept. Ho. Ian turned his head and screamed. Hoyt, what? Hoyt didn't look at Ian. His eyes were firm like there was nothing more to be said. Hoyt. Ian's face distorted. Despite his desperate look, Hoyt's knees started to slowly fold. Hoyt raised a fist. Then he saw Ian's messed up face and put his fist down. He slapped Ian's face instead. Jack. Quack. I'm disappointed in you. Ian couldn't accept it. I did what I wanted. Hoyt, I received the curse of the stars. I know. I'm not afraid of death. The fist came flying this time. Ian collapsed on the floor. Keep this in mind. Hoyt grabbed Ian's neck and lifted him. A tremendous power could be felt. The terrible face of the one-eyed Hoyt pushed close to him. An orc who isn't afraid of death can't become a warrior. Remember, young orc. Death can never beat life. The one who survives is strong. But. Do you know why the orcs are always asking if you are alive? Honor, freedom, struggle, they are only possible if you are alive. 
Enduring a little humiliation is nothing in order to live. Ian bowed his head. Elder Lord was a game to him, but Hoyt was a resident of Elder Lord. For him, life and death here was reality. Hoyt's hands were trembling as they grabbed Ian's neck. In front of survival, falling to my knees is nothing. I'm really sorry. Think about what real honor is. It is true that pride isn't real honor. I understand. No matter what, we have to survive. Ian nodded. Hoyt's true heart was revealed. The sunset caused the sky to look as if it were on fire. Ian carefully engraved Hoyt's harsh face, that received the glow, into his head. Hoyt's wild breathing, his careful eyes, and his voice that was discussing life made its way into Ian, making it impossible to tell if this world was a game or if it was reality. The sky in Elder Lord was no different from the sky in reality. Hoyt said, Thank you. I said this before, but I might think the same way if I were you. Hoyt smiled quietly. No Ian laughed despite the pressure on his throat. It was like the cliched plots that he disliked. By the way, how were my abilities? Derek was surprised. Kokoko. Nice. You should have seen his face. The two orcs burst out laughing. They talked for a while. Hoyt smiled before calming himself and asked with a solemn expression, I wanted to tell you one final thing. Death doesn't avoid you because you have been cursed by the stars. Rather, you must survive longer than others. What do you mean? You have to build up achievements in order to receive God's forgiveness, but death will cause those achievements to drop. If you don't receive forgiveness, then you will face a more severe pain and destruction than death. Those who are cursed by God, who keep dying without any fear of death, are eventually drawn into the abyss and punished for eternity. That can happen to you. Ian listened. He could see how the NPCs perceived the curse of the stars. If the story was real, then it really was a terrible curse. There is a reason why the curse of the stars is called a curse. I will keep that in mind. I will pray for you to escape the confines of it. A delicious smell was coming from inside Thompson's house. Thompson's wife, who had been informed of the encounter with Derek, cried with tears of gratefulness and regret. Ian and Hoyt desperately tried to calm her down. She was probably cooking for them. I'm looking forward to the meal. Yes. Ian and Hoyt turned towards the house. It was at that moment that a long shadow covered Ian and Hoyt. It was the shape of a person. Ian and Hoyt looked back at the same time. A man stood there. The owner of the shadow opened his mouth. What stupid orcs are standing in front of my house? Hoyt's eyes widened. The man standing there was wearing old and dirty clothes. The man laughed. Hoyt, in back. Thompson. Thompson had returned. Chapter, 17. Thompson walked towards Hoyt. One of his legs was limping, and one could easily guess what his journey had been like through his ragged clothing. Your face is still fearsome. You are still skinny like a dried anchovy. The two people looked at each other, numerous emotions flashing across their faces. Hoyt extended his fist. You are alive. Yes. Thompson looked at Hoyt's fist for a moment. His mouth twitched as he smiled and wiped at his face with his sleeves. His face twisted up in an unknown emotion. Thompson shook his head. His shoulders trembled. I'm alive. Thompson lifted his fist. A human fist was small compared to an orc's. The two fists touched. Tears flowed from Thompson's eyes. He tried to hold back his cries as he wrapped both hands around Hoyt's fist. Your family is well. Thank you. Thank you, Hoyt. The crybaby has returned. You you really. Thompson embraced Hoyt. I am sorry. And thank you. We are friends. Friends. Yes, my dear friend. The sunset spread above the heads of the human and orc hugging each other. Thompson cried for a while. The door of the house opened and a little boy stuck out his head. He discovered the figure of the man. The boy rubbed his eyes with doubt before running towards the man, crying aloud. 
the rest of the family inside the house came out and discovered Thompson's return. They rushed over to him in excitement. Ian nodded as he looked on from a distance. The two orcs and the human family had a warm dinner together. Derek leaned back in his chair. He had built a great fortune in the free city of Anail and reigned like a king in the underworld. Even the mayor of Anail couldn't face him head on. The man who entered Derek's room was trembling because he knew this fact. 100 gold. I will definitely pay you back. What about the collateral? If I sell my house. Derek picked up his dagger. The man jumped. Derek lowered the dagger and pierced a roach crawling on his desk. Copious amounts of blood and body fluids emerged from the twitching body until it fell silent. Derek pulled out his dagger, the fragmented body of the roach sliding off of it. The value of your house is a little lacking. I will pay it all back, even if I have to dedicate my life. You are also not enough. T then. Your family. Derek supported his chin on his folded hands. Once the deadline passes, the interest will double. If you can't pay the price, then I will take away some family members. That. Didn't you say that you would pay it back? Are you trying to cheat me? I'm not. Then the story is easy. You don't need to worry about what will happen since you will pay it all back. Isn't that right? I want you to solve the problem and pay me back. It is my sincere wish that our business with each other turns out well. Derek rang the notification bell on his desk. The door opened and a subordinate entered. He placed a pile of paperwork on the desk. Now, read this. It is as we promised. Sign it. I'm thinking. This won't be available later, it is now or never. Oh. Sign it right now. The man dropped his head. He scanned the doings. The contents were simple. Direct's money would be borrowed, the interest rate was stated, and the collateral set up. The collateral included his house, himself, and even his family. The man hesitated and Derek stretched out his hand for the doings. The man grabbed the papers, his eyes ablaze in fury. He gritted his teeth and signed his name and handed the doings over to Derek. Derek nodded. Derek and the man had now become the creditor and debtor. Then I wish you luck. The man accepted a duplicate copy of the paperwork. The handwriting on both copies lit up. The man held it in his trembling hands and walked out of Derek's room. Derek looked at his back and started thinking. The reason why Derek was able to accumulate wealth in a nail was simple. He created and executed a contract. That was all. He followed the agreement he signed with other people, regardless of his emotions. While others were emotionally distracted, Derek just followed the contents of the contract. He carried out the contract. If the other person broke it, then he would them and execute the rest of the contract. Senior. What is going on? Thompson has fulfilled his agreement. Derek's eyes widened. Ho. He has also paid all the added interest. Interesting. There was an accident, but he received a lucky chance because to that. The subordinate watched Derek, who nodded. Continue. Yes. On the way back, he encountered monsters attacking a group of dwarves and most of his upper-ranked personnel were injured helping them. Due to this, he returned late. However, it turned out that the dwarves were blacksmiths of the Golden Anvil. How dramatic. The Golden Anvil was a tribe with the best workmanship among the dexterous dwarves. They didn't give away their things easily. They were stubborn craftsmen who only conveyed goods to those they had a relationship with. Thanks to that, he made a deal with the Golden Anvil, and will earn large amounts of money in the future. What a funny story. Derek laughed. Benevolent Thompson, stupid Thompson. He was betrayed because of that trust, and due to this kindness in helping out the dwarves, his family was almost ruined. If it weren't for Hoyt, his family would have been destroyed while he was busy with the dwarves. However, thanks to that nature, Thompson helped both his family and the dwarves. In the end, didn't Thompson's kindness improve his quality of life? It might be the case now, but we don't know what will happen later. That's right, I don't know. Hoo hoo hoo. His subordinate removed the roach from his desk, 
cleaned the knife and asked. So, releasing Thompson will we do that? Derek nodded. The contract must be respected. Yes, then I will tell him. Good work. It is nothing. His subordinate left. Derek recalled what happened yesterday. Derek had met a lot of people in his life, and had come to a conclusion. People were all the same. They acted like they were different, but in the end, they were just greedy and selfish beings. These were variables that Derek could gauge. Despite all of this, Derek couldn't understand Hoyt and the warriors. Derek was interested for the first time. He wanted to see if their beliefs would bend. Would they have the same reaction as other humans? Would they be the same as the others or remain a warrior to the end? If so, what would they pay to keep that honor? Yesterday, he had seen Hoyt on his knees. But Derek didn't feel what he had expected. Rather, it had become more obscure. There was a young orc with Hoyt. The curse of the stars. There were a few cursed people on the continent. However, the number of those who were cursed by the stars kept increasing. Not long ago, a person cursed by the stars did a great job and his name became widely known, and the nobleman who sponsored him gained tremendous profits. Since then, other nobles and large figures started to pay attention to those who had been cursed by the stars. The young orc said he was cursed by the stars. Derek had a good feeling. He had felt one thing from the orc. A will that wouldn't break. An indomitable fighting spirit. Those with such spirits would eventually come to two ends. An early death or. A flourishing life. Derek muttered. The young orc would break early or become great. Derek was convinced. They were people he couldn't understand. He had dug into the rice paddy, and what he found wasn't the shabby grain that he had initially expected. Rather, Derek himself might be swallowed by the abyss. If that was the case. Investment. Derek had never taken risk she always made sure that there was a guarantee that benefited him. In no time, life had become boring, and he also got older. Now there was nothing unexpected in his life. The man who borrowed money earlier would run away, knowing that his house and family would end up in Derek's hands. The recovered amount would be 15% of the principal investment. I don't understand. For the first time in his life, he was gripped with the desire to take a risk and make a bet. Life is never known. ID like this. Isn't it too big? An orc should swing this type of sword. Hoyt and Ian brainstormed together as they looked over sewing on a piece of paper. It was a drawing of a weapon. In order to repay Hoyt and Ian, Thompson had offered to make them weapons. There weren't many merchants who could deal with the Golden Anvil blacksmiths, so few warriors used their weapons. Ian and Hoyt had the opportunity to obtain Golden Anvil weapons, thanks to Thompson. Hoyt drew a hammer that wasn't significantly different to the one he used in the past, but Ian thought of a huge greatsword that was much bigger compared to his previous one. Hoyt thought it was too big to be a sword. Are you really planning on this? Yes, I can feel it. A giant bayonet. At Orcrock's Fortress Hall of Fame, the great sword that Master of the Great Sword Lieutenant was holding was also this big. Then go with your gut. Kokokol. Hoyt sat on the sofa and sipped his tea. It was an expensive black tea brought back by Thompson. Thompson had succeeded in recovering his business and he was busy trading again. Every day, he rented a crystal ball from the blacksmith company and communicated with his former clients. Derek had backed away from Thompson. He was someone who only followed the contract. Ian didn't like this reputation either. Ian said, he is a villain. You never know when you might need him. Derek had handed Ian a business card, saying to come find him if Ian ever needed help. I will never approach a villain like him. Ian had cursed at the man who brought him the business card, but he, Derek's direct subordinate, just smiled in return. He'll never ask for his help. You don't know what will happen in the future. Hoyt just smiled. Ian asked, what will you do next? Thompson is back and the business with Derek is resolved, so I will go traveling again. Then, you're leaving the city soon. The time that he spent with Hoyt had flown by. It was hard to believe that it was almost time for them to separate. 
I plan to stay at Orcrox Fortress for a bit, so don't worry too much. Oh. I have sewing to tell Instructor Lennox. Even Hoyt had learned from Lennox, so just how old was Lennox? In addition, how strong was Lennox, to be able to maintain such spirit, despite the long passage of time? Ian felt admiration towards Lennox. Ian then once again became immersed in the drawing of his weapon. Suddenly, he received a whisper. It was from Grom. Grom Ian are you doing well? As soon as he read the message, Grom's sullen expression appeared in his head. Ian yes, I'm fine. How about you, Grom? Grom replied. Grom I. Grom well. Grom help me. Grom I'm scared. Ian heard that Grom had been hunting for goblins. Ian are the goblins that scary? Grom nope not the goblins. Grom replied. Grom the orc warriors. While Ian and Hoyt were watching the Thompson family, enjoying their leisure time. And envisioning their new weapons from the Golden Anvil craftsmen, Grom was pitifully rolling among the harsh orc warriors. Chapter, 18 A goblin stood in front of Grom. It had a small body, and a grumpy face that displayed an angry expression as it threw a stone at Grom. Ouch! The rock hit his shin and Grom jumped, grabbing his leg in pain. The goblin started throwing stones even harder. This! Grom raised his axe and ran towards the goblin. The goblin rushed away quickly. In the meantime, he kept throwing dirt and rocks back at Grom. Wait there! The goblin hid behind some thick bushes. Grom jumped over the bushes. Got you! As Grom landed on the ground, goblin surrounded him. Kayahak! Kayak! Kaya! Kayak! The goblins no longer held rocks. They held things like blunt axes, rusty swords, spears, and other weapons that seemed to have been stolen. The goblin who lured Grom into the crowd shot a nasty smile at him and threw a rock again. Grom was hit in the head and fell over. Detestable. Really detestable. He wanted to rush over and give it a good thrashing, but he was outnumbered. It was a group of goblins with over a dozen people. Grom fell back. Thud, thud. Someone touched Grom's back. He turned around to see a goblin holding a hand axe. He laughed. His rear was also dominated by goblins. Grom laughed awkwardly, Kolko. Grom was now able to laugh like an orc. However, he looked a bit subservient. The goblin raised his axe and started a slicing motion towards Grom's neck. His head would be cut off now if he didn't run away. As the goblin smiled mockingly, Grom felt a sense of deja vu. Sewing boiled up inside him. He was angry. It was really detestable. Yes, this emotion, it was like when someone told him off for being too loud in an internet cafe. It felt like that time, when he hit the reset button and ran away. Grom's axe flashed. Keek. The goblin's head was split apart. These kids. The goblins were astonished and simultaneously rushed towards Grom. Grom wielded his axe. There were goblins everywhere. He spun the axe around and around in order to survive. The goblins didn't dare approach the wildly spinning axe and retreated. It was his last hurrah, but it worked. Grom shouted as old memories flashed through his head. Whirlwind. Then messages popped up. Congratulations. You struggled to survive and have learned an hidden axe technique. You are like a terrible trolley car that spins round and round, destroying everything around you in its wake, no matter what. This is an attack that enemies can't deal with. All enemies will be unconditionally ed. A terrible massacre, a feast of blood is anticipated. The wild attack that will decimate everything. Oh my god. Grom's expression brightened. It was clear. A hidden piece. This was a hidden piece of Elder Lord, a hidden S. Overwhelming assault common has been acquired. Grom wobbled. The name was cool, but it was just an ordinary common grade S. As soon as he lost balance, the goblins charged towards Grom. Kiuk. He rolled and avoided their attacks, but his skull was soon smashed by a goblin's stone hammer. 
his head started spinning. He could see goblins raising their weapons out of the corner of his eye. This would be his first death since becoming an orc. Grom closed his eyes. At that moment, the earth started to shake. The goblins flinched. A thunderous sound hit their ears. Bull. Tar. Grom opened his eyes. Ten orc warriors came rushing like crazy. Their broad shoulders made it seem like they numbered in the dozens, or in the hundreds. They were like a runaway train as they swept through the goblins. The goblins' bodies flew through the air. Kayak. Kayak. Keek. The goblins started screaming and crying. With one assault, dozens of goblins were torn into rags. Kiyuk. Grom shrieked. The orc warriors didn't care as Grom fell down. You are in critical condition. Grom slumped down. The fight was over in a flash. The goblins were twitching on the ground. The orc warriors ed those goblins without mercy. Apprentice. Where are you? Are you alive? You. Grom got up. The faces of the warriors were visible. All of them looked fearsome. Their faces and bodies were full of tattoos, and they were covered with blood. They had relaxed gestures and an imposing walk. The real warriors recognized by Lennox. The warriors who found Grom laughed out loud, Coco Coco. You're alive, apprentice. Wonderful. You lured the goblins very well. Great talent. Pushovers who see other pushovers would want to catch them. The goblins truly have discerning eyes. They judged perfectly. They are perfect at judging pushovers. Kohaha. That's right. Grom had been acting as the pushover, or bait, all day. The goblins were very wary of orcs, but once they saw Grom, they would provoke him and pull him into a large crowd. Then the orc warriors would rush in to slaughter the group. As the bait, Grom had suffered and almost died many times. The goblins were too much, and he could barely resist for a minute every time. Then, once Grom was surrounded, the orc warriors would charge in and sweep up the goblins. This had happened several times already. The goblins would wither away due to the orc warriors from Orcrock's fortress. The warriors urged Grom to hurry. Then, he'll ask you to prepare new goblins again, apprentice. Grom shook his head. Warriors, I think it will be hard now. What do you mean? Goblins are also intelligent monsters. At this point, they might have noticed your strategy. HRMM. Besides, I have grown in the battles. I am different from before, I have become stronger. The goblins won't be able to easily mess with me. They have eyes. That's right. Grom had fought with the warriors. Although he almost died several times, he was able to accumulate s proficiency and achievement points. Furthermore, he had gained the overwhelming assault common s. The goblins wouldn't be able to defeat Grom, who was more powerful. That makes sense. Yes. That's right. But we don't know if we don't try one more time. I understand. However, it is a waste of time. Grom walked through the forest with the warriors behind him. He was different from before. He puffed out his chest and showed the attitude of a warrior. Now, Grom was a warrior who stood among the orcs. He was still an apprentice, but the goblins couldn't come near him. Keek. Keek. A goblin appeared before his thought finished. Keek. Keek. Grom felt resigned. The two goblins circled around Grom. They exchanged glances. Grom was able to guess their meaning. Pushover. A pushover. Resignation became anger. Grom cried out as anger rose in his body. His temper blazed fiercely towards the goblins. These guys. It was the S overwhelming assault. Kayakak, kayak. Kek. Kihek. Why did a pushover suddenly become like this? Let's see. Was it money? The goblins stepped back with surprise. Dozens of suddenly goblins emerged from the rocks. But Grom, who had become crazy, charged towards them without stopping his assault. He was like a runaway train. 
Bull tar. Then this corner. A video is the topic. Video of a video. A distilled version is given. It is like red ginseng extract. Oh, Jahan SSI. Don't you think red ginseng is too much? Ha ha ha. I'm sorry. I don't know because I have been taking red ginseng medicine lately. Distilled. Oh ho ho, who told you that it was good for you? It is a secret. Ah ha 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 ha. TL note red ginseng can be taken as an aphrodisiac and used to help with male erectile dysfunction. They are playing around. Eu shook her head. The atmosphere around the two of them is what wins viewers. What are they going to discuss? Eu was at Cafe Reason with her friend, Yun Bora. They were meeting for a group assignment. But as always, various accidents and illnesses occurred, meaning that only the two of them attended. The two of them quickly quit the task. They watched as the two hosts of Elder Road Times, Yu Yong and Jae Han, introduced the topic. The fourth video is a comedy in Elder Lord and will make your stomach hurt just watching it. It is a behind the scenes video of the militia leader, Kim Dok Wang. Isn't another name for Kim Dok Wang capitalist monster, a monster born from capitalism? Yes. He boasts exceptional role playing SS. Of course, he isn't just funny but also has great abilities. Now, then please watch. The door of Cafe Reason opened. It was Ian. He entered and discovered that EU was here. You came. Yes, Appa. Appa, hello. Ian smiled at Yun Bora's greeting. Hello. Bora SSI, right? Yes, you remembered. It's been a while. That's right. You must be busy. You should come here more often. Yes. EU elbowed Yun Bora. Why, what is it? Look at this. Ian also eyed the tablet. He was now an Elder Lord player. It was necessary to know the hot topics. Ha ha ha. That is really funny. Yes. Kukuk. My belly button has fallen off. Jahan SSI, please find my belly button. It is gone. Ha ha ha. Belly button. Yes, belly button. Find it. You'll find it after the recording. Please believe in me. Oh, impressive. Who? Ian shook his head. I'm sorry. Ha ha ha. This time, Yuvit Zerlani filmed a video that is very hot. Orc users, wake up. The force of an orc warrior. Let's feel it all together. Ian focused on the orc. What orc had done a wonderful job of spreading the taste of orcs to the ignorant humans. However, the scene was familiar. An orc quickly slaughtered three users. The face that looked into the air as he held his weapon was familiar. That was obviously. Today, I met three wicked people and ed them, implementing justice. Cough. Where are the people who know honor? See cough. Cough. Appa, what is it? No, that, cough. Cough. Did you swallow sewing the wrong way? He had choked with dismay. Eu gave some water to Ian. Ian sipped the water while calming his surprise. Ian was confused by the complicated emotions he felt as he listened to Eu and Yunbora talk about how cool and manly the orc was. Who filmed that? At that moment, the notification bell rang as the door to Cafe Reason opened. A woman entered. She was a considerable beauty. She walked in gracefully with expensive clothes that seemed to shine. Her hair was wavy, as if it was copper wire, and each sweep of her head was a seductive gesture that made the people who saw it tremble. Had a real celebrity appeared for a photo shoot? People who looked like bodyguards waited outside the door. No, they were bodyguards. Pretty you admired. The woman headed to the counter. Yes, what would you like to order? The part-time worker, Han Yori, asked. The boss, is he here? Eh. The boss? Yes, young Ian SSI. That boss, over there. Han Yori pointed to Ian. The woman turned slowly. She smiled as she found Ian. That face was familiar. 
On the other side, Ian recalled the name of the woman who cried out to him. Ji Hei Ssi. The beautiful woman, Ji Hei Ian, grinned. It was a bright smile, like a flower blooming in the spring. She walked over and held out a hand to Ian. It's been a while. I didn't know you would come find me like this. I thought I should go see my savior. Ian and Ji Hei Ian shook hands. Raven, no, is it young Ian Ssi? Ian smiled at the old name that reminded him of the past. Just call me Ian SSI. Yes, I will. No. I actually know a little bit about Ian SSI. Ah, uh, don't worry. I found out after that incident. That incident. Ian smiled wryly. Yes. She said, young Ian SSI is a little older than me. Ian ed his head. Indeed. So it makes sense. Ji Hei Ian smiled brightly again. Is it okay if I call you Appa? On Yu's side, there was a frozen silence. In this short meeting, Ian smiled again for a third time. Chapter, 19 Lennox looked at the two orcs in front of him. Now you look better. Ian laughed. He met Hoyt, learned what being an orc warrior meant, and grew as he fought against Derek. Grom also straightened his shoulders. He had defeated the goblins along with ten orc warriors. He experienced what a true warrior's battle was. He wasn't the old Grom any longer. Lennox asked, Are you satisfied? Ian and Grom both shook their heads. I'm not satisfied. Lennox nodded. Yes. Don't be satisfied. It had been a while, but Lennox hadn't changed. When Ian returned to Orcrock's fortress, the first thing he saw was Lennox grabbing the neck of an orc and lifting him. You are tired. You fell. You are now dead. If you were in the battlefield, then your neck would be pierced right now. Your urine would be soaking the ground. I would myself before being shamed like that. The orc really freaked out as Lennox raised his axe. Looking at that sight, Ian had felt like he had returned home for some reason. There's sewing you need to know before becoming a warrior. Lennox touched his chin. He seemed to be troubled. It was the first time they had seen him hesitate. It might be a little bit. Ian and Grom gulped. What would make instructor Lennox hesitate? Lennox eventually nodded. I'm going to believe in you. Belief. It was Lennox, not anyone else, who said that he believed in them. His chest became hot, a serious expression appearing on Ian's face. Lennox turned around. Ian and Grom followed him. They entered the Hall of Fame. The sound of their footsteps echoed off the stone walls. They passed by the statues of the great warriors. The torch lit up a dark tunnel. At the end of the tunnel was a large stone room. A single monument stood there. It was large enough that they had to look up to see the head. An ancient orc was carved on the monument. Ian couldn't understand what it meant. Lennox stared at it for a while. The torch scattered dark shadows over his face. Honor. Lennox whispered. His voice rang through the stone chamber. The laws of a warrior. Proof. It was an unknown story. Lennox read the ancient orc words carved into the monument. His gaze moved from the beginning to the end of the monument. Lennox turned around. His face was more solemn than they had ever seen it. Then he said, I don't like long explanations. Yes. Listen carefully. Lennox closed his eyes opened his mouth. Lennox's voice was softer than ever, but it sounded more vivid than Ian had ever heard it. It imprinted on him like a dream in an unforgettable manner. God, please acknowledge me. Ian never heard orcs talking about the gods. Now Lennox was whispering to God for the first time. Let us always hope that our honor won't be lonely. Let our weapons never decay. Listen to our oath, for we have established seven laws for you and the warrior descendants. God. Lennox's voice stopped. He opened his eyes. An intense light shone towards Ian and Grom. It felt like they couldn't breathe, and that their bodies were paralyzed. Then Lennox's voice rang not in their ears, but in their heads and in their spirits. 
I am an orc, a warrior. A warrior doesn't forsake faith. A warrior doesn't persecute the weak. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. A warrior doesn't yield to injustice. A warrior doesn't shame the gods. A warrior pays back any favors or vengeance. A warrior protects the powerless. I swear to the gods, I will abide by these laws as a warrior. Lennox lifted his axe. He looked up at it like it was a sacred object of trust and concluded his oath. Prove your honor. His voice stopped. Ian and Grom looked at Lennox blankly. Lennox smiled. He wielded his axe. The blow was invisible, like a gust of air. Ian and Grom's chests were torn apart. They couldn't even recognize the attack, let alone react to it. Blood flowed down. The skin he cut burned like it was on fire. The wound would become a scar. It would never go away. Lennox laughed quietly. It means to remember this clearly. Ian and Grom sat facing each other in a pub. They each had their own income from their respective missions. Ian received the quest reward from Stella, as well as from Thompson. In the case of Grom, he picked up the goblins' equipment and sold them to the blacksmith. The orc's beer, which was as strong as poison, entered their mouths. It's good to drink this. Cool. Grom just drank quietly. He wasn't usually like this. What happened? Nothing, just. Grom chewed on the jerky. Im absent minded because of what happened. Orcs are more than what I thought them to be, what the hell they seem to have depth. Ian nodded. The laws of a warrior it was tough to imagine as he thought about the rough orcs. Rather, it resembled the chivalry of medieval knights. Even Lennox's attitude was solemn as he recited the pledge. Ian could still hear that voice in his ears. Ian smiled and said, Don't you think that orcs are great? Grom shrugged. Well, I experienced things I never would have done if I had picked a different species. It's hard. That doesn't sound positive. In fact, I didn't start as an orc because I really wanted to be one. Grom hesitated. Ian nodded. It's possible. But if you work hard, then you will succeed someday. I might have been quiet if it weren't for you, Grom. Ha ha ha. I don't think so. Don't be sad and let's try it out. Sad. Grom repeated his words. Then he drank a lot of alcohol. Ian also drank from his cup. The two of them gulped down copious amounts of beer. Cool. Okay. Another orc sat down at their circular table, placing himself between Grom and Ian. Grom knew this face. Warrior. You're alive. My name is Golda. Apprentice. Kohaho. He bumped shoulders with Grom. It was one of the ten warriors who defeated with goblins with Grom, the warrior Golda. Golda looked at Ian. Are you also an apprentice? Kokoko. I see. I can't help thinking of my own apprenticeship when I see you. Did Golda learn from Lennox? Of course. Were you scared then? Of course. Anyone would be scared of Lennox. Kohaho. They laughed at the same time. But keep this in mind apprentices. Instructor Lennox is a scary mentor, but he is also a great warrior. You should be honored to receive his teachings. He stood up and shouted as he raised his beer glass. For the great warrior, Lennox. Bolter. All the orcs drinking in the pub shouted after him. Bolter. Bolter. The orcs downed their cups in one shot. An orc at the beer tap noticed the atmosphere and drank once again. Ian and Grom were swept away by the ambience and drank their beers a few times. The orcs started to sing. Even though the lyrics were odd, Ian and Grom clumsily sang along. We are orcs. The mighty orcs. You'll be in trouble if you mess with us. The great warriors have appeared, make way. Humans, get lost. Elves, get lost. Dwarves, get lost. Gnomes, get lost. Pretty women. Warriors have no need for a woman. Get lost. We are great orcs, great warriors. The oddest song lyrics. 
The female orcs changed the gender as they sang along. Golda, who was drunk on the atmosphere, stretched out and placed an arm around both Ian and Grom. Kohahaho. Now what was the mission that you received? In an instant, the pub became loud, forcing Ian to raise his voice. This is the mission that Instructor Lennox gave. Lennox had given them another mission after teaching them the laws of a warrior. That mission was the hardest one that they had received from Lennox. Work as a warrior. After telling them the warrior's oath, Lennox had given them the task of returning after working as a warrior. It was up to each person to decide what to do. Ian and Grom didn't know what to do. Oh. Golda had a complex expression on his face. Then he hit both of them on the back. Cook. Ouch. Congratulations to you. Orc apprentices. Very fast. Kohahaho. Golda laughed loudly. What are you talking about? This is the last gateway to becoming a warrior. Ian met Grom's eyes. Really? Yes. You received this mission very quickly. It seems like Instructor Lennox appreciates you a lot. They couldn't believe it. It was unbelievable to Ian and Grom that Lennox appreciated them, since he never praised them and always yelled at them. But Golda seemed sure of it. Apprentices, hey race to becoming warriors. Kohahaho. He celebrated with another shot of beer. Grom asked him, then, what is the work of a warrior? I don't know. You don't know. Apprentice. All warriors have their own honor. You'll need to find your own answers. It was like preparing for a job interview, only to find out that it was a personality interview after arriving. It wasn't a simple quest where they followed instructions. Grom asked him. What work did Gulda do to become a warrior? Me. Gul'dah's eyes became distant. I did a tremendous task to become a warrior. Oh. What is it? I used my halberd against Lennox. Ian and Grom's mouths dropped open. Warriors need to be strong. I challenged Lennox to prove my strength. I can't remember after swinging my halberd. Kohahaho. I was unconscious for a week. Since then, I can't count numbers and sometimes my hands tremble, but it's okay. Because I am a warrior. Ian and Grom felt more lost. The two exchanged glances. They would forget about the mission and just enjoy the rest of the day. Yes. Ian, Grom, and Golda. The trio swallowed their beer at the same time. Bolter. Chapter, 20. Ian followed Hoyt's advice and ventured alone out of Orcrox Fortress. Orc warriors weren't the only types of orcs present in Orcrox Fortress, so Hoyt advised Ian to look outside to find the answer. Heeding his advice, Ian decided to explore the wider world of Elder Lord, and find out what it was like to be a warrior. Ian headed west, since he had never been there before. The land of the farmers was to the south of Orcrox Fortress, while the free city of Anael was to the east. The west held Basque Village, where the shamans trained. Ian decided to visit Basque Village because he wanted to see the wise shaman Tashiquil. Ian moved without any difficulty, ing the occasional monster. Now none of the monsters around Orcrox Fortress were his opponents. Status Window Person Pursuing the Pinnacle Ian, Orc Apprentice Warrior Level 10 Achievement Point 610 Assimilation 63% Abilities Orc Superhuman Strength Uncommon Orc's Vitality Uncommon Orc's Greatsword Technique Uncommon Indomitable Will Special Mind's Eye Special In the meantime, both his level and achievement points increased. After fighting Derek, Warrior's Fighting Spirit was upgraded to the special ranked S, Indomitable Will. The proficiency of Orc's Greatsword Technique also increased. Mind's Eye has opened. Identifying the goblin. Target is weak. The poor goblin is afraid of you. Mind's eye showed information about the target. With it, he could grasp the target's emotions and strength, making the ability very useful. The goblin was overwhelmed by the atmosphere around Ian and abandoned his weapon. He then fell face down in the dirt. Kayak. Kayak. 
It was a gesture asking for forgiveness. Ian hesitated as he lifted his greatsword. He heard Lennox's solemn voice. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. He probably meant a situation like this. The goblin was begging Ian for mercy. If he struck the neck of the goblin, it would be a one-sided, not a battle. Ian didn't think that was the path of a warrior. As Ian hesitated, the goblin kept bowing. Kayak. The goblin tried to provoke extreme compassion in the other person. Its gestures and eyes were pitiful. In the end, Ian lowered his greatsword. Um. Kayak kayak. Rise. The goblin bowed deeper. Raise your head. Don't bow down on your knees. Keek. If you attack an orc again, then I won't forgive you. Keek. Keek. Be an honorable goblin. Bolter. Ian turned around. It was a dignified rear view. The goblin's eyes became wet. He was a goblin, a nasty monster who attacked the other person. He was a species that was always cursed and insulted. But the orc had told him to be an honorable goblin. The goblin felt an unknown emotion. Then the goblin rushed after Ian. Ha! Huh. The goblin pulled Ian's sleeve. Ian ed his head. It seemed like the goblin was trying to say sewing. The goblin pointed to him with his fingertips, then pointed to another place and made a walking motion. It was a gesture to follow him. The goblin feels favorable towards you. Mine's eyes gave him a positive answer. Ian nodded and followed the goblin. He didn't know what was going on, but he thought it would be interesting. He had previously heard from Grom that goblins were really nasty monsters. They attacked or mocked their opponent, provoking them and eventually leading them towards a large group armed with weapons. However, this goblin didn't seem like that. Ian walked alone with the goblin. A little further ahead, a small group of approximately ten goblins appeared. The goblins were sitting down and chewing on sewing. However, they became startled when they saw Ian. Kayak. 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 Keek. The small goblins jumped up and grabbed their weapons. Ian raised the palm of his hands to show he wasn't an enemy, but they didn't calm down. Keek. The goblin who led Ian to the goblins yelled at them. They seemed to talk about sewing, and then the weapons were put down. Ian walked into the group of goblins, who looked at him with a mixture of fear and curiosity. Among the crowd was a bearded goblin. Orc. Kayak. It is nice to meet you Kayak. Ian's eyes widened. The goblin used the official language. I am the elder of this group, Kayak. My name is Ian. Ian Kayak. Kayak stroked the head of the goblin that led Ian here. It seemed like the whole story had been described. Kayak beckoned. The goblins brought sewing to Ian. It was a huge chunk of beef. Thank you for showing mercy to my grandson Kayak. This is a sign of our appreciation Kayak. The goblins will treat you to a meal Kayak. Ian nodded. He wouldn't reject their hearts. In fact, the meat was well cooked so he started to salivate. Thank you. Ian sat down. The moment that he was about to take a bite from the beef. The goblins around Ian were staring at the beef with longing eyes. Ian stopped moving. The goblins were holding tree roots and grass, like they were poor. Ian was the only one holding well-cooked beef. Even Kayawak was just holding a big leaf. They looked like poor people starving due to a lack of food. Ian put down the beef that he was about to bite into. Then he drew his greatsword. The goblins were startled by the sudden movement of the blade. Ian's greatsword cut apart the beef, splitting it into exactly eleven pieces. It was the perfect distribution for Ian and the goblins. Ian gave it to the goblins without saying a word. The goblins accepted the beef with moist eyes. Kayawak seemed especially impressed as he shouted exuberantly. Kayak. Ian raised the beef. The goblins next to him also raised their meat. Ian placed the beef in his mouth and ate it all at once. The goblins also ate the beef with him. Ten goblins and one orc swallowed the beef. Munch. 
The goblins' eyes filled with tears as they ate the delicious beef. Ian admired how well it was cooked. It was a match for any restaurant steak. However, one piece of beef wasn't enough for an orc. The goblins handed out some grass and Ian filled his stomach with the vegetation. The goblins were hungry but they didn't eat that much because their bodies were small. Ian ate all of the grass that they left behind. Thank you for the meal. No kayak. We should thank you Keek. It is the first time that we've had an orc as a guest kayak. He shared a conversation with Kayawak. The goblins originally dwelled to the north of Orcrock's fortress, but there was a problem and the goblins recently started to head south. Not long ago, Grom had been given a goblin subjugation mission. The monsters in the north were rough and there were powerful mutants. Dire wolves became bigger and trolls became more oppressive. Ogres also popped up and attacked other monsters indiscriminately. We were forced to come down here kayak. Then it overlapped with the orc territory kayak. So we are moving further south kayak. The goblins were forced to go south. Sewing scary has obviously appeared in the north kayak. The orcs should pay attention keek. Hmm. The mutant werewolf popped into his head. The wolves had also come down from the north. Was there really sewing unusual happening in the north? The moment that Ian was about to ask Kayawak sewing. There was a sound. Sweek. Ian reflexively lifted his great sword and covered Kayawak. Chime. An arrow hit Ian's sword and fell down. Kayak. The goblins stared blankly. Then they raised their weapons in the direction that the arrow flew from. Ian turned his head. Oh, what is this? It was blocked. Did you feel guilty? What are you talking about? They were humans. Two men and one woman. The man aimed the arrow again. This time, the bow was aimed towards Ian. As soon as Ian raised his sword, the woman chanted a spell. Red flames that consume the world, rest on this arrow according to my will. Enchant fire. The arrow lit up and the man let go of the bowstring. The fire arrow flew towards Ian. Ian reflexively wielded his great sword. It hit the arrow but the fire broke out and hit Ian. Ugh. The fire was stuck to his body. Ian gritted his teeth and endured the burning pain. His status window sounded an alarm. At that moment, Kiowak extended both hands. Kiowa AK. Kiowa AK. Then an unknown force wrapped around Ian. The fire disappeared. The pain also went away and strength rose inside his body. What, a goblin mage? That incantation. Even dogs and cats are using magic these days. Ian raised his gaze. The three humans were having a leisurely conversation in front of the goblins and orcs. White stars shone on their forehead. They were users. Wait a minute. They stopped as the orc spoke, what is it? I am a user. Ian took off the blacksmith company's bandana that he was still wearing. A white star shone on Ian's forehead. Their eyes widened. What, an orc user? Orc. Really? Are you one of those orc users? That story was true. The man lowered his bow and said, Come out from there. Orc, get away from there. Let's get rid of those beggars. Ian turned his head. The goblins were trembling while holding their weapons. The tree roots and grass that they had been eating a moment ago were on the floor. Kayawak had a very determined expression on his face. Ian shook his head. Let the goblins go. Ha! Huh. They looked at each other. Why? Is it a quest? I know these goblins. Their expressions showed that they didn't understand. Ian spoke again. They are friends. Friends? Yes. He raised his great sword as an answer. It was a statement that he would attack if they didn't agree. The goblins watched Ian with impressed eyes. The users whispered among themselves. Doesn't he sound like a role player? Well anyway. I'd rather. They came to a conclusion and nodded. The female magician smiled and said, Orc. Then if we don't attack, can you tell us the way? 
the way. Yes. We have a quest but we don't know the orc territory. Where are you going? What was it, Basque? Basque village? We have to go that way. Ian was also heading there. He nodded. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. The users withdrew. Ian looked at Kayawak. It was earlier than he expected, but it was time to part. Ian Kayak, thank you Kayak. Thank you for the nice meal. It is nothing Keek. I hope we meet again someday Keek. Beware of the North Kayak. Ian extended his fist. Kayawak seemed to know the orc greeting as he bumped it with his small fist. The orc and goblin's fists hit. Stay alive. Alive Kayak. The goblins all waved. Ian parted with the goblins. A user asked, it looks like you really are friends with the goblins. When did you meet? Today. You are really sociable, to be befriending a goblin in one day. Why did you pick an orc? Just because. The magician had a lot to say. The men were an archer and a warrior holding a sword and shield. They looked like moderately high-level users. They originally lived in the city of humans, but they received a quest and came here. These big brothers came to help me. In order to acquire a magician's, I need to get sewing from an orc shaman. What? I don't know right now. It's a power that an orc shaman has and will fuse together to make a new s. Isn't it amazing? That's right. If I get this s, then I will have 10 ss. Hoo hoo. Orc, do you have a lot of ss? Isn't the orc a hard species to play as? As the female magician continued to chatter on, the archer asked from behind, Why are you talking so much? Geez, what's wrong with it? This is the first time I've seen an orc. Isn't it also your first time? That's correct. How long have you been an orc? What's your level? Ian answered honestly. Level 10. 10. You're still a beginner. I see, then it isn't too late. You can still reset. The tense men relaxed as Ian's level was revealed. Ian looked at the map that he obtained from Orcrox Fortress and guided them. The closer they got to Basque Village, the more the surroundings started to change. There were occasional animal skulls hanging from the lush trees and strange altars for magic rituals were everywhere. Crows cried out over their heads. It is vaguely eerie. The temperature in the forest was cool. The dense foliage didn't allow a lot of light to leak through. The sun soon started sinking. It became even darker. Sewing seemed to appear beyond the darkness of the dense forest. The female magician stopped talking. They walked quietly. After walking a while, a light could be seen. There was a log house with light coming from the windows. A strange black smoke rose from the chimney. They looked at each other. Here. It is dark and the path is hard to see. It would be good to rest here. Let's try it once. The house resembled Grant's log cabin. It was an orc home. Ian took the lead with the three human users following behind him. Ian knocked on the door. Please wait. A voice was heard from inside. The door opened and an orc appeared. He was wearing a necklace made of animal bones and animal skins, looking exactly like the shamans that Ian had seen in Orcrox's fortress. The orc said with a soft expression, You are alive, young warrior. He also greeted the three users behind Ian. You are alive, humans. He opened the door wide. It was as if he knew they were coming. I am the shaman Anchuak. Guests are always welcome. Chapter 21 Anchuak's house was cozy. Firewood burned in the fireplace, emitting warmth. Ian and the three human users sat at the table as Anchuak served them warm potato soup. The users hesitated at first, but started enthusiastically eating after trying the first spoonful. They ate the soup in silence for a while. Um. No one was able to open their mouths. Anchuak just smiled. Is there sewing that you want to ask? Well. Ian and the three human users looked at each other. At length, the female magician opened her mouth. It was the question that no one could utter. 
Over there is she sick. Her eyes were looking behind Anchuak. A female orc was lying on the bed. She was staring into the air with a blanket covering her neck. Even though she blinked occasionally, all she did was lie down and stare blankly into the air. She didn't respond at all when they had entered. Her eyes were gray as if the colors had faded away. Anchuak muttered with a wry smile. Bolter. Bolter. Ian's eyes widened. It was the orc's motto, but it gave off a different feeling from usual. It felt old. It was closer to the original pronunciation. Ian repeated it to himself. Bolter. She is my wife, Aruna. Heo. You are married. So why is she better than? The conversation between the orc and the magician created a strange gap, like an old historical man talking to a young contemporary student. She has been possessed by a different dimension. Ha! Huh. Aruna was a shaman like me. She was interested in other worlds. I warned her about the danger, but I couldn't stop her curiosity. Eventually, she completed the magic to look at other dimensions and cast it. It is sowing that our spirits can't afford to see. In the end, she lost consciousness in that other dimension. It was a story that was hard to believe. Everyone nodded. Now she is forever contemplating that world, forgetting who she is. It is an incomprehensible world are the laws that we know don't exist. I can only wait for her to come back. Anchuak rose and stood by Aruna. His rugged hand touched Aruna's cheek. She was still looking somewhere else. It has been only me and Aruna in this house for a long time, so I am glad that guests like you have come. Anchuak turned around and smiled. Yes. Travelers, why did you come to this place? The users looked at each other. Ian replied instead. They are heading for Basque Village to get some help from the orc shamans. It is a great thing that humans need help from us orcs. Antak looked at the staff that he had leaned against the wall. A surge of unknown power was coming from it. Us orcs were originally close to humans, until the past wars separated everything. I also had numerous human friends. Yes, humans. What help do you need? We. The users exchanged glances. The magician replied. In fact, I don't know yet. I just know that I will find out once I arrive in Basque Village. Is that so? Too bad. I hope that it works out. Anchuak gave more soup to the archer who had finished his bowl. The archer bowed his head and drank the soup again. Then what brings you here, young warrior? Anchuak looked at Ian. I'm not a warrior yet. You are the only one who can determine that. I am going to meet Tashaquil. Ho, Tashaquil. Why? I want to ask what a true warrior is. You are searching for the path of a warrior. Anchuak nodded. I hope you find the answer. Bolter. Thank you. Bolter. The magician, who was watching the conversation between the two orcs, got up. I've never been to an orc house before, so can I see it, orc shaman? Of course. There isn't much to see, though. All three users got up. Anchuak's house was wider than it looked from the outside. There were tools for magic, as well as the animal skulls that decorated the forest outside. The burning candles revealed the weird magical tools. The female magician asked Anchuak a variety of questions. Anchuak was kind enough to explain. The archer and human warrior followed behind Anchuak. Ian was left alone with Aruna. She was still staring at an unknown place. Somehow, he felt sorry. Please wake up. Your husband is waiting for you, Ian quietly whispered. It was at that moment. A long shadow quickly passed over the wall. Heok. There was also a small moan. Ian hurriedly turned around. Anchuak was sitting down. The edge of a blade protruded from his chest. The users were standing behind him. What is this? Ian immediately lifted his greatsword. The archer aimed at him. Ian hesitated. The female magician said in a youthful voice. Orc, thanks a lot. This was easily resolved because of you. What are you doing? 
What's the big deal? I came to the orcs to get A.S. You said you were seeking help from Basque Village. Ahayo. She murmured as fire appeared around her hands. What help? The orcs are helping me. If I obtain the heart of a shaman, then I can receive A.S. So don't blame me too much, yes. She giggled. The men also started laughing. Well, his wife is sick, so I guess he'll send her along with him. Is that okay? Kiakurunash. If she is left alone, then she would just die of starvation. The archer kicked the sword stuck in Anchuak's back. Cough. A monster pretending to be sewing else, how funny. His wife Aruna another dimension puha hat. I thought I was watching a historical drama. They spat on Anchuak's head. Ian's fists shook. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Anchuak was just an orc who loved his wife. An orc who was friendly to the guests and made good soup, Anchuak. An orc who knew how to pronounce Bolter in the traditional war, that was Anchuak. It was a short meeting, but Ian already knew three things about Anchuak. He still had some secrets of the world, and some philosophies that Ian wasn't familiar with. All of that was now collapsing, due to that sword. It was an insulting sight. The users mocked, are you mad? Play this game more moderately. It's like you are a real orc, instead of role-playing. You could have been a human or elf. Why did you choose an orc? Ian rushed forward angrily. The arrow flew towards him. Ugh. The archer's arrow was fast, and pierced Ian's thigh. Ian failed to win against the force and fell. Then the man kicked Ian in the face. Resisting is in vain. I don't want to you, but it can't be helped. Ill just you. Even a user. The female magician asked. What is an orc user? They are just mobs. Big brother, is it okay to a user? Isn't there a PK penalty? Elder Lord doesn't have anything like that. Is that so? Good. The woman giggled. Ian tried to stand up only to be kicked again. The woman chanted a spell. Sewing invisible restrained Ian. His strength fell. He couldn't move a single muscle. All he could do was collapse. He would manage somehow if it was a hand-to-hand -hand fight, but he couldn't resist magic. Ian was still too weak. Kihio Aruna. Anchuak's body was completely breaking down. The male archer and female magician searched until they found his heart. Then the warrior approached Aruna. He stared at her as she gazed towards a distant place and stabbed a dagger in her chest. Aruna kept staring at the distant place as blood poured from her mouth. Ian pushed strength to his entire body. Qua. He gritted his teeth and twisted. However, his body wouldn't budge. The arrow stuck in his thigh pressed painfully against him. Don't fight. It's over. The male archer smiled and pulled back his bowstring. The arrowhead pointed towards Ian's head. Ian gave a last hurrah. Qua. His body moved slightly. Quack. He stretched out his hand with all his strength. His body moved. Just a little, just a little more. What, does he have high magic resistance? An orc. Finish it quickly. The archer let go of the bowstring. The arrow pierced Ian's skull. His eyes dimmed as everything in front of him became blurry. Darker than black. He felt like he would sink forever. Death. The darkness blurred. He opened his eyes. An orc stood in front of him. The orc was standing at the door of a house. The orc looked towards Ian and said, You are alive, young warrior. Ian was standing he was standing in front of Anchuak's house. He could see the familiar scenery inside the house due to the slightly open door. A stove, the table, and a runa. Ian couldn't understand. The orc, Anchuak, was smiling in front of him. Why are you just standing there? What? Voices were heard from behind him. Orc, why are you staring blankly? Ian turned his head. The three human users were waiting behind Ian. The female magician's eyes were as round as a ball. Anchuak asked, young warrior, 
what did you see? See, what is he talking about? Ian couldn't say anything as he looked between Anchuak and the users. Anchuak had definitely fed them soup inside his house, and then the users had certainly Ed Anchuak, his wife, and Ian. This. Ian looked at Anchuak. He was smiling as if he knew what Ian was thinking. What will you do? Ian finally realized it. It was the truth revealed by the shaman Anchuak. The three users had used Ian to approach the shaman and to him for the shaman's heart. Ian opened his mouth, magician. The thing that you have to acquire. Yes. Is it a shaman's heart? Ah. Uh. They were stunned. The quick-witted warrior picked up a knife while the archer grabbed an arrow. However, Ian's greatsword was already swinging towards his goal. The magician's head flew into the air. W.W. what? They stepped back as Ian moved forward, swinging his greatsword. The warrior blocked with his shield. Ian used a downward blow. The warrior held up the shield, but collapsed as he was unable to overcome the shock. An arrow flew towards Ian. He leaned back to evade it. He stepped on the enemy's shield and jumped, the face of the archer approaching his blade. Ian's greatsword sliced through his head vertically. His upper body was split apart from top to bottom. The archer fell down like a doll split from the middle. Crazy. The warrior abandoned his weapons and shield and fled. Ian threw his greatsword, which flew through the air and stabbed the warrior in the back. Kuhik. The warrior fell forward. Ian walked over and pulled out his greatsword, his body twitching before falling still. Ian lifted his bloody greatsword. The man's body turned to white particles and collapsed. The other bodies of the users scattered as well. After the death process, only their equipment remained on the floor. Anchuak just watched all of this. Ian stood in front of Anchuak. Anchuak said with a soft smile, I am the shaman Anchuak. He opened the door wide. It was as if he knew they were coming. Guests are always welcome. Chapter 22 Anchuak welcomed Ian into his house like he had before. Aruna was lying in bed, staring into space. Ian and Anchuak sat facing each other. This reality didn't differ from the earlier illusion. He felt like he already had a long conversation with Anchuak. Ian was now eating the potato soup alone. Anchuak's attitude was also the same. You ed them all. Yes. You saw what they would do, but they hadn't even done it yet. He glanced around. It was at the very spot where the user stabbed Anchuak in the back. Ian formed a fist before releasing it. You don't regret it? Yes, I don't feel regret. Ian's expression was firm. Was it the right act as a warrior? I want to become a warrior, not a saint. I see. Anchuak nodded and beckoned, as if to eat the soup. Ian ate the soup. It was still delicious. You are stronger than I thought. I am relieved. He walked towards Aruna's bed. Her face moved. Ian jumped, but Aruna was still looking somewhere into the distance. Her gray eyes moved through the air. Anchuak stroked her face and asked, Are you going to visit Tashikwil? This will show you the way. Anchuak moved his finger. A faint ember emerged from his fingertip. It revolved in the air and approached Ian, moving around as if it had its own will. Ian stretched out his hand and the ember touched down on his finger. It wasn't hot. Anchuak said, I'd like to treat you some more, but there is no time. Ha! Huh. Go before it is too late. Too late. Tashikwil will know when you meet him. Anchuak was giving him an unknown smile. Ian didn't feel like Anchuak's words were light. Ian rose from his seat. He poured a second serving of potato soup into his bowl. The soup warmed his insides. Ian slurped up the soup and set down the empty bowl. It tasted better than he previously remembered. Ian gave a thumbs up. The best potato soup. The best is only that much. Anchuak laughed and shook his head. The best potato soup is actually the one that my wife makes. Ah. One day, I will invite you if my wife comes back. 
I want to show you what the best potato soup is. Ian smiled. Yes. I am looking forward to it. Tashiquil is waiting. Go. Anshuak gestured and the door opened by itself. A cool breeze blew in. It was still night outside the door. The ember danced around Ian's finger before flying to the door, as if it were beckoning him. Ian looked at Anchuak. He was unlikely to forget the serenely smiling Anchuak. I will stop by again. Stay alive. Stay alive. Bolter. Bolter. Ian left Anchuak's house. The ember was busy. Ian followed after the ember before looking back. There was nothing. It was just an empty clearing with moonlight shining. Nothing was there in the place where Anchuak's house had been. The log house with the warm light and smoke had disappeared. He looked forward again. The ember provided by Anchuak led the way for Ian, as if it had its own life. That ember, it was clearly Anchuak. Ian felt possessed by a ghost. He recalled his past memories. Anchuak definitely wasn't a lie. Ian would meet him again one day. Such a great shaman had told him to quickly meet Tashiquil. His message was clearly meaningful. Ian's footsteps became faster. Ian focused on following the ember, running through the dark forest for a long time. He burned through the orc stamina. Finally, he saw a light and some houses appeared in the distance. In addition, various tent-like structures were spread out. It was Basque village. The scenery of Basque village revealed under the moonlight was beautiful. Ian's speed increased. He could see orcs coming out of the entrance. Ian waved his hand to catch their attention. They came to a stop. I am alive. One of the orcs responded, I am alive. You are. I am an apprentice warrior, Ian. All of the orcs were shamans. At Ian's answer, an orc who was seeing them off came forward. The shamans moved out of the way for him. He was a shaman with a face full of tattoos and a striped hide around him that was clearly tiger skin. There was a huge skull hanging from his neck, but Ian didn't know what animal it came from. The force around him was incomparable to the other shamans in the vicinity. He felt like a giant mass of magic power. Ian instantly knew who he was. One of the great masters who led the orcs along with instructor Lennox, Tashiquil. I am alive. Young orc. I am alive. Are you Tashiquil? Indeed. Are you Ian, the apprentice warrior taught by Lennox? Yes, that's correct. What did you come here for? Ian tried to point to the ember that led him here. However, the ember was gone. It faded away, just like Anchuak's house. Once again, Ian was confused. Ian spoke the name like he wanted Tashiquil to acknowledge Anchuak's existence. Do you know the shaman Anchuak? Tashiquil's eyes shook. Where did you hear that name? I heard it from him. You met him. That's right. Anchuak told me to go to Tashiquil, and said that Tashiquil would be waiting for me. The emotions in Tashiquil's eyes deepened. The shamans who were about to leave Basque village told Tashiquil, Tashiquil, we will leave now. Wait a minute. Tashiquil turned towards Ian. Young orc. Anchuak told you to find me? Yes. He said to hurry. How long has it been since you left Orcrox fortress? It has been a couple of days. Tashiquil sighed. He shook his staff and arranged his thoughts. Then Tashiquil opened his mouth again, Kinger. Yes. Take this apprentice warrior with you. I understand. It was suddenly decided that Ian would accompany them. Judging by their actions, it seemed like there was no time to waste. Where are we going? Orcrox. What was happening at Orcrox that required such a large group to head there? Ian looked at the shamans. They were armed. Apart from magic staffs, melee weapons such as axes and swords hung from their backs. Inside the shaman's clothing was leather armor. Their eyes were also grim. They looked like soldiers heading towards a fight. There is no time to explain in detail. Just follow them. Ian nodded at Tashiquil's words. Tashiquil glanced at Kinger. 
Go now. Yes. I am going. Stay alive. Yes. See you all alive again. Kinjer shook his staff from the front of the group. An unknown force emerged from his staff. Waves of magic power moved around them. The bodies of the shamans trembled. Ian felt the waves of magic power penetrate his body. Power rose up inside him. His body was light, it felt like he could run towards the horizon right now. He could feel the wind brushing against his skin. A beast-like sound emerged from his mouth. Gur. The shaman's spirit magic. The shamans moved out, Ian also being one with them. Kinjer took the lead and the rest followed. It was like a group of wolves being led by the alpha wolf. They disappeared into the darkness of the forest. Tashiquil watched them leave. Silence fell. There was only the sound of his breathing as moonlight fell around him. He was locked in deep thoughts. He shook his staff out of habit, the magic power moving along with him. The moonlight covered his head. Anchuak. How long had it been since he heard that name? Tashiquil muttered, You are alive. His voice was wet. Were you alive, master? It was a said in a whisper. Suddenly, an ember appeared in the air. The ember revolved around Tashiquil's head. Tashiquil stared at it blankly. He stretched out his hand, but couldn't grab it. The ember danced in the air before merging with the sky. The ember gradually faded. As Tashiquil looked in front of him, the night sky soon turned bright. The shamans have arrived. Hoyt said. I see. Lennox was looking at his axe. A dry cloth was passed over the sharp axe. The clean surface shone brilliantly. A face could be seen in it. Lennox. Ian came back with the shamans. The apprentice? How interesting. Lennox turned his head and looked at Hoyt. Yes, what did you see? Do you think you will be a good warrior? I'm sure of it. Ho. He will be a real warrior. A real warrior. Lennox laughed loudly. He seemed cheerful. Hoyt, who is a real warrior to you? It is you, Lennox. Don't act like that. I am serious. Coco. A real warrior. Then the door opened. An orc entered Lennox's room. They asked, Are you really going? That's right. Don't be too hasty. It is now or it will be too late. It was Tanya, the administrator of Orcrox. She was responsible for the administration and operations of Orcrox Fortress. The enemy will just become stronger if we give them more time. Lennox explained. Who? I understand. Everybody is waiting for you. It'll be out soon. Thank you as always, Tanya. It was nothing. Tanya glanced at Hoyt then she left the room. Lennox looked at Hoyt again and said, we should take him. It is still too early. To be a warrior, he has to see the wide world. Lennox placed the axe on his back and grabbed the helmet hanging on the wall. It was a black, solid steel helmet. Lennox looked at it for a while. There were cuts and scratches everywhere due to its long history, but the skeleton was still strong. Lennox traced the helmet with his fingers before placing it on his head. Lennox's face couldn't be seen due to the shadow from the helmet. Only an intense light shone from within the helmet. Lennox smiled. I also want to see a true warrior. Chapter, 23 Ian arrived at Orcrox Fortress in an instant, thanks to the power of the shamans. The group entered Orcrox with a firm expression. The Orcrox warriors and shamans were already preparing for the campaign. Since dawn, the entire Orcrox fortress had been crowded. Ian was about to ask what was happening when he found a familiar face. It was Grom, who was surrounded by warriors and responding to sewing. The warriors questioned him for a while before leaving. Then Grom turned with a sigh. Ian went up to him. What is happening? Grom looked over with a startled expression. His eyes trembled. How, W.Y. are you here? I went to Basque village and met the shamans. Why are they doing this? Is a war happening? 
Grom avoided Ian's eyes. It's because of me. Ha. Huh. I be why chance he stuttered before sighing. Who? Let me explain. I found sewing strange. What? I went to the north. Grom started his long explanation. He headed north while struggling over how to act like a warrior. The north of Orcrox Fortress wasn't a place for apprentice warriors to go. Only the top rankers among the users could deal with the fearsome monsters there. Orcrox Fortress itself was built to block the monsters in the north. Grom was wandering haphazardly to the north and found Sewing Strange while running away from some trolls. It was a cave in a gap between two rocks, where he managed to hide. The trolls left because they couldn't find him, but Grom entered the cave due to his curiosity. He walked for a little bit and a wide space appeared. Torches were hanging on the walls. A human shadow stood there. The shape was human, but it wasn't a human. The light from the torch revealed the terrifying face of a rotting undead. Death Knight. The Death Knight whispered in an eerie voice. This is the place where e you can stand safely intruders should be. Grom turned and fled in terror. The Death Knight chased him and swung its sword, causing Grom to reflexively block it with his axe. Grom was thrown back by the tremendous power, but the Death Knight also rolled across the floor with Grom. The Death Knight's cold hand gripped Grom's shoulder. Grom was terrified and started to attack the arm with his axe. Once, twice, three times, many times. In the end, the Death Knight's wrist was cut off. Qua. The Death Knight screamed painfully, emitting a gut-wrenching wail that disturbed the soul. Grom frantically ran away. The Death Knight's shouts could be heard from behind him. He ran through the tunnel, out of the cave, and all the way back to Orcrock's fortress. He used all of his strength to avoid the trolls and goblins. Finally, he was able to breathe in front of the trustworthy guards of Orcrock's fortress. However, the faces of the guards were abnormal. Apprentice, what is that? Grom followed their gaze towards his shoulder. The Death Knight's rotting hand was still there. It held onto Grom's shoulder like it was still alive. As Grom became surprised, its grip became even stronger. The nails pierced Grom's shoulder. Grom screamed. The guards grasped the severity of the situation and informed Tanya and Lennox. They immediately decided on a subjugation mission. If a death knight was guarding the entrance, it meant that Sewing Stronger was inside the cave. Lennox guessed that it was a lich. The fact that a lich was located to the north of Orcrux meant that it was probably attempting evil magic. It was dangerous since there was enough dark power to still affect the hand, even after Grom escaped to Orcrux. Such an enemy had to be ed before it could accumulate more power as time passed. The decision was swift and the warriors gathered under Lennox's command. Thus, a raid was created with Grom as the guide. This is completely Ian said, isn't it a dungeon raid? A dungeon raid was called the Flower of Virtual Reality Games. Elder Lord was no exception. Raid videos were always a hot topic. Yes, but is Ian also going? I want to go. It will be dangerous, so you can just not go. Grom was somehow acting really negatively. Grom was someone who always rejoiced when the game progressed. Was the Death Knight that terrifying? As Ian was thinking this, Lennox and Hoyt appeared in front of the troops. There was also a female orc that Ian saw for the first time. She was Tanya, the administrator of Orcrox Fortress. Lennox looked around at the warriors and shamans. In a short amount of time, many orcs had gathered under Lennox's name. Ian was filled with expectation. Lennox would yell passionately and boost morale. Maybe there would even be slaps to wake up their spirits. But he was unexpectedly calm. Lennox walked forward and the area became quiet. Our goal is an undead dungeon. It is estimated that there will be a lich present, but I don't know what the risks are. The worst situation might happen. But. Every orc listened to Lennox. We have to do it. It was a low voice that was filled with a strong faith. The warriors nodded. Stay alive. The orcs raised their weapons, shouting simultaneously. Bolter. Shouts rang out through Orcrox fortress. 
Lennox nodded and led the way, the warriors and shamans following behind him. They formed units and a formation behind Lennox. Ian, who was at the back, suddenly caught Lennox's eyes. Apprentice. Yes. Ian was nervous. An apprentice warrior might not be useful, but he didn't want to miss this. Ian gazed at Lennox with earnest eyes. Lennox grinned. Don't fall behind and keep up. Ian also smiled at his words. Understood. Hoyt smiled from his position behind Lennox. Golda approached and hit Ian's back. The shaman Kinger blessed the whole unit. It was the first great battle since Ian first became an orc. There were fifty warriors and twenty shamans. Seventy orcs marched through the forest. Their burly shoulders and large size caused an intense momentum as Ian followed behind them. Grom guided Lennox to the place while Ian walked with the other warriors in the back. Golda stood shoulder to shoulder with Ian. Apprentice, is this your first time in a dungeon? Yes. It will be interesting. Kohahaho. He laughed with the halberd on his shoulder. Whether it was due to the power of the shamans or sowing else, an unknown force spread throughout the unit. The occasional monsters were swept away by the orc warriors like fallen leaves. The monsters in the north weren't at the level of goblins or dire wolves. From trolls, giant mantises, wandering wyverns, and worms emerging from the ground, there were powerful monsters that Ian would have fallen prey to if he were alone. But all the warriors, supported by the shaman magic, handled it easily. Lennox's axe was particularly terrifying. Not even the trolls could recover from his blows. The constantly smiling Golda was also awesome. As Ian was defending against a mantis, Golda ran over and cut off all of the mantis limbs with a laugh. The strength of the orc warriors was terrifying. They soon arrived at their destination. It was a rock located under a mountain ridge. There was a crevasse hidden behind rocks, but there was clearly a cave there. The shamans flinched as soon as they saw the cave. Such intense magic. Ian also felt a cold chill down his spine. Lennox spoke to Grom, who had guided them this far. Go in. Aren't you going in? I thought I was just guiding you up to here. It will be more dangerous if you are left alone. Lennox grabbed Grom's collar and entered first. The orcs followed one by one through the narrow entrance. Light from the shamans revealed the cave inside. The warriors and shamans walked in a line. Soon there was a wider tunnel. Their formations were set up again. There was evidence that someone had artificially created this area. The air was heavy. This was a dungeon. An uncomfortable feeling was stuck to Ian's body. Somehow, it was hard to move. Then the tunnel opened up into a wide space. Torches and crystals lit up the inside. There was the shadow of a human standing in the middle. That? It was the Death Knight that attacked Grom. The Death Knight lifted its sword. You orcs leave Ihiri. It was an eerie tone that seemed to rise from the abyss. Ian got goose bumps. Otherwise. A gruesome death will come eternal pain. A fearsome presence. A terrifying threat. Then Ian suddenly discovered sowing strange. The death knight took a step back as it threatened the orcs, but it wasn't noticeable in the creepy voice. The orcs were shaken. Not even feeling nervous after seeing these numbers it truly is a death knight. Oh when strong people die, they become death knights. How terrible. We can't lose. Quok I will fight even if it means death. Bolter. The death knight was getting more distant. It was subtly walking backwards towards a door. If this was left alone, it would get further away. Ian hurriedly picked up a stone and threw it at the death knight. Bam. It hit the death knight on the head. Rattle rattle. All eyes turned to Ian for a moment. The moment ended, but Ian shouted without hesitation. Catch it. The Death Knight turned around and started running. The orcs regained their spirits and chased it. Dozens of orcs chased a Death Knight through the cave one orc warrior threw his weapon. The axe turned round and round and struck the Death Knight. Cuckoo. The Death Knight fell to the ground. 
The orc surrounded it and the beating began. WW wait a minute. The death knight exclaimed. What, this can talk properly. Was it just an act? As the orcs beat it up even more, the death knight gave up resisting. Lennox approached and grabbed the death knight. Death knight, who is the one that summoned you? I can't answer. Piak. Talk properly. I, I can't tell you. If I speak, then I will be destroyed. When did you arrive here? It wasn't long ago. I was told to protect the entrance a week ago. How many more guys like you are there? When I was summoned, there were skeletons and gargoyles. There would be more now. There are also several other death knights. The lich? I, I can't say. Lennox struck the death knight, which rolled across the floor with a moan. Lennox looked over the wide space with a determined expression on his face. Strange. What do you mean? Death knights aren't this weak. Then. It's a trap. At the end of the wide space was a large door. Lennox approached it. The door moved. The firmly closed door started to slowly open, like a demon opening its gaping maw. The darkness meant that no one could see what was inside. However, it couldn't be avoided. Enter. From now on, there was no telling what dangers might be inside. Lennox took the lead and the orcs followed silently behind him. The hollow eyes of the Death Knight with its throat cut stared after them. Chapter, 24 The orc warriors passed through the giant door, which led into a deep tunnel. The true dungeon raid started. The first enemies they met was a group of skeletons at the very beginning of the tunnel. Bones were scattered here and there. There were skulls embedded in the walls, rib bones on the ground, thigh bones, and various other bones strewn about. The orcs passed them without thinking. However, soon the sound of bones moving could be heard. The orcs warily looked around. The bones were moving by themselves and assembling together. Dark magic power appeared between the bones to hold the dead bodies together. They became bony skeleton warriors. They were the poor undead who died, but couldn't rest and became the dolls of a necromancer. Ian raised his greatsword. The skeletons holding weapons started to walk forward. However, sewing else caught Ian's eyes. The other orcs became silent as they noticed it as well. Their hands were shaking. Ian also had a death grip on his greatsword. Those bones. They were revived orc skeletons. Among the human skeleton soldiers, orc skeleton soldiers approached with axes and halberds, their fragmented helmets sticking to their skulls. It was a miserable appearance without any honor. The furious orc warriors rushed out at the same time. The majestic magic of the shamans echoed throughout the cave. Ian also wielded his greatsword. The movements of the bony warriors were bizarre, but their strength and speed were fearsome. His sword bounced off the ribs of a human skeleton soldier while the skeleton soldier's sword aimed at Ian's neck. Ian ducked and swung his sword again. It hit with a loud clang, causing no damage to his opponent. At that moment, an unknown power nestled in Ian's body and his great sword shone with a blue light. A shaman's blessing. If this was the case, his attacks would now work. The blade slammed into the skeleton soldier and its arm was broken. The skeleton soldier reached out to Ian with its remaining hand. Ian stretched out his hand and grabbed it, his greatsword striking its skull. The skull cracked into pieces and its strength disappearing from the skeleton's hand. All contact between bones was lost as the skeleton soldier collapsed. One skeleton was taken care of. Ian wanted time to breathe, but another attack flew towards him. It was an orc skeleton soldier with its huge axe aimed at Ian's head. He ducked forward and narrowed the gap. Ian shouted as he swung his greatsword. The orc skeleton soldier avoided his attack and their weapons collided with each other. Ian wasn't a match when it came to a battle of strength. The muscular strength of the skeleton soldiers was of a different caliber, due to the dark magic. Ian couldn't push him away and was instead pushed back. In the moment that Ian was about to give up the battle of strength. Rest someone whispered. Ian raised his gaze. Give me rest. It was a faint whisper, like the wind. 
He didn't know if he actually heard it with his ears or if it was inside his head, but it gave him a ray of hope. The eyes of the orc skeleton soldier turned towards Ian. Soing was staring at him from the dark hollow where the eyes should have been. The orc skeleton soldier twisted his body, the axe tearing past Ian's arm. Blood splattered all over. Ugh. Red blood covered the face of the orc skeleton soldier. Warrior, for me, honorable rest. Ian's blood ran down the skull of the orc skeleton soldier. His blood, which fell on the orbital bones, was like the blood of the orc skeleton soldier. Ian nodded. Unknown emotions coursed through him. Ian didn't know much about Elder Lord. He didn't know what type of system it was, nor did he know the reality of Elder Lord. He didn't know about the artificial intelligence that caused their emotions to resemble humans. But to Ian, Elder Lord was another world. Everything that he encountered in Elder Lord seemed like it was living in reality. The orc warriors around him roared as they fought. Lennox's voice in the front encouraged the warriors. The solemn shamans recited spells for the undead orc warriors. In front of Ian, the orc skeleton soldier shed bitter tears as he asked for a honorable rest. If this wasn't real, then what was reality? Ian swung his great sword. He had to cut down this shame of the orcs. The shaman's spell was nestled in his blade, casting a blue glow over the face of the orc skeleton soldier. Lennox's shout rang through the tunnel. An honorable rest. Rest. Ian and all the orcs shouted at the same time. Ian and the orc skeleton soldier collided. Team leader Nim, the system is locked. What, again? It is in protect mode. What is it this time? This is a new situation. It says that access is temporarily unavailable due to system synchronization. Damn it. Park Jujin threw away the duance that he had been reading. He looked at the huge white structure floating in the center of the system control room. It was a smooth surface with no cracks or openings. This white sphere controlled all of the systems. No, that wasn't right. It was Elder Lord. That sphere was the world of Elder Lord itself. To be precise, it was the main core system, Albino, that computed and controlled everything in Elder Lord. Elder Lord was run by the core system Albino. Nobody knew what logic it operated on, what programs were built into it, and what exactly it was. This was all the legacy of the genius scientist Yu Jae-han. However, he disappeared. Today, there was no one who knew exactly what Albino was. Park Jujin, who inherited control as the genius after Yu Jae-han, just watched everything as the manager, not the controller. Those who were called operators and the affiliate of the Myongsong group called Elder Saga Corporation didn't understand what controlled Elder Lord. They could only use some surface cosmetic features. Yu Jae-han, that. Juji muttered the name of the man he was always following behind. It was no longer envy or jealousy. What did you do? Nobody knew how Elder Lord had achieved such a perfect virtual reality. The roughness of the previous generations of virtual reality games had all disappeared from Elder Lord. Even Park Jujin couldn't distinguish if it was the world real or virtual when he first connected. He couldn't fathom how it was created. The whole world was going crazy over Elder Lord, but the reality was that it was a mystery. Albino. Park Jujin said. Albino didn't answer. Albino, what is this situation? Albino was the system, but it wasn't under their control. Albino usually ignored their questions and only occasionally answered when it thought that they needed it. Albino stayed silent. Damn it. Park Jujin grabbed his head. It was at that moment. It is temporarily unavailable due to system user synchronization. Then Albino opened its mouth. Her voice was heard. Park Jujin looked at Albino's white body. The white system core replied with a distinctive female voice. A user's assimilation rate has temporarily exceeded 90%. For both the system and the user's protection, system access is temporarily blocked. Park Jujin's mouth dropped open. What? Park Jujin fixed his glasses. Confusion flashing across his eyes. Albino didn't say anything else. Park Jujin shouted, Okay, 
everybody get off the system and start monitoring. Why yes. Check out any user who has this ability. Find the user with an assimilation rate of over 90%. 90%. The number of personnel is lacking. Look for them. The high-level kids. Rankers. The ones who originally have a high assimilation rate. Find out if any of them are fighting or are in an urgent situation. Why yes. Now find them. At Park Jujin's shout, all of the people in the control room jumped up and ran out. Now only Albino and Park Jujin were left in the room. Park Jujin looked up at Albino. It was a white spherical machine. The system Albino was once again silent. As always, she seemed to be inside her own world. Park Jujin sighed and picked up the papers that he had thrown away earlier. The contents of the duant entered his eyes. Request form. The above VIP requests detailed information on whether this person is playing Elder Lord and what character he is playing. Park Jujin threw away the paper again. We can't do that. The orcs descended into the depths of the dungeon. All of them were reduced to silence. Among the various undead revived by the forces of darkness, such as zombies and dullahans, orcs were occasionally included. For orcs, the most important thing was life. Their very greeting involved the topic of life, and their motto, Bolter, was also about life. For that reason, death was even more sacred to them. Their lives had to be completed by their deaths. Now their dead brethren were being insulted by an evil magician. Cold anger filled the hearts of the orcs. Laughter subsided from the orcs' face and a sharp momentum filled them. The orcs thoroughly crushed the undead in order to give rest to their brethren. There were occasional injuries among the orc warriors. Ku. An orc warrior who had his arm cut off by an undead mantis sat down and groaned. The other warriors sprinkled potions on him and fixed the cut section. Finally, the shamans cast a spell of recovery. The wounded area was corrupted, so it was unknown as to how it would heal. Maybe he wouldn't be able to use his arm again. Lennox approached. Arctar, are you okay? I'm okay Lennox. Go back to the entrance and wait with the other warriors. I can still fight. I will keep fighting, even if I die here. Arctar. Lennox grabbed his shoulder. This isn't where you will die. Like you always said, it should be in a fair fight against a dragon. Kokokol. That's right. Believe in us and wait. I understand. I'm sorry Lennox. The wounded orc hugged Lennox and walked towards the entrance of the dungeon. The orcs who couldn't fight anymore would wait at the entrance where the death knight had been ed. There weren't any dead orcs yet, but their fighting power had already decreased by a third. And me too. Grom reached out to Lennox, showing off his injury. It wasn't a severe wound. Lennox's eyebrows went up. You are still able to fight. Well. Apprentice, believe in yourself. Why yes. Grom crumpled and returned. Ian asked Grom, are you okay? Ah, uh, yes. Yes. I saw you fighting well. Go until the end. Yes. Ian ed his head. As this dungeon raid progressed, Grom was acting strangely depressed. At first Ian thought that he was just scared of the Death Knight, but the Death Knight had been beaten up by the orcs. His mind just seemed to be elsewhere. Grom followed behind the orc warriors. Ian walked alongside Grom. Hoyt spoke from where he was standing in the front with Lennox, gather your strength. There isn't much left. The dungeon capture had just reached the final stage. They arrived at the end of the tunnel, coming before a huge, spooky door. There were three death knights standing in front of the door. They were different from the death knight at the entrance. A black haze was visible around them and dark energy was being exuded from them. The entire tunnel shook due to the dark power. Foolish orcs. It was obvious that they were much stronger than the previous death knight. The eerie whispers of two voices overlapped and spread out. The noise was loud enough to cause them to forget what they were thinking and gave them goosebumps. The Death Knights picked up their swords. Only three Death Knights. However, just one of them gave off an incomparable pressure. 
Ian forcibly controlled his muscles and headed to the front line. The orc warriors also raised their weapons, while the shaman started to chant spells. The death knights walked forward. Their legs moved, but with a strange gait, like their legs were slipping along the ground. They narrowed the distance in an instant thanks to that. The death knight's swords clashed with the orc warriors. The orcs were simultaneously thrown back. Ian avoided the body of an orc warrior and firmly grasped his greatsword, swinging it at a death knight. Strangely, his body was really light. The enemy's attack became really clear. At that moment, Ian didn't need anyone else's support. Ian's greatsword shot towards the death knight. Chapter, 25 Bolta The more accurate pronunciation was Bolter. It is a word familiar to the orcs in the present time. It seems that the R ending has been omitted, and has now become the present form, Bolta. The ancient orc word Bolter has both the most complex and subtle meanings. In universal terms, it refers to survival and life however, in contextual terms, it sometimes symbolizes the most important thing or sowing of high value that the orc must fulfill in life. It isn't easy to interpret this word in the continent's language, because it has a variety of meanings. In the case of the former, it is possible to replace the word with life and survival. However, the problem becomes more complicated in the latter meaning. This is because there is no word to describe it in the official language of the continent. It is a word that collectively refers to life, morality, goals, dreams, and the most important things in life. Understand this word is the most critical and difficult task when studying the culture and philosophy of the orcs. I have met countless orcs. As I moved among them, I could feel the true meaning of Bolter. Despite the gap between the two different languages, if there is a way to express it in our current language, then I would like to do so. In the ancient orc language, Bolter is life. Life is honor to the orcs. For them, life is the process of realizing honor, and honor is the sum of the most important values of their lives. This orc belief is solemn and religious. Therefore, Bolter is life, and is separate from the will of survival. Eliot de Pontian The Cultural Philosophy of Each Tribe's Ancient Language The orcs took the offensive against the Death Knights, Hoyt and Lennox dealing with one knight each. Only they could fight easily against the Death Knights. Lennox's axe split apart a Death Knight. Black smoke emerged from the Death Knight's body and healed the wound. The fight started up again. Ian regained his spirit. He thought that he had sliced the Death Knight, but his sword just bounced off. They truly were Death Knights. If so, how strong was the master of the dungeon, the one who controlled them? Lennox laughed in delight. It was a thunderous sound. At that moment, Lennox's body blazed with a white glow as his body moved at an unseen pace. The Death Knight was also covered by a black energy, becoming a dark figure. The two exchanged invisible attacks with only the spectacular flashes of light and a metallic clang as the two weapons collided a few dozen times in a few minutes. Ian's mouth dropped open. The darkness started to become diluted with light under Lennox's glorious axe. Every time his attack hit, a scream emerged from the mouth of the Death Knight. Hoyt also slammed his hammer down and the head of the Death Knight that he was facing was smashed apart. Darkness flowed from the wound, but it couldn't endure against the torrent of attacks. Hoyt's hammer slammed against the Death Knight's body several times. The remaining Death Knight collapsed under the attacks of all of the Orc warriors and their attacks that were blessed by the shamans. Kinjur shouted as he waved his staff, lightning striking the fallen Death Knight. The Death Knight got up for a final hurrah. Rushing towards the Orcs in a broken state. It was a threatening attack. The battle continued again, but in the end, it was the orcs' victory. The orcs took deep breaths. Another battle was imminent. Lennox had minor injuries while Hoyt sprinkled potions in his wounds. Other orcs moaned from their injuries. Golda approached and placed a hand on Ian's shoulder. His breathing was rough. However, he laughed excitedly as he panted. Kohahaho. Apprentice. Good fight. But he wasn't as wild as usual. Ian turned to him. Blood was flowing from a deep stab wound in Guldas's chest. Don't worry about it apprentice. But. This isn't enough to stop Golda. 
Kohaho. Gul'dah's eyes turn towards the huge door. The dirty undead S won't be able to stop me. Lennox organized the troops. Once again, a large number of orcs were unable to fight. For the first time, a few deaths occurred. The fight against the Death Knights was the most intense one. One of the Death Knights had even infiltrated the shamans and slaughtered them. The orcs closed their eyes at the bodies of the dead orcs. There was a short moment of silence. Another fight was imminent. After the battle, they would hold proper funerals for the honorable warriors. The wounded left, carrying their comrades' corpses on their backs. Now there were only a small number of orcs left. Lennox looked around. The warriors and shamans, including Ian and Grom, nodded. It was the final stage. Lennox pushed open the door. The huge door slowly opened with a strange sound. The door opened and revealed the shadow of a person. A magician with his back to them. He slowly turned around. Under his hood was the bizarre appearance of a rotting face that seemed to be holding on by force. Bones and rotten flesh could be seen through his robe. He discovered the orcs. Mocking laughter filled the air. Kuhuhu. In the end you came here, foolish orcs. Lich, don't interfere with the rest of the dead. Lennox stepped forward and lifted his axe. The person who goes against Providence will be quickly taken care of. You really don't know anything. The lich walked out. His appearance was fully revealed under the blazing torches. You orcs you are naive. The lich wasn't in a normal state. A blue glowing dagger was stabbed in his chest. The life vessel inside the heart was pierced and had a black glow around it. Anyway, I also I just being used. What does that mean? They will come soon. The lich laughed again. It was at that moment. Step. 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 Footsteps were heard. It wasn't the sound of one or two footsteps. It was the sound of many troops marching in unison. The orcs looked behind them. From the invisible end of the tunnel, fully armed human soldiers were moving towards them. It was an infantry unit wearing iron armor. They came through the front door. You were right, a human male who led the unit said. He wore a helmet with blue eyes shining from within it. It is easy to get the captain of the disgusting orcs here with a bait. The man burst out laughing. His laugh rang throughout the dungeon. The magician standing next to the man nodded. I told you, everything would go the way I planned. The magician looked at the orcs with pleased eyes and slowly took off the hood attached to the robe. He shook his sweaty hair off his face. A white star was revealed on his forehead. A magician user. The magician asked, how about it, isn't it like I said? It is accurate. There is a link between those who have been cursed by the stars. Communicating with the hidden spy is the easiest thing to do. Wonderful. I will remember this merit. Thank you. Ha ha ha. What were they talking about? Ian's eyes widened. It was a story that he didn't want to believe, but Ian clearly saw it. Grom was slowly moving towards them. The magician called out, Hey, Hyunchul. Come here. Good work buddy. Now I will push you forward. Grom ran and stood beside the humans. He looked down and avoided the gaze of the orcs. The magician user struck his shoulder. You were dependable as an orc. Are you still going to reset? Yes. I see. Good decision. I will raise you up in the clan. Thank you. Ian couldn't believe the sight in front of him. Grom had betrayed them. No, from the very beginning, his mission had been to infiltrate the orcs. Earl, I did as I promised. I will reward your group. Is the quest complete? Catching those guys will resolve it. In particular, it would be a huge achievement if we catch him. The magician's finger pointed towards Lennox. Quest. The instructor of the orc warriors at Orcrox Fortress. The great warrior Lennox. He was their goal. Defeat the orcs and Lennox. It was their quest, and Grom was the spy prepared for this quest. He became a warrior to gain Lennox's trust. 
The lich was just bait. Hey lich. You can go. Kuhuak. The magician user chanted a spell and the blue dagger fell out of the life vessel. The lich sat on the floor and recovered his breathing. The lich started to run. There was a small door near the lich. It opened the door and ran out. Ian's eyes shook. There was an escape route. They could run over there. Maybe he could buy some time. Ian went to Lennox. Lennox. Over there. But Lennox was looking elsewhere. Ian's eyes followed Lennox's gaze. There were familiar faces among the humans. Ah. He had forgotten. The wounded orcs. They were already beaten and had been dragged here. They were collapsed like corpses, except they were breathing. Bleeding marks showed the path that they were pulled. The earl kicked the face of the orc that was brought to the front. The orc's tusks flew through the air. Dirty orc s. Kill kill kill. Spags. His kicking continued. Die. Die. Ian turned back to Lennox. Lennox's eyes had sunk into his sockets. Ian was furious, but he opened his mouth to suggest that they flee. Apprentice, Lennox opened his mouth. Run that way. Ha. Huh. There might be troops waiting there, but I believe in you. Survive until the end and let Orcrox know what happened. Lennox. We will remain. Lennox raised his axe. The Orc warriors simultaneously lifted their weapons. It was ridiculous. The warriors were tired and wounded. The blood covering them didn't only belong to the enemy, and the difference in numbers was ridiculously huge. It was a battle between an egg and a rock. The orcs were about to collapse after the sheer number of battles. And the enemy was an army that was completely armed and hadn't lost any troops. Lennox. Ian gritted his teeth. They were different from Ian, they wouldn't rise again after dying. Their deaths were a complete end. But he could see that Lennox wouldn't listen to his words. As long as there were orc warriors among the humans, nobody would turn to flee. Then I will fight. Ian declared. I will fight with you. At that moment, Lennox pushed Ian. Ian rolled across the ground. He sat down and shook his head. Why? Don't make me laugh, apprentice. This isn't a fight that you can take part in, Lennox said. Golda nodded from where he was standing. Yes. Are you stupid? Don't get in the way, apprentice. Kohahaho. He removed his hand from his bleeding chest. That wasn't the end. It would be a waste to use my spells on you, apprentice. It was Kinger. The other orc warriors started to open their mouths. It seems like you are mistaken because we fought together a little bit, but you will just be an obstacle in the main fight. In fact, we couldn't fight properly before because of you. Go right now. Flee. Kokokol. Don't look too unsightly as you run away. Stop bothering Lennox and do as he says. Kokokol. Run quickly and don't get caught. I want to fight, so go right away. They were laughing. Tears filled Ian's eyes. They might be able to live if everyone would just run away. No matter how many died, maybe some would be able to live. But they would stay and fight until the end. Ian shouted towards Hoyt, Hoyt. What did you say? The most important thing is survival, life is the most important. Then he looked at Lennox. Lennox. You must live first. Isn't our slogan Bolter? He appealed to all the orcs. The orcs stared at Ian blankly. Then they looked at each other. Kook. Kukuk. The shoulders of one or two orcs started to shake. Puhaha. Kwahahaha. Kuhahaho. Kokokokol. Kokokokol. They all burst out laughing. The laughter of the orcs echoed throughout the dungeon. They laughed for a long time. Then the laughter stopped. Lennox stared at Ian with a smile on his face. Then he opened his mouth, apprentice. According to you, life is the most important thing. Yes. Then I'm going to ask. Lennox said, are you alive right now? 
Ian looked at him blankly. Are you living? What? He couldn't understand what Lennox was talking about. Are you alive right now? I am alive. Lennox asked, why? Why are you alive? Is it because you are breathing? Ah. Keep this in mind apprentice. Lennox smiled. All the orc warriors smiled at Ian. Lennox pointed his axe at Ian. In Ian's eyes, Lennox's laughing face overlapped with his axe. Lennox shouted, keep this in mind. Apprentice. It was just like Lennox was at the training grounds. Only this. You are breathing. But that doesn't mean you are living. It felt like his final teachings. Just because you aren't dead. That doesn't mean you are living. Ian finally realized it. The orc's greeting about whether a person was alive or not didn't ask about one's survival. Bolter wasn't just a cry for life. Lennox turned around. The orc warriors aimed their weapons at the humans with wide smiles on their faces. Lennox said, you don't understand this, making you not qualified to fight with us. So. At that moment, the warriors among the humans shouted and jumped up. It was a last hurrah. The ranks were disturbed. Get out now. Those were Lennox's last words. The orc warriors rushed in unison. Ian couldn't bear to look anymore. He jumped towards the emergency exit. The orcs shouted behind him. Bolter. Elder Lords Hercules' clan slaughtered a village and declared it their territory. What do you think about this? The OD was brutal but in the end, it is difficult to place an ethical standard because they are NPCs. Even other clans. Absolutely ridiculous. A man swallowed his whiskey. The bartender glanced at him as the man put down his glass. Stupid ass who don't even know what they are doing. It seems like you've had too much to drink. No, no. I am fine. You know me. The man nodded. He once again focused on the television screen. The topic had changed. How did Elder Saga Corporation implement such a perfect virtual reality? Let's see. It is due to the core system left behind by the genius scientist Yu Jae-han. There is no public announcement due to confidentiality reasons, but there is probably a tremendous amount of computing devices. A genius that we can't even fathom. The man looked down at his pint of whiskey. The clear surface showed the man's haggard face. He muttered, stupid ass what virtual reality? What computing devices? He swallowed his whiskey again. Don't make me laugh. He put down the cup and stared blankly into the air. All we know is that the core system called albino is what makes it possible. What? The man, Yu Jae-han, laughed. What did he hear? He stretched out his hand in the air. He was looking at sewing. He grabbed the air and muttered. A god you idiots. Chapter, 26. Ian disconnected. He went to the kitchen and drank cold water. It was dawn, so the apartment was quiet. He checked on Eu and went outside. There was a park next to the river. He walked along the promenade as the cold air chilled his body. He was confused. Lennox died. Hoyt died. Golda died. All of the great warriors that he had known had died. Even after disconnecting, these unknown feelings didn't disappear. The cold air didn't dissipate them. The NPCs in Elder Lord had an artificial intelligence. If their thoughts and emotions were merely flashing numbers and data in the form of electronic signals, weren't they like trapped human brains? He couldn't blame himself for being so immersed in the game. Lennox was Ian's mentor. Hoyt taught him about death. He learned a lot from them. They were more honest than the humans in the real world, more honorable and honest than anyone he had ever met. He could never be like them. Ian raised a hand to his face. It was confusing. He couldn't find the answer. Suddenly, he saw sewing in the distance. It was some children having a dispute. They looked like runaway teenagers. A group of high school students were beating another child for unknown reasons. The kid who was being beaten fell to the ground. Ian tried to pass by. 
he didn't want to get involved in anything unrelated to himself. The kids discovered Ian passing by and glared threateningly at him. Ian kept moving as he glanced at them with uncaring eyes. It was at that moment. Are you alive? Why? Is it because you are breathing? He recalled that voice. Ian stopped walking. His breathing became rough. Like a hallucination, Lennox's voice rang in his ears. You are breathing. That doesn't mean you are living. Ian turned his head. The runaway youths were talking to the kid. Hey, I told you to bring the money. Didn't you listen? Do I have to search for it? If you don't have money then sell your body, you mad woman. Why was the world filled with tiresome things like this? Many of the targets he ed had committed commonplace evil. Why did he put a bullet in their heads, regardless of the innocent or the wicked? If reality was filled with so much malice then why were heroes such as Lennox and Hoyt hiding? Bolter. Ian approached. The youths looked at Ian. There were two girls and five boys. He didn't know what they originally looked like since all of them had dyed hair and piercings. A large boy with yellow hair said, You should have just walked away instead of meddling in our business, mister. Your interference will be in vain. Another boy said. Ian decided not to talk with them. He struck the yellow-haired boy. Ian's foot hit his solar plexus. As the yellow-haired boy held his breath and bent over, Ian grabbed his head and tripped him, kicking him in the abdomen. Kiyuk. One person was overwhelmed in a short amount of time. The rest rushed at Ian. He used inertia to drop one to the ground. The back of the head was hit softly so that the kid wouldn't die. Then he responded to a low kick with another low kick. Their kicks hit each other at the same time. However, the other person was the one who collapsed in pain. The previous boy crawled across the ground and grabbed his legs. Ian kicked his abdomen. He avoided a flying fist and hit the person in the chin. The opponent's legs were twisted and he fell down. Now there was only one left. The remaining boy didn't dare attack alone. The girls trembled with open mouths. Ian gestured with his chin. The children understood the meaning and rushed over to their friends. They hurriedly lifted their stunned friends and ran away. Ian looked after them and longed for a cigarette. He had always smoked a cigarette after a battle. Ian stretched out his hand. Are you okay? The child who was beaten stared at him blankly. She looked at Ian's hand with hesitation from where she was sitting down. Thank you. She took Ian's hand. T thank you. Ian looked at the girl's condition. She would need to apply some ointment. Her lips were bleeding, but she was still pretty. Ian thought for a moment. Are you a student? Dropout. Your age? 18. She slightly moved backwards. It seemed like she suspected ulterior motives. Ian didn't care. This might be fate. Do you have a job? Ha. Huh. You, do you want a part-time job? Han Yori was in a bad mood. As a part-time worker at Cafe Reason, she believed that there was a partnership between her and the boss. But her boss betrayed her and hired a new part-timer without consulting her. It was even a woman. Not only that, she was a pretty girl who had dropped out of school. Excuse me Uni. Han Yori replied, yes. Did you originally do work like this? Of course. To be a barista, you need to be able to do at least this much. Still, there is a lot of writing. It's nothing. Ian left the training to Han Yori. For the time being, he was going to reduce the amount of time he worked at the cafe. Then he met a girl during his dawn walk. Han Yori would teach her well. Ian watched Elder Lord Times on his tablet. The last essence grade item has been sold at the Items Valley auction for a huge 100 million one. 100 million one is huge, but it isn't a surprise in Elder Lord. The record for the most high profile item at the Items Valley was 1 billion. Due to these things, the number of people viewing Elder Lord as a business has increased. Most of them are rankers. Rankers alone are paid a tremendous amount of money from Elder Saga Corporation, based on their achievement points. 
the so-called rankings were calculated using the achievement points. Their rank was decided by how many points they accumulated in Elder Lord, and Elder Saga Corporation paid a grant to the top rankers. Elder Saga's periodic deposits, item sales, sponsorship support, and the video royalty fees. Depending on their S level, they could also participate in broadcasts and advertising. Becoming a ranker in Elder Lord meant becoming a star. Rankers. Ian's eyes shone. That's right. Ian decided to work harder in Elder Lord. He currently didn't have any financial problems, but the more money he had, the better. Ian hired a student to work part-time in the cafe and he planned to earn extra income through Elder Lord. However, that didn't mean that he would become like the other players. This time, the role-playing militia leader, Kim Dokwang is with us. Hello. I am Kim Dokwang. Kim Dokwang SSI wanted to give an interview about Elder Lord. Yes. I am the militia leader, Kim Dokwang. I don't think of Elder Lord as a game. Does that mean you feel like Elder Lord is reality? Look at the NPCs. I spend all day with the NPCs, but I've never once felt awkward. I even thought about whether or not Elder Lord is a connection to another world. It is a fully implemented new world. I am worried about whether there will be any effect on reality in the future. I don't think that is the case. However, I am doing my best to become Kim Dokwang of Elder Lord. I'm enjoying the game. I have my own way. In that sense, I hate the term roleplay. I am sincere and it isn't just an act. Ian was able to understand the user called Kim Dokwang. He had lived with the Orc Warriors and became influenced by them. If Ian hadn't played Elder Lord, then Yu Suyin would be learning from Han Yori here. He would have left her and continued on his way, just like on the battlefield. Ian was deep in thought as he changed the channel. Hot videos were being played. Ian looked at the no. 1. Video. Uh. Ian's face stiffened and his hands started trembling. The name of the video was Boss Mob Raid, and the protagonist of the video was a face that Ian would never forget. The NPC was the boss mob of Orcrox Fortress, Lennox. The process of luring the legendary warrior from Orcrox and then ING him was completely filmed. The battle scene appeared. The Orc warriors rushed in unison. It was a terrible impact. Even though their numbers were much smaller, the Orc warriors slayed the human soldiers with fearful combat power. Lennox's angry assault in the front was unrivaled, sweeping away the humans like they were fallen leaves. However, the NPC called Earl came to the front and the orcs collapsed under the combined attacks from the magicians. The user shooting the video giggled. You have to use your heads, stupid orcs. Lennox glared at him, his cool gaze facing the camera. The hearts of those watching felt cold. Now, the Orcrox boss mob will die. Look. The person filming withdrew and the NPC Earl came forward. The Earl raised his sword. Lennox swung his axe at him. Both weapons hit each other. The fierce battle continued for a while. The movements were so fast that they weren't even visible. Eventually, the Earl was pushed back. Lennox kicked the Earl and the Earl fell down. The moment that Lennox's axe was about to descend. A knight stabbed Lennox in the back. The blade pierced through his body. Lennox gritted his teeth. He gathered his strength and tried to the Earl. Another knight stabbed Lennox. Kohuk. Blood poured out from Lennox's mouth. The humans continued to stab Lennox without stopping. Within a short time, Lennox was on his knees. Hoyt, Golda, Kinger and the numerous warriors collapsed from the human weapons. The user taking the video explained. The raid was successful. Simple right? It isn't difficult to use NPCs. Just use your heads during the quests. This was the raid video of the thawing Balhi clan, who are aiming to become the best in Elder Lord. Balhawiki Link. Then he captured the body of Lennox lying on the ground with his eyes still open. The word successful. Was edited onto the video and then it ended. The reaction was explosive. They praised the thawing Balhi clan for ING Lennox, who was thought to be impossible to defeat. 
they did sewing that foreign clans couldn't do, and were praised by the Koreans. There were a lot of opinions to eradicate the dirty orcs. Ian felt sewing churning inside him. He unconsciously struck the tablet with the palm of his hand. The screen was touched and the channel changed back. It was the Elder Lord Times interview with Kim Dokwang. Everyone who causes a dispute in the city, whether they are NPCs or users, will be equally arrested. I am a militia member before I am a user. In the process, many comedic scenes were produced. The thawing Balhi clan. He would remember that. He also had a picture of the users who didn't know about the situation and judged the good and evil in advance. Ian's life was peaceful. Ever since he left the military, he served guests at the cafe and spent his everyday life with EU. It was a continuation of a relaxing everyday life, rather than trying to achieve a goal. But now Ian had a job to do. God had decided to distort his face. He would show them what an orc warrior was. The voice of the militia leader, Kim Dokwang, continued flowing from the tablet. In any case, if a user or NPC does sewing wrong, then they should be arrested. There are no exceptions. Chapter, 27 Candles shone in the darkness. Tashiquil closed his eyes as he mumbled and recited an old language. The fires of the candles shook in accordance with his whispers. Ian was sitting in front of Tashiquil and listening to his voice. His mind was elevated, as if he were hypnotized. The spirit floated in the air beyond the constraints of the body. Artani moka dom de quaqua bolter misaterio disar quack kisame ilkson qfwfq. A bizarre echo shook Ian. Ian's spirit sank down into the depths as it followed Tashiquil's voice. At some point, Ian became surrounded by darkness. In the darkness, two lights turned towards Ian. Ian looked around. There were no candles, no Tashiquil, nothing. There were only two eyes staring at him in the darkness. Ian faced it. The moment that their eyes met, Ian felt like his soul was being sucked in, and formed a fist to resist it. He felt many minds converging endlessly. Ian gritted his teeth. At that moment, many lights appeared at once. Two, four, eight, sixteen pairs of eyes. Then dozens and hundreds of eyes gazed at Ian. Their outlines were revealed. Ian's eyes widened. It was the faces of the warriors. Ian spotted Liteno holding a great sword. He also saw Gloin with an axe. The great warriors from the Hall of Fame, and many other orc warriors were watching Ian. He then looked at the person closest to him. Lennox. Lennox whispered to Ian. Ian focused on listening to him. However, Lennox's voice was inaudible. Ian shook his head. Lennox smiled and spoke again. Ian still had no idea. Lennox nodded. Then Ian extended a fist. It was a rough hand covered with the wounds of battle. Ian's fist bumped into Lennox's heavy fist. At that moment, the world turned dark again. Ian opened his eyes. He was in front of Tashiquil. Tashiquil whispered, Young Orc, what are you seeking? Ian's head became blank. Only one word surfaced and filled his head. It was engraved into his mind. Honor. What do you want to achieve? Why do you walk the path of a warrior? Tashiquil looked at Ian, his two eyes staring deeply into Ian's soul. Ian couldn't move his body, he couldn't even part his lips. One word appeared in his head, and it was his only answer. His face and body became numb. Heat slammed into Ian. Ian's face distorted, but he endured the pain. He stared at Tashiquil without bending his waist. Tashiquil whispered. Then look into yourself. I am the Hawk of the North, the Blue Guardian of the Sunrise. The pale blue standard bearer who guides the shamans, Tashiquil. Warrior, who is beginning your long journey? What is your name? Ian tried to answer with his name. But his mouth didn't seem to move. Instead, a strange sound echoed through his mind. It was a word he had heard for the first time. Tashiquil stared into Ian's eyes. He smiled like he knew everything. All the lights went out. Remember that name. Tashiquil rose from his position. 
It was a ceremony that seemed to be over in an instant, but also felt like it took a long time. Ian couldn't guess how much time had passed. His whole body soaked with sweat. Tashiquil walked up to a window. That cloth that blocked the sun was removed. Sunlight entered Ian's eyes. The ceremony to become a warrior was over. Ian was now a warrior. Tashiquil gave sewing to Ian. It was a mirror. Ian looked at himself in the mirror. His appearance differed from before. The tattoos symbolizing an orc warrior ran from his face down to his body. He could feel an unknown power running through the tattoos towards the inside of his body. Tashiquil spoke, young warrior. He was in deep sorrow after the death of Lennox, but his eyes were still clear. Lennox might be the one who trained the warriors, but Tashiquil always conducted the ceremony that turned them into warriors. He was the guide who revealed the way. What is your name? At that point, a nostalgic voice came to mind. Become a warrior. Then you will receive a new name. So I won't remember your name. Ian replied. My name is. Lennox's voice rang in his ears. Become a warrior. The remains of the orc warriors were collected from the dungeon. Surprisingly, Hoyt survived. Hoyt had been found bloodied among the bodies of the other orc warriors. The orcs thought he was dead. But when they lifted his body to move it, they found that he was faintly breathing. He had collapsed and his mind still wasn't recovered. Even though he was alive, he was unconscious, and wouldn't be able to move for a while. According to the shamans, he wouldn't wake up for a while. The funeral for the warriors was solemnly held. Orcs from around the continent gathered as a last tribute to Lennox. Well-known orcs, those who lived in seclusion, and other legendary orcs appeared. The hunter Zankus, who shot down the sun, was the first to arrive. He was followed by the mountain smasher Kumarak, the abyss shaman Wallaqui, Anya the mad slaughterer and many other strong orcs. Those who came to express their condolences continued without end. The funeral hymns echoed around Orcrox. Lennox's steel helmet was left at the training grounds where he always yelled. He would watch over the warriors there forever. Status window. Person pursuing the pinnacle Ian, orc warrior. Level 16. Achievement points 2420. Assimilation 70% 1. Abilities. Orc warriors strength special. Orc warriors recovery special. Latino's greatsword technique rare. Indomitable fighting spirit rare. Mind's eye special. Tattoos of honor rare. There were a lot of changes. As soon as Ian escaped through the dungeon's emergency exit, he found the body of the lich. The soldiers left in the rear had ed the lich. Their blades turned towards Ian. However, Ian exerted an incredible power and ed them. He couldn't remember what happened but he had ended up covered in blood. He recalled seeing the message windows flash faintly as the assimilation rate rose. By the time he recovered his spirit, he was a bloody mess in front of Orcrox's fortress. His SS proficiency, level and achievement points had risen significantly. First, all his basic abilities had risen and Orc's greatsword technique had gone up two stages to become the rare grade Latino's greatsword technique. In addition, Tattoos were engraved after the warrior ceremony was over and the rare grade ability, Tattoos of Honor, was acquired. The exact abilities of this S were still unknown. Now Ian felt strong enough to be called a warrior. Ian had to leave Orcrox's fortress. His first goal was to find Thawing Balhi clan and the traitor Grom. The human magician had called him Hyunchal. They were now Ian's target. However, he was still lacking strength. He would leave Orcrox, build up his power, and pay them back. I will get revenge on the human Earl, Anya the Mad Slaughterer said. She was a berserk orc. Anya had a group of orc warriors who only followed her. All of them were bloodthirsty heirs like her. The mountain smasher Kumarak agreed. I will help. I don't need an oversized idiot like you. I'm not an idiot, Anya. Grung. They didn't know much about those who were cursed by the stars. So when Ian said that he would punish the traitor Grom, they doubted Ian's power. I wonder if a new warrior can do it. Tashikwil shook his head at the hunter Zankis question. 
he received Lennox's teachings and watched his last moments. He is qualified. Hmm. I will guarantee it. I understand. But Zankus smiled as he looked at Ian. I will hunt you down if you play stupid games. I can't trust a person who ran away alone. Zankus. Tashikwil barked but Ian nodded quietly. I understand. Everybody dealt with sorrow in their own way. All of them were orcs who had large or small debts to Lennox. It was determined that Hoyt would be the instructor after Lennox. After he recovered, he would take Lennox's place. That is, if Hoyt didn't refuse the position. After the others left, Tashikwil and Ian were left alone. Where will you go now? I will first stop at a nail. He had to meet Thompson in a nail. He had received a letter stating that the Golden Anvil clan had completed the greatsword. Ian was going to visit a nail first to recover it. In addition, there was someone else he had to see. Derek. Ian hated him, but decided to borrow his strength for the more important mission. He needed the help of an NPC who had power. I will track those guys until the end. Good luck. Tashikwil waved his staff. An unknown blessing filled Ian. Tashikwil has granted you an unknown power. The unidentified power will settle within your body. This? One day it will help you. Tashikwil smiled. When will you leave? Ian looked at the sky. The sun hadn't fallen yet. It was time to leave before Lennox's funeral was over. I'm going to leave now. So fast. It is like Lennox always said. Ian recalled his face. I can enjoy my life, or swing my weapon now. A bittersweet smile spread over Tashikwil's face. I will depart now. Then I wish you luck. Ian and Tashikwil bumped fists. He crossed the interior of Orcrox's fortress. It was in Orcrox's fortress where many things had happened. The exit of the fortress could be seen. When he first connected to Elder Lord, he never expected all this to happen. He just lightly enjoyed the game. But he met Lennox here. Grant and Hoyt as well. He met Anchuak, and then Tashikwil. Ian grew even further through his relationship with them. They had great spirits that were worthy of respect. As soon as Ian left Orcrox's fortress, familiar faces welcomed him. Hey, are you alive? I am alive. The guards of Orcrox's fortress. They were the orcs whom he had first met. They still guarded Orcrox's fortress like stone statues. You are finally a warrior. Yes. It feels like it was just a while ago that you acted like a newbie here. Now you look like a warrior. Kokol Kokol. They burst out laughing. Ian also laughed. They glanced at each other before saying to Ian. Well. Now it is time to ask you. They extended their fists side by side. Young warrior leaving Orcrox. The guards had never once asked for Ian's name. Lennox was also the same. He finally realized the reason why. At that time, Ian had no name. But now that he was a warrior, Ian had a name that he could tell them. He took a deep breath before replying. Crocta. They nodded. It was a farewell. Crocta bumped fists with them. One. For those wondering why this isn't over 90%, Albino did say that his was just temporary. Chapter, 28 The orc farmers gathered at the home of Agra, the spiritual pillar of the orc farmers. It was a meeting to resolve the present problem. Many orc farmers had left their homes for Lennox's funeral, and the ones who returned were greeted with messed up fields and broken farm equipment. Some orcs left in the village were either injured or ed. They figured it out. The farmers were engulfed with fear after realizing that it was back. The return of the mutant werewolf. Grant, who was once a warrior, had remained in Orcrox to protect Lennox for a certain amount of time after death. The remaining orc farmers were unable to cope with the brutal attacks of the mutant werewolf. His group wasn't made up of just wolves anymore, but a bunch of dire wolves that had come down from the north. The orc farmers struggled to get rid of them. However, the number of casualties increased in the guerrilla warfare against the wolves. It was a crisis. 
If this continues, then it will be the end. We need to request help from the Orc warriors at Orcrox. But this area has already been taken over by them. Anyone who tries to leave will be attacked. If all of us go out together. The children. We can't leave the children alone. It will be more dangerous to take the children. Then what should we do? At this time. Due to Lennox's funeral, there were no warriors passing by. The orc farmers sighed. As they gathered and tried to seek answers, the wolves were conducting a raid. Help. Help me. This voice. It was the voice of a young orc child. The orc farmers looked out the window. A young orc was being chased by the wolves. He was staggering and bleeding from where he had been bitten several times on his legs. This. Big dire wolves were chasing behind the little orc. Their angry teeth were only minutes away from tearing into the child. The orc farmers ran out the door without hesitation. But it was a trap. As the orc farmers ran out to save the child, a large number of dire wolves emerged from the bushes and rocks. A wolf who was especially large looked at them and laughed. Dirty orc s today I will eat all of you. The wolf spoke. His face was marked with a long scar. It was the old mutant wolf that had been attacked by Grant. He returned even stronger. Bigger and smarter. He returned to the north and brought back not just wolves, but dire wolves as well. The orcs gritted their teeth. They might all die. They looked back. The little orcs left in Agra's house were peeking out of a gap in the door with frightened faces. Close the door and hide. The farmers picked up some farming equipment and weapons. They glared at the werewolf as the wolves gradually surrounded them. The farmers didn't know how to fight, but they were still orcs. The mutant werewolf looked at them and chuckled at the sight, like it was funny. Then he bit the young orc that had been chased. Aak. The farmers were furious. Let that child go. Kukukuku. The child slumped down as blood flowed from the bite on their arm. They had lost consciousness from the shock. The orc's hand started shaking. Don't be mad. You will follow soon. The mutant werewolf laughed at the body of the young orc on the ground. Then he howled towards the sky. A woo. A woo. The mutant werewolf's body started changing. His muscles swelled like balloons. His front legs rose up, hind legs became stronger and his back straightened. The larger wolf laughed as he looked down at the orcs. A huge bipedal werewolf. Today I will eat orc meat. Tea that. Don't worry. Young meat tastes better. Cuckoo. This. The orc farmers raised their weapons. They trembled as they glared at the werewolf. The werewolf yelled. Pounce. The wolves and the mutant werewolf plunged in at the same time. The orcs also rushed to their deaths. The farmers had to protect the children behind them. It was their reason for fighting. The mutant werewolf waved his huge paws. The orcs looked like children in front of his huge size. Blade-like claws. The orcs at the front would be swept away at once. The orcs in range closed their eyes. It was at that moment. The werewolf suddenly bounced back. Yip. The mutant werewolf got tangled up with the other wolves as he rolled across the ground. Yip. It was a blank face that didn't know what was going on. The werewolf tried to get up, but staggered and fell back down. Yip yip. The orc farmer's eyes widened. Between them and the group of wolves, a single orc was standing. Oh. The farmer's faces brightened as they confirmed the appearance of the orc. A burly and muscular body. Tattoos covering his face and torso, with a huge greatsword hanging from his back. An imposing atmosphere that caused the wolves to shrink back. It was the appearance of a brave orc warrior. A warrior. Oh. A warrior. The orc warrior looked between the farmers to the body of the young orc on the ground. Then he raised his greatsword. I smelled dogs and came running. He walked towards the mutant werewolf who still hadn't understood the situation. The dog is back. Yu Yu. I'm glad to see you before I leave. 
Yeek! The mutant werewolf rushed towards the orc warrior. The orc warrior moved and cut downwards on the werewolf's body. The werewolf screamed from the blow, his blood spilling onto the earth. Kuhik! Attack! Attack! The dire wolves simultaneously charged at the orc warrior. Dozens of wolves were jumping at one orc, so it seemed dangerous. The orc farmers grabbed their farm equipment and prepared to help him. The orc warrior swung his great sword. The dire wolves in the front fell down, bleeding profusely. However, there were still dozens of wolves. The wolves surrounded him in an instant. The warrior's appearance was hidden from view. T that. It was a sight that made the farmer's hands sweat. At that moment, a light sparkled from among the wolves. Sikiak. Blood splattered from the wolves in turn as the wolves collapsed. The last wolf was pierced by the orc warrior's sword. Yip. The orc warrior's great sword thrust into the belly of a dire wolf. Yip. The orc warrior pushed off the body of the dead wolf and pulled out his great sword. The dire wolves were terrified and didn't dare resist. The mutant werewolf that was stumbling behind them yelled frantically, Attack! In telling you to attack! But the dire wolves had already lost their fighting spirit. The mutant werewolf bared his gums with rage. These wimpy guys! The orc warrior extended his hand and raised it. You, come! It was a gesture of provocation. But the mutant werewolf hovered around and didn't dare to attack. The orc warrior took one step closer and the werewolf took one step back. Good dirty orc. Don't lose your fur, mutant born from nature's mistake. The orc warrior nudged the mutant werewolf's sore spot. The eyes of the werewolf became upset as he rushed out with his claws raised. Kakang. The great sword and claws clashed. The blade of the great sword was scratched. I am a mistake. You are nature's cancer, orc. The orc warrior's muscles swelled. He was fighting against a werewolf much bigger than him, but he wasn't pushed back at all. Rather, he overwhelmed the werewolf. The werewolf suddenly withdrew and slashed out with his claws. He was aiming for the gap where the orc warrior staggered after losing against the force that he was resisting. However, the orc warrior rolled and escaped from the werewolf's attack range. The werewolf's claws slashed through empty air. The orc warrior stabbed his great sword in that gap of defense. The werewolf stepped back and avoided the attack. The orc warrior's great sword slashed at the werewolf's body several times. The mutant werewolf's wounds increased. Cuck. Kuhik. All of the dire wolves had already fled. Now the mutant werewolf was alone. The mutant werewolf looked around. The orc farmers were standing with their farm equipment and now he was the one being surrounded. He wanted to run away, but couldn't because of a deep stab wound on his leg. Gur. Dirty orc s. The mutant werewolf's eyes shone. Qua. Using the last of his strength, he turned and ran towards the orc farmers. His massive body made him seem like a bull charging. Sharp teeth flashed from his open mouth. An urgent situation. It was at that moment. Rattle. The frightened orc farmers saw a blade protruding. The mutant werewolf stopped moving. The great sword had pierced the werewolf's back, the thick blade emerged from his chest. The werewolf's blood flowed down the blade. The werewolf flopped down. GRRGGR. His head dropped. It was the end of the mutant werewolf, who terrorized the orc farmers. The orc warrior retrieved his great sword. The body of the mutant werewolf fell down. Then, let's live. The orc warrior bowed his head before placing the big sword back on his back, as if nothing big had happened. He started to head back the way he came. His steps were heading eastward. The farmers watched with stunned gazes. Then the old orc farmer, Agra, called out to the orc warrior. Excuse me warrior. The orc warrior turned his head. Really, we really thank you. Please let us know your name. He replied. Crocta. Crocta. A nice name. The warrior Crocta smiled. He nodded slightly before moving towards the east again. 
The orc farmers blessed his way. Thompson handed him the weapon. The orc warrior, once called Ian, was now called Crocta. The person who was once an apprentice warrior now had a strong atmosphere that felt like Hoyt. Here is your sword. This. Thompson had been very worried after hearing about Lennox's death, but he was relieved to know that Hoyt had survived. He said he would go to Orcrox to visit Hoyt as soon as all his work was cleaned up. Can you lift it? While the new greatsword was much bigger and heavier than the previous one, Crocta had also become stronger. He thought that this was the right weapon for him. The moment he lifted the greatsword in his hand, he felt sewing snap in place. Just by holding it, he could imagine how this sword moved and how it could cut down the enemy. It is really great. It suits you. Thank you. Ogre Slayer Essence. The great sword created by the Golden Anvil clan for their lifesaver, Thompson. It was designed for a strong orc warrior. A very small amount of adamantium is mixed in with an ogre's flesh and blood. It was an essence grade item. An essence grade item was a high end produce that would be worth millions of one in reality. It looked like an ordinary great sword, but only those with great eyes would be able to see its value. Thompson smiled as he saw Crocta's facial expression. For my benefactor, this much is nothing. Thank you very much. Ill use it well. Here is the sheath. Yes. Crocta placed it in the sheath on his back. He felt a great weight on his shoulders when he carried the sword. It felt good. I really like it. I'm glad you like it. He looked at the hammer hanging on the wall with a bittersweet expression. I wish that Hoyt would be happy to receive that. He will surely be pleased. Hoyt will he wake up. Hoyt hadn't regained consciousness yet, but it would surely happen. Crocta nodded. Yes. He will rise up and become the new instructor at Orcrox. That would be nice. I can often go and visit him. Thompson smiled. He started his own company, Thompson's Trading Company. It was still early, but on the basis of his relationship with the Golden Anvil clan, he would be able to rise up quickly to even threaten the position of the blacksmith company in a nail. At that moment, Thompson's secretary poked his head in. Boss Thompson. Uh, what is it? A guest has come. Who? It isn't for boss but your guest he looked at Crocta. It seemed like the secretary was still unfamiliar with orcs. My guest? Crocta was confused. Gesta, excuse me, you can't come in here. The door was swung wide open. A face that was familiar to Crocta could be seen. Hayu. You have become tougher, orc. It was the subordinate who handed Direk's business card to Crocta. Chapter, 29. Direk's residence was very luxurious compared to the other houses in Anale. The flowers and the trees in the garden were placed with great harmony. Fish freely swam in the pond. It had been created with a human's touch, but it looked natural and beautiful. In the center of all this scenery was Derek, who was sitting at a table, sipping tea. Crocta thought that it was a bizarre sight. The images of the leader of the underworld and a noble enjoying tea time just didn't seem to fit together. Derek smiled, as if he knew what Crocta was thinking. Young man, what is your taste? Taste? Yes, taste. Your own sense of beauty. Sit. Crocta sat down across from Derek. Derek said, I am sure about my taste. For example, I think there shouldn't be anything else over there. It should just be all yellow tulips. Derek pointed towards where yellow tulips were planted among grass. There should be thirteen fish in the pond. No more and no less. I am thorough in these types of things. These tastes combine together to make Derek. And one of those tastes is that the agreed-upon contract must be kept. I won't forgive anyone who breaks it. Thanks to that, I was able to gain wealth and power. What do you want to say? My taste has fallen. Derek laughed. Crocta couldn't understand what he was talking about. There are problems that I can't solve. I can't change the sky, just because I don't like the sun. Then use a parasol. That's right. I can't help using a parasol, so it must be part of my tastes. As I said earlier, 
I am very thorough about my tastes. Derek extended a piece of paper towards Crocta. Let me understand this. It was a contract. Crocta looked through the information. You don't have to make that expression. Crocta asked, What is this? I am interested in getting a dog. It meant that Derek had followed and investigated Crocta. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been able to prepare the contents of this agreement in advance. Crocta's lips twitched. It was a contract to provide Crocta information on the thawing Balhi and those who were cursed by the stars. In exchange for Derek providing information on the Thawing Balhi clan, Crocta would have to some of the people involved with Thawing Balhi. The targets weren't those who were cursed by the stars, but the NPCs. Don't you want revenge? Derek asked. I have decided to walk with you. I have planned a few investments on the premise that you are successful in your revenge. You don't have to worry about it, since your targets are people that you would have had for your revenge anyway. Croc to read more of the details. The Thawing Balhi clan was working with NPCs in several cities. These NPCs were rich and powerful in their respective regions. Derek was going to invest money into those who stood against that power. If the NPCs were destroyed by Crocta, Derek would share his profits with the new power that would emerge as a result. It was a gamble that relied on Crocta's success. Why are you doing this? Crocta asked Derek. Crocta was trying to get Derek's help anyway. The scale might be bigger, but it was still what Crocta wanted. Would you be angry if I said I was bored? Derek smiled as he sipped his tea. Young man. I am old and my life is complete. I don't want anything right now. Everything is done to my liking, so there isn't anything interesting left. That is understandable. Ian, who had become Crocta, might be playing Elder Lord for a similar reason. You are a little bit interesting. Derek smiled. So I want to watch you. It is a desire to get involved in your journey. If your success becomes my success, then I will be more immersed in your story. Crocta nodded. There were people like that in reality. They said sewing similar and bought a sports car. Some spent money while others expressed themselves on the keyboard. It was the same thing so he didn't mind. I understand. Good. Crocta asked for a pen in order to sign the contract. Ah, before that. Derek shook his head. I have to see your SS. What? Investing in you requires trust, so I want to verify that you have the minimum qualifications. You look stronger than before. Crocta looked at Derek. He was unchanged. He had wide shoulders and a disciplined build. The atmosphere around him was like a sharp blade. It wouldn't be easy for Crocta to fight Derek. Crocta had a strong chance of losing against Derek. Derek laughed at Crocta's gaze. Not me. My stomach is full, so I have no desire to swing a sword. Then. Here. Derek held out a piece of paper. If you do this, then I will trust you and sign the contract. Crocta's eyes widened. He read the piece of paper and nodded. The free city of a nail began with the fugitives of each species. Therefore, a nail's back streets had strict laws of their own. One of these laws was, don't innocent people. In the underworld of a nail, unexplained fights occasionally occurred, but they couldn't. Even Derek, who ruled the underworld of a nail, didn't bloody his hands unless it was for a contract. It was a common law dating back to the beginning of a nail. This was a city founded by fugitives who ran away from death, so they knew that death couldn't be reversed. But it was broken. Ha, ha. What did I tell you? A woman panted roughly. The two men nodded. Underneath them was a man with a broken head. The woman stabbed his back with her short swords to verify that he was dead. The already dead man showed no response. Blood gushed out onto the ground. NPCs are no different. We can also level up a lot. Let's do a little bit more. Three people. They were the user hunters who attacked Crocta before he became a warrior and were slain. They became notorious due to Yuvit Serlani, and couldn't hunt users like they used to. Therefore, they started attacking NPCs instead of users. 
It wasn't easy, but they had high abilities as user hunters. They moved around a nail in the darkness and attacked. The S meant that they became the target of a nail's underworld. And the ruler of a nail's underworld was the cold blooded Derek. Derek had already sent an assassin. The hitman from Derek found them. It was the orc Crocta. Crocta hid his body and confirmed their faces. He had read about them on Derek's piece of paper. Ian couldn't help smiling. Those guys still hadn't fixed their habit. He could understand why Derek gave this to him as a test. There was an unknown relationship between those who were cursed by the stars. Would he be willing to do it, regardless of the bond between users that NPCs couldn't understand? Crocta walked up to them. The users turned their heads at the sound of the footsteps. Their faces turned pale. A single orc appeared from the darkness. His face was familiar. He had tattoos, and his body was bigger, but both his bloodthirsty eyes and black bandana were unforgettable. They recoiled as they saw the handle of the greatsword poking out above the shoulders. That, isn't he that? It seems like it. They realized that there was no retreating. They had chosen a dead end to attack the NPCs. The choice of location to strike at the NPC had become a poison for them. The trio thought despairingly. We can't run away. Are we going to die again? Do we have to suffer like this? There is no way. They looked at each other's faces and sighed. Let's fight. Yes, that was when we weren't vigilant. We have to fight while protecting Brown. Jackson, Brown, and Airy. The trio of user hunters took their positions again. Jackson was the spearman who would keep the enemy in check, and Airy would distract with her movements. The magician Brown would bombard from behind. This was their winning tactic, their bread and butter. Crocta pulled out his great sword. In the darkness, a slim light flowed from the sword. The users realized that it wasn't a regular sword. Greed filled the eyes of the user hunters. If we win that will be ours. There will be an equal distribution. Brown chanted a spell. Unlike last time, he was firmly behind Jackson and Airy. They intended to leave the role of main attacker to Brown. Crocta moved forward. Jackson's spear moved. Kong. The spear and sword hit each other. Crocta deflected the spear to the side and rushed forward. At the same time, magic arrows flew in front while Eris' sword struck from the side. Crocta ignored the magic arrows and swung the greatsword at Jackson, who stepped back to dodge. The magic arrows hit Crocta's body. Ugh. Crocta stopped due to the shock. There was damage. Then Eris' short sword cut his side. Crocta had to back off without doing any damage. The opponents weren't easy to deal with. Look, if we do it slowly, then we can win. The momentum of the user hunters increased. Crocta nodded, like he had a plan to deal with the users. He took a charging posture. The user hunters were nervous. Crocta rushed in. It was a devastating assault. Jackson moved his spear in front and prepared for the impact. Brown's chant in the rear came to an end. It was at that moment. Crocta moved his body to the side. It ended up with Jackson being between Crocta and the magician. The magician tried to move his aim towards Crocta, but it didn't work. Crocta used Jackson's body as a shield. I can't see him right now. Brown cried out. Jackson stabbed his spear. Crocta avoided it and grabbed the spear with one hand. Airy tried to stop him, but she backed away as Crocta swung his great sword. She fell down to the ground from the impact. Brown, who was in a hurry, moved to the side and fired magic towards Crocta. At that moment, Crocta pulled the spear with tremendous strength, positioning Jackson's body so that it would make him into a meat shield. Brown's magic hit Jackson's back. Brown's mouth fell open. Cough. Eh sorry. At the same time, Crocta's greatsword slammed against Jackson's arm. Jackson's arm flew away. Qua. Crocta threw Jackson away and punched the defenseless Brown. The magician was stunned. Airy, who was left alone, stepped back and pointed her sword. However, it was her alone against an orc. 
Crocta approached and looked down at her. The shadow of the burly orc covered her. Within a minute, Crocta's fist had stunned her. The fight was over. Crocta didn't anyone. He captured them with the ropes and gags that Durex men had given him. Jackson was the only one to notice his intentions, but he fell unconscious after a punch. Crocta dragged them along like they were luggage. Durex men were waiting for Crocta outside the alley. You truly have great SS. What are you going to do with them now? They will be locked up. Direct subordinate laughed. His name was Jeremy and he was the strongest among direct subordinates, excluding Derek himself. These people who received the curse of the stars are annoying. They can revive after dying and can even suddenly disappear. We will use this concrete OD on them so that all they can do is breathe. It was a well-known OD to take care of users in Elder Lord. The so-called concrete OD. The original meaning of it was lost, but the users would know that they were completely defeated. The users couldn't die. After a few hours, they would revive in a safe place nearby. Therefore, the users were tied up and gagged to prevent death. Even after disconnecting and reconnecting, they would remain tied up. It was the worst OD of not being able to play the game. Due to this, fixers existed in the world of Elder Lord. They were the ones who were paid money to rescue the users, and get rid of the people capturing them. However, this time, their opponent was Derek. These user hunters wouldn't be able to play Elder Lord anymore unless they reset. Very thorough. For Lennox's revenge, he would use the Concrete OD. He would make the thawing Balhi clan quit the game as a group. Chapter, 30. Crocta headed to the southeast. His destination was Arnon, the city of elves that was to the southeast of a nail. His journey would now begin in earnest. Users were rare in not just Orcrox, but a nail as well. However, Arnon was different. Apart from humans, many users also chose to become elves, and Arnon was a beautiful city of elves. There would be numerous users, and among those users, there would be thawing Balhi clan members. However, there was a problem from the start. Crocta gathered his hands together and begged, Excuse me, elf guard. How about just a little? The rules are the rules. Please understand. A beautiful elf with blonde hair and a slender figure shook her head. She looked like a supermodel, but she was actually one of Arnon's guards. That's right. Crocta was refused entry. Nobody is allowed to enter Arnon except for the elves and the humans. That is discrimination. Then pray to be reborn as an elf instead of an orc. TSK. The elf turned away while sweeping her hair back. She was a dazzling beauty that would appear in photographs, but the angry Crocta just wanted to squeeze her. Crocta couldn't suppress his anger and spoke in rough language to the elf guard. Hey, elf with no manners. W what? Is it because you are pretty? Just because you have the face of a goddess? The elf's face turned bright red at Crocta's words. Your eyes are finally working properly. The appreciation of the elf Elwina has risen. The orc warrior Crocta's reputation in Arnon has risen. Crocta couldn't believe his eyes. Another message window popped up. Most cities have requirements to enter. Build up your reputation to overcome this barrier. There are a variety of ways to raise your reputation. Do good things to help the elves of Arnon. Crocta opened his mouth but he had no words. He had to build up his reputation to enter the city. What was this? Elwina's appreciation has risen. Your reputation in Arnon has risen. No matter how pretty I am, don't open your mouth. It is nasty. Crocta chose not to respond. He spat out the words angrily, but it made his reputation rise. Instead, he was able to realize sewing. This elf was like a princess who liked praise. In order to enter Arnon, he needed to raise his reputation with the elves, and this elf liked praise. In other words, if he praised this elf, then his reputation would rise and he could enter Arnon. Crocta Forcible opened his mouth. I really admire Elwina's beauty. Oh my god. Beautiful, gorgeous, elegant, do you know what those words have in common? What? They exist because of you. 
Well, if you say so. Hoo hoo hoo. Elwina's appreciation has risen. Your reputation in Arnon has risen. Crocta said, you have a sweet voice. Who, ho hut. It is a shame that this is emerging from your mouth. It would be even more embarrassing to keep my mouth shut in front of such a beauty. P please stop. In getting embarrassed. Beautiful. Stop. Elwina became lost in front of the onslaught of attacks. Her appreciation gradually increased, but she couldn't bear it any longer as she tightly closed her eyes and cast a spell. Your eyes. A ah. Uh. Silence. Hiok. Crocta was still weak to magic spells. He could endure a physical hit, but he was still defenseless to magic. So he was hit with her silence magic. You. He wanted to speak but only a strange groan emerged. I know that your eyes work properly. I am shy so don't tell me any more. Ah. The silence magic will be released over time. He sold his conscience for reputation, only to receive silence in return for the praise. Was God punishing him? Crocta turned around. He would honestly build his reputation. Somewhere, there would be sewing he could do to build up reputation. Suddenly, the elf guard Elwina spoke from behind him. Hey, orc warrior. If you go to the plains north of Arnon, then there might be work that will build up your reputation. No, what is that expression? Don't mistake this for a desire to help you. Crocta, who was already tired, had no energy to answer. He didn't look back and just raised his thumb over his head. It meant I know. Elwina nodded as she looked at that dignified rear view. He is a moderately cool orc. An orc with the ability to recognize outstanding beauty and speak the truth. Furthermore, he was able to give a nice gesture like raising his thumb. Elwina felt some appreciation towards the orc. Wouldn't it be really cool if that orc really did enter Arnon? Crocta, who had no idea what Elwina was thinking, just trudged along. He thought about all the good things he could do to raise his reputation. The best thing to do was to help elves in distress. He listened to Elwina's words and headed to the plains north of Arnon. Just like the elf city, the forest on the outskirts was filled with beautiful flowers and bushes. As he headed north along Arnon's walls, he eventually saw the wide plains. Oh! Spacious plains! It was a spectacular sight, lifting the cold feeling in his heart. Crocta spread open his arms as he soaked in the sight of the plains. By the way, there were things constantly moving on the wide plains. Ian realized what they were. This wasn't originally a plain. It was just that the trees and tall plants had been cut down and flattened. The main culprits of this situation were still moving and expanding the plains. They were huge monsters resembling rhinoceros. Get rid of the triters, enormous gurmans that enjoy eating plants and trees. They are the monsters that the elves are most wary of. Whenever they appear, the forest will become dry and bare. The land that they occupy will eventually become a desert. If you hunt them, the elves might think differently about you. He had painted an image of rescuing a beautiful elf and entering the city. The reality was that hard grinding was required to raise his reputation. Crocta sighed as he entered the plains. A trider discovered Crocta and made a loud sound. Its cry was similar to that of a rhinoceros, but it had a lot of teeth to chew on the trees and plants. There was a huge number of them. If there were that many of them, they truly would eat until the forest was gone. True. The trider's cry sounded like a roar. No questions asked. Crocta approached the triders, who were wary of the strange invader. Indeed, they weren't gentle monsters. Their eyes changed and their hind legs got into a position to pounce. Crocta faced one of them. The trider kicked against the ground and jumped. A strong shock wave hit Crocta, causing him to fall down. It was the first time that he had been defeated in a contest of pure strength since he had become an orc. Crocta got up. True. Crocta glared at it. The eyes of the trider slid over him. One side of its mouth went up. Then it looked at Crocta and shook its head. An obvious provocation. Crocta angrily pulled out his greatsword. 
The sword flashed and the expression of the trider suddenly hardened. The trider looked into Krokta's eyes and started to turn its body away. Krokta chased after it and blocked its path. The trider made an oblivious sound, like it was confused. Its eyes were innocent. Krokta couldn't believe that it had laughed at him just a moment ago. Great acting SS. Krokta blinked in shock. This guy. Were all the triders the same? Krokta placed his great sword back in his sheath. Then other triders started to gather around the first trider. They discovered the orc and came to ask what was going on. Once four or five triders joined, it felt like Krokta was being trapped within a huge wall. The first trider turned his head back towards Krokta again. Its lips twitched and its tongue moved from side to side. It was as if the trider was thoroughly insulting him. What a rapidly changing attitude happening after its friends gathered. Krokta's hands shook. The triders looked towards him and cried out. They started calling towards Krokta like they were joining in on the provocation. Truong. Krokta stood in the middle and listened to their insults miserably. He raised his head with determined eyes. As he was unable to speak, he muttered sewing on the inside. To enter Arnon, he had to become a friend of the elves. Krokta's eyes blazed passionately. An enemy of his enemy was his friend. He pulled out his great sword. The triders jumped at the sight of the weapon, but they believed in the absolute dominance of their numbers. Arnon, the city where it was difficult to meet orcs. For the first time in a long time, the residents of Arnon heard the battle cry of the orcs echo through the plains. Wa Bolter. Krokta's great sword tore through the air towards the triders. An elf user, Urin, chose the archer class and became confident as her character grew. She couldn't be satisfied with just the archer class anymore. She was aiming for the higher level elemental archer that was only available in Arnon. However, she wasn't qualified enough, and had to complete various quests to raise her SS and level. This quest required hunting the triders that damaged the forest. Chahat. She drew back her bowstring. The thin line shook, like it was going to break. Within a short time, she created an arrow with her magic power. The arrow flew and pierced the body of a trider. However, the leather was so thick that it didn't die. She pulled back the bowstring again. The bleeding trider glared at Urin. It snorted angrily and charged towards her. Urin's heart started running wild. She had to shoot again before it arrived. However, her mind was shaken. The eyes of the trider were so wild. Her hands became tangled and she dropped the arrow. Eh. The trider kicked against the ground. She hurriedly escaped, but the trider was much faster. It would mean death if she was hit by the trider. No. She avoided a frontal collision, but her body was thrown in the air. Blood oozed from a wound on her skin. She didn't pay attention to the injury and escaped again. She had suffered for a long time after being ed by a monster in the past. The aftereffect of death was that her S proficiencies fell. Her assimilation rate dropped rapidly and a sense of lethargy seemed to follow her around. If she died this time, then she would have to go through it all again. She just wanted to avoid that. She ran through the plains with an elf archer's unique jumping SS, but she couldn't get rid of the trider. She made one last attempt to shoot an arrow, but the trider was too close to her. She closed her eyes. Nothing happened. She opened her eyes. Her eyes filled with doubt. Standing in front of her was an orc. H how did you? Orc mobs or NPCs shouldn't be here. In addition, he was an orc warrior covered in tattoos. Orc warriors could barely deal with high-level users. Arnon obviously wasn't an orc-filled area. The orc swung his sword without any hesitation and sliced the trider. Blood spilled from the trider as it collapsed on the spot. Her heart was shaken for a moment at the sight of the ferocious, bloodied orc. The orc looked at her. She couldn't help but gulp nervously. With her SS, she would surely die if she met an orc warrior. The orc started to approach. SS spare M. The orc extended sewing. It was a glass bottle filled with glowing red liquid. It was a potion. It was a low-grade potion, but it was still expensive. 
are you giving it to me? The orc nodded without saying anything. What was this? She didn't know what to do so she sprinkled the potion that the orc gave her on her wound. Her wound was restored. Perhaps he was a user. The orc had a black bandana over his forehead so she couldn't tell. Are you a user? The orc just nodded. Why is an orc user here? Despite the recent trend of orc users, most of them were unable to overcome the limits of their species and reset. The orc had given urine a potion and even bandaged the areas that weren't healed. An unfamiliar confidence sprang up as the orc kept remaining silent. This was a reliable orc that she could trust. The orc silently gave her a thumbs up after treating urine's wounds. Thumbs up. Was he an orc that couldn't speak? He expressed his mind using his thumbs. An unknown bond formed between the orc and the elf, who hunted the triters on these wide plains. Both of them hunted the triters close to each other. Be careful. They helped each other in times of crisis. This time, the orc was the one in trouble. As he was about to be flattened by a trider, her high speed turned it into a honeycomb. The trider in front of the orc fell down. The orc stared at her from where he was lying on the ground. Urin grinned. The debt had been paid off, Mr. Orc. This time she raised her thumb first. The orc warrior nodded and returned to battle. The exchange of friendship between an orc and an elf. Heh. Cull. The two of them turned their backs to each other like they were embarrassed and snorted. Chapter, 31. Urin looked at the sky. It was almost dark. She had lost track of time as she hunted the triders with her bow. It had been a while since she had been so immersed in a hunt. After checking her status window, she saw that she had gained one level, and that one of her SS was upgraded. The corpses of the triders were all around her. It was a scene made by only two people, Urin and the orc. She couldn't see where the orc had gone. She felt regret for some reason. It was too late to return to Arnim. However, the orc appeared again, walking from the direction of Arnim. He was carrying a bag full of sewing. The orc placed the bag down on the ground. Then he dug a pit and started making a campfire. A campfire was created on the plains at dusk. After the fire was created, the orc started to pull things out of the bag. Some fighting aids such as potions and bandages emerged, as well as several bottles of alcohol. He had probably obtained them from the merchants coming to Arnim. The orc, who was preparing sewing, suddenly raised his big sword. The light of the campfire reflected off the blade of the sword. He used the great sword to dismantle the bodies of the triders on the ground. It was rapid work. The big meat was then placed on a tree branch. At the end, he laid it on top of the campfire. Trider grilled skewers. The orc beckoned, as if he had felt Urin's eyes. Urin walked up to the campfire. The orc made another skewer and handed it to here. It was big and heavy in her hands. Urin took the skewer and sat opposite to the orc. The orc was silent. He just quietly stared at the campfire. Urin's heart eased. She felt an unknown sense of comfort from the orc. She didn't have to force herself to maintain a conversation like she did with others. She just enjoyed this serene moment. Urin let out a long sigh as she looked up at the sky. There were countless stars in the sky. It was a beautiful night sky that could never be seen in South Korea, where she lived in reality. The stars shining over the plains, the sound of a campfire, and the fragrant smell of meat. She just enjoyed the comfort of this moment. Her mind became calm. Suddenly, the orc gave her sewing. It was alcohol. Urin accepted it. The orc picked up another bottle from the ground and took a sip. She had seen this scene a lot somewhere. Yes, the western films. On the screen, the wild and violent western troops would exchange meat and alcohol silently in the wilderness. Urin felt like she had become a gunman who met a barbarian or a ghastly outlaw in the wilderness. The other person was a bad person, but they fought together and a subtle friendship was formed. Urin drank heavily at the thought, the hot liquid flowing down her throat. She wiped her mouth with her sleeve. The orc nodded and gave her another bottle of alcohol. 
Ewan and the orc drank from the alcohol bottles. The trider meat was cooked. The orc and Ewan bit into it. It was a little chewy, but she didn't care. They were now the outlaws of the plains who were chewing on trida meat. Was this why other users fell into role playing? Yuin felt free. She squeezed the oil out and ate the meat. The moon shone over the dead bodies of the triders around them. Meanwhile, Yuin and the orc continued to drink. They became quite tipsy. Yuin and the orc didn't talk in words. Just tapping the bottles against each other was enough. Everything was clear with alcohol. It was at that moment. There was the sound of footsteps and people talking. Yuin frowned. Somehow, she felt like they were intruding on this historic time. I have to work hard to build up my reputation in Arnon. Isn't it night time? Just do it. Perhaps there is A.S. that will brighten up the night sky. Based on the dialogue, they were users. It felt like they were roles designed to crash this well-formed stage. It was like a loud alarm making a dissonant sound that ruined the music the best orchestra was playing. She didn't want to talk about hunting with them or what their levels and SS were. Yuin was tired of playing the hard game without being able to look forward. At that moment, she just wanted to stay in the world that she had made with the orc. Yuin pulled out a cloth cap from her bag. It was to hide the mark on her forehead. The orc looked at her but Yuin just smiled. They both raised the bottles again. The sound of footsteps was getting closer. Eh. Fire. Instead of turning around, she took a swig from the bottle and swallowed the alcohol. Then she chewed on the try to meet. The dwarf user Gilliam came to Arnon to meet his friend, the human user Puri, only to be denied entry. People from other species said that he should build up his reputation to enter Arnon. Most of them headed to the north of Arnon to hunt the triders. Despite it being night, Gilliam led Puri towards the plains. He only saw the tough blacksmiths and warriors in the dwarf villages, so he wanted to see the beautiful city of the elves. Even the cold guard was like a beauty from a photograph. Once he got inside, many beautiful people would be moving around. With these expectations, he tried to quickly hunt the triders. However, the plains were calm. He couldn't see any signs of the triders that were constantly eating plants every day. There was just the light of a fire from a corner of the plains. Gilliam and Pori walked towards the fire. Some users or NPCs seemed to be camping. They wanted to ask about the triders. However, Gilliam and Pori gradually fell silent as they approached the campfire. It was because they quickly realized. The ridges in the darkness that they thought were rocks, actually weren't rocks. It was the corpses of the triders that were scattered around the campfire. Numerous triders were dead. There was also the rotten smell of blood. Gilliam and Pori looked at each other. Signs of anxiety were clearly evident. All of the corpses of the triders were divided into parts or riddled with holes, so mangled that they couldn't be recognized. It was a disastrous scene. How long had these people been ing to slaughter so many triders? They guessed that the owners of the campfire were the cause. They wanted to step back, but a strong curiosity prompted them to identity the faintly visible people. They drew closer to the campfire. Gilliam and Pori stopped. The first thing they saw was the menacing face of an orc. An orc warrior with full body and face tattoos. He raised an alcohol bottle with a cavalier expression as a way to greet the visitors. The second person had their backs to Gilliam and Pori, so they couldn't see them clearly. A female with long hair. She turned her head to look at them. She was a beautiful female elf. But the atmosphere around her was different from the other elves they knew. Her idle eyes seemed like they could slaughter someone at any minute. The elf drank with a bottle in one hand and a huge meat skewer in the other, regardless of the visitors. The sight of a beauty wiping the alcohol with her sleeve. She turned towards the campfire again like she wasn't interested in them. Gilliam and Pori didn't know what to do. The elf opened her mouth. Are you going to just stand there? It was a delicate yet decadent voice. It was seductive but also filled with an unknown ing intent. The voice also seemed like a warning. A warning for them not to sit down. If they were given an opportunity to nickname her, 
they would call her this. Venomous Spider The Black Widow Spider who was seductive but would ultimately lead men to their destruction. We are just passing by. Sit. Thanks to her, they sat quietly at the campfire. Gilliam and Pori sat down and watched. The orc and elf drank from the bottles again without worrying about them. Were these two truly the ones who massacred the triters? Gilliam couldn't suppress his curiosity and asked. Many triters were Ed. It stinks of blood here. Are you said? At the mention of the bloody smell, the orc warrior crocked a sniffed. He didn't smell anything. He breathed deeply like he was holding his breath. He had spent all day on the plains so he couldn't smell the blood anymore. Instead, there was only the smell of cooked triter meat. The triter meat was from the very first triter who mocked Crocta on the plains. It dared to laugh at him, but in the end, it became his meal. Crocta smiled as he thought about it. Gilliam and Pori were astonished. The devilish orc had taken a deep breath at the mention of the bloody smell and then smiled. He was satisfied with the feast of blood that he had created. He smelled blood and smiled happily. He was a naturaler who was born to shed blood or a natural assassin. They started to think that sitting here was a mistake. Pori tried to change the atmosphere by talking to the elf next to him. You must have suffered to catch so many of these guys. Isn't that right? Wasn't it hard, elf? Ha 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 ha. The elf urine stared at Pori with a mocking attitude. She was normally timid and dismissed by other users. When she made a mistake, they tried to teach her. But behold, she hid that she was a user and they spoke so politely to her. They were acting like they couldn't be rude to Urin. Urin couldn't help smiling. This was why people looked for so indifferent when role-playing. Such a minor change made such a big difference. Gilliam and Pori were shocked again. The elf smiled at the memories, like she was saying that hunting so many triters wasn't that hard. It was obvious that this elf was in a state of as she recalled the scene of slaughter. Was this woman really so happy about slaughtering the triters? This was like the blood madness that was the symbol of psychopaths. If she was a real person, then she would be a serial or worse than Jack the Ripper. Gilliam and Pori looked at each other and started to shake. They met demons while trying to hunt triters. The triters, who already encountered these demons, were cold corpses. That would also be their fate. That, we. Gilliam and Pori got up from their seats. But they didn't make it. The orc's heavy hand grabbed Gilliam's wrist. Pori was also held by the elf and prevented from getting up. Gilliam and Pori watched them with trembling eyes. Instead of talking, they grabbed new bottles and handed them to Gilliam and Pori. The shadows from the campfire grew. The shadows over the faces of the orc and elf fluttered like evil masks. The long shadows at their backs made them no longer seem like humans. Gilliam and Pori flopped down with weakened legs. Chapter, 32 Gilliam and Pori began hunting the triters. Yesterday, they seemed to have become drunk from the alcohol drifting on the wind and had a misunderstanding for a while. The orc and the elf were ordinary people. Gilliam and Pri split the alcohol and the try to meet with them all night. The elf, whom they thought was a psychopather, was just a user on a quest while the orc, who couldn't speak, was an NPC hunting triters to enter Arnon. An orc building his reputation to enter Arnon was unheard of and also seemed dangerous. But unlike his menacing appearance, the orc was actually kind. Ack. The triters were formidable monsters, so there were times when dangerous situations were created. Every single time, the orc saved them. The orc warrior covered in tattoos looked exciting and dynamic, even when hunting triters. Orc, thank you. The orc smiled and raised his thumb. The characteristic of the orc was that he used his thumb very well in lieu of his voice. When it was good, he expressed his emotions with a thumbs up. When he was angry due to the triters, he would announce his revenge with a thumbs down. Gilliam also raised his thumb. I will do a thumbs up as well. Once it was daytime, other users and NPCs started to appear on the plains. The job to build reputation in Arnon was well known, so even beginners often tried it out. Dwarf, what is that orc? 
A gnome user that was hunting triders in the area asked. Gnomes were similar to dwarves, but they had a low number of users like the orcs. Their magic power and dexterity were excellent. Since orcs were normally an unplayable species, gnomes were the first to say that they had the fewest number of users. He is. What should he explain? Gilliam worried about it before replying. A good orc. Huh. Isn't a good orc a dead orc? What do you mean? Please be careful what you say. Ha. Huh. There was a common misperception of orcs. Most people though that they were rough and ignorant creatures. That they were difficult enemies that yielded great rewards one said. Gilliam had thought so as well. But this orc was different. After the sun went up, the orc kept on raising his thumb. The thumb didn't rest, meaning he helped others without hesitation. It didn't matter what species they were. You will soon come to understand my words. Enyanis, the administrator of the Arnon Plains, saw all of this occur. Ho, oh, that orc, he is quite good. Enyanis' task was to control the number of triders and to keep the forest from shrinking. Reputation meant awareness among the elves, and Enyanis' reputation also increased when he reported about the work on the plains. As the administrator, Enyanis watched every battle on the plains. The triders were tough monsters, so the plains were always at risk. But after the emergence of the orc, casualties fell sharply. I need to watch. However, the orc Crocta just repeated the work with a blank head while receiving the attention of the surrounding people. It was boring. It took time to one trider. In addition, if a user got in trouble, then he would rush over to the trider, regardless of the amount of reputation. He couldn't ignore the warrior's oath. A warrior protects the powerless. Crocta saved another user's life. As soon as a trider was about to trample on the gnome, it was head-butted by Crocta. The gnome looked at him with surprised eyes. Crocta wanted to shout, but Elwina's silence magic still hindered him. That awful woman. Hugh. It was annoying not being able to talk. Instead of speaking one hundred words, Crocta just raised his thumb. The gnome's eyes changed. The gnome seemed spellbound as he followed in raising his thumb. Crocta nodded. The people of the plain seemed to strangely follow his thumb gesture. Crocta was going back to fighting the triters when an elf caught his attention. It was Urin, whom he hunted with yesterday and drank alcohol with all night. For some reason, he felt shy and turned his body. By the way, the outskirts of the plain suddenly became loud. Crocta took a breath after finishing off a trider and looked over. A group of humans was entering the plains. All of them were beginners except for the leader, who was wearing expensive metal armor. It was the equipment of a high-level user. It seemed like he was helping out his friends with their reputation work. However, he had a pompous expression on his face. Hey, there are a lot of people. You don't know how I struggled to raise my reputation. Now everything is written on the website. This is much better, it is great. Wait comfortably. Then he showed off the power of his sword as he cast a S. An active S. A sharp force flew from the sword towards a trider. The trider collapsed as blood was spilled. Finally, the man approached and finished it off. Brother, nice. The best. The party praised the man. The man's shoulder raised. He looked around the plains like it was nothing. However, he then noticed an orc. He doubted his eyes. An orc. He looked again and saw the orc. His eyes changed. The plains were filled with triders and one orc. It was easy if there wasn't a group. He didn't know how the orc appeared here, but the orc was his target. It was a target that could make him stand out more than the trider. The man glanced over at a pretty female user in the party. Wait and watch. I will catch it quickly. He immediately approached the orc. Crocta felt his presence, but didn't pay attention since he was a human. He was walking to find another trider. Suddenly, there were a cool sensation on his back. It felt like all the hairs on his body rose. Crocta instinctively leaned down. The blade passed through the air. Crocta turned around. A high-level user with a sword was approaching Crocta. 
Crocta wanted to shout and ask what he was doing, but Elwina's silence still tormented him. He felt like he would die of frustration. Crocta stretched out both hands and protested with gestures. What are you doing over there? The other users asked instead of Crocta. The man shrugged. Hunting an orc. That orc is working to build his reputation, so leave him alone. He is a good orc. A good orc. The man burst out laughing. Don't say sewing so strange. I will take care of it. Do I need your permission to grab a mob? That orc isn't a mob. Whatever. If you step in, then you will get hurt. Then the man attacked Crocta again. Eh. What is that? That, that. Bulha. The users on the planes groaned at the scene. You a bolter. Crocta raised his great sword and responded. This man was different from the other users. His attitude was arrogant, but he definitely had good fighting SS. Fast and strong. His level was high. Crocta blocked the sword and stepped back. The man laughed and successively attacked Crocta. It was an opponent who was impervious to an orc strength. Every single attack was heavy. This is the end of the orc. The man pushed strongly at Crocta. Crocta was pushed back. You only have strength. You can't do anything if you meet a stronger person. He leapt at Crocta. Crocta hurriedly blocked it with the great sword, but there was a strong shock. He had completely lost the initiative. The man's offensive continued. Every time Crocta defended against an attack, he was pushed back. There was another strike as soon as he restored his posture, forcing Crocta on the defensive. Crocta had to change the rhythm but he couldn't see any gaps. While retreating, his foot was caught on the corpse of a trider. Crocta's legs got tangled up for a moment. The man didn't miss this chance and rushed forward. He used an active S. There was a smile on the man's face as he aimed his attack towards the fallen Crocta. Then an arrow flew through the air. Kwang. The arrow containing magic power hit the man's plate armor and exploded, causing the man to bounce back. He rolled on the ground and then stood up. He shouted angrily. What is this? What are you doing? The elf urine asked. Why did you attack him? I am just catching a mob so why is everyone interfering? He isn't a mob. If he isn't a mob, then what is he? What is an NPC? Are all NPCs mobs? An orc is a mob. Aish, all of the people here are crazy. Ha! Is that all you have to say? This uncle, I will stop you. I should be the one saying that, old lady. Really? The two people had a standoff. In any case, if I continue to attack, then you won't be able to handle it. Urin aimed her arrow. The man laughed. The elf wasn't high level so she wasn't much of an opponent. It would be hard if she fought together with the orc, but he was confident in his eventual victory. At that moment, Crocta stepped forward. He held out a hand towards Urin. Urin was able to understand his expression after fighting with him, drinking alcohol all night and communicating together. He was telling her to stay in the background. Crocta's gaze turned towards the man with an intense gaze. He lifted his great sword while staring at the man. Let's do this until the end. Then Crocta placed the great sword on his shoulder and raised his hand towards the man. Come. No one could fail to understand the meaning. The man grinned and lifted his sword. Arrogant orc. Crocta took a more careful posture. The man was the arrogant one. Crocta's whole body entered the combat posture. He didn't miss any of the opponent's slight movements. Power boiled up inside him. Indomitable fighting spirit rare has been used. Tattoos of honor rare has been used. The great sword, Ogre Slayer, seemed to cry out. The grip felt right in his hands. Even the wind blowing past his nose felt right. The opponent was stronger but that was fine. This much power was enough to defeat the enemy. The tactics of the Orc Crocta was to trample the enemy with strong force, but Raven's speciality was destroying stronger enemies with less power. If you wish to die, then I will you. The man rushed in. 
His party was rooting for the man. Brother. Fighting. Brother, you can win. The man cast an active S as a reply. It flew from his sword. Crocta rolled against the ground and avoided it. Rattle. The large rock behind Crocta exploded. It was a technique powerful enough to leave a scar on the hard rock. However, there was a cooldown on active SS. It would be fine for Crocta not to worry about it temporarily. Cool. The man smiled as he heard the female user's voice. The man wasn't completely immersed in the fight. He needed to always keep an eye on the opponent. Crocta confronted the man. He saw the moment that the man looked away. Crocta instantly kicked the ground. Dust rose and covered the man's vision. He quickly moved back. Cough, spit. The greatsword flew through the dust. The man hurriedly blocked it. His head had almost been cut off. The man's posture was unstable and Crocta used that gap to kick him in the abdomen. The man didn't receive much damage due to his armor, but his body was pushed away. He wiped the grit off his face. Fuck. As the man cursed and rushed forward, Crocta threw the dirt again. You. The man shook his head and retreated. He looked everywhere. He was cautious because of the previous actions. But the enemy had already disappeared into the dust storm. The weakness was completely grasped. Crocta ran forward. The man discovered the approaching opponent and moved his body accordingly, barely avoiding the attack. Crocta turned and faced the man again. Crocta kicked at the ground with his feet. The man couldn't help flinching back. Crocta didn't miss that moment and swung his greatsword. The man's reaction was a beat too late. The man tried to block it but Crocta's greatsword struck the outside of the man's arm. The armor crumpled and the blade became stuck in the man's arm. Cough. The man stabbed out with the sword in his other hand, but Crocta had already withdrawn. Crocta couldn't give time for the enemy to recover. He kicked the ground. Dust scattered once again towards the man who was wounded. The man spat out in disgust. U-I-N-G. He hurriedly stepped back. Crocta pursued him. The man desperately tried to open his eyes, but dirt was flowing down his eyelids. Grit stabbed at his corneas. The man reflexively blinked. Tears appeared in his eyes. As his vision blurred, the orc's greatsword could be seen. He raised his sword but his wounded right arm was slow. Crocta's greatsword stabbed through the armor into the man's stomach. The man kneeled down. Kuhu. Blood poured out. It was a situation where he couldn't fight anymore. The victor was decided. All those watching the fight exclaimed from the shock. Crocta raised his greatsword. It was on the verge of falling towards the man's neck. S stop. The man shook as he looked up at Crocta. Don't. He raised both hands and threw away his sword. The equipment he was wearing, including the armor, were extremely expensive. The after effects of death could be recovered after some time, but the equipment he went into debt to purchase couldn't. He couldn't let this orc or the other users on the planes have them. He was no longer concerned with the party watching behind him. The man still hadn't repaid all the interest yet. Through these items, he was going to become stronger and become a user who turned Elder Lord into a business. It would be an enormous loss if he lost the essence rated armor that he had purchased with much difficulty. If he lost the rest of the equipment, including the sword, he would fall into hell. Please. The man begged. Crocta looked at him quietly. Then someone said, him. It was Urin. Within a short period of time, the users quietly watching the scene started to call out. Orc, him. Don't let that guy survive. They were all users who had been helped by Crocta. The voices soon increased. They were like the audience in the Colosseum clamoring for the loser's death. Crocta looked at them and then he looked down at the man begging for mercy. Fear and horror were displayed in the man's eyes. Crocta lowered his greatsword. The watching Urin said, he tried to you first. You heard what he said, if this guy had won, then he absolutely would have never spared you. Make him pay the price. 
all the spectators, including the users, nodded at Urin's words. He is a user, a person who is cursed by the stars. He will rise again. He will just receive a penalty if he is Ed. He has to learn that if he strikes first, he might die. Him. However, Crocta shook his head. It was to indicate that he wouldn't the man. Why? Urin asked like it was ridiculous. The orc warrior she encountered was kind but not weak-minded. She couldn't understand it. Crocta wanted to speak. However, Elwina's silence magic was still blocking his mouth. So he turned around instead of talking. As Crocta walked, the crowd split to the left and right. He was heading towards a giant rock. It was the rock that the man's active S had hit. Crocta raised his greatsword and gathered all his strength. After greatsword technique was upgraded to Latino's greatsword technique, he was able to leave a mark with it. Crocta placed the sword on the rock and started carving sewing with the blade. The spectators held their breaths and watched. The shape of letters slowly appeared before the audience's eyes. Warrior. Everybody was confused, but their mouths dropped open as the contents were gradually revealed. The fighter has already discarded his weapon. Crocta finished with the sentence. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. He placed his great sword in the sheath. As Crocta turned around, the people on the plane stared at the rock in a daze. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. None of them could open their mouths. If the enemy doesn't resist, then don't. They thought that the orcs were savages and that the humans were civilized. However, it was a human who attacked the innocent orc first and the humans who shouted to the man. Unknown emotions stirred inside them. Who was this orc? Was this an orc warrior? The orc looked huge as he stood silently in front of the rock. Clap. 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 Someone walked out while clapping. It was the administrator of the Arnon Plains, Enyanis. He stood in front of Crocta and applauded, his eyes wet with tears. You are a true warrior. The talent that Arnon needed for a long time is an orc. I would like to invite you to our city. Had Crocta's reputation work finally finished? The audience cheered. Crocta silently nodded. But it will be hard for everyone here if you suddenly disappeared, so I would like to give you a mission. Crocta was confused. What mission? I will appoint you as the leader of the Arnon Plains Rescue Unit. There is no more need to catch the Triters. For the next three days, please save others as you have previously been doing. Only then will you be allowed to enter Arnon. Enyani's proposal of an Arnon Plains Rescue Unit. Crocta nodded without any worries. Those watching from behind cheered. Crocta and Enyani's shook hands as applause rang out. Arnon Plains Rescue Unit a tradition of Arnon that would remain for many years to come. It was begun by an unknown orc warrior, not a human, nor an elf. Chapter, 33 A University Restaurant Everybody was eating their meals. The TV stopped at one channel. Hello. I am Giuseppe, a reporter from Surprise. What happened in Elder Lord? I am now in the elven city, Arnon. There is a strange thing occurring here. Behind her were the high walls of Arnon. The camera illuminated Arnon's landscape before focusing on Giuseppe again. Arnon is famous for its beautiful elf mayor, but there is sowing more mysterious than her beauty occurring here. It isn't here in Arnon, but in the northern Arnon plains, the place where triders are hunted to build up reputation. She ran northwards towards the plains. The angle shook like the cameraman was chasing after her. What is going on here? This Giuseppe will go and check it out. She discovered users walking out of the plains. Their faces were covered in mosaics. Hello. Did you just come from the Arnon Plains? So what? People are saying that a miracle is happening at Arnon Plains, is that true? Ah. A dwarf male nodded. That's right. It is a very curious thing. I was pleasantly surprised. What is it? You will know if you go there. If you go now, then you will be able to meet him. Subtitles appeared and there was a narrator. Who can she meet? This time, Giuseppe asked the elf standing beside the dwarf. 
His face was also covered in a mosaic. Have you met him personally? Of course. We drank and ate together all night. Drank? That's right. At first there was a misunderstanding, but he is a very kind and nice person. My eyes were opened. Wow, is he really that great? He is truly a true. The last part referring to the character was beeped out. The camera cut to another scene. Giuseppe stood at the entrance of the planes as she stared into the screen. Now, shall I go and see the rumored person? Then Giuseppe entered the planes. The spacious planes were filled with people struggling against the huge triders. Giuseppe lowered her voice and said. Now let's find out who the rumored figure is. Then she ran. She ran across the planes and found a user who had just added a trider. Giuseppe moved cautiously. Here hello. Eh, what? Ah, Giuseppe. Aren't you Giuseppe? Ha, huh, do you recognize me? I'm a fan. A big fan of what happened in Elder Lord. Thank you. But what are you doing ah? You came because of him. The user nodded. Ah. Do you know who he is? Yes. I know very well. I thanked him for his help a few times. Thanked him for his help. Anyone who doesn't know him here is a spy, a spy. One spy was frightened off by him. Ha ha ha. Giuseppe looked at the screen with a coy look. Then what type of person is he? I'm really curious. She asked the user again. Where can I meet him? HRMM he because he is so busy. The user stroked his chin and pointed in one direction. Do you see that rock over there? That big rock? Yes. Wait over there. It is the place where his legend began. Legend? Giuseppe trembled and made a big fuss. Legend. Truly. What legend? And he might be waiting for us. My heart's already pounding. I'm looking forward to it. Would the viewers like to come along as well? Then she bowed to the user and ran towards the rock. It was an automatic shot that didn't require a heavy camera, but the screen waved once again like someone was chasing after her. They arrived in front of the rock. It was a big rock. But as they approached it, they saw sewing engraved in the rock. Subtitles popped up. Do you want to know what is written on here? Giuseppe breathed out and placed her hands on the rock and took a step back in amazement. There is sewing engraved here. This? At that moment, the focus blurred. The letters engraved on the rock couldn't be seen. Subtitles popped up. It will continue in a moment. Then the screen switched to some ads. The customers watching idly in the restaurant started to complain as the advertisements appeared. Isn't dragging it on like this annoying? That's right. That reporter, I don't like her pretending to be so pretty either. But what is it about? I've never been there before. I have I feel like puking every time I see a trider now. It was a few days of hard work. I even died once. Idiot. You died to those cows. They aren't cows. You would turn out the same if you made a mistake. The customers in the restaurant started to tell their own stories about Elder Lord. For some time, the latest capsule and electronic devices from the Myongsong group were advertised on the TV. The advertising model was a prominent ranker in Elder Lord. After the ads were over, Giuseppe appeared on the screen again. The eyes of the customers turned back to the television again. Carved here what is it? It is coarse writing, like it was made with a blade. The screen was close up so the full sentence didn't appear at first. Giuseppe touched each of the letters by hand. Warrior. The screen got further away and the sentence on the rock appeared. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. Giuseppe was confused. Who carved this? Warrior. Somehow, I can feel the spirit of chivalry. It was at that moment. Giuseppe suddenly turned her head. Her face turned pale. Ah. Uh. The screen convulsed. There was a loud sound, like sewing had bumped into the camera. A trider. Giuseppe wasn't a strong user so she ran away. The person recording her also ran. 
the screen kept on shaking. The moment that the trider was about to reach Giuseppe. Kaya. The screen was overturned. The blue sky of Elder Lord appeared on the screen. The silence continued. The customers watching the video were confused. Isn't this a broadcasting accident? But that isn't a live broadcast. Is she dead? Why would they broadcast a death? To show that it's real. The customers in the restaurant murmured. At that moment, sewing appeared on the screen. It was a big hand. Thick fingers were seen first. The customers thought it was a dwarf, but the skin was green. The rough hands filled with calluses filled the screen. Hyuk. A groan emerged from Giuseppe. The thick hand grabbed what was assumed to be the video recorder's hand. Her body was pulled up and the screen shook again. The sight revealed before them was an orc. Orc. The orc had an unusual appearance. First, the black bandana on his head. It was old and faded, like it had been used for a long time. The mark of the blacksmith company was engraved on the corner. Below it was the face of an orc. Intense eyes that glared at them. A big nose, thick lips, and protruding tusks. Fierce tattoos spanned his entire body and there was a huge greatsword on his back. But the most unusual thing was the orc's outfit. There was a red cloth vest over leather armor. In the middle of the vest, a clear cross was drawn with a word embroidered underneath it. What did rescue mean? Giuseppe couldn't speak and just looked at the orc. The orc looked at her and the person shooting. Then the orc raised a hand. The orc raised his thumb and turned around. The back also contained a white cross with words underneath it. The orc disappeared into the trider hunting grounds. What did they just see? Rescue, lifeguard. It was like the deep valley rivers, the beach at summer, and the snow-covered ski slopes. Giuseppe muttered blankly. Jay just now, an orc saved us. What is this? The odd situation where an orc that was treated as a monster saved them. But this wasn't the end. A user hunting a trider appeared on the screen. The user flew through the air. The moment that the trider was about to trample on the user, the trider suddenly bounced away, like it was hit by a strong impact. Then a black figure jumped towards it. The trider that had just been trying to stand up fell back down as blood emerged. It was a perfect hunt. The mysterious orc, who saved them previously, was standing in front of the trider with the giant sword. The sight of him holding the great sword in the middle of the broken trider was magnificent. Then the orc raised his thumb towards the user. It was the coolest thumbs up that they had ever seen. The user bowed and also did a thumbs up. The orc turned around like nothing had happened and sat down on the ground. He watched the people hunting. Giuseppe hurriedly approached the user who had just been saved. Hello user. Ah. Uh. Ah, uh, hello. I am Giuseppe, a reporter from Surprise. What happened in Elder Lord? Please explain the strange scene that I just saw. What is going on? Ah, uh, you came for him. He pointed to the orc. The orc was just sitting there silently. That. He is a mute orc warrior. Mute? The thing that is occurring here. The screen changed to a story. Instead of Giuseppe, the narrator started to explain the orc story. The situation was this he came to the city of elves because he wanted to enter Arnhem, but was denied access because he was an orc. An orc actor appeared for a retelling. Although it was sloppy, he somewhat resembled the orc. As soon as he was about to enter a castle, an elf actor appeared and stood in front of him. You can't access. Is it because I am an orc? The orc asked through gestures. An orc isn't allowed to enter here. The orc made a despairing pose. The narrator explained. He was shocked to hear that he couldn't enter because he was an orc. However, he found out that there was another way to enter Arnon. The orc actor formed a fist and nodded. He headed to the Arnon Plains with a hopeful expression. It is nothing other than hunting monsters on the Arnon Plains. But what he saw was many people suffering while hunting the monsters. The orc actor looked sad. He couldn't speak, but he was still a tough orc warrior. He made a decision. 
the orc actor decided sewing with a firm expression. He started running through the Arnon Plains. He helped those in danger. The orc saved people. The pet pigs representing the triters fell and the orc warrior actor raised his thumb at the person who thanked him. As he can't speak, this thumb is the best way for him to express himself. All of a sudden, the atmosphere was reversed. Of course, things weren't always good. One day, a user thought of the orc as a simple monster and struck. The orc actor and human actor confronted each other with knives. He was victorious after some difficulty and was on the verge of ing the human. The orc and the kneeling human were surrounded by four or five actors. All the humans called for the orc to his opponent. But after all that, he made a difficult decision. The orc shook his head. The other actors were shocked by his decision. Why? They protested. The orc looked distressed as he wasn't able to speak. Instead of answering with words, the orc inscribed his will on the rock with his sword. The orc actor aimed the knife at a rock. Then the screen changed and illuminated the giant rock that actually existed on the Arnon Plains. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. It was this. For a moment, it shone. Oh. The sound of an audience cheering was produced as an audio effect. This is all true. It changed to an interview screen. All of the users had mosaics on their faces, but they all praised the orc. He is reliable. Really. I can't even count the number of times my life was saved because of him. A truly great person. The name? Um, he can't talk. I don't know how it happened. But this much is clear. We were mistaken about orcs. He is. Genuine. A true. The interviewers all finished simultaneously. A warrior. The screen was switched. Giuseppe followed the orc. 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 The orc seemed annoyed as Giuseppe followed him. In the end, the surprise. What happened in Elder Lord? Production team couldn't get an interview with him. Giuseppe was forced to finish the program in front of the rock carved by the orc. Unfortunately, I was unable to interview him. It is a shame, but the sentence that he left behind tells us who he is on its own. The sentence shown again on the screen. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. Many things were implied with the sentence. Although he is a NPC, it seems that we have a lot to learn from him. Especially at this time, when many ethical problems are being raised about Elder Lord. I hope you have enjoyed this wonderful, delightful and warm Elder Lord life. This was Giuseppe, a reporter from Surprise. What happened in Elder Lord? She waved her hand. At the same time, the camera rose into the sky and captured both her and the rock. It continued to climb up until the rock looked like a toy, capturing the image of the plains and the blue sky of Elder Lord. The narrator finished. The Nameless Orc. I hope his life as a great warrior will last for a long time. The broadcast closed with this voice and some music. The program ended. The restaurant's customers rose from their seats. That was amazing. Was that really an orc? Really? Aren't there many witnesses on the internet? It is more interesting to see it directly. The orc is great. Are you doing anything now? Where did he go? People will come and watch. Hey, do you want to try becoming an orc? Yes. The university students left the restaurant. When they talked about the program they just saw, all of them usually asked one question. That orc, what is he doing now? Elwina, the elf guard at Arnon's gate, looked at the orc in front of her in surprise. This was the first time that someone had raised their reputation so quickly. It usually took a month of focused hunting. In addition, his pass wasn't just a permit. It was an honorary citizenship granted by the Arnon Plains administrator. It was an honorable title only given to those who did great achievements in Arnon. He would be treated as a citizen of Arnon. Elwina's heart started pounding. The orc had really solved the task he was given. He was much more wonderful than she had thought. I incredible. I'm not surprised so don't be mistaken. Elwina tried to say calmly. The orc didn't answer. What, 
Are you ignoring people now? Why do you keep a... The orc was pointing at his mouth. Elwina blushed. Ah, that's right. I had forgotten. When I think back, I think I used too much strength. I didn't know it would still last. Well, I'm sorry. She dismissed the magic. Silence was disabled. So now. Hey, elf with no manners. W what? Because of you. She looked at Crocta with a hurt expression. Crocta looked at the beautiful elf and changed his next words. So pretty. Oh my god. Well then, I'll see you later. No offense, pretty elf guard. The Crocta confidently headed through the gates. Elwina stared blankly at his back. She felt a strange feeling. Then someone spoke to her. Young lady. Don't call me that. I am now a guard. The mayor is calling. Mother? Elwina was confused. She said to stop being a guard. Please tell her that I will do as I want. If young lady doesn't return home right now, then she will sell all of your collection. I understand. I will go back. Elwina sighed. Chapter, 34 Crocta wasn't impressed as he finally entered the elven city of Arnon. Of course, everything was well organized. The scale of the buildings was enormous, and the beautiful elves smelling the leaves of the trees looked like the gods from Greek mythology. But it wasn't any more grandiose than Orcroc's fortress. Apart from the elves' buildings being wider with their aesthetic tastes, the level of construction in the city was similar to that in Orcroc's. So he wasn't impressed like the elf guiding him expected. It has been a long time since I've seen an orc. How about it, isn't our city beautiful compared to what you are used to? Crocta nodded slightly. Look, this building is in the latest Bellytran style. It is an architectural style developed by the elf architect, Bellytran. It was a revolution. There was an uproar in the capital. To emphasize the depths. Where is Ilya? Crocta interrupted. The elf pouted with dissatisfaction. Don't be in a hurry. Once you learn more about Arnon. I didn't come here to play. Crocta looked around. There were only two species in Arnon, humans and elves. They were mostly elves, and occasionally humans could be seen. But most users were humans. In his eyes, they all seemed suyous, like they were members of the thawing Balhi clan. Oh, you are urgent. Too urgent. I know why you came here, but you shouldn't live like that. Okay. Follow me. The elf raised a hand to Crocta's shoulder. He turned away from the residential area of Arnon where they were walking into an alley between two buildings. The elf increased his pace. Arnon was filled with greenery, so it wasn't hard to keep up with his movements. He jumped between trees like a monkey and led Crocta to a hidden place in the city. Soon, an entire forest was revealed. There was a lush forest inside the city. As the elf ran through the forest, his form temporarily couldn't be seen. Crocta sped up as he headed in the direction that the elf had disappeared. It was a while before Crocta caught up with him again. The elf was sitting at a round wooden table in the middle of the forest. This place. I have fond childhood memories here. It is also a safe place. The elf grinned. I am Ilya. I guessed so. Is that so? Ho ho. I was surprised when Derek suddenly said he would help me it is even more surprising that the person sent is an orc. He waved his hand. The magic power swayed and a few leaves fell into his hands. He arranged them on top of the table. Our objective is the same, so let's join hands. Please explain in detail. You want to get rid of the group of cursed people called Thawing Balhi. I want to get rid of the corrupt people who colluded with Thawing Balhi and establish a clean order in Arnon. Corrupt? Who is the corrupt person? Ilya placed three leaves on the round table and picked up one of them. It had a hole in it from where a worm had bitten through. Ilya raised it to his eyes. His blue eyes were visible through the hole. Arnon's mayor, Elsinad. Crocta nodded. He recalled Direk's voice. I have planned a few investments on the premise that you are successful in your revenge. 
Derek was betting on the collapse of the Arnon Mayor. Crocta looked into Ilias' eyes. Derek was absolutely not a good person. It was hard to believe in Ilya if he had a good relationship with Derek. Ilya shrugged. All you have to do is hit the thawing Balhi clan with me. I will take care of the rest, so don't worry. Um. But Crocta wasn't a good person either. His goal was a bloody revenge. Therefore, he would join hands with Ilya for the collapse of a common enemy. I understand. It sounds like you have decided to do it together with me, so let me explain in more detail. Ilya placed a hand on the round table. Suddenly, the wind blew away the leaves. In the past, Mayor Elsinad and I were friends. She was a dear friend of mine. His eyes became distant as he recalled the past. We once wanted to make Arnon a happy place for everyone. We were young. I helped her to become the mayor. However, she gradually changed. After getting the taste of power, she changed. Now she isn't the Elsinad that I knew anymore. Is this related to the Thawing Balhi clan? Of course. She is conspiring with those cursed by the stars called Thawing Balhaethi started elf trafficking and the reconstruction of the city. The people you want to are the dogs of Mayor Elsinad, the ones enjoying profit from her. Here, let me show you. Ilya beckoned to the air. Then two elves walked out from among the bushes. Crocta wasn't surprised since he had noticed them. Ilya introduced them, they are my friends. It is nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. They greeted Crocta. They felt sowing unusual in the orc's eyes. Crocta greeted them. Are you alive? I am the orc Crocta. Ilya explained Crocta's words. This is an orc greeting. The two elves moved. The group left the forest where the round table was located, heading in the opposite direction from the way Crocta entered. Crocta frowned as he saw the landscape outside of the forest. It was far from the glamorous Arnon that he saw earlier. There were crumbling buildings and houses that were just barely keeping their shape. These were the streets of the poor. It was like looking at the back alleys of a nail. I showed you Arnon's sunny spot earlier, while this is Arnon's shade. Nobody cares about this place. Suddenly, there was a disturbance. Ilya placed his finger to his lips in a shoe gesture. They approached the place through some shade. Crocta's eyes widened. A group of humans were kidnapping an elf in front of an old house. The elf's mouth was covered with a towel and her body restrained so that she couldn't move. The captured elf was twisting her body to resist, but she couldn't go against the strength of many. A kidnapping was taking place in broad daylight. Damn! Crocta tried to run out. However, Ilya grabbed Crocta. His body was greatly shaking. Ilya looked startled as he saw Crocta's arm trembling. Calm down. Look at that. I know where they are going. They are the small fries. Taking care of them will just make their leaders more vigilant. We must wipe them all out. The kidnappers disappeared with the elf. Crocta took deep breaths to try and calm his anger. You have a strong sense of justice. I'm really surprised. Ilya said, hang in there. I also want to save her right now. But numerous other women, children, and men have disappeared this way. We have to save them as well. Doesn't Arnon have security forces or guards? They do, but they don't come here. It is an abandoned area. One or two people will disappear and the empty houses will become a rich elven villa. He pointed to a distant place. New buildings were going up in that area. Elves and humans alike were sweating as they built a mansion. It was strange comparing the large building to the old and ruined houses. Crocta asked. What about the kidnapped people? There are only a few options. Sold into slavery, selling their bodies, or worse. Ilya placed an arm over Crocta's shoulder. I also feel the emotions that you are currently feeling. They looked around the slums for a while before entering the center of Arnon through the forest. It was a stunning city compared to the streets that he had just seen. Elves were smiling as they walked the streets, looking like they were from photographs of famous brands. But it no longer looked beautiful to Crocta. They'll introduce you to the inn where you will be staying for the time being. 
when will the plan begin? Tomorrow, or maybe as early as tonight. Crocta nodded. I know that orc warriors are tough, but there are many enemies. Be well prepared. Ilya guided Crocta to his accommodations. It was a small inn located on the corner of the main street. The owner was an old friend of Ilya's. He was surprised to see an orc but nodded at Ilya's description. Then he welcomed Crocta. It is the first time I will have an orc guest, ha ha ha. You are really big and strong. Elves aren't like this. Kohuhut. Despite being an elf, the owner had rugged muscles. There were a few muscular people among the elves. Yes, aren't you a little bit heavy? What is your weight? Is it three times mine? Ha ha. Next time, you should exercise with me. Ha ha. Ilya paid for the inn. Krokta put down his luggage, left the inn, and looked around Arnim. The rare appearance of an orc drew the attention of the elves. Krokta ignored their gazes and reached the fountain in the center of the main street. Can I ask you one thing? He talked to a young man sitting idly at the fountain. He was a human and he seemed to be thinking as he stared into the air. Then he looked startled as Krokta appeared. Wow, an orc. How surprising. What did you want to know? What is Mayor Elsinad like? Elsinad? She is an excellent mayor. She has made Arnon prosperous. Is that so? I hope she will be elected again. There is an upcoming election. I will vote as a citizen of Arnon. So she has no problems. Problem I heard that she's worried that her daughter isn't listening to her. Why? Do you want citizenship here? Sewing similar. Ha, huh, Arnon is a livable city. Welcome. I will think about it. By the way, what were you thinking about so intently just now? A hin fact the young man struggled to open his mouth. The person I love how to I want to confess what do you think about expressing my heart publicly? Would you be impressed? I'm going to do a surprise event after calling her. I'll make a heart with candles and serenade her, singing publicly in front of many people. Crocta shook his head. Get rid of that. Ha. Huh. Listen to my words. T then. Rather than a spectacular event, your sincerity will work better. Ah. It is better to confess your heart when the both of you are alone. Like this, he saved the life of the young man. Crocta finished the conversation and got up from his spot. Sewing had been irritating him from the beginning. Crocta turned his head. There was an elf looking at him from the middle of a crowd. He smiled as he noticed Crocta's gaze. Crocta approached him. It was Ilya. Are you following me? Yes, sewing like that. Please understand. Derek sent you, but I can't trust you straight away. He cleared his throat and placed an arm around Crocta's shoulder. Then he lowered his voice. I heard your conversation with that young man. Just like that young man, Arnon's citizens are being deceived. Everybody thinks she is a good person. The truth is what we saw. The awful truth. Crocta and Ilya moved with their shoulders close to each other. As Crocta walked a little bit, he saw Ilya's colleagues. They whispered sewing to Ilya. The date is decided. Tonight, we will move. I will stop by the inn at midnight. I'll see you then. Please be prepared. Crocta nodded. Ilya licked his lips before saying sewing else. Right now, your anger at their misdeeds is vivid. I have been waiting for someone with a strong sense of justice like you to come. He grinned. Arnon needs people like you. Welcome. Then. He disappeared into the crowd with his group. Crocta considered his words. A sense of justice. It didn't fit at all. He was angry at the scene, but that didn't mean that it was due to a sense of justice. Crocta looked in the direction that Ilya had disappeared in for a while. His eyes blazed. He just had common sense. Chapter, 35 The moon could be seen through the window. Crocta wore his great sword on his back, walking past the crowded pub on the inn's first floor and heading outside. The cool night air woke up his senses. You're early. Ilya and his companions were waiting. 
They wore masks covering their faces. Only their eyes shone in the darkness. Quickly. The sooner the better. Arnon was quiet at night. Except for some pubs that opened until dawn, they all turned off their lights. They moved quickly, rushing through the forest. They soon reached the slums that they had visited during the day. It was a street covered in darkness. As they stood there, it seemed like darkness was the only thing they could see. The slums were darker than the other areas of Arnon, all black without a single house lit up. Only the faint traces of moonlight filtered through the air without reaching the ground. Ilya whispered and created a faint, feeble fire that only revealed the immediate surroundings. Ilya gestured, as if to follow him. Ilya arrived at a broken-down building in a corner of the slums and released the fire. He took a deep breath and approached. As they listened, a faint sound was heard from inside the building. Ilya raised a finger to his mouth. Quiet. They had any noise and stepped closer. The dialogue leaked through. If this is successful, then won't it be the second largest one? Exactly. There are many old men standing in line for elves. Some of them have low assimilation rates. Assimilation rate. They were words that indicated that these were users. Crocta quietly raised a hand to the doorknob. It wasn't locked. They exchanged glances. Ilya gathered both hands together and muttered. Moisture was drawn from the air and became a sphere of water. Ilya summoned two in the air and then whispered. Enter quietly. Crocta and the elves nodded. Ilya gave a signal. The water spheres flew through the air. Crocta quickly opened the door and plunged in. The two humans sitting at the table were shocked by the sudden intrusion, but they had to cover their heads as the water spheres hit them. They were trapped in the water sphere and couldn't breathe properly. One of them was stabbed in the abdomen. The elves handled the other one. Both became unconscious and fell to the ground. Crocta tied up the users with the prepared rope and gagged them. The members of the thawing Balhi clan were thrown into a corner after being suppressed in an instant. Underground. Ilya started searching the floor. His hand grabbed sewing and lifted it up. There were stairs to the basement. Light was coming from the bottom. Faint words could be heard. There will be more down there. Then Ilya looked at the elves. As Krokta wants, overpower instead of ing those cursed by the stars. Yes. Let's go. The elves entered. Krokta followed. As they went down, a somewhat remodeled basement appeared. They slowly advanced. There was a tunnel that was like a mine shaft. At first, it looked rushed, but then an orderly structure started to appear. There was a bend in the path. A sound was heard. Krokta stopped in his tracks. Ilya tried to ask. However, a scream rang out. They looked at each other for a moment. Then they all ran forward at the same time. They doubted their eyes as they went beyond the bend. A horrifying sight. Two humans were raping a female elf. They repeatedly punched and kicked her when she resisted, as if they had no interest in the woman's life. The woman lying underneath the men already had bruises and scars all over her body. Another human was sitting at the table and giggling like it was funny. Behind him, a prison with steel bars were visible and countless elves were confined like dogs inside. It looked like hell. The empty eyes of the female elf was like a doll as she turned her head towards Crocta. At that moment, her eyes seemed to shake. Crocta angrily pulled out his greatsword. His sword shone in the light. The humans turned as they noticed the presence of an intruder. W what? Crocta rushed in. Ilya and his elves followed. First, he attacked the man raping the elf. The body of a man flew back from Crocta's attack and hit the steel bars. A few of the trapped elves looked up at the frenzy. Crocta stabbed the stomach of the other human, controlling his strength so that the man wouldn't die. He forced the opponent's legs off balance with his greatsword. The moment he was about to turn his blade towards the other person. A spherical fireball flew at him. Crocta hurriedly lifted his greatsword. However, before it hit him, the fireball slammed into an invisible barrier and disappeared. 
Krokta turned to see the smiling Ilya. Please be careful. Thank you. Krokta expressed his gratitude and slammed his knee into the human's face. The human's teeth flew through the air. Ilya's colleagues were also proficient in battle. The thawing Balhi clan members resisted with intense aggression and the fighting became longer. It was some time after the launch of Elder Lord, so the users had developed. However, the situation changed when Krokta exerted his power. A limb flew into the air every time Krokta's great sword moved. The lost limbs wriggled on the floor. Kukthis. How did you know Kuk? Krokta kicked their mouths. It cracked together and broke. Then they were tied up and gagged. The thawing Balhi members realized what was happening. They were shocked and struggled fiercely, but they couldn't stop Krokta. His burly hands tied up the struggling users in turn. In the end, all of the thawing Balhi members here were overpowered. Ilya recovered his breathing and looked at Krokta. The work isn't over yet. He found a bunch of keys and handed it over to his colleagues. The prison doors opened and the elves were released. There are a few more places like this. Krokta nodded. The night wasn't over yet. They raided several more bases through the night. Gradually, the level of the thawing Balhi clan members increased. Some people in Ilya's group were injured. Krokta was almost hit by a blow but managed to escape. So far, they had saved dozens of elves. This is the last one. They walked towards the house. It was bigger than the previous places they visited. All of them were in a mess due to the lasting battle. Thawing Balhi's response was stronger because they already communicated with each other. This was the last one and the enemies would be ready. As expected, powerful magic hit them as soon as they entered the house. Ugh. The shield spell that Ilya had prepared blocked the magic. However, the shock was conveyed, causing Ilya to turn pale. He would be queasy for a bit. It is a very well-made game. NPCs can cause such unexpected events. One man walked out. Krokta's face stiffened. He had see that face somewhere. It was the man standing next to the magician of the thawing Balhi clan at Lennox's last battle. But he didn't seem to recognize Krokta. He looked at Krokta and Ilya's companions before lifting his spear. I will get the orc. Your activities ends here. He pointed his spear at Krokta. The other clan members also raised the weapons, ready to rush forward at any time. The enemies were numerically superior, but the personal SS of Krokta and Ilya's group were outstanding. If the battle lasted too long, then reinforcements might come. It needed to be lightning quick. The two sides collided. Krokta's greatsword hit the man's spear. The man maintained his distance and stabbed the spear at Krokta. Krokta evaded, but the speed was faster than he expected, causing him to be hit in the thigh. Cook. The cut wasn't deep. The pain caused his movements to become uncomfortable. Krokta wiped his thigh and grasped his greatsword. The man grinned. Orc it would be difficult if I had a low level, but not anymore. Not anymore. He stepped back and forth. He was holding a spear, but his movements were reminiscent of boxing. Krokta moved forward and wielded his greatsword. The man quickly retreated, and then his spear aimed for the gap in Krokta's movements. The target was Krokta's shoulders. Take this, orc. But Krokta's shoulder twisted flexibly as he avoided the stab. Then he grabbed the spear with his arm and pulled. The man tried to hold on, but he couldn't overcome Krokta's muscular strength. Krokta spun his body. His body was swung around Krokta and then slammed into the ground. Kohak. It was a clean move. Krokta tried to stab the man with the great sword, but another clan member attacked him. Unfortunately, Krokta was forced to back off. He looked around and saw that all of the other elves were on the defensive. It was a tiring battle and it wasn't easy due to the difference in numbers. Who? More than I thought Ilya muttered. The eyes above the mask frowned. I am going to have to use some strength. Protect me. The elves gathered around Ilya. There was a powerful wave of magic power. 
The gazes of man who got up with the support of a clan member turned towards Ilya. He felt so insuious and aimed his spear towards Ilya. Krokta blocked him. The man looked at Krokta and twisted his lips like he was annoyed. You. He raised his spear. Everyone attack him. He pointed towards Ilya. The thawing Balhi members charged towards Ilya. The elves thwarted them. While the clan members and elves fought, Ilya's spell was being completed. The chant was in its final stages. Sewing started to emerge over Ilya's head. The man confronting Krokta threw his spear at this moment. It was a powerful throw. Krokta hurriedly tried to stop it with his greatsword, but he was too late. It aimed straight towards Ilya. Ilya had his eyes closed, so he didn't know about the spear. Krokta didn't even have time to yell. The spear passed by Ilya. The chant stopped. Hugh Ilya wiped the sweat off his forehead. The spear aimed at Ilya had narrowly passed him and struck the wall, leaving a long scar on Ilya's cheek. At the same time, his mask was torn. Ilya's face was revealed. I almost died. Ilya laughed as he wiped at the wound on his cheek. The chant had been completed. Sewing Unknown was waving its tail above his head. It had the appearance of a long snake made of water. It seemed to be a dragon at first sight. Then it spread its wings and opened its mouth. Cold air emerged and lowered the surrounding temperature. It was an elemental summoned by Ilya. The thawing Balhi members fell back. Krokta's eyes headed back to the enemy. The man who threw the spear was now weaponless. He was scheduled to receive concrete. But his expression was strange. You. He was staring at Ilya, not Krokta. But Ilya shouted before he could speak. Undine. Attack. The summoned dragon penetrated the man's body. He screamed in pain and fell to the ground. His body changed into white particles. He was dead. Krokta stared at Ilya. Right now, we are in a hurry. There is no time to capture everyone since reinforcements are coming. I know your situation, but please understand. I understand. Krokta nodded. The fight began again. After Ilya summoned Undine, the battle turned to their advantage. The clan members were either ed or captured. All of the thawing Balhi members in this city had been swept away. The group explored the interior of the house and found more victims. The rescued elves thanked Ilya and Krokta. But Ilya seemed to be searching for sewing else. It is really here. After going through the house for a while, Ilya emerged with sewing. It was a thick book. It is a book. Ilya quickly confirmed the contents. The letters inside the book made it look like a ledger. A smile flashed on his face. This is a record of all the dirty dealings between them and Elsinad. Chapter, 36 I know why you are so obsessed with being a guard, Elsinad spoke. She was checking the shape of her earrings in the mirror. When she touched it with her fingers, the transparent earrings moved and scattered light at various angles. Elsinad was satisfied with the brilliance and quietly laughed. The reflection in the mirror showed Elwina's sour expression. But how long can you keep it up? I will do it for as long as I want. There is good in the world Elwina, as well as poison. Elsinad rose from her seat. She spent most of her day working as the highly respected mayor of Arnon. The only personal time she had to herself was when she prepared her appearance before going to the city hall in the morning. As an elf, she was sensitive about her appearance and painstakingly managed it. Elwina, who inherited her blood, was no different from her. Fortunately, both of them had prominent beauty among elves, and were never dissatisfied because of their appearance. However, unique hobbies would form due to their high sense of aesthetics. In Elwina's case, it was dolls. There won't be much room for your collections anymore. She made the dolls directly. There was only one of them in the world so she appreciated their unique charms. I'm tired of pretty elves. I need new materials. As a guard, she was able to see many groups of people traveling to Arnon. The strangers and members of other species gave her a type of inspiration different from the elves. It is awkward because you've only loved elves. 
then are you planning on making an orc doll? Elwina didn't answer, so Elsinad turned towards her. Her daughter had a confused expression on her face. Elsinad burst out laughing. Elwina, I'm glad that you are forsaking the prejudice against other species, but I am worried about your blush all of a sudden. Did you meet an orc? That's right. It has been a really long time since an orc has entered Arnim. Maybe it is a good thing for Arnim. Elsinad rose from her seat. In her elegant dress, beautiful earrings, and necklace, she looked like a goddess from a piece of artwork. Elsinad's secretary, who was watching them talk, opened the door. Mayor, it is time to go. I understand. Just before she left the room, she looked at her adorable daughter Elwina. Daughter. I know I have been negligent towards you since your childhood. I have always felt sorry about that. It's nothing. Come here. Elsinad stretched out her hands and hugged Elwina, patting her on the back. Elwina looked at the secretary like she was embarrassed by the sudden embrace, but she soon hugged her mother back. I am your mother, but I am also the mother of all of the citizens in Arnim. I'm aware of that. You don't have to worry. You've always said that since I was a child. I appreciate your understanding. If you can live in a happier and more beautiful Arnim, isn't it worth it? Elsinad released Elwina from her arms. Most of the plans that I first thought about are currently ongoing. Once I am mayor again after the election, I will do what I can for Arnim. Yes. At that time, I want to retire and spend more time with you. Elwina nodded. Next time, show me your dolls again. They are beautiful. Yes. Elwina smiled. Elsinad touched her daughter's cheeks. She was a stubborn daughter, but she looked like an angel when she smiled. She was reminded of her dead husband. Then, I'll be going. Goodbye. Elsinad kissed her daughter on the cheek and left the room. Her secretary followed. As soon as they left home, she turned to business straight away. How are they? Is it going well in the slums? Of course. I'm glad. It is my long-cherished wish, so I am sorry that I felt any doubts. They entered a carriage. As the carriage moved through Arnim, citizens waved and greeted their mayor. Elsinad smiled at the citizens through the window. Everybody is happy, I think. It is all thanks to you. The old Arnon wasn't beautiful. It made me sick. Elsinad's secretary, Alcyon shrugged. He was firmly dedicated to his boss, Elsinad. However, her passion and enthusiasm was solely based on her own strict standards of beauty. This often led to gaps between ideals and reality. It was his role to point this out. The citizens of the slums will also smile like that, Elsinad said. They will. Hulhut. Just. Just. The cost of the new building seems to be excessive. Don't just try to make it pretty when building. I know that you are sensitive to beauty, but you have to compromise. In particular, the statue of benevolence in the slums is a bit. Isn't it okay? It won't work. It is a waste of money. Really? Yes. I strongly oppose it. Elsinad's ears dropped. Alcyon's heart weakened, but he didn't give in as he declared, it is nonsense. I understand. I will take care of it. Thank you. Elsinad wanted to build a statue of the goddess of mercy in the slums. It would look good, but the cost was a problem. She was crestfallen, but Alcyon pretended not to know. She looked out the window and suddenly laughed. Alcyon, look. A sheep cloud. Alcyon's gaze moved. A cloud in the sky was shaped like a sheep. It was a rare and beautiful sight. Elsinad's eyes lit up like a girl who liked pretty things. Pretty. Elsinad grabbed Alcyon's shoulder and enjoyed it. Alshan also smiled. Krokta wiped out the thawing Balhi clan, which had been committing evils in Arnim. Most of the clan members were rendered unable to play the game, and Ian got some revenge for Lennox. But the thawing Balhi clan wasn't based only in Arnon. Arnon was just the beginning. He still had to clear them from a few other cities. However, Direk's contract still remained. 
Krokta's work in Arnon wasn't over yet. These were the conditions. Elsinad, or help Ilya win the election and become mayor. According to the contract, he could those who took part in the crime. Direk's goal was to make his business partner, Ilya, hold the reins of power in Arnon. If Mayor Elsinad was Ed, and if her wicked deeds were publicized, things would become easier. But Krokta decided to watch some more. It was sufficient if Ilya was elected mayor. Ilya was questionable. There were many suyas and unknown things about him. No matter how long he had been preparing, he knew all of the information about the thawing Balhi clan and guided Krokta through their secret passages. Most of all, the man who seemed to be the leader of the thawing Balhi clan in Arnon was surprised when he saw Ilya's face. Then Ilya had blocked the man's mouth by ing him. Krokta, young Ian, had gone through all types of things as a soldier. He wasn't always on the right side. He often saw those involved in power cover the truth with deception and move people according to their will. To him, his task here was over so he was just playing around now. Thus, he didn't intervene anymore and just watched Ilya. Arnon citizens. I have sewing I must tell you. It is the truth. The dirty and ugly truth. Ilya stood in the square and shouted at people. It was Arnon's election season. Support for Elsinad was overwhelming, so the vote was close to a formality. They would run the competition, but the winner would always be Elsinad. But this time might be different. What type of person is Elsinad? A clean person? A mayor who makes sacrifices for Arnon? If so, you have been tricked. She isn't such a person. Ilya shouted. His words, enhanced through magic, rang out through the square. The citizens passing by stopped. It was irritating to hear such things about their beautiful mayor. The citizens were interested in what Ilya was saying. As you all know, not every place in Arnon is beautiful. There are slums. You don't want to see it or admit it, but Arnon doesn't just consist of rich elves like you. There are the poor and persecuted. And Elsinad. He spoke about how Elsinad joined with those cursed by the stars, trafficking and enslaving elves through them. The citizens didn't believe it. To them, Elsinad absolutely wasn't such a person. But Ilya held the clear evidence high in the air. Take a look at this book. All of their transactions with Elsinad have been recorded here. Ilya opened the book and thrust it before the eyes of the spectators. It agitated the crowd. Ilya didn't stop. His powerful voice resonated in the square. People started to believe his words. Ilya's fellow elves among the crowd led the response. Krokta watched silently and turned away. Ilya was Suyas, but Krokta had no evidence. Whether it was true or false wasn't his problem. Krokta just wanted revenge for Lennox. It wasn't the same as justice. It was up to them to do their share. At that moment, there was a disturbance in a corner of the square. Mayor Elsinad's carriage had appeared. City Hall was just across the square so Elsinad was confronted with Ilya as she arrived at work. The citizens had interested expressions on their faces. Elsinad didn't know what was happening and just wanted to pass through the square. But Ilya blocked her horse-drawn carriage. The driver asked him to move aside but Ilya was adamant. Elsinad. Reveal the truth. You can't fool us anymore. The driver spoke inside the carriage. Then the carriage door opened and Elsinad stuck her head out. The citizens shouted as her beautiful face was exposed. Ilya. Elsinad's eyes widened. Ilya's expression didn't change as he approached her and shouted. Elsinad. All of your crimes are recorded here. Are you pretending not to know? You are a corrupt mayor who sold the elves to those who are cursed for the sake of your own self-interest. Ilya, this. At that time, Alcyon spoke to the driver of the carriage. He had a sense of what Ilya was trying to do. Move around that person. Leave now. Alcyon. Let's go. Mayor, please ignore this. That person is trying to incite the citizens. You don't need to deal with it. But. There is no need to move as he desires. Just go. Leave now. 
The driver moved the horses. The carriage redirected and moved around Ilya to leave the square. Ilya looked back and shouted louder. Look at this. Elsinad is avoiding the truth and running away. The crowd murmured. A smile appeared on Ilya's face. He once again raised his voice. Let's find out the truth about Elsinad, who has lied to the citizens. Chapter 37 Kraka snuck through the slums to search for the remaining members of the thawing Balhi clan, but none remained. There were no noticeable users in the vicinity. It seems like they had withdrawn from Arnon. The elves living in the slums were at work, so it was quiet. Only the voices of the workmen building in the slums were occasionally heard. Were they doing sewing wrong? Krokta wandered for a while before suddenly stopping in front of the construction site. Krokta's eyes widened. It was due to the appearance of the sweaty workers holding the construction tools. Hey! Move carefully. Don't get hurt. Phew, why am I doing this in a game? That's what I said. A white star was shining on the foreheads of the workers. Krokta examined each one of their faces. There were NPCs, but the majority of them were users. They were wearing protective gear and using construction place jargon like they were actual builders. Hey, orc. A man sitting on the floor and drinking water waved at Krokta. He also had a white star on his forehead. This is the first time I've seen an orc in Arnhem. If you want to build a house then tell me. We can make it for cheap. Krokta looked at the entrance of the construction site. The sign, Kangaroo Construction was hung there. Below was an advertisement for prompt construction at low prices. Krokta asked. Are you people cursed by the stars? Eh. How do you know? The man was confused. Well, we are cursed but does it matter? We are cursed, but we build for a cheap price, and we do it quickly. So if you have some land, tell me. We will build it nicely. Ha ha ha. They were users who enjoyed the architectural field in Elder Lord. Their deft movements indicated that they were people who actually worked in the construction industry. There was a brief overview of the construction posted at the entrance of the construction site. Name of Project New Construction of the Benevolence Medical Aid Client Arnon City Contractor Kangaroo Construction Building Usage Public Medical and Support for the Underprivileged Facility Krokta scrutinized it carefully and the man shrugged. Do you need a job? An orc should have enough strength so do you want to try it? No. Do you know the Thawing Balhi clan? Thawing Balhi? I know. The man nodded. They connected us to the mayor here. They are quite dishonorable, but we didn't have a choice. Do you know them? I don't know. I see. Be careful not to tangle with them. It seems like they are doing bad things to amuse themselves. NPCs, no, they don't like orcs. Ha <laughs> ha. The overseer called out to the man. He got up from his seat. I'm going, I'm going. So brother, stop wagging your tongue. The man ran back and continued working on the construction. Krokta looked after him thoughtfully. Ilya had said that this building would become a villa for the rich elves, but that wasn't it. It was a medical facility for the poor. His mind became complicated. Ilya. His face popped into Krokta's head. He seemed friendly, but his real intentions were unknown. The surprised thawing Balhi member seemed to know Ilya. He was ed by Ilya before he could open his mouth. Ilya made a deal with Derek. Derek wasn't a good man. Rather, it was the opposite. Derek and Krokta just joined hands to use each other. Krokta absolutely didn't trust Derek. Was he being deceived? Krokta sighed. His purpose was revenge on the thawing Balhi clan. It wasn't necessary to worry about other things. Whether he was being used or not, it was sufficient if he wiped out the thawing Balhi clan. Therefore, he tried to turn away. But sewing kept nagging at him, making his heart uncomfortable. He stood still to think about it. Krokta closed his eyes and looked into his heart. Ah! Krokta opened his eyes. It was him. He was there. He was watching Krokta from the bottom of his heart. 
I understand Lennox. Crockta touched his chest. The scar created by Lennox's axe would be there forever, along with the laws of a warrior that he preached. Before he left Arnon, he needed to know the truth about what was happening in this city. It wasn't too late to decide how to act after confirming the truth. Crockta moved again. Enyanis, the plane's administrator, looked between the two people who came to visit him with a difficult expression. What are you? One of them was the orc warrior Crockta, whom Enyanis had directly granted an honorary citizenship. The other person was his friend, Secretary Alcyon, who was Elsinad's shadow. Crockta, sit down. Alcyon, what are you doing here? Enyanis served tea. The three of them were facing each other in the drawing room. Crockta didn't know who Alcyon was and got straight to the point. Enyanis, I have a question. Enyanis nodded. It was the first time hearing the orc's voice. After becoming an honorary citizen, Enyanis learned that Crockta had been unable to speak due to silence magic. What is Elsinad like as a mayor? Then Alcyon looked at Crockta. Why was an orc asking about the mayor of this city? Enyanis burst out laughing. It is funny that you are asking me this when this friend is right in front of you. Maybe it is because of the disturbance that happened yesterday. Enyanis pointed to Alcyon. He is the mayor's secretary. Crockta looked at Alcyon. Alcyon greeted him lightly. Enyanis said, for the answer, I'm not saying this as his friend, but I personally think she is wonderful. Everyone's opinion is different, but I respect Elsinad. I don't believe Ilya's words. Do you know Ilya? I know. Alcyon, did you come because of Ilya? Alcyon nodded. I know that he once worked with Elsinad. I heard that after Elsinad first became mayor, he caused trouble and was fired he is probably spreading these rumors due to that. That's right, it's absurd. The mayor selling citizens. It isn't funny. Alcyon's voice was ferocious. Enyani said, however, there are rumors that Elsinad ran away from him. The fact that she didn't deny his claim on the spot has left the citizens shaken. You should have been there. Why did you do that? That. Alcyon sipped his tea. Cough. That she shouldn't have to deal with such a person. There might be problems if she responds too quickly. It obviously isn't true, but it is a betrayal for the people who believe it. Regardless, an explanation is needed. Not responding will make the rumor more pervasive. I know. Alcyon thought about it. Then he looked at Crocta. Crocta, it is nice to meet you. You have become an honorary citizen. Enyanis told me about your excellent behavior the other day. It isn't a big deal. As a citizen who works with the mayor, I can say that the mayor absolutely isn't such a person. Of course, there are other things but thanks to these unusual aspects, she has done a good job. Arnon is prospering thanks to her. I understand. If you have any more questions, then I will answer them now. Is there anything else you are curious about? Crockta was troubled. Well how about the mayor's daughter? He heard the other day that the mayor was worried about her daughter not listening to her. Alcyon's face hardened for a moment. But then a smile appeared on his face. Ha ha ha. You are interested in her daughter. I am just curious. She is beautiful like the mayor. She wants to keep working as a guard that is the worry but there are no problems. She is just young. Yes. If you continue to watch, then you will see that everything is fictional. Anyways, welcome to Arnon. I need to return to the mayor. Alcyon rose from his seat. Enyani said, are you going already? I forgot that the mayor called me. He'll come back next time. Yes, thank you. Alcyon left this place with large strides. Crockta was deep in thought as he looked at Alcyon's back. As the door to the drawing room closed, Enyani sipped his tea and said in a quiet voice. Crockta. In fact, I have sewing to say to you. What is it? Enyani's coughed. Crockta listened closely. The Arnon Plains Rescue Unit, inspired by Crockta, is very responsive. The reaction is explosive. So it makes sense. Can I draw a portrait of you? 
They'll also create a nice invitation for you and frame it hanging them side by side in them, it will go down in Arnon's history. I know a great painter. That's okay. Just think about it once. It's okay. Still. Elsinad looked up. She was in her office. Her desk and appliances were neatly arranged and all in harmony. The whole room looked like it was made for her. It was all Elsinad's vision. Alcyon. Mayor. Alcyon stood in front of her. Didn't you get today off? She asked. I have sewing to say to you. Elsinad took off the glasses that she was using to look at the doings. Her vivid green eyes stared at Alcyon. What is it? There are some people who believe Ilias' words. The election is upcoming. It would be better to take care of this at once. Elsinad nodded. If Alcyon says so. Ilya still seems to have some complaints against me. I will personally explain it to the citizens. I'll ask Ilya about the rumors that are stirring up the citizens. Do you have anything else to say? And. And. It is about Elwina. Elsinad at her head. Elwina? Yes. Hasn't Ilya started acting? It might be dangerous for Elwina to go around like this. She is careful. I understand. I'll tell her. I'll explain it to her properly. Thank you. Alcyon nodded and bowed. Then let's go. Huh? Where? Didn't Alcyon say it just now? Elsinad got up from her desk and wore the coat that was hanging on the wall. The cloth was the color of the sky, making her white skin shine. Elsinad dressed up and smiled at Alcyon. The whole room seemed to light up from her beautiful smile. I'm going to see the citizens. Now. Of course. Elsinad passed by Alcyon. It won't be beautiful if they keep on talking. I need to get rid of it quickly. Due to Elsinad's beautiful appearance, people often thought that she was gentle or weak. But she absolutely wasn't. Rather, it was close to the opposite. Elsinad was strong. She had difficult standards. The things that didn't meet those standards would be thoroughly excluded. She didn't care about contrary opinions. She just wanted to accomplish what she desired. In that sense, she was closer to being heartless than being gentle. Her beautiful appearance and attitude didn't reveal her essence. It was fortunate that her dream was Arnon's prosperity. After thinking this, Alcyon spoke to Elsinad, they'll prepare the carriage. Where are you going? The square. Everyone should be there. Prepare a podium. I understand. I will let the citizens know. Please. Elsinad, Alcyon, and her attendants headed towards Arnon Central Square. Crocta and Ilya were also there. Chapter, 38. Elsinad bowed to the citizens, her voice filled with sincerity. She explained about the allegations. She wanted to increase the number of facilities in the slums, and had contracted those cursed by the stars at a cheap price in order to solve the budget problem. She admitted that there was some trouble in the meantime. Citizens, I have only been working for Arnon. I believe that all of the citizens here knows my heart. I didn't think they would commit such evil things. It is my fault. I will bow down and apologize. They nodded. The elves that were freed from thawing Balhi by Ilya were touched after Elsinad's speech. As witnesses of the crimes committed, Ilya had brought them here to testify. But Elsinad's eloquence caused their hearts to shake. Ilya's face gradually stiffened, and Krokta was watching all of this. Elsinad came down from the podium and hugged all of the victims. She promised to compensate them for the damage and tearfully emphasized with the pain they suffered. She expressed her strong will to thoroughly search for the criminals. Crocta used A.S. Mind's Eye Special has been used. The target's level is higher than the caster. It has failed. He used it again. He used it several times, but the result was the same. Crocta frowned and concentrated. Mind's Eye Special has opened. You can feel fine but sincere emotions. Then Ilya drew near to shout at Elsinad. Elsinad's expression as shaken and she protested. As her emotions grew, 
Crocta was able to grasp a little bit of her heart through mind's eye. How do you explain this ledger? Elson add. This is the physical evidence. I don't know. The contents might have been manipulated. I would never do this. There is no criminal who would admit to their sins. Ilya raised the book up high. This details how much they sold the poor elves for, and how much money they gave to the mayor in return. Citizens, don't be fooled by Elsinad's slick tongue. This woman is a demon who sold her own citizens. The citizens started murmuring again. The level of the target is higher than the caster, but his frenzied emotions are emanating from him. Feelings of deceit can be felt. Elsinad's emotions were heartfelt. Feelings of deception could be felt from Ilya. For Crocta, it was clear what the truth was. I couldn't save all of the elves that were sold. I can't leave this city to such a suyous woman. Citizens. Please find out. Here is the proof. Ilya, calm down. Everybody, he is spreading rumors to tarnish my honor. Then bring proof that this evidence is false, Elsinad. The citizens were once again confused. In the end, the two campaigns failed to come to a conclusion. As Arnon's election approached, both of them were being talked about by the citizens. Those who believed in Ilya and those who believed in Elsinad hit the streets. Others believed that Elsinad wasn't guilty, but she should take responsibility for neglecting this incident. Arnon was in a state of confusion. Crocta went and visited Ilya. Ilya. Crocta, did sewing happen? Ilya was scratching his head while writing, like sewing wasn't going well. He raised his head at Crocta's appearance. Ilya's mansion was very luxurious. He was clearly a wealthy person, and it seemed that he was funding his own political activities. It was impossible for someone with an economic crisis to plan such a thing. I have to ask you sewing. What is it? Il just speak bluntly. Crocta closed the door. Did you doctor that ledger? Ilya's expression changed. He pulled out the ledger, an old, leather-bound book, from the drawer under his desk. He opened the book, revealing the many transactions written inside. Manipulated Elsinad said that. Ilya laughed. He stared at Crocta for a moment. Crocta looked back without any hesitation. Ilya's eyes shook. His expression was calm, but feelings of irritation and anger filled his eyes. Ilya threw the book. It flew and landed at Crocta's feet. Then he said. Whether it is manipulated or not. Ilya pulled out another book from his drawer. It looked exactly the same as the previous book. The same contents were also written inside. Ilya chuckled and threw it at Crocta's feet. Does it have anything to do with you? You made a deal with Derek, just like me. You just have to do your assignment. Stop doing such useless things, Crocta. A few more similar books were pulled out of Ilya's desk. Ilya laughed as he looked at them. Anyway, you came here for revenge against the thawing Balhi clan due to the orc called Lennox. Crocta's expression changed at the mention of Lennox's name. Ilya continued, Direct's warning for me was true. He did say that orcs were righteous. I told him I would handle it. Did you deceive me? It wasn't deception, but proper cooperation. Didn't you catch those guys, thanks to me? Can you continue to catch those cursed by the stars without me? Can you handle the tiring work while watching your own life, without my help? We each did what we needed to do, that's it. Ilya got up from his seat. His beautiful face, which had always been smiling, distorted. This caused a word that didn't suit the elves to appear in Crocta's mind. Ugly. His true face was ugly. Yes, I will tell you everything. I sold the elves together with the people from Thawing Balhi. I had a deal with them. And I got tired of them. I had drained just enough from them. Those cursed by the stars, did they really think I would deal with them forever? Thank you for your help. He spread his arms and laughed. Anyway, I will become Arnon's next mayor. That's it. You can leave quietly. Ugly. Everyone is like this if you dig deeply enough. I'm just being honest. Ilya approached Crocta. Crocta didn't move. 
The faint shape of an elemental was around Ilya's body. The appearance of the elemental was distorted like Ilya. If you want to reveal anything then do so, orc warrior. Then I, along with Derek, won't help you anymore. I wonder if the citizens will trust the word of an orc. Why don't you just worry about your revenge? Otherwise it will be a waste. Ilya raised his hand. The door behind Krokta was opened using magic power. Krokta, I quite like you. I don't like you. Our motivations are different, but we are similar when it comes to moving forward towards our purpose. In fact, I actually like justice. Isn't it good? Justice and judgment. However, I don't want them shoved towards me. Ilya waved his hand. Well, bye. It was a command to leave. Krokta looked at Ilya's face. It was a familiar smile. As he nodded and turned around, Krokta thought about his own actions. Alcyon entered Elsinad's residence. It was beautiful, but at the same time, he couldn't erase the feeling of desolation. Everything was well maintained and kept the same. The garden was always kept in the same shape that never changed, even with the passing seasons. Gardeners watched the landscape with bated breath each and every day. Inside the mansion. He bumped into an elf maid. She flinched and hurriedly moved, entering an open room and not leaving until Alcyon passed by. Alcyon was familiar with this place, so he kept moving. He arrived at the drawing room and saw that refreshments were already prepared. However, there were no signs of the people who prepared it. It was like he was alone in the mansion. Those who worked in Elsinad's mansion were never allowed to show themselves. They had to work for Elsinad's convenience in incongruous ways. It was the same whether they were gardeners, maids, or cooks. They obviously existed somewhere, but Alcyon couldn't see them. That was Elsinad's mansion. This was because someone coming and going while working would disturb the beauty of the mansion. It was a standard close to perfection that others couldn't understand. Elsinad was the one who made it happen. Alcyon sipped his tea. Elsinad couldn't be seen. She wasn't in the mansion right now. Suddenly, a familiar face appeared. Elwina. Young lady. Alcyon, what happened? She seemed to be in a good mood. Her smiling face resembled Elsinad. She moved like she had done so in good like a child who had received a Christmas present. It was a beautiful sight for anyone to see. But Alcyon's face hardened as he saw her. Ha! Huh. Perhaps. Alcyon put down his cup of tea. It's nothing. Why? What is it? Alcyon touched the cup with his fingers and asked again. You look good. Did you get a new doll? How did you know? Alcyon rose from his seat and approached Elwina. Her green eyes that resembled Elsinad's looked up at Alcyon. What did I tell you? Alcyon caught her shoulder. You shouldn't do this hobby. Why can't I do what I want? The daughter of Arnon's mayor. Are you angry right now? Elwina pouted. Her pink lips looked dirty, and Alcyon turned his head like he couldn't speak anymore. I should be going back. Tell the mayor to come and meet me tomorrow. Elwina smiled, but Alcyon immediately turned his body around. He quickly left the mansion. Elwina's face appeared in his head. Elwina's face gradually shifted to Elsinad's face. He shook his head. Ilya's voice shouting in the square entered his head. Alcyon tried to get rid of it again. He felt dizzy and stopped in the middle of the street. Looking around, he spotted a familiar shape. It wasn't a common appearance in Arnon. The person gradually approached. Alcyon. It was the orc Krokta. Krokta, what a coincidence. Krokta shook his head. No. I was looking for you. He smiled. The orc smile was strange, but Alcyon couldn't think it was terrible after being told about Krokta by Enyanis. He didn't know about all orc warriors, but this one was a man who deserved to be an honorary citizen. Krokta asked. Would you like a drink? Alcyon was surprised by the sudden offer. Drink. A drink. It had been a long time since he last drank alcohol, but it didn't seem to be too bad of an idea right now. Elwina's face was sitting heavily in his head, 
so he could wash it away with strong alcohol. He wanted to get rid of the faces of Elsinad, Elwina, and Ilya that were making him sick. Krokta was a stranger, but he seemed more reliable than anyone else Alcyon knew. The usual Alcyon would have never done sewing like this. But right now, he wanted to do it. They entered a small pub nearby. The elves stared at Krokta the orc, but soon went back to their own affairs. The two people sat down in the corner. Elves generally drank fruit wine that had a fairly high alcohol content. You came to find me? Yes. Krokta drank the alcohol. The elven cups seemed small to him. Let me talk for a bit. Do you know the reason why I came here? Well, I'm curious. The two raised their glasses. Krokta started talking about his past. Lennox's work, the man who betrayed him, the attack of the humans, and Krokta's revenge. Krokta told a brief story, but it was enough to show what type of orc he was. As a warrior, he set out for vengeance against the humans who ate his teacher. As the story continued, the number of bottles in front of both of them increased. Alcyon wasn't a strong drinker. His eyes gazed into the distance as he put down his cup. His eyes shone as he started swaying and asked. Why are you telling this story? Krokta talked about his past, the reason why he came here and about Ilya. The ledger was false and Ilya was the one who had done all the bad things. Then want your revenge go to waste. It was important for Krokta to get rid of the thawing Balhi clan, but he could lose that chance for revenge if he told the truth. Don't you already know? Krokta laughed. Alcyon silently drank the alcohol again. Those words. It was a question that didn't need an answer. There was no reason to tell a lie. However, the truth was a heavy burden on Alcyon. The reason for not revealing the truth was due to the people who hid it. Alcyon gazed at Krokta. A dreadful face, a muscled body, some fierce tattoos, and a fearsome greatsword on his back. He was a strong warrior. If Krokta was self-interested, then this could backfire. But Alcyon wasn't worried at all. For the first time in ages, he could trust someone. Krokta. Yes. Are you alive? Krokta laughed. Alcyon had been deeply troubled after hearing Krokta talk about Lennox's death and his final teachings. Then he asked himself was he truly alive? Or was he merely breathing? He couldn't respond, so he wanted to hear Krokta's answer. Krokta opened his mouth, of course I am alive. How come? Krokta took a sip of the alcohol and laughed. I am breathing right now. Kung Kung Kung. I see. Hu hu. Kul Kul Kul. Krokta and Alcyon both burst out laughing. The laughter stopped and Alcyon nodded. He stared at the little bit of alcohol left in his cup and thought about sewing. Alcyon looked at a distant place and said, Krokta. And Yanis asked me, when Ilya first started the accusations, why did the mayor leave, instead of responding straight away? That's right. Since you have told me the truth, I will tell you the truth. I am drunk, so listen carefully before I regret it. What? At the time, I thought it would be enough. Krokta closed his mouth. Alcyon stated, Krokta. Alcyon drank the alcohol remaining in the cup. He stared at Krokta with eyes that seemed completely sober. Go to the basement in Mayor Elsinad's home. After his words, Alcyon lost consciousness and his head dropped down. Chapter, 39 Under the cover of night, Krokta crossed the wall. Mayor Elsinad's mansion was quiet. He walked past the garden and up to the front door. He turned the doorknob, opening the door. A deep darkness blanketed the inside. Krokta stepped forward. His footsteps echoed thanks to the structure of the mansion. His eyes scanned the darkness. The mansion, which was beautiful under the sun, looked creepy in the darkness. Chobiak. Chobiak. He crossed the corridor while looking in the rooms. None of the doors were locked. He passed by the deserted ones. Then suddenly, Krokta saw a shape looking at him in the darkness. It was a statue. The faint moonlight shining through the windows gave him a glimpse of the outline. It was a statue of an elf staring into the air. 
Crocta reached out to it. The texture of cold plaster could be felt. The physical shape looked real, and it seemed like it would move in the darkness. Crocta slowly turned his gaze to the side. The elf statue was guarding sewing. The door was firmly closed. He grabbed the handle, but the door didn't open. It was the only locked place that he had discovered in Elsinad's mansion. Crocta looked around. It was dark but his eyes could see the shape of everything. Nothing moved. There were no indications of any people. It was eerie. Crocta gave strength to his hand. He gripped the doorknob tightly. It gradually creaked until it fell off with a low sound. Pieces of the door fell off. The door opened. Crocta entered. Then he flinched once again. In the large room, there were several statues similar to the one at the entrance. They looked so alive that he almost swung his greatsword at them. Crocta explored inside. In addition to the statues, paintings were hung on the walls. The paintings were expensive pieces of artwork signed by the artist. It was a room where Elsinad's aesthetics could be felt. Crocta wandered through the room and paused in front of a painting. It was crude compared to the other paintings. However, it was the sign name below that made him stop. Elwina. Elsinad's daughter. It was a crude work with a human and elf standing side by side. Elwina had tried to draw every detail, despite her lack of SS. It was a painting drawn by a person with a high interest in the human body. Crocta looked at it for a while before lifting the painting from the wall. He found it. There was a recess in the wall where the painting was hanging, with a button inside. Crocta pressed it. The floor started to tremble slightly. Crocta turned his head towards the sound. The bottom of the floor was slowly opening. Slowly, stairs leading downwards were revealed. They were stairs heading to the basement. Alcyon's voice telling him to visit Elsinad's basement popped into Crocta's head. It was here. Crocta took one step. It was a small passage for him. One step, two steps, his footsteps echoed as he descended. He headed downwards for a while before reaching the end of the stairs. There was a door. Sewing was beyond it. Crocta remembered Alcyon's eyes. His eyes had been shaking. What did he know? What was he troubled over? Crocta opened the door. Then he took one step. A chill went down his spine. There were the dark shadows of dozens of people who were looking at Crocta in the darkness. He lowered the hand that had moved to the handle of his greatsword. His fingers shook. They didn't move. Inside the basement there were people staring blankly at the air, not at Crocta. Crocta's heart sank as he saw their faces. The face of Elwina, who greeted visitors at the entrance of Arnon, popped into his head. He later found out that she was Elsinad's daughter. He thought that she was just a spoiled person. But that wasn't it. In fact, she had a world of her own that she couldn't communicate with others. It was a world that could never be tolerated. Crocta reached for a nearby elf. He felt soft skin, but it was cool and didn't feel alive. Is this why she's so obsessed with working as a guard? Alcyon had said this in passing and Crocta now realized what he meant. She chose victims that no one would care about if they died. No one would know where and how they had disappeared. Visitors disappeared in droves after visiting Arnim. Elwina's goal was those visitors. Crocta was no exception. It is a tragedy. Crocta muttered. His head dropped as he was surrounded by dozens of stuffed victims. All of them were beautiful. A face with beautiful proportions. Dark blue eyes. Unusual hair color or pinkish red lips. The slender legs, elegant shoulders, and long, delicate necks made them victims. Elwina had stuffed them to maintain their beauty and to keep them forever in her collection. It was a horrible tragedy. Crocta closed his eyes. Their sins weighed heavily on him. Arnon was a beautiful city, but it was an abode where numerous beasts with human faces were tangled together. A demon sold his people for wealth and power, deceiving his victims with a smile. The other demon, who stuffed the visitors of the city, strolled among the citizens under the protection of her mother. All of the citizens believed in and followed them. 
It was a terrible mess of deception and evil. There was no truth anywhere. Krokta's hand clenched into a fist, his body starting to uncontrollably shake. The stuffed truths were staring at Krokta. He raised his eyes. His eyes met those of an elf child. The little elf child was smiling. That smile was stopped forever. Krokta sighed. Lennox. His face popped into Krokta's head. What would you do? Would you have an answer for this tragedy? Lennox looked at him and smiled. He slowly opened his mouth. Lennox's voice echoed. He only said one word to Krokta, but it was enough. There was always only one answer. Krokta nodded. Bolter. The sun shone in the sky. Ilya and Mayor Elsinad met again in the square to debate over the controversial issue and to determine who the next mayor would be. The two mayor candidates. Elsinad and Ilya. Depending on the outcome of this debate, the future of Arnon would be decided. Elsinad, changing the topic is meaningless. You are the culprit. There is clear evidence with this book, yet you would deny your sins until the end. I can't say anything. It is a fake book, anyone could make that. I could also forge a book and claim that you were behind it. Do you admit that you would handle things that way? Did you run the city like this? Through forgery and deceit. You use cowardly means. Don't change the topic. Right now, what you are doing is deception. The conversation was going nowhere. Elsinad countered calmly, but Ilya was excellent at stirring up the citizens. The crowd split in half and cheered for the politician they were supporting. Arnon guards were around the stage in case of an emergency. Ilya and Elsinad continued the debate on the stage. Now no one was concerned about the victims. The story of the elves being trafficked had been forgotten, and the voices of the victims vanished without a trace as no one in Arnon cared for such things. One orc ran across the square. W. What? The man who was bumped into turned his head away as he met the orc's fierce gaze. The orc had a determined expression on his face. His greatsword was on his shoulder as he walked towards Elsinad and Ilya. Entry isn't permitted. The guards around the stage blocked him. The orc didn't go any further. He stood there and looked at the two politicians. Ilya suddenly noticed his presence and turned his head towards the orc. However, he didn't care about the orc, and kept criticizing Elsinad. Elsinad's eyes darkened. There was no guilt in them. The orc confirmed this fact and turned towards the citizens. He saw the faces of the citizens. Interest, tension excitement etc. All types of emotions were swirling. However, there wasn't what he needed most. It was anger. No one was truly angry. The orc felt anger fill his chest as he shouted. Everyone. The orc's voice rang out in the square. Quiet. An intense cry that shook the eardrums of the listeners. The shouting of an orc warrior, which hadn't been heard for a long time in Arnon, shook Arnon Square. A sobering voice. The square became quiet in an instant. Everyone looked at the orc who was the epicenter of the sound. The guards didn't know what to do and just watched him. Ilya and Elsinad, who were making claims on the stage, also quieted down. All the eyes and ears in the square were focused on the orc. The orc lifted sewing up. A crystal ball was in his thick hands. Ilya's face turned pale. Now. Krokta declared. Then a human came forward. It was a human magician, Puri. He had been helped by Krokta on the plains along with Gilliam, so he was now paying back the favor. Puri raised a hand, his magic power wrapping around the crystal ball. The crystal ball started shining. In the air, a giant video appeared. It was the memory playback magic that could play videos in the crystal ball. It was an expensive item, and the magic required to activate it was difficult. The citizens paid attention to it. The video that appeared was stabilized. Someone's face appeared. It was Ilya, his face floating in the air. He moved within the crystal ball and spoke. His remarks were reproduced. Yes, I will tell you everything. I sold the elves together with the people from Thawing Balhi. I had a deal with them. 
Ilya jumped up. And I got tired of them. I had drained just enough from them. Those cursed by the stars, did they really think I would deal with them forever? Thank you for your help. The citizens started murmuring again. The truth that they were arguing over had finally been revealed. Ilya's ugly remarks followed. Anyway, I will become Arnon's next mayor. That's it. You can leave quietly. The eyes of the citizens turned towards Ilya in unison. His face distorted and Elsinad's face brightened. She didn't know who the orc was, but he had given evidence of her innocence. She used this momentum. A complacent expression appeared on her face. Citizens. Have you seen everything? This man tried to discredit me and fool the citizens. She raised her fist. As the mayor of Arnon and a citizen, I will make a formal accusation against the coward Ilya. Then she shouted to one of the Arnon guards. Guard, take him to jail right now. The citizens alternated looking between Elsinad, Ilya, and the orc. They were confused due to the sudden situation. However, the citizens soon responded to Elsinad's words. That guy. Ilya was the culprit. The mayor is innocent. But the video didn't end there. The screen jumped and this time a white mansion at night appeared. It was a building that every citizen in Arnon knew. The mansion was one of the most beautiful buildings in Arnon. Elsinad's home. The citizen stopped again. The video moved gradually as it followed the eyes of the filmer. Over the wall and once inside, the person arrived at a room filled with statues and paintings. Elsinad's mansion continued to be shown. The citizens looked at the screen with confusion over what they were seeing. Elsinad's face stiffened as she saw it. Stop that right now. She tried to run off the stage. But Ilya grabbed Elsinad's wrist. He sensed sewing in her reaction. On the video, the secret door to the basement opened. The video started going down. Elsinad shouted, Guards! Stop that orc! Stop him! But the video continued without stopping. The terrible truth was revealed. The citizens were surprised to see the elves and humans inside the room, and were shocked as they understood what it meant. It was a terrible scene that they had never imagined. The owner of the video gazed at the stuffed animals for a while. On the screen, the faces of the elves, humans, and a smiling child could be seen. The screen moved along with his eyes. At first glance, there were more than twenty stuffed people. Everyone looked alive and motionless, like they were still breathing. There were citizens who stumbled at the scene. The truth was harsh. This demon, who was a serialer, was the leader of the city. The gaze of the person filming moved downwards. He looked at his feet. The screen displayed the floor. The murmur of the person filming resonated in the ears of the citizens. It is a tragedy. It was a calm voice. Then the screen showing the floor cut off. The crystal ball finished its roll and broke into pieces. The video ended, but nobody moved. Silence. Everyone in the square had stopped moving. In that stillness, the orc alone moved. He turned around. He gazed towards Ilya and Elsinard, the two demons, and said. Ilya and Elsinard. They didn't move. With the evidence I just presented, I accuse you. The stunned guards recovered their spirits. They looked at each other and then started walking towards Ilya and Elsinard. Now they were horrible criminals. Elsinard exclaimed, Don't make me laugh. This is all fabricated. You might have a pass to enter Arnon, but you aren't a citizen. Not even a citizen, yet a dirty orc dares accuse me. Impossible. It was her last-ditch effort. On the subject of the orc. Who the hell are you listening to? Guards, do you believe an orc over your mayor? Someone who isn't even a citizen? It was Elsinad's futile struggle to delay her downfall. Even Ilya stared at Elsinad with disgust in his eyes. But Elsinad was the mayor. The guards stopped moving the moment they heard her cry. Then they looked at the orc accusing her. All eyes fell on the orc once again. But he had a cold expression on his face. The orc opened his mouth, listen up, Elsinad. 
The orc spoke in a distinctively thick and low voice. I am someone who is equal to the citizens of Arnim. His voice rang out through the square. All rights enjoyed by the citizens of Arnon are equally applied to me. It is a legitimate right granted for the dedication and merits I have contributed to Arnon, one that nobody can withdraw unless I commit an offense that undermines Arnon's justice. He pulled sewing out. His evidence sparkled under the sun. Everyone's gaze turned to the proof of identity. The orc declared, I am Krokta, the one given an honorary citizenship by Enyanis, the plains administrator. Chapter 40. What will you do? Asked Jeremy, direct subordinate. Derek had invested in Ilya betting on Elsinad's downfall, but the results had turned in an unexpected direction. Krokta had accused both Ilya and Elsinad. Wait a minute. Derek was writing at his desk in his office. Jeremy waited. Derek wrote sewing for a while before putting down his pen. I wish you luck let's pray that the Ashira flowers will bloom soon which one is okay. Jeremy's eyes widened. It was because there was a smile in Derek's voice. I think both are good. If you think it is bad, then you can tell me. Jeremy nodded and asked Derek a question. Is the person a man or a woman? A man. Then the former would be better. But he is an elf. Then I will recommend the latter. You are very prejudiced about gender and species. Derek laughed and picked up his pen again. The sentence about the flowers blooming was derived from an epic poem. The Ashira flowers decorating a garland meant a march of victory. It was meant to express good luck, but in a less dry manner. Do you know how long it has been since I had to write a letter to fix an unexpected problem? I've never seen it happen. Yes. It was so long ago that I don't even remember it. Derek placed the letter in an envelope and sealed it with candle wax and handed it to Jeremy. Very interesting. Is this as you expected? Jeremy, victory is only worth it if you meet a difficult and unexpected problem, and manage to jump over it. Jeremy was told to deliver a letter. The recipient was a name that he didn't know. Who is it? Who? My new puppet. Derek laughed. Our orc warrior has upset Arnon, so now I need someone to fix it. Then. The bad guys have been cleansed. However, new villains always appear in the world. Jeremy nodded. This was why he followed Derek. Jeremy had never seen any gaps in Derek. He responded as if everything was as expected, and produced results according to his own will. It was also true for his incident. Crocta did things in a way that they hadn't expected. Ilya, whom they had invested in, was now a criminal and would be held in Arnon's dungeon. Derek had said that this was unexpected, but Jeremy didn't think so. Derek had plenty of precautions for just in case. In the larger picture, Derek still controlled everything according to his will. Also, pass on the following information to Crocta. Even though he broke the contract. In a way, I was in the wrong. Crocta had placed a condition in the contract. He wouldn't do anything that would go against a warrior's honor. I didn't know that Ilya and Elsinad were such villains, so I suppose it was to be expected that Crocta would be so willful. I understand. Please. This time, I hope that you will help Crocta a bit. Jeremy read the letter recipient's name again and nodded. The recipient was the Arnon Plains administrator, Enyanis. Now that Ilya and Elsinad had fallen, Arnon would need a new mayor. It didn't matter who they were. As long as he accepted Derek's help, he would become the new mayor of Arnon. The citizens would be enthusiastic about him without knowing his deceit. This was the world that Jeremy saw. The two politicians turned out to be criminals. There was a city-wide outrage. They desired a new beginning. As there was a lot of excitement for a fresh start, new politicians appeared in Arnon and spoke about clearing up the ugly past. The name of the honorary citizen Krokta also filled the city. However, the orc didn't want the attention and didn't appear in front of the people. There was a huge response for Enyanis, the elf who appointed him as the honorary citizen. A statue of the honorary citizen was erected in Arnon Square. It was of an orc, not an elf, nor a human. They didn't write his name in respect for his will, 
but all of the citizens of Arnon knew who the honorary citizen was. It was an expression of the citizen's wish for an honorary citizen to appear again whenever Arnon was corrupted. I'm tired. Crocta hid his body because of his popularity. A hood covered his face, but it couldn't hide the orc's unique size, so he refrained from going out as much as possible. It is because you are the only orc in Arnon, Enyani said. Are you really leaving? I have sewing to do. Too bad. It would be nice if you could have stayed longer. Derek had unexpectedly given Crocta information about the next destination. Crocta became aware of another thawing Balhi base. The name of the destination was Chesswood. This time, Derek didn't ask for anything. Derek's messenger said that Crocta could do what he wanted. It was hard for Crocta to guess Derek's intentions, but he chose not to think too deeply. He would do what he needed to do. This was the first place I saw you. Crocta and Enyanis were standing on the Arnon Plains where they first met. Enyanis nodded. He looked at the rock that Crocta left behind. A warrior doesn't attack unarmed people. The thrill Enyanis felt at that time was still vivid in his mind. The orc in front of him was the type of person that he had never met before. Many people spoke about justice with their mouths, but it was the first time he saw someone act directly on their words. He was looking forward to the orc's actions in the future. Where are you going? Chesswood. Chesswood. It is the land of humans. And the word that best suited it was pandemonium. A cursed place. But if it was this orc, it might turn out well. Good luck. I hope that every step you take is filled with Ashira flowers. Thank you. Crocta didn't know what it implied, but it sounded good. Suddenly, a yell was heard from those hunting the triters on the plains. Wah! Help me! A man was running away from a trider, but Crocta wasn't the one who moved. Suddenly, dozens of arrows flew through the air and pierced the trider. It was the S of the user Urin, who had joined the Arnon Plains rescue unit after Crocta. She winked as she noticed Crocta's gaze. Crocta nodded. In addition to Urin, other NPCs and users were wearing the red rescue vest that symbolized the Arnon Plains rescue unit. Those who didn't have the ability relied on the rescue unit to help them out with the triters. The Arnon Plains were filled with a lot of warmth. This is your heritage. The number of people who died hunting the triters greatly decreased. Crocta had made a contribution as the honorary citizen, alleviating the criticism towards other species. Well, let's live and see each other again. It was time to leave Crocta extended his fist in the orc manner. Enyanis also extended his fist. The orc greeting was strange, but he could feel sewing. Sewing seemed to rise in him as his fist met the orc's hard skin. The two people firmly bumped fists. Crocta turned around. The large orc moved away from Arnon. It was calm after the great orc left. Phew. Somebody approached Enyanis, who had been staring blankly. It was Jeremy, who had been sent by Derek. Jeremy whistled as he stood beside Enyanis. Phew. That orc is truly frightening. Enyanis stared at him. Jeremy turned around. Both of them had already talked to each other. Jeremy asked, Anyway, have you made up your mind? You will definitely keep the promise. Of course. Well, help you. I didn't know a mere money lender would have so much money. Watch your mouth. Derek is more than that. Enyanis nodded. Okay. It's a deal. But keep this in mind. I might receive political funds from you, but I won't do anything unjust. Well soon see. Jeremy grinned. Everyone was like that at first. Then other people will come and talk to you about the rest. I have to go. Are you going with Crocta? He doesn't need to know. Jeremy looked in the direction that Crocta went. Derek said it was fine, but Jeremy was unsure. He would keep a close eye on the orc. Ian disconnected. He checked his watch and saw that he had been playing for a long time. The strange thing was that he didn't feel dizzy or tired at all. His body was refreshed, like he had a good night's sleep. He looked back on the previous gameplay. He was immersed, like he really was Crocta. 
The things that happened in the place called Arnon truly made him furious. Thanks to Arnon, his achievement points had gone up tremendously. Despite accusing a high-ranking NPC like the mayor, he seemed to have been praised for his influence in the world of Elder Lord. As his achievement points rose, his level also increased. Now there weren't a lot of people playing Elder Lord who could ignore him. He went out to the living room and turned on the TV. Elder Lord News was playing, a program that briefly told news about the world of Elder Lord. There was also news about Arnon's mayor replacement. The details weren't revealed, but it mentioned that Arnon's mayor and mayor candidate were arrested after the accusation of a citizen. Um. He checked his phone and saw that it was the busy time at the cafe. He had left Han Yori in charge. An image of her looking at him resentfully appeared in his head. He needed to pay a bit of attention to her. Ian left his house and drove to the cafe. After parking the car and entering the cafe, he heard the greeting of the new part-timer, Yusuyan. Welcome. This is Cafe Reason. It was a cheerful voice that brightened up the listener's mood. Ian nodded. Han Yori had taught her well. Han Yori confirmed Ian's appearance and said, It's the boss. There was sewing strange. Yusuyan's expression sank as she heard Han Yori's words. It felt like she had lost all sense of animation. It was a subtle distinction, but Ian could clearly feel it. Han Yori looked at Ian and nodded towards a corner. Ian turned towards where she was indicating. Ian was surprised again. A familiar woman was elegantly sitting down with her legs crossed while also drinking a cup of coffee. She was Ji Hei Ian, the heir to the Myongsong group. She had already seen Ian and was smiling at him. The men in suits that Ian had seen outside the cafe were because of her. Ian approached. Ji Hei Ian spoke first. Have you been busy these days? I think Hei SSI is busier than me. That's right. I'm busy, but I made some time. She took a sip of coffee. It was like a scene from a movie. Ian SSI, do you want some coffee? Or are you tired of it, after owning a cafe? Not really. Have you eaten? There were a lot of questions. Ian smiled and shook his head. No. Then do you want to go and have dinner together? I'll buy it for you. Ian shook his head again. Ji Hei Ian's expression became sulky. I'm sorry, I'm going to eat dinner with someone else later. Who? He looked at Han Yori instead of answering. She was making a drink for a customer. She seemed listless, so he was going to buy her delicious food. Is it like that between you two? It's just a boss and employee relationship. HRM. She looked at Ian like she was Suyas. Ian just shrugged. The conversation between the two broke off. Ji Hei Ian seemed to be thinking about sewing as she hesitated before opening her mouth. Do you play Elder Lord? Ian looked at her. Recently, he discovered that Elder Saga Corporation was an affiliate of the Myongsong Group. Therefore, he didn't feel like her question was strange. Yes. I see. What about Hei SSI? I don't. Ah uh, maybe Ian SSI shouldn't play it either. She could be called a shareholder of Elder Lord. Ian ed his head. Is there a problem? Nothing, just. Her voice trailed off. Ji Hei Ian's father, Ji Yunchul, didn't allow his family to play Elder Lord. It was due to safety. It was a secret that Elder Lord's core system wasn't properly controlled. Even though the user protection system on the capsules guaranteed the safety of the users, Ji Yunchul had strictly forbidden any shareholders from playing it. It was a matter that involved the reputation of the Myongsong group, so the company was using every means possible to find Yu Jae Han, the only man who could solve it. However, he was nowhere to be found. Ji Hei Ian couldn't explain that to Ian, so she laughed it off as a joke. Don't people turn violent after playing games? Hoo hoo. She glanced somewhere else. One of her bodyguards outside the cafe was pointing to his watch. It was almost time for her next appointment. She wanted to cancel it for dinner with Ian, but it seemed like today wouldn't work. She sighed. I was rejected today. Do you dislike me? That's impossible. 
Ian laughed. He'll have dinner with you next time. Okay, it's a promise. How about the day after tomorrow? Okay. It's a promise. Ji Hei Ian rose from his seat. Then, he'll see you the day after tomorrow. She left the cafe with her unique and elegant gestures. Ian headed to the counter after seeing her off. Yu Suyin greeted Ian. She had been helped by Ian, and had become noticeably brighter ever since she started the part-time job. Han Yori glanced at Ian. Boss Nim, what do you want? An espresso. It was a sullen voice. Ian laughed. Yori. Let's close up early today, and come have a good meal with me. Omo, really? Her expression changed in an instant. Ah, didn't you have an appointment with her? No. Can I eat sewing expensive? Han Yori nodded. The cafe's automatic door opened and some customers entered. Han Yori greeted them quickly. Welcome. This is Cafe Reason. She once again returned to her normal animated self. Ian started laughing. Chapter, 41 Crocta didn't like the sound of footsteps behind him. He stopped and looked back. Why do you keep following me? But the other person didn't feel intimidated. We're just going the same way, so don't flatter yourself. Did you rent this road? How much did you pay to rent it? It was direct subordinate, Jeremy. He had caught up as Crocta left Arnon, and headed northeast to Cheswood. Good, renting is comfortable. Renter, 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 renteric. Jeremy smiled at Crocta's fierce glare. You are scary. Relax, brother. Crocta decided to ignore him. He started moving again. Jeremy whistled from behind him. Jeremy's whistling was very clear and high. At first, Crocta thought it was a flute sound. There was a time when he admired it, but now that whistling didn't sound very pleasant. Jeremy's whistle rang throughout the plains. Thus, they continued their awkward companionship. As the name suggested, the Cheswood area that they were heading to had small human villages scattered about in a checkered pattern. Cheswood wasn't a big city like Arnon was, but a cluster of various small villages gathered together with their own system. What was the thawing Balhi clan doing there? Would he be able to find Grom's new character, the traitor called Hyunchal, and get revenge? The future was unknown, so he had to do the best that he could right now. Crocta decided to just go there for now. As they headed further east from Arnon, the forest disappeared, and an off-travel trail could be seen. If he proceeded to the center of the continent in this direction, he would be able to reach the big cities of the other species. Hey, orc brother. I am called Crocta. Oh. Are we already friendly enough to call each other by name? Is this day one of our relationship? Crocta wanted to him. What are you going to do with the cursed people in Cheswood? Are you going to use the concrete OD? There is no need to know. No, I'm Direct's delegate, so I should know if you're planning to do sewing strange. Our investment might fly away, after all. I need to know since our money is on the line. Where did Derek invest in Cheswood? Secret, a secret. At the end of his words, Jeremy was standing beside Crocta. Crocta glanced at him but didn't point it out. Isn't that a good sword? Is it expensive? Jeremy asked. It's the work of the Golden Anvil clan. Hayu, how great. I'm envious. I also want to buy a new sword. As they talked, the two people started walking together. Jeremy started to whistle again. Crocta didn't know where it came from, but there was a melody to it. It wasn't too bad to walk leisurely while listening to Jeremy. You are good. He said. When I was a child, I was proud of both my whistling and my sword SS. Jeremy started whistling again. The sound was crisp, and sounded good overall. Orc brother, do you know any songs? Songs? I don't think that a whistle can come out well from an orc's lips, so how about a song? Your voice is pretty good. A song. There was the orc song that he had learned from a pub in Orcrox. Maybe he should try it once. Crocta coughed. Jeremy looked at him with expectant eyes. Hmm hmm. 
he cleared his throat. It was slightly embarrassing singing this alone. However, he couldn't betray Jeremy's expectations, so he started awkwardly singing the warrior song. We are orcs. The mighty orcs. You'll be in trouble if you mess with us. The great warriors have appeared. Humans, get lost. Elves get lost. Dwarves, get lost. Gnomes. It was an exciting song when sung in a group, but it was shameful to shout it out alone. The contents of gnomes, get lost followed by warriors don't need a woman didn't fall from his mouth. Jeremy looked taken aback. Jeremy flashed an awkward and nodded. Gee great. It was humiliating. It would have been okay if Jeremy had teased him. But even Jeremy wasn't able to make fun of him. He even pretended and gave Crocta a compliment. Crocta became anxious and dropped his head. It was impossible for humans to understand the wonderful song of orc warriors. He tried to maintain the spirit of victory. But he was a warrior who could face reality, so he couldn't turn away from his conscience and pride. Isn't every culture different? Ha, ha. Crocta felt more shame at Jeremy's nice remark. Therefore, Crocta cleared his throat again. He wanted to let this guy know what a real song was. He said, that was just a joke. No. The song was good, brother. I will let you hear what a real song is. There is no need. Crocta grabbed Jeremy's shoulder. He flinched. Jeremy. Yes. Have you ever been in love? L love? Yes, love. What I did have a love relationship. Then listen. Crocta was very serious. He closed his eyes and remembered the sound. Right now he had the low bass tones of an orc that most singers couldn't mimic. He recalled his school days. That boy's genuineness as he wept still breathed in his chest. He poured out the distant memories into the lyrics. This song would suffice. Crocta's voice poured out like a sigh. Just like I wasn't prepared for the rain, I sent you away with silence. Jeremy's eyes widened. Crocta's voice, which was strangely low, sank calmly. The lyrics he sang were beautiful and melancholy, just like a poem. For a while, I would get drunk or sleep at dawn, trying to forget you. I can't forget that time, I realized sewing while thinking. Ah. Crocta's low voice rang out. The bass tone was filled with heartbreaking emotions. A good person, if I had cherished you then, I wouldn't have been so sad when we broke up. Jeremy closed his eyes. Suddenly, an old relationship passed through his mind. Jane. Her name was unforgettable, Jane. Both of them were in love, but she was the daughter of a well-known family, and Jeremy was just a swordsman from the back streets. It was a relationship that wasn't possible. A painful love. She eventually left him, but Jeremy couldn't blame her. She was a good person Jeremy's eyes became wet. Now Crocta's song was reaching the climax. The end of the heartbreaking love song rang out. I would like to say that I will always protect you, please come back again I'll make amends. His song was over. Crocta closed his eyes and become drunk on his emotions for a while. Just like there was black soul in reality, Elder Lord had the orcs. It was a vocal structure that seemed born for this type of song. A stunning performance. Clap. 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 He opened his eyes at the sound of applause. It was from Jeremy. However, he wasn't the only one applauding. Crocta and Jeremy turned their heads at the same time. There was a strange man wiping his watery eyes. I heard it very well. It was a song that really made me feel like my heart was breaking. You. The man was carrying a musical instrument resembling a guitar. I am the minstrel Blackmore. I was heading this way when I heard a heartfelt voice by chance. It was a really great song. I am embarrassed. Don't be, brother. It really was amazing. You were hiding your singing SS. Jeremy also acknowledged Crocta's song. Blackmore asked, did you create that song? No, I just imitated the song of another singer. I see but the impression you have given me hasn't faded. What is your name? 
I am called Crocta. Based on your direction, are you perhaps heading to Cheswood? Yes. I am also heading there. Do you mind if I accompany you? Feel free to do so. Crocta and Jeremy were joined by Blackmore. A light conversation was started after that as Blackmore asked, the lyrics to that song are especially beautiful. What is the title of the song? As the lyric said, it's called Good Person. Good person how great. If you love a good person, you won't be sad if you break up. Blackmore nodded and wrote sewing in his notebook. Of course that doesn't mean that you weren't really sad. Right. Cool. Paradoxical lyrics that a man could understand. The eyes of the three men became distant. They were gazing at old memories. I had those days as well Orc, why are you going to Cheswood? Are you going to participate in the contest? Contest? Ah, you don't know. A small contest for minstrels will be held in Cheswood. Ho, oh, really? It isn't a big competition. It's a small contest between the Cheswood villages, but the pride of the villages is at stake. I know since I am from Cheswood. That's why I returned home after a long time. I would like to see you play. Ha ha ha. Please come and watch. I will be singing. The conversation continued as they walked along the road. They started to enjoy music while walking. Blackmore played his instrument while Jeremy whistled. Crocta hummed along with his bold voice. A jazz conversation with their own melodies. It was fun to enjoy the music without worrying. What are you talking about? Suddenly, a voice was heard. Crocta looked in the direction of the sound. It was a group of humans. Crocta didn't miss the white star on the forehead of the woman riding in the lead. NPCs. Isn't this a funny combination? Orc musician. There were five people, all users. Jeremy was unconcerned but Blackmore welcomed them cheerfully. He greeted them. Hello. The woman who seemed to be leading the group laughed and replied. Yes, hello. Mr. Minstrel. She was also friendly to NPCs. She seemed to be familiar with Elder Lord. I am the minstrel Blackmore, and these two are Crocta and Jeremy, who are accompanying me to Cheswood. Crocta and Jeremy lightly bowed. Oh my god, really? We are also going there. She turned around and talked briefly with her group. She seemed to be asking if they should join up. Then would you like to go with us? I would like to hear your music. Is everybody here a minstrel? Ha ha ha. I am the only minstrel, but they are musically talented. Wow, great. Blackmore declared, let's go together. Sharing music is a wonderful thing. The party increased. There was now a group of eight people heading to Cheswood. Blackmore was returning to his home after a long time, so he started to sing song reminiscent of his hometown. It was a singing S that was just as wonderful as his S with the musical instrument. The users clapped in response. Suddenly, Jeremy grabbed the hem of Crocta's clothes and pulled him close. Ha! Huh. Brother, are they people cursed by the stars? He asked in a low voice. He knew that Crocta was one of those cursed by the stars and that they could recognize each other. Crocta nodded. Jeremy whispered again to Crocta, be careful. About what? Those guys and Cheswood. Jeremy pulled Crocta a little further away from the group. Blackmore, I don't think he knows the news yet. Jeremy squinted at Blackmore. Blackmore was playing his instrument with a bright face. Cheswood isn't an idle place right now. Then. It is a land of discord due to the cursed people. One user suddenly looked at the two of them. Jeremy slung his arm over Crocta and grinned. As the gaze of the user moved away, he whispered again in Crocta's ears. So these people over there are enemies. I see. Certainly, Enyanis of Arnon had referred to Cheswood as in a state of pandemonium. Crocta nodded. Do you understand? Jeremy hit Crocta's chest and released him. Blackmore's singing became louder. In the distance, the dim shape of a village started to appear. Chapter, 42 there was smoke coming from the village in the distance. 
Only Crocta and Jeremy noticed the faint smoke, as Blackmore and the other users were still laughing at the music playing. There was a problem from the beginning. Jeremy stroked the handle of his sword, his tension subsiding. No matter what happened, it would fine as long as he had his sword. He was a swordsman, a borner that even Derek acknowledged. He was also aware from Derek that the orc was a powerful warrior. Mister, there is smoke, the woman suddenly said. Blackmore stopped playing his musical instrument. What's going on? Smoke continued to emerge from the village, gradually covering the sky above the village. Blackmore's face stiffened. This it looks like a fire. I should hurry. Blackmore rushed towards the village with his musical instrument on his shoulders. As Blackmore prepared to move, one user walked over and knocked him over. Blackmore tumbled down to the ground. A corner of the musical instrument was destroyed. He lay on the floor and moaned. W. Watkul. The users chuckled. It has already started. Hey, wait for me. There isn't enough here to share. Crocta watched the users talking. Jeremy shrugged and pulled out his sword. Brother, didn't I tell you? This is why I hate the cursed ones. They are s that will hit people in the back. Jeremy glanced at Crocta and added, Of course, I will watch you more. The users approached them. Unlike Blackmore, the two of them had weapons and one of them was an orc, so the users were cautious. Will you be okay against an orc? Believe in me. All of the users pulled out their weapons. The magician stepped back and prepared to support from the rear. If you kids are in danger, then call for me. The female user who first talked to Blackmore grinned. Anyway, our kids are in control of areas A1 to C4. Jeremy whistled. His long sword sparkled in the sun. It was small compared to Crocta's sword, but the amount of human blood that had covered it was enough to make a small stream. Guys, don't you see that this orc brother is angry? Do you want him to be angry? Do you want to bleed? Jeremy joked around as he narrowed the distance. His movements were light. Crocta also held his greatsword and lowered his center of gravity, gathering enough momentum to break through at once. Crocta scanned the area. It seemed that it was possible to take care of the front line, but the magician was the problem. He was already muttering sewing to complete a spell. Magicians were always bothersome opponents. Crocta carefully looked for gaps in the enemies. At that moment Crocta's eyes widened. Suddenly, the magician fell without a sound. Blackmore was standing behind the magician. Blackmore met Crocta's eyes and winked. The crowd in front was still unaware of what happened to the magician. Crocta nodded and charged forward. Bolter. Shouting the battle cry of the orc warriors before battle had now become a habit. Jeremy also ran after Crocta. Crocta rushed and swung his greatsword, the users pushed back by the impact. Jeremy leapt from behind Crocta and instantly pierced a user's neck with his sword. He was like the wind. The confused users yelled out, Magic! Use it quickly! Why aren't you using it? What are you doing? Then they paled as they turned around. Blackmore didn't care as he looked at them with his foot on the magician's chest. At that moment, the users felt sure of their deaths. It seemed like they could already feel Crocta and Jeremus blades against their skin. Their heads flew through the sky. Crocta and Jeremy were too strong for them. They weren't just ordinary people, or various minstrels passing by, but a real orc warrior and a notorious swordsman from the back alleys of the fugitive city of Anael. The user's bodies turned white. It was the last of those cursed by the stars. Their equipment fell to the ground. There was nothing that looked great. Besides, they needed to hurry to the village. Blackmore immediately started running towards the village. Jeremy and Crocta looked at each other and ran after him. The village was a terrible mess. Several houses were burning. Battles between NPCs and users were occurring in various places in the village. Blackmore looked around and found a piece of farm equipment. He broke the edge and made it into a club, swinging it in the air. Jeremy and Crocta glanced at each other as they saw it. Blackmore's actions were quite said. Blackmore squeezed the rod, like he was trying to regain some old senses, 
before running into battle. Crocta and Jeremy also helped in the battles. The villagers were all farmers, but they used their equipment to fight against the users. Their attacks turned one or two users into white particles. Crocta's great sword beheaded a user. The users were too weak. There were some decent ones, but the majority of them looked like beginners that had just started Elder Lord. There were many people who ran away from Crocta's fearsome appearance. Orc. Run away. An orc. Run away. Let's go. I'm scared. Monster. The users hurriedly ran away. Crocta didn't have a chance to fight properly with them. Jeremy giggled and knocked against Crocta's shoulder with a teasing attitude. Hey, brother. Brother's face, well, it no longer frightens me as much. Don't take it personally. Noisy. Crocta turned around before adding sewing else. I am a handsome orc. That's right. Crocta was a handsome orc. In Orcrox, the female NPCs often ogled him. He had customized his face to be as horrible as possible to make fun of his sister, but it seemed to be attractive to orcs. Jeremy burst out laughing. By the way, what's going on here? The cursed people are gathering together and attacking. Besides, aren't they all weak? Crocta confirmed the equipment of the users that fell on the ground. They were all common grade equipment. I can roughly guess. The users whom they defeated with Blackmore said that their area was from A1 to C4, and the users here had poor combat abilities. The local characteristic of Chesswood was that the villages were scattered about in a checkered pattern. The recurring evils that humans committed in online games were being repeated in Elder Lord. Blackmore. You came back. Blackmore. There was a disturbance. The villagers finished fighting and discovered that Blackmore had returned. However, their reaction wasn't like what Crocta expected. Rather, it was the opposite. Why did this guy all of a sudden? I thought you left. They were reluctant to talk to Blackmore. Some even spat on the ground, like he was unlucky. Blackmore just looked down and touched his half-broken instrument. Ha! <laughs> Blackmore, becoming a minstrel, I really can't believe it. Crocta and Jeremy stayed at the home of Blackmore's uncle, Ingram. He was tall, sturdy, and looked very strong for his age. You didn't originally leave your home to become a minstrel. They asked. Blackmore? This guy was completely Ingram grinned as he gazed at Blackmore. A bully. Oh. I wasn't that bad, Blackmore pleaded. Weren't you a gangster working for a private money lender? What? Blackmore dropped his head. Jeremy couldn't help shaking his head. Crocta nodded in agreement. Then he whispered to Jeremy, a bully, a gangster. Ugh. Jeremy struck Crocta with his elbow. All he knew was how to fight and how to wield a spear, and that was all he did in Chesswood. I didn't do too badly. Blackmore became notorious in Chesswood. He was a called a cruel, a man with no feelings. Under the full moon, Ingram treated the two humans and one orc to his homemade beer. The taste was quite good. Crocta thought it was comparable to the beer that he drank in Orcrox. I regret it, Blackwood said. Yes, I didn't hear from you after you left Chesswood. So how did you become a minstrel? Blackmore's explanation wasn't long. After leaving Chesswood, he wandered from place to place. With his SS, there was work wherever he went. He worked as a mercenary, a soldier, an escort, and various other things, but there was always regret in his heart. He made money from people's suffering. Then by chance, he saw a minstrel playing at a pub. The minstrel's SS weren't that great, but he saw people laughing and having fun. Blackmore was eating expensive food in a room that was much more expensive than theirs, but he seemed more unhappy. Thus, he abandoned everything and became a minstrel. That was ten years ago. The most emotionless person is doing the most sentimental job in the world. Blackmore laughed bitterly, isn't it because of that child? Blackmore gulped down his beer and asked, how is she? Married. To who? A decent person. Then that's fine. Say no more. Blackmore also seemed to have his own story of heartbreak. 
His mood became so heavy that Ingram, Crockta, and Jeremy couldn't open their mouths. Blackmore changed the topic and spoke, the people cursed by the stars keep coming. Yes, it's serious. I tried to ask for help but. The villages united to block the attacks of those cursed by the stars, but it was getting harder. Crockta's eyes sunk. This area must have been designated as a hunting ground to level up, with the areas distributed between different clans. It was rare for NPCs with high levels to be scattered around villages like these. There were also no professional guards. The best hunting ground. In addition, the clans would be controlling the hunting grounds in order to monopolize it. Tomorrow, the Chesswood village leaders have decided to meet to discuss the problem, Ingram said. Blackmore continued to drink before rising from his seat. Uncle, I have become a minstrel, so I will sing you a song. However, my instrument is broken. Ho, oh, is it a song that you made? That's right. I missed this place, so I made a song for Chesswood. If it's terrible, then he'll stop listening straight away. Of course. Then Blackmore started to sing. Unlike Ingram's worries, it was a wonderful melody. The introductory part was strangely sad, but then it became more exciting. The audience clapped in time with him. As they listened to the lyrics, they felt like they were the narrator rejoicing as he ran towards his hometown. I have traveled to many places in the world, always looking for new things. But I realized sewing. I had already found the things that I was looking for. Dancing under the moonlight, singing in the rain. Oh. I'm happy to be back home. Laughing under the sun, running along different trails. Ah. I'm happy to be back home. Chapter, 43. Chesswood was an area where dozens of small villages were scattered like squares on a chessboard. It was usually just called Chesswood, but the inhabitants of Chesswood liked to differentiate their villages from each other. It was like lines splitting each village apart. There was a subtle fight of pride between them. I heard that in Cactus Village, your bull gave birth to twin calves. So you've already heard. Both of them are very strong, ha ha ha. But there is sewing funny, as in my dandelion village, our cow gave birth to triplets. Cactus Village Chief, too small. Kelkokel. Kook. See congratulations. Ugh. These types of arguments happened often, even during a meeting of the village heads. This was the town hall at Edelweiss village in the center of Cheswood. Representatives from each village gathered for the meeting. Once the leaders of the villages gathered, sometimes the atmosphere could get rough. As I said, our gold villages come back Takendero will win. How funny, that isn't even close. Our Natasha village's youth reign will make you pee when you hear it. You say such pretty words. Do you want to duel with me? Ha! I am James. Do you want to make me an active volcano? Challenge me to a duel. Let's go. Ha! Okay, I'll slam your ugly face with my sweet serenade. Gather the audience. The village chiefs of the Gold Village and Natasha Village growled at each other. They were on the brink of a brutal song showdown in Chesswood's traditional coliseum, where the losing singer's life was at risk. Crockta and Jeremy shook their heads as they watched. Can these people fight? The people of Chesswood weren't fighters. It was understandable why Blackmore, who once worked for a money lender, was the object of fear. Blackmore, who wielded weapons like the Chesswood people sang their songs, would have looked like a demon. Everybody be quiet. We shouldn't be fighting among ourselves. Ingram, Blackmore's uncle, calmed everyone down. He was a normal farmer these days, but he was still respected by people as the former chief. They're attacking us because we're scattered and easier to defeat. What benefits will they gain from ING us? The enemies are those cursed by the stars. They are trying to us for their achievement points. What? They can build up achievements, even if they do evil. How they really are cursed people. A user's achievements points didn't depend on them doing good or evil. As long as they did things that affected the world of Elder Lord, it would accumulate proportionately. Furthermore, ING NPCs were a great help in the growth of SS. 
Although it was expressed as achievement points, their aim was to acquire experience to raise their S level. The various clans were trying to raise their power in Chesswood. I sent people to the castle but it will take time. We can't wait for them. What do we do? How about collecting money from the villages and hiring some mercenaries? The chiefs were troubled. They used farm equipment and hunting tools to prevent the user's attacks, but the enemy was gradually becoming stronger. Crocta also closed his eyes and thought hard. High-level users were gradually appearing to help their clans. Chesswood would be swept away. He only planned to get rid of the thawing Balhi clan but he was troubled by Chesswood's situation. It wasn't easy to distinguish between enemies. It was at that moment. Everyone. It is serious. The door to the meeting room opened. There's currently a massive attack on Dandelion Village. What? The leader of Dandelion Village, who had boasted of the triplet calves, jumped to his feet. Crocta confirmed the direction based on the map attached to the town hall's wall, and Dandelion Village was in one of the outlying areas. If he compared it to a checkerboard, it was one of the corner positions. It'll go right now. Have you told Chrysanthemum and Camellia Village? Yes. Support is coming from the nearby villages. The chiefs tried to rush out straight away, but Ingram calmed everyone down. It would be better if we don't go right away. Then what should we do? Let's discuss some countermeasures first. What about Dandelion Village? The meeting room fell into a mess. Then someone spoke, I will go to Dandelion Village, so you should stay here and establish some countermeasures. It was Blackmore, who was sitting in a corner with Crocta and Jeremy. The meeting room fell silent as he spoke. Blackmore. It was true that you returned. Oh my god. The infamous Blackmore made them even more nervous. Crocta and Jeremy could guess what Blackmore was like in the past just by their expressions. Then Blackmore said. I've washed my hands, and now I would just like to help the villages. As the representatives of Chesswood, you should develop measures for Chesswood's protection. Isn't that your role? Blackmore spoke solemnly. The chiefs nodded. Indeed we won't be a big help if we go now. If Blackmore goes, then he can get rid of all of them. Indeed, he is a great fighter. He was terrifying when he was an enemy, but more reassuring than anyone else when he was an ally. The chiefs felt relief that Blackmore was fighting for them. Would you like to help? Blackmore asked Crocta and Jeremy. He had already experienced the combat power of the two victims. I understand. Crocta nodded. I have already decided to help this brother. Jeremy also agreed. The three men who met on the road were now heading to Dandelion Village for Chesswood's protection. The three of them borrowed horses. Crocta didn't know how to ride a horse, but Blackmore and Jeremy helped him. While it was very hard for the horse to carry his heavy body, there was no time to care. They needed to save Dandelion Village first. Over there. They arrived at Dandelion Village, the battle there already in full swing. A huge number of users were gathered and slaughtering the villagers. Blackmore's face stiffened, his face distorting. It was an evil expression that was hard to believe for the minstrel who had always been smiling. He was carrying a spear on his back. He instantly jumped down from his horse. He swung his spear and swept the users away, his spear moving like a storm. Extremely deadly. Crocta and Jeremy belatedly got off their horses and participated in the fight. The three of them shook up the battlefield. Bolter. The orc's battle cry rang out. Crocta charged, causing users to fly through the air as his great sword sliced apart the bodies of users. Their upper bodies were split in half and their guts spilled out. The momentum could often decide victory in a war. Crocta kept yelling out battle cries to trample on the enemy's morale. It'll slice you to pieces. Then he kicked aside the body's parts and scattered flesh. The sight of a blood covered orc warrior wielding a great sword filled the users with fear. Crocta roared, Qua! A true butcher of the battlefield. Blood spurted everywhere he went. The villagers, who were on the defensive, started to move forward as they became emboldened by Blackmore and the orc warrior's appearance. 
Blackmore and Crocta jumped and slaughtered users everywhere they went. White particles shone all around them. There was no mercy in their attacks. Some frightened users turned around and started to run away. This. A user ran over to Jeremy, wielding a sword. Did he look easy? But Jeremy's sword moved like the wind and pierced the user's neck. Life is real, cursed brother. Cool. The SS were excellent. Jeremy pulled out his sword and started running around. There were sacrifices, but the villages started to gradually gain the advantage. The battle centered around the activities of the three men. Brother. Have strength. Jeremy shouted. Crocta was in the middle of punishing a spear user. The user tried to attack the family's members hiding in the warehouse, but Crocta appeared and took care of it at once. The residents sighed with relief. One mother was holding a crying baby in her arms. Dirty S. Crocka immediately ran out of the warehouse and scanned the situation. There was a group of users, which were his next target. The moment that Crocta was about to rush over, he was suddenly blown away by an unseen force. Crocta rolled around on the ground as he was struck by A.S. Ugh. An orc suddenly appeared. A man asked as he approached Crocta. Crocta instinctively felt that he was strong. He got up quickly and restored his breathing. The man was wearing expensive equipment. It was reminiscent of the high-level user Crocta met on the Arnon Plains in the past, but this user was on a completely different level. The users shouted. Higashi came. Ranker. A ranker came to help. Bugilma. Bulgema came to help. Ranker. They were the top 500 influential users in Elder Lord. Considering the enormous population of the world that was playing Elder Lord, being in the top 500 was truly known as the peak. Elder Sage Corporation provided them with benefits and they were treated as a star. Higashi was a ranker. Crocta felt despair as a sense of pressure that he had never felt before manifested. This place now seems fun. Higashi smiled as he held his sword and shield. Crocta looked around. Blackmore and Jeremy also seemed to be fighting high-level users. The critical people were marked. The users' morale rose at Higashi's appearance and they started attacking the villagers with renewed vigor. The villages collapsed under the swords and users laughed happily as they slaughtered random people. Crocta's eyes flashed. Hey orc. Your opponent is me. But Higashi didn't let him leave Crocta clenched his great sword. The weight of being a ranker wasn't small. Their SS, S levels, and equipment were all high leveled. Crocta moved slowly to look for gaps, but Higashi also moved in tandem to maintain his distance. Higashi moved first. His body appeared in front of Crocta as if space had folded. It was too close to swing his greatsword. The shield strongly pushed against Crocta. He blocked it with his greatsword, but his sight was momentarily covered by the shield. He couldn't anticipate her the sword would move beyond the shield. Crocta threw himself to the ground and rolled his body. Ho! He got up while covered in dirt. Higashi locked at Crocta and turned his blade round and round. If you were a little late then you would have been stung. Your judgment is fast. The connection between sword and shield was excellent. It was a real battle. Indeed, it is clear that Higashi did martial arts. He might be the strongest opponent Higashi had fought so far. Crocta gathered all of the strength in his body. Indomitable fighting spirit rare has been used. Tattoos of honor rare has been used. Latino's greatsword technique rare will exert an extreme performance. His senses sharpened. A faint steam rose from his greatsword. The S proficiency of Latino's greatsword technique had temporarily risen. It wasn't a situation where he should conserve his stamina. Mind's eyes special has opened. Mind's eye opened. Powerful. Higashi approached. Thanks to Mind's eye, Higashi's movements seemed a little clearer, but Crocta felt heavier. He could see the strength of the enemy more clearly. Bolter. Crocta muttered. He had to fight while being prepared for death. It was at that moment that he saw sewing else thanks to Mind's eye. Someone was hiding in the village. 
The shape of the person using stealth was dimly visible. Crocta retreated as he stared in that direction. Higashi was confused. Mind's eye special has penetrated through the stealth s. Crocta could see the faint figure of a woman wearing leather and a mask. The woman was standing next to a building and shooting this scene. This outfit was familiar. Her face had never been revealed, but her character was well known from her videos, like a trademark. She spread the wicked deeds of users and announced their names. The Yuvitzer who had shot Crocta in the past. It was Laney. Chapter, 44. Higashi didn't let Crocta think for any longer, charging over straight away. Crocta defended while his head was busily brainstorming. Think. He had to think. He staggered as he was hit by the shield again. Higashi struck with not only his sword, but with his shield as well. Crocta concentrated on thinking as he avoided Higashi's attacks. How would he win this war? He swung his great sword, which bounced off the shield. The attack was filled with momentum, but Higashi's shield didn't move. Rather, Crocta was kicked and rolled across the ground. He scanned the battlefield as he struggled to get up. Blackmore and Jeremy were being simultaneously pressured by several users. In the first place, this was a war caused by the clan for their own purposes. Their numbers would gradually increase. In the other clans, there might be really strong users like Higashi. Crocta's power alone was insufficient to protect Cheswood. Crocta once again squinted at Laney. Even if he lost the battle, he had to win the war. Crocta's mindset had already returned to the raven of the past as he focused on the most efficient OD of winning. If his chances of victory were slim to none, he should struggle to get the most out of the situation. In order to do that, he would crawl on the ground to make it possible. Anyway, he couldn't win this battle. The number of users kept increasing, and even Jeremy was now trying to escape from the battle. Blackmore was also gradually becoming conscious of the rear. They would soon have to retreat. Crocta closed his eyes as he heard the screams of the villagers. What? Are you giving up? Higashi asked. Crocta laughed instead of answering. Yes, look at me, Higashi. Take a look at me, Laney. If there is to be a fight, then it'll give you a hard time. Look at me. Laney rapidly gained fame after uploading the fight between the orc and the user hunters. Now her Yuvid's channel had tens of thousands of people visiting a day. The reason she did this was insignificant. She didn't like bad people and she also got money. She was able to earn money from upsetting the villains. That's all it was. Laney wanted to distort the faces of those using dirty tricks while trying to avoid the eyes of others. It worked better than she thought, and she was now a famous Yuvitzer. Reports from other people also increased. There was a piece of information that caught her eyes. The famous Thawing Balhi and other big clans were gathering in one area. Furthermore, they started to control the access of other users. Those who didn't belong to the clans were forced out by their threats. The name of the area was Cheswood. It was well known that clans would slaughter weak NPCs for their own benefit. There was a lot of talk about this in the Elder Lord community, but it was the first time in Elder Lord that they tried to rule an area and exclude others on such a large scale. Laney's senses tingled. She wanted to reveal disgusting actions. She hated the big clans. They used their size to nurture rankers and raise the clan. If the former rankers enjoyed the fantasy life of Elder Lord, the newest rankers were just mechanical users fostered to make money. It stunk. She went to learn what was happening in Cheswood. Her class was the hidden piece called Shadow Assassin, and it was a character that specialized in hiding in the shadows. No one noticed her. When she first arrived, nothing had happened. It was an ordinary village. The special point was that all of the villagers loved singing and didn't know how to fight. It was a village where the residents welcomed travelers and lived without locking their doors. But Laney had accused users and she knew how dangerous this could be. The clans would erase the Cheswood area in order to raise the level of the clan members. The users entered Cheswood disguised as travelers, dividing sections of Cheswood among themselves. But Laney was distressed. Could she really file a complaint about this? 
The clans were gathering in ING NPCs, disturbing the balance of Elder Lord. But was this really sowing that people would consider a crime? Would they respect NPCs who weren't users? She didn't know. So she just continued shooting mechanically. Her idea was to watch until the end. Then the full scale attack of the clans began. Lainey was able to find a black bandana that she had seen somewhere before. Bolter. He had changed, but it was the same bandana. An old bandana with the mark of the blacksmith company on it. He was bigger, and there were tattoos all over his body, but he was the same orc. He appeared and started to fight for the villagers. The battle turned against the users in an instant. He was like an incarnation of the battlefield as he ruthlessly swung his great sword and cut down the users. There was a fountain of blood every time he moved his great sword. However, it was only for a while. Within a few minutes, the Yamato clan's vice leader, Ranker Higashi, appeared. He and the other high level users had joined to help the clan members. He was the main force of the Yamato clan. The orc and Higashi fought. At first, the orc fought enthusiastically, but was eventually pushed back by the difference in power. Higashi effortlessly suppressed the orc. After Higashi appeared, the situation changed again. The residents resisting the users were broken, and the men helping along with the orc gradually retreated. But the orc wielded his great sword till the very end. Ugh. Higashi's one-handed sword sliced the orc's thigh. The orc fell to his knees. Why don't you run like your colleagues? The orc didn't answer. He raised his body using his great sword. The two people clashed again. The orc's great sword reached Higashi's neck, but Higashi blocked it with his shield. The great sword was deflected, revealing the orc's abdomen that Higashi's sword instantly sliced apart. Blood gushed out. The orc grabbed his abdomen. It'll give you an opportunity. If you run away now, then I won't chase you. Higashi twirled his one-handed sword as he walked up to the orc. Orc, why do you need to die for the humans over there? Higashi shrugged. Now the battle was over, and the only thing left was the massacre. The villagers couldn't resist and were becoming the user's experience. In addition, those with weapons kept joining the battle. Yes, even your allies ran away. Laney filmed all of this. She wondered what the orc would answer. But he never opened his mouth and continued the meaningless fight. The orc rushed back. There were wounds all over his body. He was bloody. He tried to resist Higashi, but his body didn't listen. Now this is just disgusting, you. Higashi cried out. During the fight, the orc slashed at one of Higashi's arms. It wasn't a big wound, but Higashi's face distorted. He swung his sword with a fierce momentum and hit the orc, who flew through the air. It was towards Laney's location. She hurriedly moved her body. The orc hit the wall where she had been standing by and rolled to the floor. Blood stained the wall. The orc crouched on the ground and used the great sword to raise his body up. It seemed like it was harder for him to stand. Laney felt an unknown emotion. What caused the orc to keep standing up? She recalled the voice of the orc in the past video that she shot. Where are the people who know honor? Higashi approached and said, I definitely gave you a chance to get away. You have chosen death, you stupid orc. His sword raised itself high in the sky to deal the final blow. The blade glinted in the sun. The silent orc finally opened his mouth. You, is that right? What? The orc raised his gaze. It was an intense gaze. You. The orc straightened and raised his great sword. He yet again took a step towards Higashi. The orc asked, You, can you just turn around and run away as you see people being slaughtered for no reason? Laney felt like she had been hit with a hammer on the head at those words. Higashi's face distorted. What are you saying now, you? You don't understand. The orc grinned through his bloody face. It is you who is stupid, not me. Ha! Higashi grinned and looked at the sky and angrily wielded his sword. This. The orc blocked with his great sword. Then the shield slammed into his torso. He rolled on the ground together with the shield. 
but the orc couldn't get on his feet again. Higashi walked towards him with a face that was red with anger. He intended to really finish this. But Higashi was forced to stop moving. At that moment, a woman suddenly appeared beside the orc. A masked woman wearing black clothes that clung to her body appeared. Laini, it was her. Higashi was unable to move because he was wary of the unknown strength he felt from her. Who? Laini didn't answer. Instead, she spoke to the orc. Hey. The eyes of the fallen orc turned towards her. You. There is no need to know who I am. The orc stood up again. However, it seemed like it was difficult to raise his body due to the acculated damage to his body. In the end, the orc stretched out on the ground. Laini raised her palm in a gesture for Higashi not to approach and asked the orc again. Why are you fighting? It is a dog's death. Laini couldn't understand it. The orc, Krokta laughed. Krokta squeezed out all the power in his body and got up again. It wouldn't be unusual for your broken body to die right away. Nevertheless, you keep getting back up. I pay homage to your spirit. Indomitable fighting spirit rare has been upgraded to combative spirit essence. Only humans worry about such calculations. Krokta raised his great sword and gestured to Laini to move. Laini turned sideways. This was the last one. Higashi was in front of them. Just before he charged forward, Krokta whispered to Laini. A warrior doesn't yield to injustice. That was one of the laws of a warrior that he heard from Lennox, an oath that he had sworn to uphold. Laney didn't answer. It was no longer necessary to talk. Krokta glared at Higashi. It was time to end this. Krokta squeezed out his remaining strength to deliver a battle cry. An honorable death is better than a craven life. His roar shook the area. Krokta ran forward. Higashi, who had paused at Laney's appearance, also got ready for the final clash. The two rushed at the same time. At that moment, Laney reached out and hit the back of Krokta's neck. Neat work. Krokta collapsed. Laney grabbed Krokta's huge body. Higashi hesitated. He felt like Laney was a tough opponent and had been wary since she appeared. Laney just sighed. She cast a Shadow Assassin S. Shadow Escape Essence has been used. It can't be used for another 168 hours. Laney and Krokta's bodies started blurring. They were like a shadow as they became translucent and disappeared, completely gone from the previous scene. Laney's body appeared far away from Dandelion Village. Egu, Egu. Ah, why did I do that? What's going on? Laney grabbed her head. It was an impulsive behavior. As she was groaning, Krokta was snuck a peek at Laney from the ground, smiling with satisfaction. That's right. He actually wasn't knocked out. Laney was strong, but that wasn't enough to make an orc faint. He just pretended to be stunned. He didn't know that she had such a miraculous S, but he was able to achieve the result that he wanted. Had she filmed it? Krokta smiled before hurriedly closing his eyes and pretending to be stunned as Laney glanced over him. Laney's lamenting continued. A man had to resort to trickery to grab her heart. If he asked for help, then Laney would have ignored him. Instead, he showed the tragic image of a warrior who was about to die. Even if she didn't help, Krokta would lose nothing. He was a user. He could live again. He didn't care about death. In the first place, what he was trying to save wasn't his own life. He wanted Laney's help with Chesswood's plight. In order to win the war, he needed to use everything in his favor. Chapter, 45 It was a strange day. Hmm. Kim Chuljung, the middle-aged sales manager, smoked a cigarette on his way home from work. Today, he felt a strange sense of separation from the world, as if he was different from the world around him. It was a subtle emotion that made him suddenly look back at himself. These days, the behavior of new employees sometimes embarrassed him. This was the flow of time. Kim Chuljung thought about the routine of his company as he put out his cigarette and prepared to leave the alley. At the corner where he was standing, a group of students were smoking on the other side. 
Despite wearing uniforms, they showed no signs of hesitation. They noticed Kim Chuljung, but the children didn't care and lit up the cigarettes anyways. Ha! Kim Chuljung stepped closer to the children. Students, you're all kid wearing school uniforms, so can you really smoke like this? They glanced at each other before looking back at Kim Chuljung. They started to giggle. Who cares, a juicy? We're smoking cigarettes that we bought with our own money. These guys. A meddler has come, how lame. Pfft. What a funny. The students echoed their slang amongst themselves as they laughed. He smells like cigarettes that's why he's so bald. Let's go. Dirty, dirty. They walked past Kim Chuljung and started to leisurely stroll somewhere else. Not one of them put out their cigarettes. They smoked in the streets as they headed to some place only they knew. Kim Chuljung stared at their backs. He once again felt an unknown feeling. It was an era where virtual reality games were popular, cars moved on their own, and artificial organs were being transplanted. The world was changing. He pointed out students smoking and was treated like a meddler. Actually, that wasn't the case. It was just that he was old-fashioned. Kim Chuljung smiled bitterly and started walking. But today's strange day didn't let him go. An excited child was running and bumped into Kim Chuljung before falling down. Kim Chuljung grabbed the child however, the ice cream that the child was holding had spilled onto Kim Chuljung's clothes. This Kim Chuljung laughed bitterly. The child gasped and watched Kim Chuljung with fear. This guy, you shouldn't run around on the streets. If you make a mistake, then you should say sorry. Mother. A young woman came running over. She quickly figured out what happened between her child and Kim Chuljung, sweeping her child into her arms. Are you okay? Yes. This Ajusi didn't do anything bad to you. Kim Chuljung was outraged. What are you saying? The world is rough. My pants, do you see it? If a child makes a mistake, then their parents should apologize. What did my child do? Don't you know how to do laundry? Ha! The young woman took her child away before Kim Chuljung could answer. Kim Chuljung was left alone, feeling that unknown emotion as he headed home. His common sense wasn't the common sense of the world anymore. He came back home, but no one welcomed him. Instead, only the faces in the family photos hanging in the living room smiled at him. He was the father of a flock of wild geese. As a middle-aged man who went back and forth from his company, he had worked hard since he was young. He reached the position of a manager, but now he had to prepare for retirement. He only occasionally heard the voices of his wife and children over the phone. The things that happened today made him even more lonely. It was a day where he found nothing to live for, so he couldn't help but feel overwhelmed. He sat on the couch and turned on the television. The screen flashed in the living room. Today's topic, a video of Elder Lord, was being played. His sunken eyes stared at it. It was a video from the famous Yuvitzer called Laney. Oh, this. He felt that emotion that he had been feeling all day again. No matter how much the world had changed, why was such a horrible sight still occurring? Those who were called giant clans were slaughtering the inhabitants of a village. They were game characters, but the way they were crying and begging for their lives looked more real than actual reality. If someone had a human conscience, how could they stab women and children, just because they were artificial intelligences? Why was it good to those known as NPCs? As someone who once played Elder Lord enthusiastically, Kim Chuljung was well aware of how lifelike the NPCs were. Suddenly, the focus of the video moved. The scene of the massacre moved to the side. Now it wasn't a human in the center of the screen. It was an orc who most people thought of as monsters. The orc was persistently resisting the users who ed the NPCs. His body became bloody as he kept falling to the ground and rising again to defend the villagers. The humans were monsters while the monster was acting human, a paradoxical sight. Kim Chuljung sighed. The orc seemed to balance on the edge between life and death, but he never actually died. He swung his great sword. Kim Chuljung felt sewing stir in his chest as the orc never gave up until the end. 
what made this orc fight like that? You, is that right? The orc was talking. You. In Kim Chuljung's eyes, he was a bloody hero. You, can you just turn around and run away as you watch people being slaughtered for no reason? Kim Chuljung unconsciously rose from his spot. The breathing of the person filming became rough as they felt the same thing as Kim Chuljung. The video recorder intervened. The voice of the recorder was a woman. She asked why the orc continued with the reckless fight. The orc smiled like it was natural. Only humans worry about such calculations. He whispered. A warrior doesn't yield to injustice. Fighting to the end against injustice. It was an old-fashioned idea. The orc was a really old-fashioned man. He was like an antique, as most middle-aged men these days ended up buying sports cars. In this age where heroic beliefs only belonged in history, it was rare to find such a person. But heroes had died and left their names behind. The orc and the ranker rushed at each other and the video ended. Kim Chuljung didn't move. He stood there for a while, wondering about this emotion. It was strange, but it was always present inside of him. He thought for a while. Kim Chuljung opened his eyes. They were no longer the weary eyes of a middle-aged man going about his daily routine. It was the eyes of a passionate man. Kim Chuljung muttered, I forgot. He headed to the empty room that used to belong to his son. There was one capsule to access Elder Lord. After becoming distant with his family, it was sewing he had used to relieve the loneliness. Dust had piled up because he hadn't used it for a while. Men are wine. It was the moment that the sales manager Kim Chuljung, no, the worst necromancer, Iron, returned to Elder Lord. Yo, man. What's up, man? Hey, long time no see. Whoa. Good to see you again. Me too bro. Hey come inside. Joseph and Bob embraced each other in the natural manner of Americans. The members had gathered at Bob's house. Joseph, Bob, Elia, and Gary. They were old friends and had been partners since their youth. They enjoyed an old hobby that only a few people remembered these days. TRPG. They rolled the dice and tackled all types of adventures in an imaginary world. They were dragon slayers hunting dragons, heroes who saved the world, and sometimes demons who destroyed the world. But times changed, and there were now virtual reality games. As the medium to achieve their imagination appeared, their area of activity gradually became the virtual reality game. In that place, they boasted the best roleplay. That's right. They were widely known in the American community as intrinsic roleplayers. Bob's home had four virtual reality connection capsules placed side by side. Before connection, they had a light snack time as they discussed what to do for the day. Hey, I found an interesting video. What is it? Look. Bob opened his tablet and the video was played. It was from the Yuvitzer called Laney. Due to the advanced interpreter S, they could understand the videos of other countries without any problems. None of them could open their mouths. The video was shocking. The clan slaughtered the NPCs, but an orc appeared and fought against them like a hero. An unbreakable spirit that fought against injustice. Bob looked at the eyes of his friends in turn. After a long time together, they knew what Bob was trying to say. Gary nodded. The theme of the day is the endangered village and the four warriors that saved it. Not bad. They laughed. Elia asked, but that orc, is he alive? They couldn't verify it in the video. However, death was a strong possibility. But Bob's expression was bright. That is what we will check. If he died, the four warriors will maintain his role. Bob rose from his seat. How far is Chesswood? Let's see. He'll prepare my buff right away. They entered the capsules. The Elder Road role-playing crew that anyone in the RPG community would recognize, F4. They moved into the world of Elder Lord. A man checked the internet forums. A new post appeared. He clicked on it. Title Brothers, the time has come. Brothers, everyone would have seen that video. My hands are trembling as I write this. 
Our compatriot is spilling his blood. He is struggling alone in order to prevent their evil deeds. I don't think there was any brother who didn't tremble at the sight. It is time to let those dirty humans know who we are. I am heading there now. I leave some space for my brothers. It wasn't long but the comments were overwhelming. The man confirmed the comments. As expected, they were all passionate. I'm going. Let's go. I will participate. Dirty clans. Go. We have to punish the wicked. I'm going. Let's leave our mark on the world. I will say two words. Come, brothers. Morals. Assault. View more. A smile flashed on the man's face. As expected from his brothers. He was also unable to tolerate it after watching the video. He declared his participation in the comment input window. Number 1 Orc user Maguchwi I am going. Come brothers. Shout Bolter. Since the launch of Elder Lord, he was someone who started as a orc and spread the talent and honor of orcs, the number one orc magician who loved orcs more than anyone else, Maguchwi. And the secret orc users community he ran, Orc Users Brotherhood. Maguchwi and his brothers started running towards Cheswood. The road leading to Cheswood. Gordon's wagon was carrying a group of people heading towards Cheswood. Cheswood wasn't a bustling place, but there were those who wanted to relocate because it was simple and peaceful. A single family and their luggage were on the wagon. The great weather, the shipping costs he received, and the thought of meeting Madame Rachel at the pub meant he would soon arrive at Cheswood. In many ways, this was a great day. Thus, he let out an enthusiastic greeting as he discovered travelers on the road. Hey! Hello! They saw Gordon. The group seemed to be heading to Cheswood. It's good to see you. I am called Gordon. Hey guys, are you heading to Cheswood? It might be narrow, but do you guys want a ride? Oh, it isn't expensive. How about it? Your legs must hurt. The travelers started talking among themselves. Gordon grinned. Travelers always had a lot of suyans, but he was an honest coachman, so he didn't think to cheat them. It is one silver for one person. That is a good bargain. Then he hummed. The sun was bright and the wind was good, so the melody couldn't help emerging. The travelers consulted each other and nodded. Okay. It is five silver for five people. Gordon stopped his wagon and held out his hand. The man who seemed to be the representative approached Gordon and extended his hand. Thank you. But he gave Gordon a punch, not money. Egu. Gordon rolled off the wagon. He couldn't understand the sudden attack. Gordon groaned from his position on the ground. Quack, what is this? The travelers laughed. I was bored on the way, so this is great. The white stars on their foreheads were faintly shining. All those inside. We will take this wagon and join the clan. I understand. Their conversation shocked Gordon. What is this wicked? Why are you surprised? The man laughed. Is this the first time you've seen those cursed by the stars? Gordon gulped at the words. He just had to meet these bad people at this time. He tried to get up but was kicked by the man again. Gordon crouched on the ground. He thought that it was a great day, but it was actually the opposite. Quack. Wait here. There must be people inside. The man left the party and entered the wagon. As expected, there was a family surrounded by luggage. They didn't know what was going on and stared blankly at the man. Someone who was clearly a NPC asked, Who is it? Have we already arrived? Then he pulled out a knife. You've arrived in hell. The man grinned. The NPCs freaked out. The mother rushed to protect her kids, while the father spread out his hands. It was a great sight. W. We have nothing. Only our lives. Your lives are enough. Please, the children. Everybody come out. The NPCs obeyed. Elder Lord was too realistic, so it was more enjoyable. As the man smiled and pulled them out of the luggage compartment. Qua! A scream was heard. What, they're done already? 
The man asked. It seemed like the driver was Ed. The man tried to continue his actions without a care in the world. But then another scream was heard. Kiuk. Kiak. The man's face stiffened. Sewing was strange. That was the voice of his party member. He hurriedly left the compartment and looked in the direction of the driver. He couldn't believe his eyes. All of his companions had turned into white particles. All four people had died. They weren't at a level where they could be easily beaten, as there was a mixture of high-level users raised by the clan. The man moved his gaze. Gordon was looking at him from over the bodies of his party members, a sharp sword brightly gleaming in his hand. As the man looked stunned, Gordon laughed and swept away the long bangs. The man's mouth gaped open. There was a white star shining on Gordon's forehead. The man flinched back. Gordon waved the tip of his sword and approached. He had an unimaginably cruel expression on his face. Why are you surprised? Gordon laughed coldly. Is this the first time you've seen a role player? Chapter, 46 The chiefs decided to hold the battle at Edelweiss village in Cheswood in an attempt to face the clans who were dividing and occupying the area. The response was swift. The clans joined together, but the residents were locked in the center of Cheswood and had built a form line of defense. Orc brother should act more moderately, Jeremy said. I'm okay. Then don't fight so crudely. Jeremy and Blackmore had retreated safely from the Battle of Dandelion Village, but Crocta had fought until the end. He had barely managed to escape thanks to Laney, and now all of Cheswood knew his name. The orc warrior who risked his life fighting for them. Jeremy's eyes had turned red because he had thought Crocta was dead until he returned. He acted grumpy but was surprisingly cheerful. Laney had disappeared. Crocta thought that she was probably somewhere filming this very scene. The video she uploaded got an explosive reaction. The internet's public opinion had now turned against the clans, including the thawing Balhi clan. People were enthusiastic about the drama. The NPCs were inhabitants who couldn't fight the users massacring them, and the orc who fought for the people was a hero. The end of the battle and the orc's fate was unknown, but there was the shared opinion of wanting to help Cheswood. There were those who actually went to Cheswood. But Crocta didn't expect that much. In any case, the world was about victory. In the world of the strong, victory couldn't be achieved through public opinion and compassion alone. Even if some of them came to help, it wouldn't be enough to go against Thawing Balhi and the other clans. Krakakta examined the defenses from a high place. All of the villagers who could fight were gathered in Edelweiss village. Now it was a siege. Outside of the village, the clan users seemed to be scouting this place. They were also gathering. They would destroy the village and then scatter after getting what they wanted. The big clans couldn't ignore the ongoing criticisms of the public. They are coming, a villager said. Crocta and Jeremy looked in that direction. The armies of the clans were slowly approaching. Massive. There were many novice users, but there were also high-level users with good equipment scattered among them. They are coming from behind. The other side also announced the approach of the clans. Blackmore's uncle, the former village chief, frowned. The enemies just now appearing were split into four groups, according to the words of Crocta the Orc. They were trying to invade Edelweiss from four different directions. Ingram was troubled. The villagers were far from combatants. Ingram looked over the village's line of defense. Everyone was trying their best, but it couldn't help but look shabby since they didn't have professional training. He called his nephew Blackmore and two others over. They came. Blackmore had a dark expression ever since he fought in the battle at Dandelion Village. He missed the piece of chesswood and came back despite his past sins, only to find that the village was on the verge of collapse. He was forced to flee despite seeing many villagers ed in front of him. Should he have fought to the end like the orc Crocta? Ingram knew his heart and patted Blackmore's shoulder. Blackmore, Crocta, and Jeremy. Right now, you are the people most familiar with fighting in the village. Crocta nodded. Ingram continued, the enemy is moving forward in four places. Take one direction each and fight there. Is it really okay? 
Crocta asked. He wondered if it would be better to reduce the defense lines even further. The defense line could break if they fought in all four directions. Ingram shook his head. The residents have already lost so much. This is the last bastion. Please understand. It was for this reason that the people of Cheswood had gathered here. In the end, the villages that they threw away were burned and destroyed. The villages of Cheswood included the slaughtered Dandelion Village, Black Rose Village, Chrysanthemum Village, Cactus Village, Camellia Village, Daffodil, Saffron, Morning Glory, Sunflower, etc. They were all destroyed. If the battle was pushed to Edelweiss, then they really wouldn't have anything left for them. Crocta nodded at Ingram's determined face. He was a user, so he often overlooked their hearts. For all of them, this was a real problem. Their nests were destroyed, their friends had died, and their families were slaughtered. It was a disaster without notice. Due to the selfishness of their enemies, they lost everything. Crocta's eyes cooled. He had also lost important relationships due to the thawing Balhi clan. He completely understood their hearts. But if he was asked if they could win this fight, it would be difficult to answer. Crocta had barely come back alive, thanks to Laney. More powerful users like Higashi would appear. The odds of success had increased to 1%, but they were still ridiculous odds. But he didn't give up. Crocta touched the handle of his greatsword. The weight and grip of Ogre Slayer was now completely familiar in his hand. Numerous people, people who didn't know how to fight, took up weapons to protect their homes and families. They couldn't even live again after death. Once their necks were sliced, they were gone from the world forever. What about Crocta? How shameful would it be if he, a user, gave up first? How could he step back in front of Ingram and Blackmore's determined faces? I understand. Crocta turned his head. The villagers were nervous. The men held weapons and took deep breaths while the women tried to support them as much as possible. In the center were the children, the elderly, and the sick who were praying for the return of their families. Crocta, please take care of the southwest. Yes. Blackmore will take the northeast and. Jeremy, Blackmore, Ingram, and Crocta scattered in four different directions. The moment they wished each other luck, the alarm horn rang out. An attack. The attack has begun. To your locations. Go back to your locations. War. They exchanged glances and ran to their assigned area. The villagers also ran to their respective locations, picking up their weapons and preparing for battle. Hastily fired arrows flew in the air towards the clan members however, they were blocked by the opponent's defense wall, failing to cause damage. On the other hand, Flames appeared in the air and were launched towards the villagers' defense lines. The magician's bombardment. There were those who could use magic on Cheswood's side, but they weren't raised for battle like the clan's users. One of the village chiefs who learned magic deployed a shield, but it was soon broken by the repeated bombardment of the users. Aak. Those who were caught by the flames rolled across the ground. The flames spread. The arrows of the clan poured over the collapsed lines and the members rushed towards the residents. He couldn't leave them alone. Crocta pulled out his greatsword. The villagers were groaning from their injuries, some of them so terrified that they couldn't hold their weapons properly. Crocta took a deep breath. War was dependent on morale. Crocta yelled towards the sky with all his might, just like a lion's roar. Bolter. A call that shook the battlefield. It was an intense battle cry that shook the earth and caused the whole army to flinch. Your roar filled with ing intent has terrified the army soldiers. Your battle shout is now more than just a threat. Rare grade S, crushing roar rare has been acquired. The message windows popped up. It seemed like a greater force was rising from his body. Crocta didn't capture it. Rather, he let it explode towards the enemy again. Show the cost of blood to the invaders. The users blocked their ears at the ensuing roar. The shout was tremendous enough to shatter windows. It elicited fear in the enemies, and invoked an unbreakable fighting spirit in his allies. The residents remembered how to hold their weapons thanks to Crocta's intense presence. 
his battle cry. The enemies were invaders. They were demons that came to trample their homes, friends and families. No matter how unsophisticated the farmers, they realized that they would have to swing their fists. They needed to raise a sword towards those who wanted to their families. The residents shouted in response to Crocta. All the S. Save the village and our families. Chesswood is ours. The inhabitants sprinted towards the enemy, with Crocta leading the charge. Crocta was in the front as he hit the enemy's camp. Their formations shook. Crocta's greatsword broke the army's formation. The enemy's heads flew and blood spurted. Crocta's battle shout once again crushed the enemy's morale. Chesswood was better than he thought. But objectively, the power difference was obvious. Jeremy glanced around. He heard the cries of Crocta, the orc brother who was running around like crazy. He truly was too energetic. He was a monster who would continue to grow stronger in battle. But that was a matter for over there. Not good. Jeremy stabbed his opponent's neck and stepped back. This place was already a melee frenzy. It wasn't long before the enemies and allies mixed together. Gradually, the number of corpses increased. The eyes of the dead villagers were still filled with resentment towards the enemy. Damn it. He was only accompanying Crocta because of Derek, but he couldn't help being shaken by the awful sight. Those who were cursed by the stars. Disgusting yes. Jeremy wasn't a good man, he was well aware of this. He didn't have any sentimental aspects, and worked ultimately for his and Derek's benefits. But those guys were beyond wicked, like demons. Jane Jane. One dying resident was calling the name of his lover. It was hopeless, since his body had been split apart at the waist. His hollow eyes captured Jeremy. Jane. It was that name. Jane. Jeremy grasped his sword. He also knew a Jane, the name of an old lover. She was living well now. There were countless Janes in the world who were someone else's lover, just like this man loved a Jane. That's it. Why did he feel dirty? He volunteered for nothing. He didn't follow Crocta. He felt too much when he was with this brother. Yes, just like that time. When Hoyt and Crocta were standing together, Jeremy had felt an unknown feeling. Boss Derek. The boss also felt this way for the first time. What should Jeremy do? Those who were cursed by the stars were approaching. More residents on the front lines were dying. It was time to run away. Why couldn't he take a step back? Jeremy looked back. Edelweiss village was visible and the frightened faces of the children could be seen in the windows. He saw residents struggling even as they collapsed. At that moment, Jeremy fell back from a strong shock. Jeremy barely caught himself in time. A man was visible. It was the man called Higashi, the one who brought Crocta to the brink of death. He was wearing dazzling and expensive armor while holding a sword and shield. Jeremy whistled. You came now. You're later, brother. Higashi studied him with an unknown smile. NPCs truly seem real. Those cursed by the stars called people a strange term, NPCs. He wasn't sure why, but Jeremy felt dirty every time he heard it. There was a reason why they were called the cursed. They were cursed and committed bad deeds without any care in the world. He wanted to ask. Brother, I was wondering sewing. Jeremy raised his sword. Why are you attacking this place? He heard that it was for achievements, but it wasn't funny that the cursed people were trying to get rid of their curse through evil deeds. They shouldn't innocent people just to resolve their curse. Higashi laughed. It is annoying to explain, so just know this. What is it? If you understand how trivial the reason is, you will become angry. Those with an artificial intelligence were really funny. They didn't even know that they were born for the sake of humans playing a game. Higashi said. Jeremy saw Higashi's smiling face. A trivial reason. I see. Jeremy started laughing. He couldn't help laughing. Higashi and Jeremy looked at each other and laughed. Yes, it is accurate. Even though I didn't hear your reason, I can feel a fire burning inside me. 
It is already too hard to say how upset I am. Jeremy said. What if the fire emerges? What if? At that moment, Jeremy moved like the wind. I'm going to you, you er. Ha ha ha. The two exchanged blows. Jeremy's sword stabbed at Higashi's gaps, but they were all blocked by the shield. Cough. Jeremy was wary of Higashi's one-handed sword, but ended up being hit by the shield. Jeremy flew into the air and rolled across the ground. Kuhik. So painful. How did that orc brother endure this? How did he endure such pain? Jeremy barely managed to raise his body. Blood flowed from his mouth. His body structure was too different from an orc. Jeremy smiled again as he looked at his sword and then shook it. You're not running away. Like the previous time. Higashi asked. He should run away but. His body bent towards the front. He couldn't do this. Why did he follow that orc? He tried to recover his spirit, but then Higashi approached. The sword penetrated Jeremy's stomach. He fell to his knees. Blood gushed out from the wound in his abdomen. Jeremy's head hit the ground. He could see Higashi's legs slowly moving away in the corner of his vision. I have no more time to play today. Cough, poo-hoo. Jeremy couldn't help laughing. Death, he had never thought about it. Was death coming this way? Death was now passing close to life. It wasn't strange that he died from a sword. His sword was covered with the blood of many, and not all of them died so easily. Anyway, life and death were both fleeting. Now it was his turn. Jeremy closed his eyes. He wouldn't be subservient. There was no need to regret it. Life was rough, so he should calmly accept his death. Embrace it. His vision became dark. In the darkness, sewing fluttered. Dead. Someone spoke. It was an eerie voice. Do you know death? I have never witnessed an irreversible one. Jeremy wanted to open his eyes, but there was no sensation at all, like his body had disappeared. Only his consciousness floated in this deep darkness. At that moment, a terrible scream coming from the abyss shook him. It was terrible. It was a vicious cry that seemed to scrap against his soul. His heart seemed to stop. The voice continued to whisper. It isn't your time yet. Then I will be waiting. The horrible scream constantly echoed around him as he rose in the darkness. Terrible fear. He had to escape. He wanted to get away. Every part of his body was twisting from fear. He opened his eyes. Cough. Then he coughed up blood. Black blood was scattered on the floor. He wasn't dead yet. He moved his gaze. Oh my god. He couldn't believe his eyes. It was impossible. One, two, they were standing up. The dead residents were rising again. Even Higashi didn't understand this situation as he fell back. Countless bodies were revived again as an unknown black energy covered their bodies. The astonished clan members swung their weapons at the corpses, but their attacks couldn't pierce the black energy. Jeremy turned his head. From far away, someone was slowly walking towards them. On the man's back, there was a gigantic darkness that resembled the wings of a demon with the tongue of a snake. Jeremy had heard about this. The worst beings. The demon spokesman who brought hell to life. Necromancer. The middle-aged man carrying the hellish darkness stood in front of them. His ominous eyes scanned the area. And he declared. I am the wine man, Kim Cholno, Iron. He raised his hand. The corpses started to surround the enemies like beings from hell. I came here to punish the people who are like rice wine. Chapter 47. The dead rose and struck the users. Higashi cut at the people coming towards him, but they just rose up again and stretched out bloody hands to him. Higashi freaked out and sliced apart their bodies. He looked around. The clan members were also lost due to this bizarre sight. They slaughtered the dead for a second time. Them in the abdomen didn't them. Instead, they kept staring with resentful eyes as they used their broken bones as their weapons. It was a hell-like pandemonium. 
Higashi looked at the man who was the source of all this. The middle-aged man, the necromancer named Iron. A black haze extended from his body to dominate the battlefield. Higashi felt an instinctive fear towards him. Necromancy was a strength that could be called the antithesis of life. But as the Yamato clan's vice leader and ranker, he couldn't back off. As the screams of his clan members were heard behind him, Higashi rushed to iron. It was the typical attack using the sword and the shield. But he overlooked that his opponent wasn't a warrior. The darkness slithered around his neck, as a cold chill went down his spine, surrounding him. Sewing was wrong. Gijiok. He was thrown back as he heard a sound. The sky and ground turned upside down. Higashi couldn't think. He tried to get up, but his eyes were ringing and he couldn't find his center. He relied on his sword as his body staggered. Iron stretched out hands towards him. Don't resist. You will regret it. It was a solemn declaration. And it was serious. If Higashi resisted any longer, then he would see terrible things. Iron was the worst type of necromancer, the one with the presence of a demon. He contracted with an entity that should not be called unto the lands. This was why he hadn't connected to Elder Lord for a while. He was different from the other necromancers, who only raised the dead. He wasn't a ranker, but he contracted with a powerful demon who could make even rankers kneel. There was a price for that great power, which was to pay compensation to the demon. Demogorgon. Life to death, laughter to screaming. Iron's body soon escaped from his control. The lion of hell who borrowed his body opened his mouth, there are so many of them. Those cursed by the stars, what a funny joke. The demon occupying Iron's body giggled. Iron's body no longer followed his control. His mind was locked in his body and he felt all sensations without any filters. Even pain. It feels good to meet you again after a long wait, contractor. He scratched at Iron's chest with his fingertips. The demon's punishment. Iron swallowed down the pain. He had signed with a being that shouldn't have existed in the game. People protested several times to Elder Lord Corporation, but they ignored it, saying it was an element of the game. An evil demon that took away control from the user. Demogorgon told Iron, you must have been doing well. Iron inwardly cursed before replying, yes yes. That's correct. Demogorgon. I wanted you to have peace. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, I guess you have been doing fine. It is all thanks to Demogorgon. I've been so busy, but I always thought about Demogorgon. Ha <laughs> ha. Now I feel like a fish in the water. As expected from my trusty contractor. Koka ha ha ha. Were you expecting anything else? Kukaka. That's right. It was one reason why Iron was able to deal with a high-ranking demon. The worldly wisdom of a sales department manager. He had the S sales force essence. Thanks to this S, Iron was able to deal with the demon. Even though there was a big side effect of losing control, the demon helped Iron out with great power. Yes, it has been a while, so I will listen to what my contractor wants. What is your reason for calling me? Do you want the advent of hell? Do you want to recreate souls by mixing together life and death? How is such a thing possible? As always, Demogorgon's strength and talent is sowing I can only admire. Ha 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 ha. But these people deserve more than that. I want them to never come to this place again. Kukukukaka. I see. Is that enough? There is no need to use a knife to catch a mouse. Furthermore, Demogorgon isn't a knife, but a dragon. No, they don't deserve the final weapon that will destroy this world. They are unworthy of it. Please give this present to me. Yes. Kukukukukuka. Demogorgon burst out laughing. How long had it been since he had a contractor who was such a good fit? Demogorgon smirked and looked at all the enemies in front of him. On the other hand, horror gripped Higashi. The necromancer was mumbling to himself like he was crazy. Iron looked at Higashi. You. Do you know? Higashi raised his sword and shield as he asked, what do you mean? What comes without sound, tears apart your life, and isn't reversible. 
A voice spoke in Higashi's ears. Death. Higashi freaked out and turned his body, but there was nothing there. He flinched back. The voice whispered in his ear again. The eternal sinking. Higashi blocked his ears. He looked around. Iron couldn't be seen. There was nobody. There were only the dead bodies and the corpses of the clan members on the floor. Do you want to know it? Soing touched his spine. It was under his skin. The demon's hand touched his skin, muscles, and nervous system. Higashi flopped down. He couldn't breathe. The sky was in front of him. A dark curtain started to descend from the sky. I'm going to show you. His vision became dark. Raisin, master of the Napoleon clan and rancor, couldn't believe it. Obviously, it was very easy. The four clans allied in order to decimate an unknown village. Once they trampled on the village and raised the level of their new clan members, they would create a base here to gain more wealth and power. An easy and efficient operation. Everything had gone as planned. However, the existence of these guys wasn't drawn in the nice blueprint. Warriors. Too cool. The best. The elf female trembled and made a fuss. Ha ha ha. As expected of the warrior chosen by the great sage. A magician with a long beard nodded. In the only one without a great role. A man holding a sword shrugged at his colleague's remarks. Then warrior Bob, the man who was being praised by everyone, lifted his shining sword. My sword, ex Geiger is howling. For justice. Raisin now realized it. These crazy guys. They were crazy role playing lovers. He didn't want to get involved with crazy people like this. But the problem was that the crazy people weren't just joking around when it came to strength. That guy's eyes. They are eyes steeped in evil. Well must discipline them. The wise sage can see everything. No, don't come over you crazy people. Raisin ran around. After the fight began, the front line started to be pushed back. The middle-aged man who seemed to be the leader worked hard to encourage the residents, but the clan gradually drove them back. The moment the clan was about to purge the villagers with powerful ranged magic. All of a sudden, these people appeared and attacked. The warrior's sword moved through all air, and all of the gathered magic power was scattered. A vacuum that drew in all the magic power in the area. They exhibited huge strength and instantly stopped the Napoleon clan's march. An unexpected variable. However, it wasn't impossible. Everybody gather here. Catch these guys. Raisin screamed and stepped back. The clan members recognized the instructions and flocked to his side. No matter how strong the opponents were, they were outnumbered. The men and women in the group of four were nervous. Raisin laughed. The group couldn't deal with so many clan members. It was at that moment. The villagers who didn't know English soon realized that the group were allies and moved forward. Numerous residents stood shoulder to shoulder with the group. Raisin's face distorted again. We will fight together. The villagers held farm equipment and rusty weapons. However, determination shone in their eyes. This was their village. They would protect it themselves. The Napoleon clan was stunned. How about it, didn't we do well coming here? Yes. The best stage. The four roleplayers, F4, exchanged glances as they stood with the residents. It felt good. No, it was a good thing. The best. It had been a long time. The four of them had created and destroyed worlds. They rolled the dice for a long time, but had felt empty. They came here to the world of Elder Lord because they knew the reason why. Those who stood with them. Having companions stand next to them was required on adventures. It wasn't a fiction that the master of the dice created, but a reality where their allies breathed, thought, cried, laughed, and felt anger. A party always needed some allies, and today, they were standing as heroes to the people who needed them. Bob raised his sword. Now. My sword ex Geiger. My sword doesn't drink water, nor alcohol, nor the blood of the enemy. Is this necessary? 
Elia whispered as Bob started talking nonsense. But Bob's mood was the best. Thus, Bob couldn't stop anymore. What does my sword need? Elia, Joseph and Gary laughed. It was obvious what Bob was going to shout next. The line that they always told him not to say. The very thing that caused them to cringe in embarrassment. But they would accept it today. Justice. Justice E. Just ice. The role players shouted at the same time. Raisin saw the funny scene, but he couldn't laugh. It was because they unleashed a wild assault. Crocta gasped for breath, wielding his greatsword like crazy. But the enemies didn't give up. He trampled the enemies, but more enemies appeared. Moreover, several influential figures were acting to keep Crocta in check. Crocta tried to help the inhabitants, but the enemies kept Crocta away of them. He could only watch as the residents were slaughtered. Crocta thought despairingly. Insufficient. His power was lacking. More power was needed. Crocta rushed again, but was blocked by several people. He wielded his great sword at their defense. He was able to slash at one user but at the same time, he received multiple wounds on his body. Blood and flesh were scattered onto the floor. Crocta fell to his knees. Don't be upset, orc. They said with a laugh. Crocta closed his eyes. He still had power left. He grabbed his great sword. It was only up to here, but it was still good. He had done his best. It couldn't be helped. However, he would stamp it clearly. What an orc was. Crocta opened his eyes. He prepared for his last hurrah. It was at that moment. Do 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 do. The earth shook. Everyone on the battlefield gazed at a distant place. Dust had risen up. W what? Crocta also lifted his head. The earth was ringing. A crowd of people were rushing from the horizon towards this place. Everyone looked at them. The distance narrowed. The earth shook like there was an earthquake. Do 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 do.